All right, so this is a video born somewhat of spite and out of me just thinking this would be hilarious. And that is stemmed from my starter guide video. So as you can see, I have about a 30 minute video on my channel going over everything to a new player would need to know and save the world. And I've gotten not many, gladly, but a couple of comments that were along the lines of, oh, this isn't a real starter guide. All he did was link his own videos, which makes no sense because these videos go way more in depth into these into these topics and if i talked about everything in its entirety the video length would be well look at the video length of this video i thought it'd be hilarious to drop every single one of the videos i link into one timeline so this is going to be the full cut ultimate guide to fortnite save the world i have no idea how long this video is going to end up as i'm recording this but i suspect this is going to be a uh uh, a multi, a multi-sitting video. If you watch this in one sitting, you, I, I hope you got a snack because, uh, you know, popcorn might help you get through this one. Without further ado, let's get it started. Okay, this is going to be one of the more complicated videos ever. And just to get it out of the way, the code Mista is going to have to be set aside for today. So I'm trying to gear this video towards people who have never ever played the game before. Now, you're in luck because I have covered most of the game already. Uh, there are going to be a ton of links in the description of this video where I have covered much of the things I'll be discussing briefly in greater detail, and I think it'll be a really good resource. For example, um, to skip ahead a little bit, we'll go to the very beginning, but for example, survivor squads are a thing that are going to matter. Your power level is essentially how strong you are, and making your survivor squads, you know, set up properly, and... Uh, doing your research every single day are the two main ways to get that level higher. And that is one of the things that is covered extensively in my, you know, how to raise your power level survivor squads video. We're talking about survivor squads today. And I know that I've already covered this topic on my channel. Uh, none of the information in my old video is outdated at all. And it will basically be a slower version of what I'm going to be covering today. I'll link that video in the description below if you're curious. But I'm older now. I'm wiser now. I'm now apparently not a max power level. Oh, yeah, because of something I'll demonstrate later. And uh, I want to go through this a little bit quicker and with a little bit more information. So first and foremost, do your research. Collect this every single day you collect it just by opening the tab and then you spend it on these different levels these will correlate to the different bonuses you get in game health is literally just that green number in every single mission weapon damage is i'll let you guess which one that one is resistance is your shield which is interesting because if you guys play with blast in the past this is completely useless as you won't have a shield so if you're somebody who has that team perk and uses it regularly you can maybe prioritize this a little less and then tech will be your ability damage from your heroes if you're using shockwave minigun dragon slash seismic smash kunai anything like that all of them will be ability damage and then of course trap damage and your healing rate which is not that big of a deal but it is very nice to have personally back in the day i maxed out my offense first that's just because that's how i like to play i like to do as much damage as possible but you guys can of course level up all of this as evenly as possible and then you can see how much you're generating right here this will go up as you raise your level i think this is your player level that prioritizes the most and i'll talk about that in a second and uh you can see exactly how much you have exactly how much you're getting how much you're sharing with your party and that's all that and that's all well and good and that's that account level that i was talking about earlier i believe this does contribute to to your power level a little bit but that just goes up from getting xp from doing missions you can get more xp by not upgrading this hero and going to your resources so you have teammate xp boost you should dump these on all your teammates don't be like me who's got 242 of these lying around give them to your teammates and then i would show you how to use yours but i don't have any right here but you'll have the ability to pop these these always give you a bonus and you can see that that bonus is right there i think that's my daily bonus but the blue bar will be boosted xp and you can't waste those xp boosts so just dump them on your friends give them all of those because they will appreciate it if they're leveling up through the ranks. Now, before we get into squads, I want to share something that I wish I knew when I made my first Survivor Squads video, and that is ability bonuses. So the set bonuses that you get from these guys. Ranged weapon damage is something everybody wants to care about. Everybody sees that 5% extra damage and thinks, oh man, I'm going to want that. But it's completely negligible and almost entirely pointless, because you can see that my offense is 3,251. They don't give us any information beyond that. Epic's just, here's a number and then goodbye. That is actually technically a multiplier. So I am doing, so to speak, I don't know if this is exactly how it works, but it's an easy way to visualize. 
that I am effectively doing 3,251 times the amount of damage of a base one player who has nothing leveled up. And what that multiplier means is if I get a 5% ranged weapon damage bonus, my damage goes from 3,251x multiplier to 3,256x multiplier. I'm going to show how little that is on the screen now. It's basically nothing, and that is true for, unfortunately, every single set bonus. I hope this changes in the future. I will pin a comment if they ever rework this. I think they are desperately in need of it because that means that essentially every single trap bonus gets more and more useless the higher your power level gets. When you're just starting out, if you're power level 10, that 5% might be a big deal. That could be a really, really big thing if you're just in Stonewood, but in these higher levels, it is so small that it doesn't even matter. What does change is trap durability. That 8% is of your trap durability, and most traps have about 32, so I can show some of my schematics here, like the wall launcher has about a 34. When I go into game, that's going to be quite a little bit bigger. I'll, I'll be in like the 40s or 50s or something, which is nice. That's a very nice ability to have, and it's really the only one that I have found that actually makes any kind of real world difference. I've seen friends that have intentionally lowered their power level specifically to maximize their trap durability bonuses. I'm not really about that life, but you can see that I've been setting aside trap durability survivors anyway, just in case I ever want to go down that route. And that leads me into why my power level is a little bit lower, because I want to talk about survivor squads and exactly how you should set them up. It is as simple as this. So the actual first thing you want to do is to turn off autofill. Please never ever use this again, because after you watch this video, you will be far more effective than it will be at raising your power level. They specifically set this up to not help you nearly as much as setting it up properly will, because they want people to actually learn how to do the survivor squads, and autofill will actually make your power level go down in a lot of cases. And uh, I demonstrated here, but that would be quite a mess to clean up. Suffice it to say, it would actually probably lower my power level because of the way that they set it up. Now, getting back to the video, first and foremost, you unlock these squads as you do storm shield defenses and quest lines and whatever. I have a friend who just started the game and uh, he had only one squad with two survivors available. And that's exactly what you start out with. But you'll unlock more and more of these squads as you do more of your storm shields. And as you get further in the game, you'll have uh, the opportunity to unlock every single one of these going up until I believe Twine SSD 5 or 6. Obviously, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you should just be doing your storm shields anyway, so it doesn't really matter exactly when you unlock that. And the way that you want to set these up is, well, you can see this is exactly kind of like a perfect score. You want to have mythic leads in all of these slots and then legendary survivors. But as you're getting up to that point, here's what you want to prioritize. You want your leads to have a leader match. So this guy's a doctor. You want him to go in the EMT squad. You got this girl who is a marksman. You want her to go in the fire team alpha slot. Fire team alpha is a little bit different than close assault squad because while both of these will update your offense, as you can see up there, uh, one is fire team alpha. That's where she goes. She has that marksman symbol, whereas the uh, close assault guy is going to have the martial artist role. So all of these different heroes are going to have their own different abilities. I can show some of the other leads here right now. So you see, we've got a lead survivor for explorer, gadgeteer, marksman, and martial artist, which I already mentioned earlier. It's also good to mention that these bonuses are the same thing as research. So fortitude, offense, resistance, and tech, the things we already talked about, are influenced by your survivors. So me personally, I buffed my uh, fire team alpha and my close assault squad. That's where all of my early legendary survivors went when I wanted to maximize my damage. And if there's a certain one of these traits that you guys want to spec into, I would highly recommend prioritizing that if that's something you want to do. Now for leader, you want to prioritize that leader match because when it goes into this leader slot, it will be exactly doubled in its effective power bonus. So he's giving me a 270, whereas if I pull in somebody who's not matching, you can see all of these mythic leads are 25, but the one that's actually matching is 50. So obviously if I leveled up Marlin all the way to max, then he would have that 270 bonus. And if I leveled up any of these other guys, they would actually max out to have about 135, which means if I leveled up a matching legendary survivor all the way to max, a 130 would get doubled into 260, which would be way, way more than a mythic lead. So my point here is that you want to have a matching leader match as your absolute priority. Rarity comes second. For the squad members, it's completely different. And that's actually why my bonus is a little bit lower. And that's what I'm demonstrating on the end here. So all of these people are matching legendary survivors. That's as high as you can get besides the two mythic survivors that you get from your quest line. You can see Joel and Carolina here are two that you get from the quest line. These are the only mythic survivors that I'm aware of that you can get in the game as of now. Hopefully they release more in the future, but you will need these two to get your survivor squads all the way max. But don't worry, as I said, they come from the quest line and they will have that maximum 153 bonus if they are matching to the lead. But in every other case, your maximum survivor is going to be about 138 matching legendary survivor. So what I want to show here is the fact that a fully maxed out purple survivor with a matching personality type is still less than a fully maxed out legendary. And I believe that starts to be true around the two star or three star range. So if you're just coming up in the levels, you actually want to prioritize having the highest rarity survivors that you
you can possibly get before your matching personality type. Now, matching personality doesn't actually do anything other than raise their power level bonus here. Uh, that's the only thing it does. So even though this number is red, it's actually, you can see six higher and definitely the better option. Aha, now I'm back to normal and I'm uh, up to 131. So now on the topic of survivors, let's talk about where you can get them. Most events offer up a survivor. That's not very common. These reset once every like few months, but you might have the opportunity to buy a survivor. You can get survivors in the weekly shop as well. Every week you get an opportunity to get about two per Purple survivors, but both of these rates are very, very slow. So under the loot tab, you'll have any other llamas that you might have unlocked from the collection book or any other event or, you know, any sorry llamas that Epic might give you. So you could have some Epic troll truck, troll stash llamas in here. Maybe those could potentially give you legendary survivors. And the unfortunate truth is upgrade llamas and super people llamas are what you're going to want to look for are kind of the best way to really farm survivors. I'm not going to recommend this because it will cost V-Bucks, but if you ever see the mythic lead that you need or a legendary survivor that's matching and that's something you've been looking for, you might want to get this. I mentioned my friend of mine who just started his game like yesterday. His very first upgrade llama, I couldn't believe this, had three legendary survivors in it. I wouldn't recommend spending V-Bucks on these llamas unless you absolutely need it. And three legendary survivors right off the bat is something I just could not let him pass up. And he kind of agreed that 50 V-Bucks was worth it because 50 V-Bucks is actually what you get from your daily quest. So if you keep up with these, you should be able to buy about a llama every day. And if you save up enough of these, you might be able to afford some mythic lead that you need down the line. Of course, as I showed, you really only need eight mythic leads to hit max power level, so finding ones that match the personality types of your main legendary survivors is going to net you the most success. Now, the other way to get them is kind of my favorite way. So, one of my favorite sites to recommend is Fortnite DB. This might not exist in the future, there might be a better options, but they are very, very good in laying out all of the different rewards for the day, and you can see right here in the 94-4 player, you can get a legendary survivor. The usefulness of this will vary from day to day, because the awards are usually randomized, but if you see a legendary survivor or more excitingly a mythic lead that you need, I highly recommend checking this site every single day uh, at the shop reset. For me, it's 7 p.m. I live in Central Standard Time, so you might want to line that up with your day, but every single time the shop resets in Battle Royale, it also resets and save the world and so do the missions, so every single day you have an opportunity to go and get these survivors. There's almost always a legendary survivor available. Now, I'm sorry that that news wasn't a little bit better, but you kind of have to understand that they need to make it a little hard to get legendary survivors because because there's not really any real way to farm them because if you could uh, you'd fill in all 54 legendary survivors you needed uh, very very quickly I understand that the personality needs to match so it'll probably take you a few hundred survivors to get there as you can see I've saved up a few over the years but you know you just got to stay vigilant and uh, another good way to get them is the collection book so this might be less successful for you more or less depending on your level but you absolutely can get survivors from these I can't show it because I don't have it unlocked but very frequently I actually get like two legendary survivors from this or those troll truck Pearl Stash or Smorgasbord Llamas. I'm not even going to try that again because that was insanely hard for me to say. Those will drop lots of legendary items and very potentially some legendary survivors. Now that just about wraps up Survivor Squads. I hope that this was a little bit more helpful than it was before. I try to make things a lot quicker, a lot snappier because like I've said, I've learned a lot. If you want to watch me slot survivors and really see what I've said here today in action, I'll link my old Survivor Squads video with a timestamp in the description below where I go through my entire Survivor Squads and slot every single thing again. Uh, I put a little bit too much emphasis on the set bonuses again like I said those are useless nowadays I mentioned that earlier but that's a really good way to see me in action applying exactly what I was saying today and uh, I also want to add this on at the end is if you're looking for training manuals I have an entire video on how to get those in the description below I go over exactly how to get these in uh, mass quantity because you are going to need an absolute ton of these to level up your survivors now the title of this video is how to increase your power level fast in Fortnite save the world but this entire video has been mainly focused on squads not exactly how to do it fast now, the best way to get XP is, uh, well, queuing missions that give you 4x survivor XP. Right now, that's hard to demonstrate because the awards are looking normal for the perk up, but all of the uh, four-player missions aren't actually displaying 4x. So this mission will actually give you four times as much hero XP as a normal mission. Now, it's interesting that I actually clicked on a Category 4 Storm because these are the missions that will actually give you the most amount of XP in the entire game. So survivor XP is not exactly hard to come by. I have a little bit of it because I've been playing this game for a while now, and the missions that give you the most are absolutely category four and evacuate the shelter missions and if you find one of those in a four player mission they will give you the most amount of survivor xp now there are easier missions like repair the shelter that is again you want to be looking for four players going to give you plenty of survivor xp these missions change over every single day so mind this timer up here that fortnite db section i covered earlier is definitely going to be relevant here you can also look for missions that give you survivor xp on there and uh, those are the ones you're going to want to prioritize if you definitely want to make your survivors as high as they can go and then of course for the evolution 
Foundation Materials is the exact same thing as Survivor XP, you basically want to look for, you know, not perk up as enticing as it is, but Eye of the Storm, Lightning in the Bottle, Drops of Rain, all of these are going to be able to come from these missions and are something you kind of just need to be vigilant about and looking out for. So if you need Storm Shards, Q of 4X for Storm Shards, that kind of thing. Of course, in the item shop, you can also buy absolutely everything you need. Storm Shards, Eye of the Storm, Lightning in a Bottle. As of very recently, they've upped the amount of Pure Drops of Rain you're getting weekly. I don't know if this will pursue in the future, but you should definitely be buying this stuff if it's something you need. So that just about wraps things up. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you want to support my channel, feel free to use code message to check out. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Like the video if you liked it. Dislike if you disliked it. Subscribe if you're new. I hope you guys enjoyed and uh, thank you for watching. So uh, that's sort of like a little freebie for you guys. Log in every day, minimum just for the research. You don't even need to play the game. Just log in with this research, dump it into one of these categories. I prefer to offense. It doesn't really matter in the long run because they're all going to get maxed out. And uh and you go from there. So let's start off with some of the early things that you want to be sure not to do. And the, the first one is to never, ever trade. If you drop into Stonewood, you know, you go into the map, you're, you're going to the Stonewood, you're, you're queuing your first missions, you're likely going to find yourself inside of a box and someone's going to shoot the corner. They want you to drop weapons or they're going to offer to drop you weapons. It's not worth it. None of it is ever worth it because if you look at my inventory here, this is what it's going to look like for you down the line. None of this is special. None of this is anything I'm bragging about. I am just saying that all of your weapons can and will be 130 eventually. We'll get into weapons and heroes and how to get these later. Trust me, I'll try to cover it. But uh, essentially in the early game, people are going to drop you 130s. They're going to drop you 144s. And two things are going to happen. One, it's going to ruin your experience. Uh, or two, you're going to actually get into trading and then you're just going to get scammed and it's not worth it. You don't need anybody for anything. There are really great ways to farm. We're talking about farmers today and oh. Oh, I'm sorry. That was that was still there from my shop videos. Let me get rid of my creator code. You know what? No, no. I'm just going to leave it there for the whole video. So I was feeling a little hesitant about recording this video today because I wasn't entirely sure that it was necessary. I have an old video right here on screen of me covering some of the best Outlander loadouts in the game. And basically that was... A, in addition to my series of all of the best loadouts for the different hero classes, you know, soldiers, ninjas, uh, outlanders, and constructors. I inevitably never did a video on constructors because that's way too basic. Like, seriously, just pick what you need. If you need strong walls, then just load up the support. There's really, like, not that many complicated ways to set up constructors. And with outlanders, it was kind of the same sort of thing where I took the approach to, you know, showing the best way to farm. And I thought that video was good. I still think it's good. I'm going to link it below. It's still public and everything. But Clip came to the game. She changed everything. Never mind the fact that it's been a year since I recorded that video. I'm older. I'm wiser. You know, I have lights behind me now and a face cam because people requested that heavily. I'm glad you guys, you know, like what you see. But I, uh, I have a few more things to say. Right off the bat, I'm going to get some plugs out of the way. If you want just the field guide to all items in the entire game, obviously I'm going to link my how to get every item video in the description below. That is, to this day, a fantastic resource. It's older. Again, I am wiser now, but how to get every item in that game is still relevant. Also, running expeditions is a fantastic way to do that. If you guys just want like a quick little guide, I always thought I was going to make a video on uh, on expeditions and how to do them, but I, I'll, tell, I'll tell you now. First and foremost, you want to do the uh, the bread box, the crafting supplies. This is what's going to get you like all of the regular stuff, the nuts and bolts, the rough ore, the, the fibrous herbs, all the things that you want. And nowadays, and this is going to lead on to my second point that I wanted to cover before we get started, is the uh, the trap. The trap packs. Medium is usually not worth your time, but it might be. You, you definitely want to do large. If you get the traps, you can recycle them to get 100% of the materials back. And that's the other thing I wanted to mention right off the bat. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that segue worked so well. If you farm a lot and you end up getting tons of materials, you can craft whatever trap you want in the entire game and you can recycle it for full. Anti-air traps, for example, are going to cost me 7 nuts and bolts, 4 and 1. But if I go to recycle this, whoops, I will get everything back. I'll get all 1400, 800, and 200 quartz in, you know, in the respective materials. And this is not a new trick. That was new a year ago when I mentioned it in my old video, but it's a fantastic trick to say that, you know, right off the bat, here's how to get every item in the game. And using this trick for traps, you can you know, crunch all of them down. Like, you'll see that my backpack is nearly full, but so is my storage of just tons of traps. Some were gifted, some were crafted by me, and I just can, you know, downcraft any of these to get everything back. Now, with all that out of the way, Let's talk about farming loadouts. I know I've already showed this right off the bat here, but this is not the best farming loadout. There is no best farming loadout. I mean, shocker, if you've seen my videos before, that will not be a surprise. But 
there are a few ways to uh, to go about farming. And there are like three-ish primary ways you can do it. First and foremost is actually, I'm going to start with the pickaxe, and that's with Pathfinder Jess. You can just use her in the lead. I'll talk about the respective loadouts in a second. But for the categories, you got the pickaxe and then anti-material charge, which is the punch. That's, you know, you know, that's what most people are thinking of. And then there's kind of a third one where there are a lot of different anti-material charge users in general. And a lot of people uh, brought up one-two punch. I always thought one two punch was kind of a cop out because the way it works is that it reduces your heavy attack cost, you know, the energy cost based on, you know, the last ability that you use. So if you have all of your supports filled up and this thing is active to 100%, if you phase dash, for example, your next punch will do zero energy. And as far as I can tell, you're essentially complicating your farming by making it look free by spending your energy on dashing, which doesn't seem efficient at all. And I, I don't really think that 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 one didn't click with me. A lot of people recommended this. I got a few comments on this, and I'm, I'm really not convinced that this is a good way to go. But if you want to use 1-2 Punch and make your farming free, then that is an option for you. I went with phase and confuse just to up my uh, phase shift and then my phased out was you know able to reduce the the cooldown time which was nice and all and there wasn't really any energy regeneration. I had to use fuel for the fallen which I didn't really uh, show very well because I didn't kill any enemies and that's kind of my point is that when you're farming not just trying to demonstrate for a video you're not worried about enemies. You're running around punching rocks. You're running around punching cars. You're not you're not focused on the enemies. You shouldn't have to be stopping to kill things. And that's why I'm kind of uh, not on board with this. So let's move on to the one that I actually, believe it or not, had the most fun with. This has always felt like kind of a weird build, but... Pathfinder Jess. So in the gameplay you're about to see more of, I was using this loadout where I had Archaeologist and Fossil Southie in support. This is just giving me the constant energy regeneration. You're going to hear about those two heroes a lot today because you need them in basically any anti-material charge based build. And then of course 100% we're using Clip. So she is definitely something we'll talk about later, but like literally a must have. Her plus Southie plus Archaeologist are the three that you're going to need for any farming build. Your other two support slots are almost whatever you want, basically. Of course, you're going to have to have Blast on the Pass active, but we'll get to all that in a second. She is just fantastic to have in support. However, she only affects the anti-material charge. So I'm running all this in support just so that with Pathfinder Jess, I can constantly punch because I'll have that 33% chance to get extra materials from Clip, and then I'm just punching as many trees as I possibly can. And I'm only still showing this loadout because I want to talk about going coconuts. I had like a phase shift thing in my gameplay, but as I'm uh, talking about it now coconuts were going to be better because a it keeps you alive that's nice and all but it gives you a 16 percent extra damage so it would make all of my pickaxe damage do more but as you can see i'm already three shotting most rocks and trees and in a forest holy crap this was way more efficient than i thought it would be because in a forest everything breaks in about three shots like i said so you're just mowing through the entire thing almost literally just getting all of the wood all of the planks all of the twine all of the adhesive resin if you're breaking rocks you're getting more rough ore and everything of course i you got to remember to use your anti-material charge so that you can get that 33 percent chance to get extra stuff but while you're at it just smack everything and so pathfinder jazz is like a really really good hands-on approach but a lot of people might not like the fact that you're not instantly breaking everything and you're not quite getting that 100 percent bonus so let's skip over my fossil southie build and talk about clip i have officially switched sides I was convinced that she is best in the lead, and I stand by that depending on what you're farming for, but let's talk about it. So her in the lead is kind of the same story as Archaeologist. A lot of people have compared Archaeologist to Fossil Southie in the way that Fossil Southie apparently got more punches off. I don't know if I did it wrong, but I was only able to punch four times in a row before my energy ran out. If you somehow don't know what he does, he gives you 12 energy per second in the lead, four energy per second in the support, and it's kind of tricky to use him in the lead because you need Blast in the Past active. So you can see to have him in the lead, I need to have kind of a dead perk with Saurian Might in my support. So it's kind of not my favorite thing to have Fossil Southie in the lead but I found that he might actually be the best because with Clip in the lead she performs basically like Archaeologist in the lead where you get like more punches in a row but that doesn't really make sense because Archaeologist will get six punches in a row and then you're out of energy and then you're regenerating slowly and it wasn't really a good experience so 
I found it to be most comfortable to actually run Fossil Selfie in the lead because he was constantly regenerating energy. Obviously, you get less punches with spamming it, but you're not always spamming it. You know, you're running to the next rock, you're running to the next car, you're running to the next tree. There's going to be a little bit of downtime here and there, and he's giving you 12 energy per second. So it's about three seconds wait time to get your next punch back. And of course, you can stash up 100 energy to punch about three or four times in a row. So he is just go, 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 go. And as you can see, I actually don't have clip in my support here. That was a mistake. I was just sort of setting these up for demonstration purposes. I do have a couple of phase shift things in here, which are nice to get around the map, and you can afford it with Fossil Southie in the lead. But I would say either put Pathfinder Jess in the support, just so that you can punch things if that comes to that with your pickaxe, or obviously you want clip and support, or you can just have phased out or phasing infused. These just make you, you know, dash faster. It, it's nice to get around the map if you're farming. I think that makes sense. And while you are getting less of the uh, resources that clip gives you, you are getting more of the build. So that's kind of one of the situations where I talked about how Clip might not actually be the best all the time. And this is sort of why I switched sides. She is really, really good for rough or planks, you know, nuts and bolts, literally anything extra that you get. She doesn't give you any extra wood, brick, or metal. And that's very important because I was farming rocks in a lot of my gameplay because I was low on brick from yesterday's farming session. I was down to under a thousand. So I was prioritizing rocks, which she's not giving me any more of. So it's actually kind of dumb for me to run her in the lead if I'm just trying to get a building material. And if I don't really need any more of the rough ore or oxidized powder or something, she's not that helpful. Not to mention, if you just run selfie in the, in the lead, you're still going to get plenty of that stuff anyway. I mean, how have we been farming for the past several years? We've never needed Clip. She's just kind of nice to have. And nice to have, she definitely is. In fact, while I'm recording, I'm kind of sick of her not being in my support. This is how this loadout should look. This is just probably my personal favorite way to go. As I said, if you're specifically grinding for nuts and bolts, you know, any of the extra additional ingredients that she gives you, she is probably more bang for your buck in the lead she's definitely more focused if you're just trying to get the most nuts and bolts kind of thing but i think if you just play the numbers game and punch 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 constantly the selfie you'll end up with more of all of that stuff anyway i knew i would forget i left a note even before i recorded but i got to the end without even mentioning a lot of people want me to run long arm of the law with clip and i want to talk about it like i've been recommended this so many times that i feel like it's worth bringing up in a video that you don't want anti-material charge to be extended here because it's helpful that is a nice thing to have but to run long arm of the law you're going to lose blast from the past and the whole reason as i mentioned that we use blast from the past is for fossil southie you need that energy regeneration clip is already slow enough in the lead and this will just slow her down even more uh, unless you're willing to like throw a drone or put traps over an encampment or something both of those are very sketchy and the drone is very limited i i don't see a way to make that not very wonky or not very impractical. I, I long arm of the law is nice. It gives you more more distance on your punch. That can be helpful, but it's going to slow you down so much that it's not really worth it. So that's kind of where I'm landing on this. Those are some of the uh, the best farming loadouts. I know, kind of snuck up on you how we're at the end already. But yeah, that's basically all there is to say. And that's kind of why I felt a little weird re-recording this video, because my video from forever ago is basically what I'm saying today. It's just the same loadouts I recommended a year ago, but hey, throw clip and support. But I understand that a lot of you guys wanted me to update this video with the new information and really flesh out what clip brings to the table. So to just summarize everything one more time for the end here, she is good in the lead if you need crafting ingredients and she is really good in support you if you're running a build based around anti-material charge around that punch you're using southie in the lead or archaeologist in the lead as i mentioned i think southie's better if you're running one of those loadouts you need her in support it's kind of stupid actually to not have her in support because she's really easy to get from the quest line obviously she's in the collection book so you can grab her with a voucher that's actually how i got her just to make the video i don't recommend doing that so long as you can get her from the quest line but she is just fantastic to run the support and uh, i can't recommend not using her but that's pretty much it you guys uh, i hope you guys enjoyed the video you know feel free to use code mista at your checkout normally i'd head over to the item shop to show that but we're doing things a little different today uh you can become a channel member here if you guys want to support me on youtube i am trying to get partner on twitch so if you're watching this in the future i might already be a partner but you know feel free to follow me down there hang out in the streams i we really have a good time over there i appreciate you guys stopping by and i guess that kind of segues nicely into the amount of uh, materials here uh i'm gonna try and go through the menus more properly but if you're trying to craft your weapons all of these different 
different resources are categorized and covered very clearly in my how to get every item video. It covers every single item in the entire game, how to use it, and where to get it. And that is an older video, for example, like uh, adhesive resin is now actually used to craft rocket ammo. That's a big deal. Uh, explosive ammo didn't exist when I recorded that, but other than like that tiny detail, it's essentially a good resource to get well, all of these things figured out, you know, like what bright core is, what sunbeam is, all of that is covered in that video. All right, you guys, today we're going to be making probably one of the bigger Fortnite save the world guide videos I've ever made. And it was inspired by a conversation that I had with, I think, a fan of my channel, Bubba, <laughs> in our Discord the other day. It was a rare opportunity where I was just kind of hanging out in a public channel, and it was a really, really nice kid. And he was in Lower Stonewood, and talking to him and Jaffe, a friend of mine a lot of you might know already from my streams, who is also very early in the game, it became pretty obvious that they were both very unfamiliar with some of the most simple aspects of the game. And one of the things that inspired me to think about was how to get certain items. And while I'm streaming almost every single time, somebody asks me something about how to get a certain item. Or more often, they're blatantly asking me to give them Sunbeam, which is a, an unfortunately common question. But what I end up doing is basically showing them how to get that certain item. And it occurs to me that I have not seen, and I did look, any place on the internet where you can find an entire video showcasing how to get every single item and save the world. And I do mean every single item, starting from the bottom, how to get rough ore and planks and nuts and bolts, and working our way all the way to the top, showing you how to get oxidized mineral powder and sunbeam and bright core, some of the most valuable stuff in the game. I'm going to say it now, just for because I know it's going to come up. I'm going to be skipping over six star materials. This is stuff that was introduced in the game long, long ago, and as I understand it, there were quite a few glitches in the early days where people's inventories were getting wiped, and one of the mistakes Epic employees made was refunding people's inventories with the wrong materials. So what they would do is, whenever your inventory got wiped, if they didn't have a recent backup, they would just give you like a couple of stacks of every item in the game, uh, which pretty much solved the problem for a lot of people. However, instead of capping out at Sunbeam and Brightcore, people were getting Rainbow Crystal, Moon Glow, Spectrum light you know I don't have it all I do have vendor tech parts to show you guys here but I don't have any of the um, the spectral whatever it's called the spectral twine I do also have honey that's another story and also unobtainable so we won't be talking about it and then there's I it's it's, it's escaping me but there is a six star powder as well that was passed around you guys can tell me in the comments below I will be skipping over six star materials simply because it's only obtainable through player to player communication ie trading or gifted to me because people really wanted me to have Rainbow Crystal that day. Um, but you, you can't obtain this in the game through normal gameplay, so I will be skipping over it, and I'm just getting it out of the way right now just to cover it. Um, going forward with this video, it'll basically be sectioned. So in the description, I will have uh, timestamps to the best of my ability for every single item in the game, and I will be grouping them. So showing my storage here, I will be starting all the way at the bottom, like I mentioned, with the rough ore planks and nuts and bolts, and then I'll be working my way up. And we have sectioned this between the different areas. So you've got all the white stuff with the nuts and bolts, the batteries, bacon, and then the powders will all be in their own section. The crystals, quartz, uh, sunbeam, and, and uh, shadow shard will all be in their own section. And then all of the ores, copper, silver, malachite, obsidian, and brown, Bright core will all be in their section, and then the mechanical parts will all be in their section, including rotating gizmo, which is uh, it's more of a surrogate mechanical part. It's mainly used for epic schematics. We'll get all into all that later. The twines will also all be in their own section, and then uh, I believe that just about covers it. But uh, it'll all be listed in the description below, so you guys can check it out if you want to jump around. Another way to get a lot of the items in the game, like mechanical parts and the quartz crystals and just all the different crystals and crafting materials and power cells, etc., rotating gizmos, are mist monsters. Mist monsters and lobbers and like fatties, certain like higher level husks in the game do have a chance to drop all of these items, including building materials and ammo and planks. But I'm not really going to mention that throughout the entirety of this video because they're just sort of, it's uncommon and it's a really passive, normal way 
to get them, and you should be targeting mist monsters and zombies generally anyway. So it's not a good way to get any one item, but, you know, usually when I kill a smasher, I'm kind of expecting, like, a mechanical part or maybe, you know, shadow shard or something. But that's just one of the many ways to get it, and I figured it would be irresponsible for me to, to, to not mention that, because I feel like somebody could be thinking that and think, Beast, you forgot about this other way to get items. No, I didn't. It's just sort of a, a normal gameplay mechanic, just like looting normal chests and boxes and whatnot. So, yeah, without further ado, let's get started. We're going to be kicking off the list with one of the most simple items in the game, and that is Rough Ore. Rough Ore is basically just obtainable through punching rocks and different ores that you find around the map. Uh, this is going to start a long-running trend of one of the things I'll probably be saying a million times throughout this video. It is also obtainable through searching containers within, you know, around the map and different chests, level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I don't think you can, well, you can find a 6, but you can't find a 7-star chest in the map. And then storm chests and encampments will also give this. Rough ore is mainly obtained, like, from encampments and anomalies through the ones that have the little brick on them. You can get rough ore from those as well. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways to get rough ore. You kind of just get it from everything. Uh, this is probably not one of the most uh, highly requested items in this video. I'm sure plenty of you guys have more rough ore than you know what to do with. Second on the list, we have planks, which is about as boring as rough ore. You basically get it from punching trees. That's... That's basically it. Trees, bunches of logs. If you find those little log containers where you can search them, you get planks from those as well. And then, of course, from searching all different types of containers, you also get planks. If you want to beeline for them with encampments, you want to look for the encampments that have the wood symbol on top. Upon completion, you'll get various wood items and twine relation to the area that you're in. And you should also get a fair few planks. Same with anomalies. My personal suggestion for the fastest way to get planks is either taking Archaeologists or some whatever the best new Outlander setup is in the future, going into a forest and then just punching as many trees as possible. Or you could just go to Plankerton and barter yourself a few stacks of planks. Hey, does anybody have any spare planks? Uh... <laughs> what? Yeah, hold up. <laughs> uh, come here for one sec. Oh, yep. Thanks, man. Next up on the list, we have nuts and bolts, which are by far one of the most commonly used and needed materials that you will have throughout the entirety of your playthrough of Save the World. Straight up from Stonewood all the way to Twine Peaks, you're going to be using this to craft all the different ammo types and lots of different traps, and it'll basically be just an all-around necessity throughout your entire playthrough. And <clears throat> a lot of times, people can think that it's extremely hard to get because they haven't exactly discovered Outlanders. I always used to have a tons of trouble getting them because punching cars was really annoying. It was taking like five or six hits per car at my level, and it was just, you know, a really, really slow process. But later on, I learned that Outlanders were a thing and that you could just, you know, punch with your anti-material charge. Nowadays, you just right-click your pickaxe with your favorite Outlander setup. Link in the description below to my favorite loadout and personal, you know, farming guide. Uh, Archaeologist is probably one of the best Outlanders to use, and this is going to be a great thing to know for the rest of this video because it'll help in getting pretty much every single item in this game. Um, especially for nuts and bolts, if you just go around into an industrial zone or a city zone punching cars, or if you find those electrical areas where you just make one big punch, my friends and I have a running uh, a running little little competition to see how many nuts and bolts we can get from one punch. My personal record was in was from a, a striker AC where it doubled my loot and I got about 190 nuts and bolts from one punch. But that was a very that was a singular occurrence and most of the time we usually get about 140. However, with this new update, you can definitely still get a whole bunch of those in one punch and it's just a big influx of nuts and bolts just from one big punch. Of course, expeditions are a good way to good way to go about it if you just send out those ones with the little red box. Warcraft is like the highest one that you can send out. You'll get tons of nuts and bolts. And of course you'll get it from searching chests, searching containers, anything mechanical. This is going to go in line with mechanical parts. Pretty much anywhere where you can get mechanical parts you will always get nuts and bolts. So a lot of those sinks and different uh, anything mechanical. You kind of just have to explore around the map. I mean little stuff like a fire hydrant. It's two hits and it can give you parts but can also give you nuts and bolts. So Cars are the most direct way to go. Just throw on an Outlander and hit up a city or industrial zone. You'll get tons of nuts and bolts. You won't even know what to do with them. 
Okay, so this is going to be kind of a two for one because flower petals and fibrous herbs are effectively the same thing in terms of how you get them. Not only can you get them from, of course, as always, searchable containers and chests, you can get them basically from searching bushes and flowers on the ground, or you can find them all sorts of different bushes. I'll show a few different examples, and then you can get them uh, a lot of times of all places in desert tiles where you can get those little scraggly half bush things um you can get lots and lots and lots of fibrous herbs from forests and deserts uh just search all over the place these are integral so part of the reason i'm making this video is to teach about what all these different you know materials are used for and as a low level player fibrous herbs are just junk and so are flower petals flower petals i, I can ease your mind now and say that they're pretty much never going to be useful the only time i ever use them are cozy campfires which are one of my personal favorite traps you can use them to heal in very dire situations Two or three of these will cancel out a ricochet mini boss, by the way. Very good to use, especially when you can slap them down in encampments or whatnot. But that's pretty much the only use for flower petals, so I personally don't carry more than a stack. Anytime I roll over to that 200 mark, I just throw away the 200. Fibrous herbs, on the other hand, are used for one of the most important traps in the entire game, gas traps. It takes seven fiber herbs to craft one of these guys, along with the bacon and nuts and bolts, as we mentioned previously. But... Fibrous herbs are the key thing here because of how hard they are to get. And it's not that they're difficult, they're just very grindy. You're, you're just going to have to constantly be searching bushes and, and looting around the map. And while I wouldn't recommend doing that, I would honestly recommend, while you're playing the game normally, doing your missions as you do, just search bushes as you go. You'll find that you'll get maybe a couple of dozen or you know even 50 or more per mission just passively looting all these different bushes and if you are playing on pc if you just hold down f and walk up to these bushes it's pretty easy to just get them as you go so you know fiber serves are pretty easy to obtain in bulk if you make if you make a go of it and of course i mix them in with flower petals because you'll be getting them from the exact same source which is just random looting containers and bushes on the ground so now that you know what fiber serves are used for i would highly recommend saving up as many of these as you can because even if you're a low level player you will need these in bulk Gas traps are expensive. They are very expensive. Seven each might not sound like a lot, but in the higher level missions, if you're using your traps even fairly wisely, you can use upwards of like two dozen or more, and that is a lot of fiber serbs. Now, one of the things I actually forgot to mention is if you want to hunt fiber serbs as well, uh, if you're doing into those desert tiles like I mentioned or ghost towns, I don't know if this is going to stay forever because ghost towns were kind of added as a new zone recently-ish, like a few months ago but if you find those corn or those hay mazes you can find the hay king um which may or may not be a reference to the office that's that's a, that's a different point of in, of in and of itself but if you kill him you can get like 10 to 15 or 16 or 17 fiber serves i'm not sure the exact range but you can get a decent amount just by punching him by no means is this like the best way to get fiber serves because if you back out of the mission and just try to farm him over and over Odds are you will get way more fiber serves from just searching bushes than farming him, but if you ever find him in-game, he's definitely a good guy to hit up. Going naturally through the list, we have batteries, which are probably one of the most boring items in the game. They're pretty much obtainable in the exact same way as mechanical parts and nuts and bolts. You will get them from effectively the same thing, just anything mechanical, cars will give you batteries, looting containers, etc, etc. Batteries are the kind of thing that you can sort of just forget about because they come from so many different sources that you'll just sort of get them as you go. Um, but if you want to get these in bulk, and I, I believe I should have mentioned this for the other ones previously, but it's not that big of a deal. If you ever find those encampments with the with the hammer and the, uh, the anvil, those crafting material ones are pretty good. You can get these from uh, expeditions as well, and the anomalies that have that little hammer thing. And also radar grids. I suppose I forgot that for the ones earlier, but it's really not that big of a deal. I don't expect too many people to be going to the effort of a radar grid to get these items. It's definitely not the most efficient way, but it will work. But yeah, batteries are, are pretty pretty basic. They're pretty much only used for, well, energy ammo uh, does take batteries. Energy weapons do take batteries to craft. If I can find one right here, I just scroll past it. You can see it takes 15 batteries just for my energy weapons. And then they are used for a number of traps. Uh, you know, seeing electric fields take a couple of them. Uh, you know, just, you know, one or two batteries is, is kind of a common trend. I do believe uh, wall lights might take up, really? You know, I always get this one wrong. Don't worry about me. But batteries, they're used for a couple of traps, but they're not really the most integral ingredient. I would never recommend carrying more than a thousand and some change of these. Uh, you kind of get them from everywhere. 
Bacon, bacon, bacon. Bacon is that item that you kind of thought was silly in the beginning, you know? You got it in Save the World and you thought, wow, there's food in this game. But then you realize that you can't eat it, and for some reason it's really, really rare. And you kind of forgot about it because it wasn't taking up too much storage, but you never quite knew what it was for. Well, I can tell you as a high-level player, bacon is probably one of the most important crafting materials in the entire game, simply because of what it's used for. And that is two key things that I'm going to address right now, not everything. First and foremost, energy cells. Very recently, I'll link my video in the description below, they released the neon weapons back into the game as a full addition to the game. No more neon llamas, no more event, they are officially in the game. And as I mentioned earlier with my batteries, the Mercury LMG is one of the weapons that uses bacon uh, for the ammo, because it uses the energy ammo. The Mercury LMG is one of the most powerful assault weapons in the entire game. It is just hands down a very, very devastating weapon, and I would highly recommend everybody get one. And the Neon Sniper is kind of its counterpart, the Sniper version. It is It shoots through walls. It's very, very nice. So again, you can check that out in the video description below. I'll tease some footage on the screen so you can see how it looks. But uh, both of these have something in common. That's that energy cells take bacon. And honestly, it's not that much. If you make an effort to loot around the map and you hit up kind of the areas that I'll talk about in a second... You shouldn't ever have any trouble getting bacon uh, bacon from different sources. Uh, and you should always have enough bacon to craft all the energy cells that you need. I've been mentioning a lot that expeditions are a good way to go, and they are. But if you just send out expeditions two or three a day, you'll have more bacon than you know what to do with. And it, it's just going to stack up your inventory. I would never, ever recommend throwing bacon away. I don't care if you have 3,000 of it. Okay, if somehow you've amassed 3,000 of them, then you can add me. My my name is X, Mr. Sax. Just, just send me a friend request and I'll take it. Don't worry. <laughs> Bacon is, is so important because once you run low on it, it's kind of hard to come back. But with these couple of tricks, I'll show you exactly how to get it. First and foremost, in no particular order, <laughs> actually there's there's no reason I'm ordering it this way, but first and foremost, uh, porta potties, of all things, they'll give you bacon. Toilets, I believe, also give you bacon. Uh, beds, I've heard, give you bacon. I mean, any searchable container will give you bacon, but certain containers will give you more. Anytime you find those little spam containers on the ground, pick them up. They always, always drop bacon, and they're a great source of it. However, none of these are even close to corn stalks. Yeah, I just said corn stalks. For some reason, corn stalks 100% of the time give you only bacon. And you can find them in mass in, I believe, Ghost Town tiles have these corn stalk patches around the map. I'll show some footage now where if you're not trying to complete the mission and you just queue in, look for these tiles, use like an Outlander or Fleetfoot Ken for the 37.5% you know, speed bonus as your commander. Or the Pathfinder Jess, I believe she's broken in the past update, but if she dashes, you can move for 140% speed. Point being, if you use a fast-moving you know, hero and just get around the map searching for these different corn stalk patches... They should give you about like 30 to 60 bacon at a, in a go. And it should only take you like 10 minutes tops to find all of them around the map. Then you just leave the game, queue back in, and then get more. Even if you're only getting like 100 bacon an hour, that is plenty. 100 bacon is 10,000 energy cells, which is kind of a lot. And, you know, the only reason that... The only thing that they're used for in gas traps is just it's, it's one, one bacon per gas trap. So even if you craft a stack of them, that's like 200... And so, like, that's a very good source of bacon. Like I mentioned, you shouldn't need to do this, but if you've only got a couple of hundred bacon, you might it might behoove you to do this and then get to, like, where I'm at, which is a very comfortable 1,000. At 1,000, I can craft a stack of gas traps and still have 800 more just for energy cells, and then, like, it's going to be a while before I'm running low, but if you if you want to get to that point, then, then the corn stalks are definitely a good way to go. Sort of as a epilogue, if you will, just sort of a follow-up point, that is not the only thing that bacon is used for in this game. Uh, healing pads are another huge use of bacon, fiber serves, and flower petals. I didn't mention them in the fiber serves and flower petals because I forgot, but the point is the healing pads are really not that amazing. I mean, you can level them up and they'll heal you for a ton in one go, but once you get to the level where you're like leveling these up to a decent schematic, like like decent perks and everything you you shouldn't really be needing it uh adrenaline rush is a thing like i mentioned campfires are quite powerful and significantly cheaper Th there's just a better way to spend five bacon and 15 fiber serves than exactly one healing pad not that these aren't unusable i just personally cannot recommend them 
An extra point to note for both duct tape and bacon is defender posts. Defender posts are quite powerful for obviously defenders. Uh, we use them quite a lot in Twine. I can show it right here. Some of my uh, some of my snipe sniper defenders. You lock these guys in a box with an obliterator, and they will do so much damage. It's it's crazy. You can basically AFK missions if you're a high enough level. And defender posts cost one bacon and one duct tape. So maybe not the biggest use case, but but definitely worth having. And I'm not sure how I'm going to share this information. I'll probably just mix it in between duct tape and bacon because it's kind of, you know, half and half. But something that's good to know. And if you didn't know, now you now you do. Next on our list to go alongside bacon is its other important counterpart, duct tape. Duct tape shares the bacon quality in that it is only usable in very certain schematics for very high cost or very single cost as a, as a key ingredient. Duct tape is also quite uncommon. Like I said, with bacon, you can get it from searchable containers. It's quite rare. Uh, you can get it that way, though. The best way that I have found to find duct tape consistently, and this is the only way that I've really found, are, are ducks. <laughs> if you ever find those rubber duckies just around the map, they can be hidden anywhere, but I'll be showing on screen right now that you can find them in like ponds or lakes and like the, the desert tiles, the ghost towns. Um, finding duct tapes there is great. If you go into the underground caverns, I don't think I'll be able to get footage of this. They're kind of rare and hard to find, but if you go into the underground caverns, you can find ducks just kind of sitting in there and there's like you know five or six or seven of them and the reason ducks are important is because each one that you break they drop a certain amount of duct tape and i have found is in as little as like five or six ducks you can get like 15 duct tape and that might not sound like a lot but because like i mentioned like for example floor spikes if you use the blue schematic it only takes you know one duct tape for each of them so that's 15 floor spikes and if you do this regularly and you kind of back out of the mission and farm it over and over you will get a lot of duct tape by just grabbing those ducks yeah. This might not be the best way to get it, but it's the only way that I've found that is, like, consistent. And I guess it's fast enough to get what you need. But duct tape is used in kind of just a lot of random weapons. Like, really low-level shotguns and low-level pistols might take duct tape. Definitely the, definitely the gray weapons can use duct tape. So you're probably never, ever going to be using duct tape on any of your weapons because if you are then that weapon is probably a low enough level trust me a green strong arm is not worth four duct tape but it's pretty much like i mentioned it's only used in the really low level stuff once you move on to the blue and epic schematics you can see that uh in this stinger the the duct tape gets replaced with uh rotating gizmos and rotating gizmos we'll talk more about later are namely used in rare and epic schematics and then get replaced by the mechanical parts later on so that's why they'll be in their own segment alongside mechanical parts but uh you know tldw duct tape is very very good for very specific traps it's used for two main traps and that's wooden floor spikes and the wooden wall spikes wall spikes lately have been getting a lot more recognition Used with certain constructor loadouts, they can be used to deal significant damage when zombies attack the wall, but this video isn't about wall spikes, it's about duct tape, so duct tape, you might want to save it for that, but, you know, it's it's maybe not, maybe not best used there. My pro tip is for wooden floor spikes to keep them blue. That way it costs one duct tape instead of two, so you'll be using half as much duct tape for the effectively the same use case, because late game, we don't use wooden floor spikes for damage, we use it to slow enemies within our tunnels, so... The less duct tape we use, the better, and the less overall material cost we use, the better. So that's kind of how to get duct tape. I'm sorry that I don't have a better method, but if you just farm ducks, or like I mentioned with fiber reserves, maybe not just specifically farm the ducks, but just sort of grab them whenever you see them around the map. Spas work great as well. I'm sad I didn't mention that right away. Um, you, you can just get them passively throughout your playthroughs, and so long as you're not using crap tons of wooden floor spikes in every mission, you should always be profiting on duct tape, or at least hovering around a certain amount. Now, it is also worth noting that duct tape can be crafted, and that's where I'm going to mix this segment in with adhesive resin, and that is just don't use it. Adhesive resin, it's just... If you really need duct tape, and you're really okay on fiber serbs, go ahead and craft it. I would never recommend this, because fiber serbs are so much more better... They're so much better used for gas traps than, like, I would rather have one or two more gas traps and no floor spikes than have those floor spikes. Like, the, it's just not, the, it's not comparable. Um, fiber serves are not, not to be used for duct tape. You can do it. I'm not going to stop you, but I, I can't recommend this. And that's where I'm going to say adhesive resin kind of goes along with this, because as far as I am aware, it is only, only used as a crafting ingredient for duct tape. I'm not sure I'm aware of any other use case where adhesive resin is a thing. So, 
yeah, definitely, definitely save it for, uh, well, the trash. I, I only keep, like, a stack and some change because I usually forget that it exists, and it's just sort of an extra item in the game. So, coal and black powder are a pretty easy segment because they are basically the same thing. Blast powder is an interesting item because it is, as far as I'm aware, the only item in the game that is purely obtainable through crafting. These guys take four rough ore and one coal apiece, and then you can craft five of them. So, you're pretty much never going to have too little blast powder. I do get the question a lot from low-level players, and that's, how do I get coal? And I'm like, seriously? How do you, how do you get coal? Um, the two main ways, well, obviously you can get them from containers and, you know, you know, materials and expeditions, blah, 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 the normal, the usual stuff, <laughs> but you can also get them from searching the fire pits inside of houses, believe it or not, I believe those still give you coal, they did when I was a low level, and I'm sure they do now, um, I haven't used this method in an extremely long time, as it, that's why I'm saying when I was a low level, because it's kind of, I don't know, it's just another way to get coal, and we pretty much always get coal just from everything. If you play the game, you'll get it from every container. You can find it in caves. They're quite common where you can just mine coal straight up as normal. Uh, caves are a great resource of all the different types of ores, you know. But coal is, is one of those things where if you are really low on it and you need lots of blast powder, then hit up a cave. Go into houses and find those fireplaces, search them, or search any uh, any searchable container. Or honestly, just ask your friends. If you've got any higher level friends, like me personally, I hover around two to four stacks of coal at any given time, and I don't need that much, so I, I usually give it away if somebody asks. And I personally use a lot of rocket launchers, so that should go to show just how little coal you need. Like, it's three per one of these, and I don't know. Coal is kind of like batteries in that y you just sort of get enough of it to always have as many as you need, so I don't really think about it that much. But yeah, I'll be merging coal and in, in, in the blast powder in the same segment because they're basically the same item, and blast powder can only come from crafting. Next up, we're going to talk about one of the more fun items in the game, uh, active power cells. Active power cells are just like any other, where I think one of the only ways to get them is from just looting random containers. They're pretty rare. You almost never get them from that. I mean, like, you can get them, but they're very, very uncommon. You might only get a dozen a day if you play a lot, but um, it's okay because active power cells are pretty much used by legendary, all legendary weapons. It's one per weapon. Uh, the key difference here is once you come up from epic, uh, active power cells basically basically replace rotating gizmos and that's kind of the, the key difference and I say that they're fun because the main way to actually get active power cells are garden gnomes <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm being serious if you find those flower shops or those gnome shops in cities or wherever you can find them uh, I believe they're in cities you can get just a crap ton of gnomes and they have a pretty decent chance of giving you active power cells uh, Alongside that, you can also get them from the duct tapes, as mentioned from the uh, the, the, the rubber ducky section right there. Um, I'm not sure if I'll show this because it's pretty rare. I feel like it's it's probably like a 1 in 20 or less, but you, you can get um, active power cells from rubber duckies as well. But the main way are garden gnomes, and you're not going to have to concern yourself with these too much because you can see my inventory here. I've only got 171. That is 171 weapons. That is... This much Sunbeam, or this much Malachite, is 11 for each of them, that is this many mechanical parts, it's, I will run out of those way before I run out of power cells, so, they're kind of one of those things that is tricky in the early game, but if you know to punch Garden Gnomes, you should never have a problem with these. So in my previous segment, I talked about power cells, and it would be pretty natural to lead into rotating gizmos, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention that alongside the other mechanical parts, and I want to do that towards the end along, alongside the other crafting materials. So we're going to back all the way up to here. <laughs> we're going to be going to the, the powders. So the powders are an interesting topic because this is one of our first big groups of items. Um, rough mineral powder is obtained in I exactly the same way as oxidized mineral powder. It just depends on the zone you're searching in. So if you're a stonewood player, you'll be finding rough, and then towards the end of stonewood, you might be finding a bit of simple. If you're in plankerton, you'll be finding a lot of simple mineral powder, and then towards the end of plankerton, you might find fine grain. Fine grain is what you're going to find all throughout canning until the very end, when you might be picking up bits of char black mineral powder. These are used for your 106s, 82s, 58s, and then the 34, I think. And then when you are in the 94 plus zones in twine, so... 94 zones, it's kind of rare, but you'll definitely get them a lot in the 100 zones, is oxidized mineral powder. 
and pretty much all of these are obtained through rocks are the most most direct way just punching rocks deserts are great for these uh searching random containers will always give you oxidized mineral powder alongside chests and storm chests etc um and um, again i am talking about all of these but oxidized might be the one that people are really looking to get more of and char black i mean you just get a lot of it from you know twine and then you can also get them from encampments. So if you find that brick encampment, like I mentioned earlier, brick encampments, anomalies, radar towers will all give you all these different powders alongside mimics. Um, mimics give you pretty much every item in the game, but you I mean they have a chance to give you all the different powders. So if you really want to farm up any kind of mineral powder, punching rocks is the most direct way to just go and do it. While you're on that map, look for encampments that have the brick. Do the anomalies. They're worth it. Like anomalies, yeah, you got to go around and grab all the different pieces that fly out, but you might get a decent amount of powder and stuff back. And this oxidized powder is used very, very late game for my gas traps or your gas traps or whatever build you're using. It doesn't matter. But wall launchers uh, also use them. Floor launchers are very powerful. I'm not going to go through all the different traps, but a good amount of them use these different powders. And so do uh, shotguns. So shotguns, I can show Hydra. That's technically an AR. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Epic. Um, I don't have a shotgun leveled up, do I? Don't I have a pop shot? Am I blind here, guys? Am I, am I blind? Oh, okay, here we go. Pop shot's like the only shotgun I've leveled up, but you, you can see that it uses 30 char black, and if I evolve this, I can actually demonstrate that. If I evolve it, it'll start using the oxidized mineral powder and sunbeam. So, shotguns use oxidized, and then I believe a lot of melee weapons do. So, I don't have too many of these leveled up. I went to sunbeam route on this one, so I can't show it, but... Uh, it depends on what you use, but some of them do actually end up using the different powders. You can see my Guardian's Will takes 36 char black, so kind of a lot. I don't personally use that many melees. They're not the best weapons in the game, but they do require all these different powders, and now you know how to get them. To follow up powders, we're going to talk about their counterpart, Twine. So in all the melee and shotguns that I just talked about, pistols tend to be the ones that use a lot of Twine. Whereas shotguns tend to use a lot of powder. And then melee, it's basically just the difference between Sunbeam and Brightcore and uh, just, you know, melees always use their own different assortment of weapons, including a lot of batteries, but a lot of them use twine. And the way to get that is basically the exact, like I mentioned, counterpart to powder. The most direct way is punching trees. So if you go into a forest and just go in with your archaeologist or your outlander loadout and you smack a bunch of trees, you should get plenty of twine, I guess. Personally speaking, I once cleared an entire forest in Twine. It took me about two and a half hours. I was watching you on Netflix. Fantastic show. But I only made out with like 200 Peaky Twine. So this stuff can be hard to get in one big go of it. But it's the kind of thing that you should get throughout an entire playthrough. You'll just get it all the time. As always, I'm a, I'm a very broken record today. You can get it from normal chests. You can get it from, you know, chests and searchable items in general. And I think storm chests give you them as well. Storm chests are great because you can actually just recycle the items that you get back. And that does give you almost more materials than a storm chest could otherwise give you. I feel like I haven't mentioned that yet, but it hasn't really become relevant until now. So another way to get these is the wooden encampments. The wooden encampments will basically depend on the zone that you're in. So like, you know, Canny will give you the sturdy and then Twine will give you the peaky. Uh, Plankerton is a simple and then, you know, the, the stringy is in, is in stonewood and all of this sort of correlates to each other. Carved, you're only going to be getting in 100 zones in Twine and 94 zones. And same with the powders, if you didn't watch that segment and you're cutting to this, peaky you'll find in light Canny but not for most of Canny. And Sturdy, you might find towards the end of Plankerton, and Simple, you might find towards the end of Stonewood. Uh, these are like the 19-level missions, if you will. And then all of this stuff you'll just get from, you know, not, like I mentioned, the encampments that have the wood on them. They'll give you wooden-related items, so twine and, you know, uh, planks. And then if you search the, the wooden anomalies, the wooden radar grids, uh, you should get all the different twines from those. And, you know, like I mentioned, you'll just get them through normal play. You should get plenty. I, I used to value carve twine, but I never really used it for anything, like, at all. So it just built up. So now I've got all of this carved and oxidized that I, I just I just don't use that much of. The only thing that I've personally found that's extremely useful for, for carved is these campfires. Going back to campfires, they I use them a good bit. I don't personally use a lot of melee, so I don't use them there. And then, like, the only thing that I craft that actually uses these are deagles, which only use peaky. So your mileage will vary. You know, this isn't, you know, 
my personal how to be me but if you use a lot of twine then i'm hoping you know how to get it but now you know how to kind of go for it if you really want carved twine or peaky or any of that high level stuff go to the zones that have them you know if you want peaky just go to a 100 zone forest and just punch a bunch of trees do any of the wooden encampments while you're there and uh maybe ask a friend maybe that maybe they have some extras all right we're definitely definitely getting into the fun stuff so up until this point, this entire video has been about pretty much all of the basic materials in this game. But now we're going to be talking about the stuff that I know a lot of you are probably been waiting for. <laughs> this is the stuff you really want to know about, and that is how to get the mechanical parts, rotating gizmos, which is basically the same thing, and then the uh, crafting materials for them up here, the ores and the crystals. So we're going to start with the mechanical parts here. Rotating gizmos are a bit tricky. Um, I don't have a ton of information on how to get these because honestly, they're one of those items like batteries. They just they just pop in your inventory. You get them from looting containers. You get them from encampments or anything mechanical. I think you can sometimes get rotating gizmos. We'll kill a smashers here and there and we'll drop them. But uh, rotating gizmos are pretty much only used for rare and epic schematics. So I'm imagining if you're worried about too many mechanical parts, you're probably out of the woods in terms of rotating gizmos. So we're not really going to worry ourselves too much with those the only thing the only one of the one of the best weapons in the game that actually uses rotating gizmos is the founder's revolt for whatever reason you can't actually evolve this weapon you can't upgrade its rarity like most other weapons it is hard locked at epic and it's honestly a fantastic weapon but it's it uses rotating gizmos because it's an epic schematic i can actually demonstrate that by going to any of my epic schematics that use rotating gizmos you can see this burst sniper will use rotating gizmos and then as soon as i increase rarity it'll start to take power cells instead so it's kind of a cool way to demonstrate that but that's pretty much one of the only weapons that use was rotating gizmos so we're just going to go right past that and then same with the twine and the powders the mechanical parts are all pretty boring to talk about if you think about it like Rusty mechanical parts you can get throughout the entire game because all of those different, uh, all of those washing machines give you rusty mechanical parts. Even in a 100 zone twine, if you search those and break those, you'll get rusty parts. I guess it's just kind of a funny gimmick in the game, but you will mostly get these from just anything mechanical. So sinks give you them. Fire hydrants, those electrical boxes. Uh, if you search around and find those encampments that have metal on them those will also give you most mechanical parts metal encampments um the the radar towers and the anomalies will all give you mechanical parts cars are the most direct way to go about it uh, electrical appliances inside of kitchens are also pretty good i'm not kidding go to a kitchen with an outlander loot it like just search all the containers and then just punch through it you might get a whole bunch of parts it's probably worth your time and that is not every mechanical item in the game server racks are also good but um so many things give you those it's it's kind of hard to list them all seesaws that comes to mind if you go into those parks you can just break all that stuff and they might just give you parts uh mechanical parts that is and then of course all of this um, information applies to all of these so if you break seesaws and in, in like for example stonewood you get rusty if you break them in 100 zones you might get efficient or sleek and this is the same thing as twine and powder rusty is for stonewood and then in late stonewood you'll get simple and in plankerton Late Plankerton, you might get sturdy, and then all throughout Canny Valley, you'll be getting sturdy parts. And then um, Late Canny, you'll get Sleek, and Sleek is the kind of thing that we get tons of in Twine Peaks. And then in 94 zones, they're pretty rare, but in 100 zones, you'll get uh, efficient parts. Now, the best way to farm these directly is to just throw on an Outlander, your favorite Outlander setup, go into an industrial or city zone, and just punch all of the cars, loot all the containers that you can find, um, do any of the anomalies or encampments that are metal, and they'll give you all the different parts related to them, along with nuts and bolts, and etc. And uh, you should get plenty of parts just for that. Um, never, never underestimate parts. A lot of people like to focus on Sunbeam for the 130s, but efficient parts? It's 30 per gun, and you'll run out of these before Sunbeam pretty much every time. All right, so we're finally coming up on the ores. So there are two different crafting materials for weapons late game. So you've got malachite, well, not malachite, but like just ores in general. So silver, copper, malachite, obsidian, and bright core ore. And then we've got one of our little tricks in this game, and that is crystal or quartz crystal. And then we've got shadow shard crystal and sunbeam crystal. You might notice a trend here with the six star materials. There's also rainbow crystal and spectrolite ore. It continues the naming scheme, and I found this to be kind of an oversight by the devs. There is no two or three star uh, crystal, 
but Quartz Crystal still has a one star, even though it's not exactly the same as the other crystals. You see, it's not like you're using copper and malachite to craft weapons. However, with the Sunbeam weapons, you are using Quartz Crystal and Sunbeam Crystal. So I think Sunbeam and Shadow Shard are meant to be like the main crafting ingredient, and then Quartz is basically in trade-off of uh, Blast Powder. However, only Shadow Shard and Sunbeam weapons actually use Quartz for their crafting recipes. Every other weapon in the game, you know, the Quartz, Silver, Malachite, all the, all the different ores and beyond, all use Blast Powder. So when you choose Shadow Shard or Sunbeam in your evolution line, it actually replaces Blast Powder with Quartz. So the Quartz Crystal goes along with the Crystal line. Um, this is going to be a common question uh, for a lot of people, and that's like Obsidian or Shadow Shard. I would say fundamentally, like as a big blanket rule, Shadow Shard is always better because it will always and forever have the higher damage per second, but they will have lower durability and a slightly slower fire rate. So if you want your weapons to last a long time and you don't want to craft them very often, go Obsidian and Bright Core. Just know that even though they got a, fire, a higher fire rate, their bullet damage will be quite significantly less. The only time that I've ever seen Obsidian to make sense is if, like I mentioned, you don't play the game a lot. Somebody in stream told me the other day. Shouts to you if this was if this was you in chat. Um, he said that he doesn't play the game very often and he doesn't like to, you know, he doesn't have time to farm as as much. But he really enjoys playing the game. So he always goes Obsidian just so his durability is higher, and that made total sense to me. Like, the damage hit is pretty not noticeable. Like, if you're a high power level, or if you're a power level that's high enough for the zone that you're in, and your weapons are powerful, it's not going to make a difference. Somebody told me that they accidentally made their hemlock, you know, obsidian, and they're like, oh no, what do I do with this schematic? I'm like, nothing, just use it. It's probably going to be completely fine. The hemlock chews through bullets. You're just going to have to craft a lot less of them than I do. The only difference is my durability is about 300, whereas an obsidian or bright core one would uh, have it at 375. So you kind of get a lot more durability there at a slightly lower damage. I'm not exactly sure how much less damage, but it's it's really not that big of a deal. And I know that like Epic has a whole support page on getting these weapons swapped. I, in fact, did that on my own. I had my Spyglass here. I Whenever I was first evolving a weapon, I made the grave mistake that a lot of people make. So it's like, oh, wow, I really like this Bald Eagle. Let me just go to evolve it and then... Like you get one path and once again i made a mistake it's a 106 so if i if i take this uh a drum roll again let's just use that for for consistency's sake you, your pathways are up here so you can see the difference in fire rate and durability and the dps is like pretty low 78k to 72 and a half k that will spread out a lot later on when it's a 130 but like i said i think the difference is only about 30 percent so it's it's pretty significant but it's not life changing, but my 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 spyglass was a was obsidian, and this is a high power single shot sniper. You don't want this to be obsidian. You want every bullet to count. So I actually contacted Epic and got mine swapped over to to Sunbeam, because I, you know, I wanted this weapon to to, to account for as much. And they understand that their their upgrade paths are kind of confusing, so you can get a one time reset for your account, which is pretty cool. One one time reset for that weapon. Now, I am recording this all in one big segment, and this is to relate back to the different ore choices. Uh, Malachite ore, it's the exact, I mean, all the different ores, but they are the exact same as the parts and the twine and the powders before them. Copper is for stone, wood, plankerton, canny. And I mean, this is all throughout Twine Peaks, and you can take it from me as the highest power level in the game. You don't need 130s. In 94s, 94-4 players, and 100-plus zones, I personally prefer 130s because I can afford them and they do more damage. But if they are at all breaking your bank and you don't have Sunbeam, 106s should do just fine for all of Twine. As with as we've talked about all throughout, you can get the the silver in late in late Stonewood. You can get the malachite in late, you know, and and you know, I should show this just for once. So for example, like in Stonewood, you should get copper throughout all of these different zones. But once you start queuing these 15 and 19 zones, you might be able to find silver. And then the same thing in, I'm not gonna do this for every mission, you guys don't worry. But like in the 46 and 40 zones, you should be able to find just a little bit of malachite, even though throughout all of Plankerton, you should be finding silver. Um, and that's to say that like silver weapons, 58 weapons should be perfectly fine in all of Plankerton. And Twine Peaks is no different. Um, 106s will do just fine 
all over here. It's not going to be that big of a deal. So long as your power level stays consistent. If you're like a 100 power level and you're playing these 94 zones, a 106 should be just fine. If you're like an 80 or something and these are still tough for you, then maybe you might want to try out a 130. Just know that you're not going to be finding 130 materials until you're playing in the 100 zone. And you might actually find a few of them in 94 zones. It's just less common as usual. So kind of just a misnomer there. 130s are like everybody's crown jewel, but they're really not what you need. And then to go back to the crystal, they're kind of the counterpart. So uh, all throughout the game, you'll find uh, encampments that have copper as their symbol. I think that's a little outdated, but that's basically an ore symbol. That will give you either, you know, based on the zone that you're in, it should give you, you know, copper, silver, malachite, or obsidian. And then if you're in like a 100 zone, it might give you bright core. And then the counterpart to that is the crystal encampments. The crystal ones will give you quartz normally, but they might also give you shadow shard if you're in twine, and then like in the 100 zones you might get sunbeam. Or if you're in candy valley, I think you might also be able to get shadow shard from those. Uh, and that's basically the main way to get those. The other ways are you can find them in caves. So the ores that we're talking about here are finally where the caves are going to stand out. You can find quartz and coal and just normal rocks, but you might be able to find the Sunbeam and Bright Core Ore. I don't know if I'll have stock footage for all of the different ores, but I'll try my best, you guys. Um, I did find Malachite while I was streaming the other day, so there you go. Um, that is, the, the caves are where you find those. Storm chests are great. I mentioned in a previous segment that recycling the weapons you get from storm chests might be the best way to get these items, because the actual weapons storm chests give you, you know, can be broken down, and they, they give you kind of a lot of loot. And then, uh, obviously, the encampments I mentioned, anomalies are... I don't think anomalies can give you the ores, but you might be able to find them from mimics as well. General looting, you know, just searching random containers. That can give you all the different ores that you need. Uh, and as always, asking other players. I'm not saying that you should leech off your friends and beg streamers, because as a streamer, I know how annoying that is. But if you were really having a hard time finding these items and you just can't get them... Talk to somebody, you know, and don't beg. Just ask, hey, do you have any extra? And if they say no, then it's no. But like me, for example, please don't beg me on stream, you guys. I'm just using it as an example. I save this mostly for friends and when I play with like other random people. I do not need 2,000 Malachite. I'll admit it right here in my video. But if I've got a friend who's just starting the game and they want a really nice head start and they're okay with it, then I might drop them a stack. I don't know. It's very rare that I do this on stream. Please, please do not come from this video and beg me. But uh, if I am playing with people, sometimes I do feel generous, but that's kind of just a on-the-fly on decision that I make. So that being said, uh, you, you should be able to get all of these yourself. And I mentioned earlier that, like, if you're in the correct zone, Sunbeam, for example, if you're not queuing 94 and 100 zones all the time, then you shouldn't... Uh, you shouldn't be using 130 weapons if you're not able to afford 130 weapons normally then you shouldn't be using them and the same goes for shadow shard and obsidian if you can't afford these weapons then you shouldn't be using them but hopefully that gives you enough information by no means have i listed every single way to get these items because like i said pretty much every container in the game can give you any item in the game there are certain best methods to get these items and i might not have mentioned all of them for example takers and mist monsters and lobbers and all that they can actually drop sunbeam or miss mini bosses can drop them as well and that's not like a good way to farm it you can't really consistently rely on that but you can get it so it's something to think about but yeah that should cover all of the uh, ores and crystals and then and then we can get into the wood, brick, and stone. Uh, the wood, stone, and metal, because that's that's definitely the hardest part. No, honestly, that's just <laughs> if you don't know how to get wood, brick, and metal in this game, it's it's um, I don't I don't know what to tell you. Um, although there is something interesting to note about this. So wood can be got obviously from trees, and then brick you want to get from rocks. But metal is not actually supposed to be obtained through cars in 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 that respect. The main base game way to get it is technically from metal ore. That's what that thing is on the side of the... the I forever thought that it was rough ore, ore that was just giving me metal. Because if you mine obsidian and bright core, it also gives you metal. So I kind of just thought that that's what that was. But no, that is well and truly a metal ore sticking out the side of the wall. Obviously, obviously cars and metal materials are just the best way to get it all over. Um, that's definitely where you want to get your metal, but I don't know. I, I would highly recommend, at least if there's any tip to be given here, build up a lot of it. I personally like to have the three rows of 25,000 each. 
Um, this does not take that long to get if you just throw on an Outlander, a good TV show like I mentioned, and just farm up all these items. Uh, I use this a lot because I don't always have time to farm in the middle of missions, and if we're doing a really hard mission, I might be doing like 2,000 metal or more per run of a mission. So we had one day where we were doing a Category 4 Atlas and High Twine, it was like a 94-4 player, and we ran it for like 9 hours straight. And I went through about 20,000 metal. And I can, uh, 23,000 metal, and I can assure you that I did not have time to farm throughout that. So to have all this on hand was really, really great. And I know, it makes my storage look nice and clean, and if ever I need to give it to a friend, I could just hook them up. As long as at the end of the day, or I, or whatever, I find time to throw on an Outlander and uh, get those materials back. So, that should just about cover it. That is how to obtain every single item and save the world. Uh, this was kind of a long video. Uh, it's probably going to take me a lot of work to make. Um, thank you so much to Chaser Exortion and I think Cthulhu. I don't know if he actually recorded anything, but he did help me with some of the some of the, a lot of the logistics of this video. Um, these guys recorded a lot of the stock footage you guys have been seeing, and uh, that probably saved me a lot of time as I'm recording this. I haven't actually done a lot of that but um mostly mostly i just wanted to get this guide out there because a lot of people ask me a lot about this game and i feel like one big video showing you how to get every item and save the world is probably going to be a very good blanket answer to everybody who asks a lot of these questions and hopefully this helped you out maybe i shared some early game tricks that i didn't think were that good or maybe maybe you got some some information that you couldn't get anywhere else leave let me know in the comments below if this helped you at all and share it with your friends if they're if they're curious about the same thing uh yeah hope you guys enjoyed thank you for watching uh subscribe to the channel for more fortnite videos use my creator code in the description below i don't plug that enough but if you guys are checking out the item shop i do have a code uh, I do stream this game pretty regularly. I do consider myself a streamer before a video maker, even though I really enjoy making videos, and I have been for a long time. There's like a thousand or more on my channel. So, yeah, stay tuned for more of these. Uh, if you guys want any videos, any topics that you want me to cover, any hero loadouts, let me know. I'll be sure to get to it. Thank you guys for watching, and have a nice day. This is actually floating away. What? What oh, is? There's like a. What? There's like a. There's like a gnome. What? There's like a gnome on a bench. With. What? Okay, so there's a gnome on a bench, and there were balloons, and he had a little, a little chest, and then I, I shot him down, and he... What? Well, I guess that's another way to get, uh, you know, materials. And then, we can also explain, uh, I guess the menus now. We can go back to the quests and talk about things that are going to go on. So, when you first start playing the game, you're going to have a Stonewood quest line, and a Plankton quest line, and a Canny quest line. Nowadays, we have something called Ventures. Now, I do recommend doing your Stonewood, Plankton, and all that, but it could be worth it to do these Venture seasons, because these are usually limited time. As I'm recording this, with the Scurvy Shoals going on, it is going to end June 19th, and, uh, of course, those dates will change in the future. I try to keep you guys updated every single single day on my channel and uh, that's kind of a good resource you know uh, my channel is something uh, worth subscribing to in my opinion because I do make daily videos covering everything that's going on trying to keep everybody up to date and uh, it's definitely a good thing to do if you're trying to uh, progress in the game and, uh, and and with that kind of thing you might want to prioritize the events that are going on and this is going to tie into like how to get all the different weapons so right now we have dungeons and that's just part of, uh, of this quest line let's go to the collection book and talk about I guess, uh, what, what's being laid out here. So the collection book is a good way to illustrate that every single weapon has a set that it's a part of, and these rotate uh, annually. So every different season, you know, has all these different things going on. For example, uh, right now in our current season, pirate weapons are available. In the future, you might have boombox weapons with the hit, hit the road event. Uh, Art Deco weapons are the kind of things that you can just research whenever, and this is how you get the different weapons. If you're looking for the best weapons in the entire game, that's one of the focuses I have on my channel, and uh, I'm going to link my best weapons video down below. Oh, shoot, is it time to talk about the top 10 weapons in Fortnite? Uh, sorry, I was just uh, entering my creator code. My bad. So, yes, I 
I already did this video and it is a good video. You know, it's one of my most popular videos. I'm glad so many people enjoyed it and the information was good for its time. But a few major updates have occurred. One, they changed a lot of the perks of some of the weapons to where in the mag size reload perk, you can now have a damage slot. That didn't change much, but they also rebalanced every single weapon in the game. That's the big change of the three changes that occurred. And that is a huge one. And the main reason that I had to remake this video, I want to say it right off the bat that my old top 10 video is still good. If you just followed it recently, if you even want to watch it today, it's of course still up. And it will be recommending good weapons. Nothing on that list is a bad weapon. It's just fine in that regard. However, the actual top 10 best weapons in the game are a little bit different, and I think I changed almost every single slot on this list. So of all 10 spots on my list, there are new additions to it and or a different weapon altogether. So yeah, all of the old weapons are still good, but the list has changed quite a bit. And the third major change was the new sixth perks. Now, I am still not an expert on that subject. I do consider myself quite informed. I have looked at a ton of weapons and user feedback. Anybody who's commented on my videos or my streams in the past month or so since this change has occurred has let me know about all of the best six perks in the game. So I do feel like I'm educated enough on the subject to rank some of my new weapons accordingly. There are weapons like the vacuum tube launcher, for example, which is not on today's list, but it is a phenomenal weapon. I made a video on it here. All of the weapons will have their own videos, by the way, linked below. I'll link my best perks playlist as well for all uh, old and future uploads on these weapons. But for the vacuum tube launcher, it's a fantastic weapon that got even better because now it has area of effect damage with that chain lightning. And that's just a singular example showing how a lot of the new six perks have changed how I look at things and might impact this list. Now, before we get into the list, I also want to get into some very serious disclaimers just so that people don't get too heated at me in the comments. First and foremost, I have a calming disclaimer. That means every single weapon on today's list is good, okay? If it's in the 10th slot, this is better than like all of the other weapons in the game, seriously. And it's not that demanding. Meaning like any weapon that's ranked higher than another weapon isn't strictly better. There are situational use cases. For example, the obliterator is on this list and it's not maybe better than the weapons that are below it on my list. It's just that the obliterator has very specific uses that make it more relevant to the meta. And that sort of ties into another way that I rank my weapons. Damage is not the only metric. Attack speed can't be the only metric. There is no one way to measure every single weapon in the game, meaning there is no real data for how many weapons are being used by the players on a day to day. But what I'm going by is quote unquote meta relevance. You know, these are the weapons that people are using or should be using in a day to day basis. I feel like that's the only true way to rank these weapons. They're not all measured the same, but for example, it's the way that I can put an obliterator, the bundle bus, and the thrasher on the same list. Those are three extremely different weapons for extremely different use cases. However, their individual use cases may impact their spot on this list. So that's how I'm going to be ranking the weapons today. I also want to mention that I, myself, and everybody else in the world is limited by their own experiences and their opinions. And people who have watched my videos before will know that I heavily rely on math. I usually like to come correct and explain my reasoning, but I have only used the weapons that I've used. No, I have not touched every single weapon in the game, but for the weapons I haven't touched, I've looked at their numbers and I kind of know where they lie. And I've also talked to tens of thousands of people through my streams and videos, and I've got a very, very large general idea of what weapons are being used in this game. But of course, there could be a change in the future updates, and that is where I will pin a comment below. I like to have this addition in this video because my old video went outdated. If there are any changes Changes to the game or anything major worth ringing up, it will be pinned in the comments down below so you guys can stay up to date and make sure that this video is still relevant. So that means if you're watching in a year from now or whatever, you might want to scroll down and see if there's something to know. Now my final point is going to draw into my first point, and that is that every single weapon on this list is good, and there are probably dozens of other weapons in this game that are also extremely strong. If you'd like to see the video where I rank all of the ranged weapons in the game, you can check that out in the description below. It's not as focused as this video, so I won't spend as much time on every individual weapon because that video would be over an hour long. Oops. And I included some weapons that were missed in that video in the description of that video. So you can check that out if you're interested. Just because they're not on my top 10 list today does not mean that they're not useful. And I will be making a best weapons video for all the ARs, SMGs, pistols, shotguns, all of the categories, traps, melees. I've already done all of those videos. They will be linked below, but they are outdated in the exact same way that my old top 10 list is outdated. Those videos still recommend good weapons, but there are so many new weapons and so 
many changes to the game worth mentioning that I will be redoing those videos as well. That is of course except for the best bows video as this was recorded after all of the changes that affected my previous videos. Now one last thing before we start the list, I want to discuss some exclusions. Now I will not be putting any of the mythic weapons on this list. With the rebalance some of them are beat out by some of the normal weapons in the game like the Ravager and the Scourge are topped by some other weapons but because they're mythic and because of the way they behave and because of their unique six perks they might be beat in the strictly damage output department but they also have ways that you know inch them back up onto the top so if I included mythic weapons they would sort of dominate much of this list and I think everybody should know that these weapons are all already very very powerful and don't really need any more praise and the other thing that I will be mentioning are founders weapons I will not be bringing up a lot of them just because they're locked behind an old paywall that you can't even do anymore and as of recording you cannot get any more of these founders weapons if any more are announced or anything updates obviously you can check the pinned comment below like I mentioned but as of now seeing as these weapons are unobtainable they will not be on the list and the nocturno won't be included for both reasons not only is it completely unobtainable but this thing hits about as hard as a mythic weapon I'm not even kidding they might as well make it a mythic weapon because it is going to be one of the strongest weapons in the game it has the same DPS as the siege breaker but with that six perk oh my goodness does it climb its way to the absolute top of the food chain so the nocturno and many of the other founders weapons won't be on the list specifically but I will be mentioning a couple throughout without further ado let's get into our number 10 slot and this is a tie yes every single spot on my list today will have a tie and that stems from the 12.0 rebalance that epic did where I call it a rebalance where lots of lots of weapons got buffed and all of the best weapons more or less got left alone of course there are outliers but ultimately epic balanced out almost every weapon in the game no not all weapons are the same but they are very 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 close in performance across the board rather than some serious outliers like the silent specter and some really really bad weapons like the thrasher used to be so because of that rebalance every single spot on the list is going to have a partner or even more and the wrath is down here in the number 10 slot because it's good enough to be mentioned a lot by the community a lot of people like it it's a really popular weapon but due to its lower damage than the other ars and its slow fire rate it doesn't quite hold up in the end game it's still perfectly good you're going to have to stand still to get a consistent spray but it's not really going to be making much headway in the end game so it's down here in a number 10 slot i paired the pepper sprayer down here for the exact same reasons as the wrath it's a great smg it has great range i think it has great accuracy this is a phenomenal weapon but frankly due to just damage alone it falls short of all of the other smgs so almost any other pick is going to be a higher damage output as with the wraith it's a very popular weapon and i do recommend using it but it's going to be down here in the number 10 slot for now our number nine slot is going to be absolutely dedicated to the storm king and this ties into the disclaimer that i mentioned earlier where the bundle bus and the surround pound on their own are frankly unexceptional weapons they both do great damage don't let me talk them down too much but honestly they wouldn't be on this list if it weren't for events and that's the same way the bundle bus made my list last time it has extremely high damage in an extremely short burst it can pack a punch really quickly and you can even switch between two of these to make it a very effective tool but in normal missions that's really just not needed you, you don't need it for anything other than mist monsters maybe it's not going to be great for crowd clearing etc but for the specific use case of events you know with difficult enemies and the storm king for example it is extremely useful and i personally got through about 100 wins of the storm king using the bundle bus before i got the wrath and the surround pound is there for the exact same reason it is only on this list because of the storm king but the storm king has become such an important fight and so integral to getting some of the mythic weapons that the surround pound is basically your gateway to some of the best weapons in the game and for that reason alone i felt like it deserved a spot on our list for the number eight slot we're going to go with some of our utility picks obliterators are incredibly strong for a couple of reasons one they are basically an unlimited range pickaxe as they can instantly destroy any material in the game they are very very great for clearing out houses making death pits whatever you want to do and the neon sniper can shoot through all structures making it very very useful and that's basically the reason why it's on this list they are very very good for utility they're very effective for shooting through walls and all of that and of course sniper defenders if you don't already utilize sniper defenders then i don't know what you're doing but i set up three of these guys with obliterators almost every single game and while it is an expensive way to play you can do it on some of the harder missions and it will absolutely save you in a lot of situations three defenders with obliterators are basically like super strong anti-air traps they can shoot flinger zombies out of the air and of course help you with the mini bosses and the stronger enemies that might break through and it really just makes it an awesome utility and it's for that reason that i put the obliterator tied with the neon sniper because they essentially function the same the neon sniper while it doesn't break walls also does shoot through them and gives you a thermal scope to see enemies so they're close enough to be tied in the number eight slot 
in our number seven slot, we have a three-way tie between the Siege Breaker, the Typewriter, and the Pain Train. And I put them here because all of these weapons behave very similarly. All of them are popular in similar regard. And if you look at the damage outputs, they're almost all identical. And I think the Pain Train is a little bit stronger than the both of these, but it sort of relies on its six perk to get up there, and its accuracy is a little eh. So if your accuracy is low, then it kind of falls off because you won't be hitting all of your shots anyway. And I consider all three of these weapons to be equal. And I'm really happy to put the Siege Breaker on here because I feel like it's a fan favorite. It's the weapon that we all look to if you came over from Battle Royale and it holds up. It was a really strong weapon even before the 12.0 update and it's even better afterwards. So these are some of the better weapons in the game and I don't really have much else to say. The Typewriter, Pain Train, and Siege Breaker all perked correctly will absolutely dominate pretty much any zone they're in up to a degree because as you might have noticed, we're down here in the number six slot. If you're in a 144 player, you might want to look elsewhere, but in the 124 zones and below, yes, I'm talking to you early game players, any of these three weapons will do just fine. The number six slot is Paleo Luna. Yeah, we're talking about some of the melees in this game, and I'm only half kidding. These swords are good on their own, but I have mine triple and double attack speed because Paleo Luna's buff alone makes them so strong that they are the top melees in the entire game. And I did mention that I'd be covering a couple of Founders weapons, one of them being the Masamune, because it is very similar to these weapons in the way that it behaves and the way that you can perk it, so triple attack speed with Paleo Luna makes it very good. Obviously, the video for all three of these will be linked below where I explain different perks, and you'll note that I won't be recommending triple attack speed other than the Masamune because that was discovered later on. But I'd like to mention that you don't need Paleo Luna for these weapons to be good. They're still going to be in the top slot. It's also important to draw attention to something I mentioned earlier and that the Spectral Blade can actually be better than the Ravager. If you perk both weapons just the same with Whiteout Fiona in support and Paleo Luna in your lead, this will be the optimal damage output. And if you have the stacking damage perk that I'm highlighting here on the Spectral Blade, it will actually overtake the Ravager against normal enemies. But as I mentioned with the special six perks, if you use the right click ability to send a surge of extra damage with the ravager it will sort of win in most situations but it's good to know that a normal weapon like the spectral blade can be better than a mythic weapon if you perk it properly i do want to give huge thanks to cthulhu a good friend of mine he did a lot of the math for this so because of all of that i have placed these weapons in the number six slot now we're only in the number five spot, but you know things are getting serious when the Xenon Bow is highlighted. Yes, I supercharged my Xenon Bow because it is one of the best weapons in the game, but as you'll see later, our top four slots are incredibly competitive. I will go out and say the Xenon Bow, the Powder Keg, and the Vacuum Tube Bow all do perform very similarly and are equally worthy of their location, except that the Xenon Bow shooting through targets makes it just an absolute monster. If you guys have used this thing with Stoneheart Farah and you've been using the Xenon Bow, then you don't need me to explain to you that this thing is just an absolute powerhouse. I have cleared super encampments with this thing with a breeze. I was actually shocked when I got this footage recording for the Best Bows video that this thing absolutely annihilated everything. It just, it just did everything. This was a 140 zone for goodness sakes, and this weapon never lets me down. Now the Powder Keg and the Vacuum Tube Bow sort of live in its shadow, but these are equally good weapons that all have great area of effect damage, even as a bow, and are some of the best weapons in the entire game. And if used correctly, hint hint, link below, you can use these weapons to the best of their abilities and have a great time. Now, our number four slot is a little busy, and that's because the 12.0 update rebalanced the shotguns to basically make them all complete powerhouses. I will mention the Ground Pounder, Huskbuster, and the Stampede, because the Huskbuster is just the scavenger version of the Stampede, so the stats in the damage department are completely identical. And the Pop Shot are all completely identical damage output in the base damage, meaning once you apply perks and get into the end game, they start to stray away a little bit, but on the basic level, if you take the damage divided by the time span, reloading these weapons all four of them are completely identical and the maverick and the pulsar 9000 and the big shot and the vacuum tube shotgun are all incredibly good as well the ground pounder is fast firing and very powerful and if you add damage to each of its shots and give it a little bit of area of effect damage you basically have the big shot which fires twice and reloads after every shot if you're not looking for single target damage then the pulsar will absolutely annihilate everything always the pop shot performs very similarly to the ground pounder and the maverick performs very similar to the big shot and the fact that it can shoot in a cone and affect many enemies at once. Not to mention the vacuum tube shotgun is sort of on its own, shooting the three round burst, eliminating everything in sight. Pair this thing with a chain lightning perk and you will be eliminating everything. All of these weapons are very good. There are other amazing shotguns in the game that you should definitely check out, but I'll be making a video on that later down the line. I have never used a weapon set that felt more fun to use. Yes, we're only in the number four slot and I'm already saying that. And that's because, you know, other weapons get more expensive and a little bit different, but shotguns are incredibly strong 
and potentially could even deserve a higher spot on this list. I just feel like their limited range makes them a little bit tougher to use and they're not quite as popular with the community sort of for that reason. So I think the number four spot is acceptable, but there is no understating just how incredible these weapons are. Now the number three spot is one of the reasons that I actually wanted to remake this list and it is dedicated to the SMGs and you'll notice there's a bit of a shakeup. The 12.0 update did a lot for the Thrasher, making it better than the Silent Spectre in almost every way. I explained more about it on its best perks video that is linked below, but it is essentially just the best SMG in the game right now, except that the Founder's Quickshot exists. However, as I mentioned, this is a Founder's weapon and I explained why those won't really be counted on this list and it's essentially the same weapon. This is perked a little differently for the video that I made on it, but yeah, they perform very, very similarly. The Founders Quick Shot is essentially just an upgraded version of that, but because it's Founders, we won't be counting it here today. And the Riptide is also essentially a clone of the Thrasher, except that the Riptide is the Scavenger variant, and for whatever reason, breaking the mold of most Scavenger weapons, it has about a 3% less overall damage than the Thrasher does. So I'm really not sure about that. It has a little bit more impact, but the Thrasher is essentially just a better Riptide in every way. And that leads us to our remaining four SMGs. However, the Bobcat sort of falls short of the Silent Spectre. I was led to believe for a long time that these weapons were essentially identical, and they do behave very, very similarly, but the Silent Spectre seems to beat out the Bobcat in every single damaging situation. However, the Bobcat is a little bit more versatile with the perks that you have available, so you might be able to make it edge it out in certain situations, but because it has a 3.3 reload speed, you can't really utilize all of its damaging perks. It's for that reason that the Bobcat really won't be on my number 3 spot. It would better be tied in the number 7 slot alongside the Siege Breaker, Typewriter, and Pain Train, seeing as the damage is more similar to the Siege Breaker. That being said, the Bobcat is still a phenomenal weapon. Don't look too hard at my rankings here, as it's still going to perform amazingly in-game. And that leaves us to our last three. However, there's one more caveat. The Lightning Pistol only beats the Thrasher in damage. Yes, it's actually stronger than the Thrasher against water enemies. Because the Lightning Pistol is locked to nature, you can't really make it viable anywhere else. If it's nature on nature, it's still going to do about as much damage as an energy weapon would and the thrasher would take over again so our number three slot essentially boils down to the thrasher the silent specter the bobcat and the lightning pistol kind of now in the number two slot, we're going to talk about something that the astute amongst you might have noticed was missing in the number three slot. Uh, Beast, where's the hemlock? I thought that thing was insane. Where's the ratatat? Isn't that kind of good? I'm sure none of you were asking about the ratatat because it's sort of a sleeper pick. Did you know that this thing is basically one of the strongest weapons in the entire game? Yeah, it's not in the number two slot on accident. This thing, perked correctly, can absolutely annihilate. I have a triple crit damage because I recorded in my video Totally Rockin' Out, and I don't count Totally Rockin' Out in my videos, but this is one of the very very few weapons where you can run crit rating, crit damage, and fire rate, and perked correctly, this thing is just the best SMG in the game, kind of. Let me explain. If you have Causes Affliction or Slowed and Snared and perk it accordingly with a matching 6 perk, it'll be a little bit worse than the Thrasher, but if you have the new 6 perk with the ramping crit rating, you can perk this in a specific way to make it be a little bit better than the Thrasher once it's wound up. And there are other ways to perk it like I have here with Totally Rockin' Out, where it'll be absolutely monstrous, but Totally Rockin' Out kind of doesn't count. So the Ratatat is only better than the Thrasher if you have the right perks, and even then it's only better sometimes. That said, because this weapon is essentially a chameleon with the kind of perk options you have on this thing, I am putting in the number two slot, but it needs to be strictly stated that this weapon is not specifically better than the weapons below it. It just has the potential to be significantly better. So it's a little weird to explain that. I explained it much better in its specific video link below, but it's definitely worth knowing. And a new face on our list, a weapon that did not exist when I last made my top 10 video, the Floor Flusher is on this list with another caveat. Yes, the number two slot is dedicated to weapons that are technically better in certain situations. Now, the Floor Flusher, if you have the matching six perk and the element, is over 300,000 DPS. I've stayed away from specific numbers a lot here, but for reference, the Thrasher has about a base 244, 245,000 DPS with my specific stats, and the Floor Flusher can beat it by a lot, almost 60,000, and that is a huge deal. The Floor Flusher against a nature enemy in this circumstance, or depending on your six perk, you can't have the crit rating, it is not better than the weapon deals bonus damage. If you're against Water Fire Nature and the element is perked to compound on top of that, the Floor Flusher is a king. It is very, very, very strong in those certain circumstances. However, in a normal mission, you're never going to be shooting one element the entire time so it doesn't always stay on top there are 
are better generalists, but it should be noted that the Floor Flusher is a sleeping giant if you've never really tried it out. And the Hemlock is essentially in the same position. Its normal damage output, perked kind of as I'm showing here, is essentially the same but a little bit lower than the Silent Spectre and the Thrasher. It's a pretty good but not exceptional weapon in that it'll still absolutely shred. The Hemlock is a fan favorite for a very good reason, but it's still going to fall short of its brothers. But with the landing five hits in a row causes a small explosion six perk, it can be better. Now, area of effect damage is really hard to measure. It's impossible to know just how many enemies you're going to be hitting all the time. Sometimes that explosion hits one enemy, sometimes it hits 10 of them. You really just can't account for that in the math. I would have to give you a dozen different numbers to even look at that. But what's unique here is you're going to kill most enemies very, very quickly. So it's not going to matter most of the time. But on the bigger targets, when you can land that fifth hit without eliminating them, that 70% of your damage extra chunk does make this weapon quite a bit better than some of the other SMGs in the game by a good margin. It's not 70% better, it's like one fifth of 70% better. So it can edge out some of the other SMGs in the game when you're shooting at bigger targets like Miss Monsters, Smashers, you know, mini bosses. And because that explosion can hit enemies around it, not only is its single target damage better than the others, but it's hitting multiple enemies as well. So it's for that reason that the Hemlock is sometimes the best SMG in the game, but so is the Ratatat sometimes. It really depends. So the number three slot was essentially the best SMGs all around, and this number two slot was the best SMGs sometimes, and then of course the floor flusher bringing the assault rifles back up on top. Now this number one slot is going to come as no surprise and is going to include a lot less confusion than the last few slots on this list, and that's of course rocket launchers. I put these in the number one slot because I think it's obvious. These are incredibly expensive weapons, so they will never be your primary, but everybody knows that when you pull out a rocket launcher, it's because shit just got real and you need to clear up a mess. And that is where we are going to be talking about, hands down, the strongest weapons in the game. I have the Storm King's Wrath favorited here because obviously it has like an honorary spot amongst these weapons, but because it's a mythic, it's kind of sort of not on our list. But the Deatomizer, the Metal Marauder, the Santa's Little Helper, the Pot Shot, kinda, and the Sod Buster sometimes are clear candidates for the crown on this list. I do think on a personal note, the Deatomizer is the best generalist. It's what I use the most because it clears the most amount of enemies the most efficiently, and it is an extremely strong weapon to use. But the Santa's Little Helper and the Metal Marauder are very similar candidates in the fact that they have one single explosion that affects a number of enemies, extremely strong, it does a lot of damage in one punch. The Metal Marauder is basically the same as the Santa's Little Helper in the same regard. It does very similar damage. It's a little bit stronger if you're hitting it with low health, and because of that six perk, it gets a little tricky. You can change the six perk nowadays to do damage to nature enemies, and that can make this weapon an absolute monster for the same reason that the Sawbuster will be, and for the same reason that the Floor Flusher was. And that's that if you switch off of this physical element, make it fire, switch that six perk to nature, which I don't necessarily recommend doing. Core Reaper perk is very scarce as I'm recording this, but that will do an absolute ton of damage, and you can swap this fifth perk for something a little bit more useful, like putting your reload speed down here and switching to an extra damage perk. You can see that if it's perked correctly, shooting a nature enemy, it can be incredibly strong, way more powerful than the Santa's Little Helper. But of course, because it has so many little caveats going along with it, the Metal Marauder isn't strictly better in any one way, but it's very tied with the Santa's Little Helper in the way that I have it here. Now, the Pot Shot was kind of an eh, because because this weapon says it's doing whatever it's doing, but it's almost always doing more than double. So I am very suspicious that it's bugged. However, the deatomizer is sort of the same way. You might have seen that it says that it's doing like 45,000. It's almost always doing more, and the pot shot is very similar. I have some pretty clean footage of it showing that it's going to be doing about half a million, and then just not hitting for anything less than 1.2 or 1.3 million damage. This thing, if it goes unchecked, is insane. It is way stronger than any Anything that should exist in this game. People have run this triple crit damage of totally rocking out, and that can get out of hand very, very fast. So it deserves a position in the number one spot, but that may change in the future. Of course, you can check the pinned comment below if there's any news on that. And the Sod Buster is a very similar situation. If I compare the numbers here, you can see that it's hitting for about identical to the Santa's Little Helper. They are essentially the same. But if I'm shooting against a fire enemy with the one that I have here, it will be doing, well, essentially 44% more, but kind of more than that. It's 
not specific, but it will be doing a lot more because of the elements here. And it's just a very, very good weapon because you can get all three elements on this. So if you have three sod busters and you pick one for the mission at hand, it is, in my opinion, a lot better than the Senna's Little Helper because it's doing identical damage normally, but even more damage if you have the right element. A lot of people will point out that I'm running physical on a lot of my launchers here, and that's because I usually run with the basic attitude that these weapons are hitting so hard that it doesn't matter for the normal enemies, and the hard enemies are going to be shooting the Storm King, the Mist Monsters in the Storm King, which are all at physical, or Zappy Faces and Takers are always physical, Flingers are always physical, Smashers are only sometimes elemental, and even then, an AR or a more prolonged damage output weapon, or like an SMG, would be a lot better of a choice than a rocket launcher, so in every single circumstance where I'm actually using a rocket launcher to eliminate things, physical tends to be the better option for me. Of course, the sod buster, for as I just explained specific reasons, is better to match the element, not to mention the sod buster, along with the other art echo weapons, can't actually have physical or energy anyway, which is funny to me because you're going to want to match the element to your six perk regardless, but you don't have the choice to do anything else otherwise. So yeah, those are our number one picks. That is the top 10 list. I've been recording for over an hour, so I have no idea how long this video is, but hopefully this was insightful. There will be no honorable mentions at the end of this list though. I feel like it's pretty fleshed out and like I mentioned earlier, any weapon that should have been mentioned in this video will be covered in the subsequent category videos later, meaning if there's an SMG that I should have brought up or there is an assault rifle that I should have brought up or where are the traps on this list beast? Well, traps are extremely different from the normal weapons so I don't even think they should be mentioned here, but regardless, all of that will be mentioned in their own videos down the line. All right, let's talk about the best bows and save the world. Now before I get into it, I have a couple of disclaimers and one of them of course is the fact that obviously they may or may not be done releasing bows to this game but of course they are not done adding any of the other weapon types to the game and I made those videos anyway but we did get confirmation from Epic that they are as of now pretty much done with all the bows because they wanted to make one for every set which they still haven't technically done but I imagine any winter set would probably come in like well the winter time and it's May so I think it's going to be a very long time before they release any bows but a lot of people are really curious right now which of these 12 bows is the best one that I should use and we're gonna get to that later. Now of course I will be covering any future bows that come out so if none of these bows are one of the bows that comes out in the future then rest assured you can check my channel or search it up with my name I have most likely covered it usually upon release so if there's a new bow that's not in this video I've probably got you covered anyway and I can of course talk about it in its own video. And the other thing that I wanted to get out of the way is the perks for this. This is not a best perks video. I have made a best perks video for all of these bows. I will admit as of release some of these videos might need updating so you might want to check the links below see if I've changed that video. For example one of them I'll say right off the bat is the vacuum tube bow. This was a very very different weapon day one of release. The six perk didn't even function the way that it did. In fact they actually changed it to work more like I recommended it should work rather than how it did when it first released and uh, I'm very very grateful for that. I don't know if they ever saw my video but they literally did exactly what I wanted them to do because initially it was upon elimination it would branch out to up to six enemies maybe not always six enemies and that had a four second cooldown I said that it should just hit as many enemies as possible up to six you know always try to hit that six and it was upon every single hit which is literally exactly what they did and that is why the vacuum tube bow is actually quite a bit stronger than it used to be uh, and that's how my original video might be a little bit wrong but the best perks for all of these is actually very standard this is not true for every single bow but fundamentally double damage is going to be a lot more consistent reload is something I can recommend on every single bow that can have it and crit is something I do a lot because most bows will one shot a target anyway they're very strong weapons depending on your power level and your missions of course and for the bigger targets you're never really going to kill them in two shots so so long as you're going to take at least three shots by then you would have crit anyway and that's my mentality beyond running crit for a lot of these especially with the powder keg that I'm looking at right here or the xenon bow these bows are very very frequently hitting multiple targets at once where crits are plentiful now of course, I've noticed in-game that when the Xenon Bow doesn't crit, kind of sucks, I don't love that, and that's where a double damage loadout might be good, but I will just recommend you to be vigilant, check out my videos on these, think for yourself for all the bows that I show here, because uh, you might not agree with the perks, and some of these are, of course, not even made properly, and with bows like the Instigator, I was given a copy of these to show for today's video. And on that topic, I do want to thank Benz for pretty much all of these. I literally just DM'd him that I wanted to make a best bows videos, he was like, okay, cool, and then he just, like, drop, 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 literally gave me a copy of, like, every single bow you can see him sprinkled throughout here because he was uh one of the friends of mine who maxed out a copy of every single one of these and was very helpful i have multiple perks for a lot of these and uh that is so that i can get into it now one more
one more thing before we get into it. I do have a video on the best bow loadout. I'm going to link that in the description below. This is what I use personally, but there are other options, and I'd highly recommend checking out that video so I can explain exactly why I use what I use and how this build works. Let's start with the boom bow, the only bow that I haven't made a video on. This was not released at a time when I was making videos on all these new weapons, which I greatly regret, and I should be covering a boom bow later on. If it is covered in a future time, I will be linking that in the description below, of course, but the boom bow is everybody's go-to bow when they think about, you know, bows and save the world because it was the first one added. It was coming over for Battle Royale and it's not incredibly amazing compared to some that have come out later and it is lacking a reload perk, which is a major knock, but fire rate has been added to the game and it makes it quite a little bit better. Uh, fire rate for all of the bows, if you were curious, does make it so that it gets to its max charge faster and almost every single bow has a hidden feature, some of them not so hidden, where they do the most damage when they're fully charged and for some bows that difference is uh, more than others but you can get up to two or three times the normal damage by charging it all the way to the max and with the boom bow you can hit multiple targets at once while its radius is a bit lower than the powder keg it is very very effective in crowd clearing and that makes it a secure contender for one of the better bows in the entire game moving on to the cloud burst i'm going alphabetical here this is a bow that's really really good for killing a single target and i think their intent with this bow is it to be you know decent with crowd clearing seeing as an elimination can cause a cloud of steam but that has a five second cooldown and that cloud of steam is not only tough to control because enemies don't always walk into it but it's not insanely big and nor is it doing a ton of damage so i've never really seen the cloud burst as a phenomenal weapon but i'm gonna let you decide for yourself this was great for a while because it was bugged with pharaoh's ability where it was making it you know branch out to other enemies and it's probably good that i mentioned pharaoh because on bow hit the arrows can splinter off dealing extra damage to extra targets and that is now on only a bow's hit so it doesn't actually splinter off with the cloud but the cloud burst is kind of just that it's a very mediocre weapon i think you can use it especially if you're in the lower zones that's true for all of these bows however and uh, i don't see a lot of use out of it but maybe it'll get better in the future the Compression Burst Servant is kind of just a weaker boom bow in my experience. It is a bow that got a lot better with that fire rate perk because it has a very slow draw but a very high extra damage when you charge it all the way to max and also the highest impact of any of the bows as well. So this is Editing Beast coming in after to tell you that this is a very very good weapon for knocking enemies around so you might not want to be specifically using this for damage in certain specific situations you can roll it all impact and uh, try to knock some smashers around around maybe impact some enemies you'll see in my gameplay later on some of the enemies actually instead of attacking me will get stunned on the ground and you'll get a bit of a second shot so i don't personally value impact all that much if you've been watching my videos for a long time i hardly ever mention it because i very rarely see it as something that actually changes the flow of a mission in any meaningful way but it is one of its selling points and i figured i should mention it and it has like a i think a very similar radius as the boombo and it doesn't quite explode as satisfyingly but it does do essentially the same thing you have a nice little draw time and then it killed zombies in a mass group it's nice to have and i i think it's kind of outclassed by the boombo but all in all it is very very effective at what it does if you don't have the boombo so it's something that you can try out if you want to use it but i'd also recommend a fire rate perk on that so you can pop off as many shots as possible now the night fire is up and this is from the medieval set which is interesting because it has a very unique ability where hitting an enemy can regenerate shields which is nice if you're not using blast in the past i'd highly recommend using the night fire with totally rocking out if you want to maximize its ability to, well, heal your shields. One thing I want to note is that I will be using Totally Rocking Out for some of the bows that don't have very good area of effect damage. So like the Night Fire, the Love Song, the uh, Night Owl, etc. I will be using Totally Rocking Out for these, which I do understand buffs the damage way more than Blast in the Past. And I know that it'll look like these bows are a lot better than they are, but I figured it was fair to give them their nice little representation on the screen here because they aren't that good at taking out large crowds of zombies and you sort of need Totally Rocking Out to make them at all viable. But if you're using... Uh, uh, blast from the past that six perk is going to be totally wasted but the night fire isn't all bad because it's really really good at popping off a lot of shots very quickly it has a very very quick draw time and it makes it very easy to use in a high octane mission and you can pop off a lot of shots which is very very nice to have and its damage is pretty decent to go along with it so i'd say this is an extremely good mid-range bow you can get off a lot of shots to make up for its low damage but ultimately it's not going to be hitting quite as hard as some of our bigger weapons and unfortunately it can really only hit one target at a time meaning all of your extra damage is coming from Stoneheart Pharaoh, which you should absolutely be using with any bow. As with any bow, and I'm going to be saying this a lot in the future, is if you don't have area of effect damage, it's really kind of a backseat weapon. Like, you really shouldn't be using it unless you have, you know, no other option and you really want to use a bow, because... 
without hitting multiple targets, it is definitely a drawback. I'm going to be mentioning the Xenon Bow later, but that is where this weapon shines as one of the strongest bows in the game because it does about as much damage as any other bow, except that it can shoot through as many zombies as you want and through walls, which makes this thing phenomenal. But we're not quite there yet. We're talking about the Nightfire. I think it's a great option. I think it's very good, but uh, unfortunately, without the area of effect damage, it's kind of a mid-range bow. The Love Song, my favorite weapon to hate because, you know, like I've said before, anytime I get to use Selena Gomez in not only the thumbnail but the footage, I'm having a great day, trust me. But the Love Song was not the source of that enjoyment. It's kind of just a slower firing average weapon. It, it just has a very typical draw speed, it does very typical damage, and its 6 perk is meant to be useful in that it can stun an enemy for 10 seconds when you charge it all the way, but that takes a long time to charge unless you have fire rate, and that stun is not insanely necessary. Uh, it, it helps you do extra damage, especially if you can do the damage to knock back, stun, stagger kind of deal. But that doesn't really save it because, like I said, with the Nightfire, it doesn't have any area of effect damage, meaning you'd be carrying an entire weapon just to do extra damage to a Mist Monster after the second hit. And I mentioned Mist Monsters because they're basically the only thing that's going to survive that first hit, which means it's a very decent weapon for single target damage. But other than that, it's very, very unexceptional, and I don't know that I have talked to anybody who's gotten any use of this weapon outside of the day one release when we were testing it out. Hopefully this weapon gets buffed in the future, but unfortunately it is kind of a lower, lower range weapon and I don't think it's up there with some of the better bows in the game. Now the Night Owl is going to get a very similar treatment to me as the uh, the Love Song. It doesn't have any area of effect damage and uh, eliminating two enemies can reduce your health by X amount and that'll turn into a little bit of extra damage but that's not going to be saving this weapon unfortunately because bows are already tricky to use and having it hurt you in the process isn't going to help much. I in the past have been one of the few fans of the Black Metal set. I think it's really really cool that you can turn you know a loss of health into extra damage. If you use Coconuts and Blast the past and you stay on top of that health reduction that can be okay that can be just fine obviously with this weapon it'll do lots more damage with the less health that you have but that's not really going to save this weapon especially considering it's locked to physical and fire which can be good as of recording this uh this will be not true in the future of course but nature missions are very common right now so fire can be nice to use this weapon in if you are trying to make a bow for every element maybe the night owl could be your fire bow maybe that could be dedicated for it and the vacuum tube bow could be your nature bow you know you see where i'm going with this there isn't a dedicated water one though unfortunately so you're gonna have to figure that last one out for yourself but the night owl might not want to be on that roster anyway just because yeah it's got mediocre damage and it hurts you in the process which gives it extra damage which could be nice make up for that lower damage but it's uh not exactly going to be getting too much favoritism for me and that's where i'm going to class this as sort of a bottom half bow now the scrap shot is a fun one because I'm going to talk about the scrap shot and the instigator at the exact same time because the scrap shot doesn't have any special six perk but as far as I'm aware it's the same thing as the instigator. I have very different perks on this so I can't really compare it apples to apples but you can kind of trust me when uh, at the base level these are like the exact same weapon so they basically are going to be talked about at the same time. The instigator is very good for on that max charge it'll allow enemies to take extra damage but that's very similar to the love song and like I said that didn't save the love song and it doesn't really save the instigator it doesn't affect bosses which as far as i'm aware only means the storm king so it only means that it doesn't affect the the, the storm king because it's the only boss in the game uh mini bosses as far as i'm aware at least didn't count for this on day one if i'm wrong about that let me know but if you can use this to make mini bosses take more damage that can be nice but it's kind of like a low budget war cry in that respect. I don't know. Up to you guys. I have never found that to be useful or necessary, but it can be uh, kind of a thing, especially as of release. Chrome husks are a very big problem. And while that won't be true forever, it can be very, very good at helping you and your team eliminate enemies that are harder to take down. But ultimately, the scrap shot and the instigator both suffer from what some of the other bows have, where they don't have any area of effect damage. They are very, very good at taking out single targets. They have very decent fire rate. You can pop off a lot of shots very quickly. You can get to that max charge fairly quick because of how fast these weapons are and maybe fire rate can help you with that but ultimately if you can't hit lots and lots of targets this can't be your primary it's just very very tough to use it that way and you will be holding back your team so unfortunately i have to class these weapons in the lower half but i've been saying that a lot and that's because our best weapons are to come next i'm going to jump ahead to the vendor tech seeker because i want to talk about the best bows last and i know that's going to be a kick to the gut for some of you guys i know that there are some serious vendor tech seeker fans out there this weapon is one of the most impacted by the fire 
fire rate changes where you can get to that max draw very, very quickly and you can fire off, what is it, three extra charges that can seek out enemies and that's kind of the secret part of it. Because of that, you can do a lot of extra damage to a single target. This very well may be the hardest hitting single target bow in the entire game, which makes it very, very effective at taking out miss monsters and mini bosses, but because it takes so long to get to that max charge in the past, I haven't really been able to see this as my primary weapon. With fire rate, this weapon can be a little bit more viable and definitely usable in game, but I think we have some better bows, starting with the powder keg. The powder keg is where we're going to be talking about the upper half of bows. The powder keg, xenon bow, and the vacuum tube bow are the three bows that I've been using as my primaries, because the powder keg is a huger explosion than the boom bow, and I do mean huger because it is huge. That thing can affect tons of enemies in one explosion. Its base damage is very low. This does significantly less than most of the other bows, and that's because that explosion makes up for it all the way. What I've been doing with bigger targets is I'll just spam a lot of shots from this thing and blow up as many times as I can, and that will be very, very effective at even taking out mini bosses. It's great for encampments and fantastic for crowds of zombies, which is what you'll be seeing a lot of in Save the World, and it makes it perfectly suited to be the right tool for that job. I've been running it fire because that's kind of what I wanted. I don't know. It feels like an explosion of a powder keg should be a fire bow, and that's kind of what I went with, and that's very, very good, seeing as most of the enemies are in nature right now, and that will, of course, not be true in the future, like I said, but that has how I've been running it, and I am very, very satisfied with it. I think the powder keg is one of the best bows in the entire game. Now the vacuum tube bow. I've given it enough praise. As you can see, mine is double damage. You can obviously go crit rating on this. Again, this isn't a best perks video. That's just what I have, and the vacuum tube bow is phenomenal. That extra zap damage is very, very good at affecting lots of extra enemies, because you need to think of it like this. You are affecting six extra enemies with a zap. Pharah is hitting, I think, five extra enemies. With plus your initial target, you're hitting a dozen enemies per shot with this thing, and it is very, very good at sweeping crowds of enemies. It hasn't been getting a lot of use recently because there haven't been that many water missions, but if you have a water modifier where you're going to be against frost enemies, you know, water enemies, this thing will do its maximum damage, and it's going to be a very, very, very fun time because it's going to be hitting lots and lots of enemies all in one shot. A lot of people are going to have a sore taste in their mouth because this weapon did just get, uh, a lot of people are saying nerfed, but really it was fixed. Its ability was like the cloud burst bow, where all of those zaps from the electricity was affecting Pharaoh's ability, so they were also hitting five more enemies on top of that, which means it was really hitting more like 30 enemies rather than six, and that's not I think what Epic was intending and you could wipe out entire encampments in like two shots if there wasn't healing death burst so I think that a lot of people think this weapon is a lot worse than it really is because it just went from god tier to like you know normally very good and that's where I'm going to say it is normally very good this is in my opinion a top five bow no doubt and you should definitely consider leveling this up if you have it pull it out of the collection book you know use code Mista if you're going to be using V bucks for that but this is a very very good bow and something you should should definitely try out. Last, but definitely not least, is something I have set on record might very well be the best bow in the game, and I don't want to hype it any more than that because it's not. There is no best bow. If you've been paying attention so far, you'll realize that I don't rank these weapons, I don't think that you can compare a lot of these weapons, but I do believe that the Xenon Bow might just be a contender for that number one slot because of its range and the fact that it can shoot through freaking everything. And I do mean everything. You could go through an entire encampment of zombies, through a wall, through a tree, through the ground, and into another encampment of zombies because this arrow will go until it hits the edge of the map because it is just that cool. The Xenon Bow has effectively infinite pierce. It can go through as many targets as you want and because of that, you're hitting way more targets than the other bows. Like I mentioned, the Powder Cake has that huge explosion and the Vacuum Tube Bow can hit up to a dozen enemies, but the Xenon Bow, it can hit, if you think of it like this, you can shoot through a crowd of zombies hitting maybe 10 enemies at once and each one of those zombies will be activating Pharaoh's ability to branch out to more zombies. You could hit... In that instance, about 50 enemies, so to speak, or 50 times with one shot. Not to mention, you don't have to worry about lining up a shot. You can aim ahead of an enemy without feeling like you're going to be hitting the ground because it's just going to go right through it. You don't need to worry about that tree or that car or that wall in front of you. You can shoot wherever the target is. Half the time when I'm using the Xenon Bow, I'm aiming at health bars. There's no piece of the environment that's going to get in your way, and that makes it an extraordinarily versatile weapon, and I have never been more satisfied using a weapon because because I feel like the Xenon Bow is limitless. I have gone a bit far there. I don't want you to think that I am overhyping this weapon. It's a personal favorite. A lot of this is coming out of opinion, but I like to be objective in these reviews. So I guess I should stop hyping it there. I'm just saying that when you could shoot through literally anything and the weapon's doing good damage while it's at it, 
boy, you've got a recipe for disaster there. I, you can see that I've been running this with fire rate since the changes because you can get to that max charge faster, which more or less means you can shoot more accurately. And that's true for every single bow in the game. I want that to be understood. If you put fire rate on any of these bows, they will whip up to their max accuracy uh, faster and it makes it a little bit more easy to use. I was using damage to afflicted down here, which was nice and that may be something I use in the future, but I think I'm satisfied with fire rate right now. I'm not entirely certain on that. But that just about wraps up the current best bows in Save the World. I hope this was good for you guys. I I hope I wasn't too biased on any of these. I try to be objective, just laying out exactly how these bows work, why they're good for all of their unique reasons. You have a lot of options here. I really think there is a playstyle for everybody here. I did not cover crossbows. I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but I don't think crossbows really have a place on this list. They're a very different weapon, and even Epic has been treating them differently because they are, well, they're very different weapons, and none of them are very good anyway, so trust me, you're not missing out on any information there, but that's where I'm going to call it. All right, let's talk about some of the best assault weapons in Fortnite Save the World. World. Now, the educated among you might already be aware that I've covered this weapon once before on my channel. In fact, I covered all of the best weapons in the entire game, and that is hands down one of the most popular series on my channel, and I'm a little disappointed that I haven't remade these videos sooner because some changes have taken place that have made those videos a little outdated, including my old top 10 video. I actually remade this entire video listing everything that I covered, and I definitely recommend watching that before watching this because it definitely gives a nice intro to the series that I'm creating here. Now, if you've already watched those videos, then you definitely already have a good idea of some of the best weapons in the game. And honestly, nothing that really changed made those videos completely obsolete. In fact, the most notable changes is that many things actually got stronger. So lots of you are probably going to expect this, but of course I'm going to be talking about the weapon changes spreadsheet. Thanks to Dyson for noting all of these, we're going to be focusing on the assault weapons today. Meaning, if you look at this spreadsheet, at the worst of it, everything just sort of stayed the same amount of damage. But at the best of it, a lot of these weapons actually got a little bit stronger. Now, that's not going to fundamentally change most of what I'm going to say. Like in the first video I noted pretty early on, based on the order that I talked about these, the Beat Blaster and the Blackout are very, very similar weapons, and the Beat Blaster getting a small 8% damage buff isn't exactly going to be rocking the world or anything, so I will be talking about a lot of what I mentioned in the previous video, but on top of all of these changes, I am older, I am wiser, I have learned lots more about this game, and I will be providing more and more insights into some of the weapons that we'll be discussing. Not to mention, there are weapons like the Electro Shock Rifle and the Floor Flusher, which straight up didn't exist when I recorded the first video. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, the Spy Weapons didn't exist. In that first video, the Blizzard Blitzer had just come out that previous week, so some new things have definitely happened. And, not to mention, new fancy six perks exist. Now, obviously, the Floor Flusher and the Grunt introduced some new six perks with the extra elemental bonus damage and the fact that you can stand in place to grant extra damage. And, nowadays, you can go to any of these weapons and use Core perks to change these. It should also be noted I did an entire video on how to spend Core Reaper, which actually acted as a really good guide to some of the serious changes and what weapons got impacted by this new six perk change and pretty much everything is in here so if you're curious as to what changed even if you're not looking to spend your core perk I actually recommend watching this video it'll be linked below of course I will mention those six perks where notable if I don't bring up those six perks or if some of your favorite assault weapons aren't mentioned in this video just know that I skipped them probably for a reason if I don't bring up a weapon in this video it was probably not significant enough to mention but I will open this up to future changes meaning I will state, just for the record, any changes will be updated in the pinned comment down below. Always scroll down there if you're watching this video in the future just to make sure that everything is up to date. And there are two changes that I want to note. You might have noticed in the previous list of changes, the Nailer and the Ranger are both noted of getting really decent damage bonuses, 22 and 23% respectively. I have not actually looked at these weapons since making my previous video. The Nailer is actually kind of a joke. My entire best perks on it is an 8 second video of me recycling the schematic. And the Ranger has never been tested by me before. So I am going to leave those two weapons as a question mark on today's video and if I do end up covering those in the future once again check out that pin comment and when they are covered they will be linked in the description below along with all of the best perks for all of the weapons that I've covered here today. So there are going to be a lot of links in the description below but I highly recommend checking them out because today's video will not be focusing on the best perks for these weapons necessarily. Those best perks videos individually will talk way more in depth about these individual weapons. Today we're just going to be doing a light overview of some of the best assault weapons in the game. So without further further ado, let's talk about the Electro Shock Rifle, because of course, I do have this one supercharged. Now, of course, we will just be going down this list alphabetically. I don't think there's any other way to do it, so let's start with the weapon that I have supercharged and why I have supercharged it. So the Electro Shock Rifle was a starter pack weapon that is essentially a reskin of the Argon Assault Rifle, so we're effectively going to be talking about both of these weapons up front. The Argon Assault Rifle is a painfully mediocre weapon, and that's still true with the Electro Shock Rifle. However, the Argon Assault Rifle has a little bit of an audio cue where it, it sounds like it's shooting twice as fast 
fast as it really is, and there's a lot of, like, muzzle flare where it makes a flash every time you shoot, and I don't know what it is, but they definitely changed the feel of the electroshock rifle where it shoots slower, more focused beams, and I can definitely see where I'm shooting. And even comparing it next to the Argon Assault Rifle, I can see that the Argon Assault Rifle is also as accurate, but it just never felt as good. So in my brain, I felt the electroshock rifle was worth supercharging, and if you're interested in supercharging your own weapons, I'll link my video on that down below. It definitely is a good talk into which weapons are worth it, because there are weapons like the Nocturno, which, you know, ironically here, I actually don't recommend supercharging, and that's because this weapon is already just insanely powerful. And yes, this is a transition. I don't have much else to add about the electroshock rifle. It's a fun weapon that I personally really enjoy. I highly recommend using it and the Argon Assault Rifle if you're interested in trying those weapons at all, but they aren't really a top tier weapon. They're more of like a B plus A tier weapon. The Nocturno is what we call an S tier weapon in the industry. So when you're ranking weapons in this game, you know, A, B, C, D, just like a US report card with the way that we do grades, the Nocturno is what people call like an S tier, meaning it is like the gold standard of an amazing weapon. It is also coincidentally the exact same base damage as a Siege Breaker. This isn't going to show very well because I've supercharged my Nocturno, but they do have the exact same damage, crit chance, everything, except for the fact that the Nocturno has one more crit damage perk option down here and a completely different six perk. So I will be showing gameplay of the Nocturno here where it is just exploding crowds of enemies and it is incredibly effective. That's actually why I don't recommend supercharging it, but I just wanted to make the best weapon even better and I don't regret it at all. Now, even though they have the exact same damage output, the Nocturno and the Siege Breaker, the six perk on the Nocturno adds 65% of the bonus damage every time you reload or finish eliminating that enemy, affecting other enemies around it. So if you are reloading absolutely perfectly, like against a Smasher, it's very easy to do so, or a mini boss nonetheless, you are essentially adding 65% of your damage on top of the weapon and to the surrounding enemies. Now that doesn't work out perfectly. You have to be really, really precise to make that actually you know, viable. You're always gonna reload with like a little bit less than 65% HP remaining on the enemy that you're shooting, but it is just a phenomenal weapon all around. And the Storm King Scourge is a very, very similar story. It is very, very strong. If you switch off between targets and you're shooting between two at, at, at a single time, you are essentially doubling the damage because when you switch enemies, it'll deal 100% bonus damage. Or if you just build up to five charges, which essentially works out to about a 20% damage bonus, it's a really, really accurate weapon. It was essentially designed to be the best AR in the game. That's kind of the idea of it being a mythic weapon, and it definitely does not disappoint in that regard. I don't think I needed to tell anybody that the Storm King AR is a definitely good choice. Now, the Beat Blaster and the Blackout are two weapons that I mentioned briefly in my previous video. I'm just going to make it quick and say they both shoot two shots at a time. They both perform very similarly, and the Blackout is a weapon that now has a fancy new six perk. So if you end up using this with the extra damage against nature enemies, it can be really, really effective. Unfortunately, the Beat Blaster was not so lucky. None of these six perks are new or game-changing in any way. So I do nowadays consider the Blackout AR to be a slightly bit better than the Beat Blaster, considering it'll do a lot of extra damage against nature enemies. But fundamentally, these weapons are very similar, and there's nothing really new to add. The Blizzard Blitzer is an interesting one as well, because this is one of those older, wiser things where back in the day, like I said, this weapon had just been out for a week, and I didn't really know what I know now. But thanks to Dyson, who made that previous spreadsheet, the Blizzard Blitzer, apparently, he actually did the math, if you just take the base damage of the weapon and you factor in the time spent reloading between shooting if you're just constantly firing at an enemy the blizzard blitzer is technically speaking i cannot stress this enough this is not real world performance it is not the best ar in in my opinion but Mathematically speaking, it has the highest base damage when you factor in reload speed, which is interesting because it has a really, really quick reload and a decent-ish fire rate, but a pretty good base damage. So it's kind of all around a decent, really good weapon, but it does shoot projectiles. These snowballs are a little bit hard to deal with and you will very, very often be missing shots. However, the six perks are very interesting. You can do that 44% damage against fire enemies, which makes it very good against fire enemies. And then of course you can freeze enemies in place. It makes it for a very interesting weapon that is definitely worth trying out if you've never used it before. The Bundle Bus, once again, there is nothing new that I can say in this video that you guys haven't heard before. Needless to say, it is just a powerhouse of a weapon, and instead of covering it in today's video, wasting our time, I'm just going to link my videos on it down below. I have covered the Bundle Bus best perks, best uses for the Bundle Bus, and hell, I'm even going to link my Storm King video because the Bundle Bus comes up in there as well. There is no point in taking precious seconds away from what's already going to be a fairly long video, talking about a weapon that we all know is phenomenal. The Candy Corn LMG is once again another example of me learning things since recording. I stand by the fact 
fact that this weapon is heavily hindered by the fact that it's locked to physical. This weapon is not going to perform very well against elemental enemies in the late game. However, there are ways to get around that, meaning you can run triple crit damage on this. And while I don't really love it when you need totally rocking out to make a weapon good, if you are a totally rocking out fanboy, there are very few weapons in the game that are a better candidate than the Candy Court LMG. Throw on like a reload perk here and then triple crit damage, put on totally rocking out and just have a fun time. You're going to be a glass cannon, but it is definitely an interesting way to play. And I don't recommend changing the six perk. You can get more damage and you can get more crit rating by making these six perks different. Uh, but I do believe those those candy droplets dropping on the ground, giving you some extra healing while you're in the fight is kind of more essential than those. However, there are definitely options to make this weapon better if you choose to do so. The death rate is a weapon that, as you can see by my perks, is not something I'm going to be spending too much on in today's video. It's essentially like, in my opinion, it's, it seems like a worse Argon assault rifle, even though the DPS is a little bit higher. The Argon, it, 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 it performs a little differently, but the death rate might be stronger. This could be a little opinion based, but my point is it is just if you're going to be using energy cells, I'll just say that you should probably just use the Storm King's AR, and that's kind of it. The Death Ray has its own video. I'll link it below, of course, as mentioned, but I'm kind of going to be skipping over it because it's not going to be helping you too much. The Dragon's Roar is interesting because as of recording this, actually, Lunar Llamas are what's available. Now, this won't be true in the future, but it's basically a piercing AR that can affect lots of enemies at once, and it was really interesting back in the day because it had Affliction, which most weapons, you know, didn't have. It was kind of a new thing, and you can have those Roman candles, so it's a very fun weapon, very interesting, but it has a bit of a quirky fire rate for a semi-auto weapon. It's a little annoying to use in my personal opinion, but you can definitely have a fun time with it. So if you find yourself playing a nature mission, maybe you might want to try out the Dragon's Roar, but eh, I don't know. The drum roll is a fantastic example of changes that have made this video worth recording. So I appreciate you tuning in for the updated video because the Founder's Drum Roll has definitely gotten a bonus. Now, back in the day, it had a six perk that gave it headshot eliminations caused an explosion. In fact, now that I'm recording this, I believe I saved the very last drum roll that I ever crafted because it had that old six perk, which isn't really good for anything. The new six perk is better in every way, but you know, when you have a weapon that's now legacy, it's just kind of fun to save it. In the drum rolls case, every 10th round increasing your damage by 15% is really nice. 40 rounds in, you can get a 60% damage bonus, and that is really, really good. So, of course, I have a mag size perk on this because it has, you know, 87 rounds. Not to mention, I use Assault Ammo Recovery, which essentially adds 31% rounds back on top of that. So, I'm essentially shooting for over 100 bullets before I have to reload, which means a huge amount of my bullets are getting buffed by that 6 perk. So, whenever you hear a loud bursty sound whenever you're shooting this weapon, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get good gameplay for that, your weapon is just getting 15% stronger, 15%, 10 rounds later, 15%, 10 rounds later, and it just gets better and better and the drum roll is if you are not well informed basically a reskin sort of of the bobcat of all things so for those of you who don't know uh founders weapons are generally reskins as you saw earlier the the nocturno is a reskin of the siege breaker and the drum roll is basically a bobcat uh, i don't have any of these that have the exact same perk so it's not going to show as well but you can just kind of infer here that the damage is very very similar they both have a base 50 mag size they have a very very similar reload speed and they're not exactly the same but they are very very close to each other and that is definitely a good place to compare the drum roll to just know that it is uh, it's a unique weapon and it's definitely gotten better the gamatron 9000 is an ar that is essentially unchanged since my last video in fact i'm going to chain together a few of these the gamatron the gravedigger and the mercury lmg are all you know just stronger than they used to be basically or unchanged at all and they're all just good weapons in general that are definitely worth using the gravedigger is an old favorite i know we all love to see it but it is unfortunately not something that has fared well in the world of power creep all of the weapons around it have gotten stronger while it got a measly three percent damage buff and has been mostly kicked to the curb unfortunately i i love this weapon it's one of my near and dear favorite weapons of all time but it is just not exactly a powerhouse it's as i mentioned earlier with the other weapon it's basically about a b or a b plus weapon it's not really going to be ranking too high the hacksaw, however, is not a B plus. It's more of like an A or S tier weapon. A lot of people have kind of argued with me because they tried it in game and didn't really experience what I was saying. This is more of a mathematically good weapon. On paper, it is really strong, but in practice, you need to run fire rate damage because there is no crit rating perk. You can't run a crit build on this weapon, which definitely holds it back. Fire rate and damage is mathematically identical to crit rating crit damage. However, in practice, it means you're just going to be draining your magazine, shooting more bullets to do the exact same amount of damage that a crit 
crypt build would have done anyway. So a lot of people in game are shooting tons and tons of bullets and killing enemies how they feel to be slowly, even though it's actually quite fast. So it's a weapon that you kind of need to know what you're getting into to have fun with, but it is definitely a strong weapon. The Hammer Crush is once again, you know, I, I I gave the disclaimer earlier that the Nailer and the Ranger were out of my scope, but the Hammer Crush is a weapon that I am definitely interested to take a look at at some point because it is not a weapon that I've really tried much. I leveled this up because I was using it on my Twitch stream, link to that in the description below, and it was definitely good. It actually one-shots a lot more effectively than I thought, but I have not dealt with this weapon significantly, you know, enough to really give you a good perspective on it. I don't think this is a top-tier weapon. If it was, it would have shined, and I would have known that immediately, but it's definitely something that, that's worth having fun with, so, you know, you know, we'll leave that one open to interpretation later on. Hydra and the Rat King are two weapons I'm going to cover at the same time, because there is, you know what, I don't actually think I have a Rat King leveled up? Oh my goodness, I don't even see it. Yeah, after looking through my inventory, it seems like the Rat King, I must have either, I must be either blind or it's in my collection book. But the Hydra and the Rat King are two weapons that shoot shotgun shells as an AR. They are slow firing, high damage weapons, and they perform very similarly. Both of them I've used just double crit damage and reload. You've run first shot Rio in the lead and you can just crit on every single hit. And there is that new fancy six perk where five hits in a row can cause a small explosion around a target, which with a Hydra shooting what I believe to be, whatever it says here, a tight cluster of pellets can basically trigger that explosion on almost every single shot which is really really cool and can make an old weapon even more interesting but it does definitely require first shot reel for that 100 crit chance otherwise it's just a very very substandard weapon just like the lynx this is a weapon that i tried in a recent video and it, it underperformed it's just a burst weapon that exists it's outclassed by the gamatron and the razor blade and it's it's just kind of not my most recommended weapon as for the Pain Train, this is a weapon I should have mentioned earlier with the Mercury LMG and the Grave Digger and the, and the Gamatron, where it is essentially unchanged. It is just as strong as it always used to be. That stacking damage and crit rating can both be very, very effective, and it just is a weapon that gets stronger the longer you shoot it, uh, assuming you're not shooting it longer than 15 bullets, because that's as strong as it's going to get. It can definitely buff its own damage, and it makes it a very, very, very powerful pick. It's right about in line with the Siege Breaker in performance uh, once you get down to it. So, yeah, if you haven't used the Pain Train, I highly recommend it. I did just casually mention the razor blade is good, which is a weapon I've harped on in the past, but I can't ignore it. After using it recently, it is really quite good. The math is hard to work out because that fire rate is tricky. This is a burst weapon, so I don't know if Epic is factoring in the time between bursts. I don't know if that fire rate is just how fast the bullets are shooting for the three round bursts that you get. I'm not actually 100% certain how to calculate this weapon. However, in game, it performed better than I could have expected. I'm not going to pretend like this is a top tier weapon. It's not going to be blowing my hair back, you know, anything crazy but it is definitely quite good now the swan is a weapon we're skipping over the siege breaker mentioned that earlier is a weapon that is kind of i don't know i'll just call it a b tier i'm not going to waste too much of this video on it it is a weapon that has some interesting six perks you know each shot upping the fire rate damage or crit rating depending on what you got and it can be fun to use but i've never been convinced that it's a, a top pick weapon the terminator is basically the hacksaw but it can run a crit build and even that doesn't save it its dps is strictly lower it is an inferior weapon to the hacksaw every single time i've ever done the math other than the fact that you do have a crit build on it which is nice you won't have to waste as many bullets but it unfortunately does not save the weapon the floor flusher is definitely a last but definitely not least weapon it's not literally the last here but it is extraordinarily strong in my updated top 10 video i actually ranked this weapon tied with the number two slot now the number two slot on that video was sort of an asterisk section where it wasn't literally top two weapons it was basically weapons that in certain circumstances can be amazing meaning the floor flusher against a normal non-elemental enemy is doing about as much damage as the siege breaker it's relatively unimpressive and it's nothing really to write home about but my goodness when you factor in that 44 percent damage against you know the elemental enemy that it should be shooting at in this case against a water enemy it is literally over 300,000 dps now i've strayed away from numbers in this video a lot we do use a calculator and i am very well informed when i talk about this but in this case i will say this weapon goes from about a 220,000 dps to uh over 300,000. which if you want a frame of reference the Nocturno is one of the only other weapons in this entire list that can actually break that 300,000 barrier, and weapons like the Siege Breaker are hovering around about a 217,000 DPS. So 300,000 is monumental, and if you've ever used the Floor Flusher with the correct element and the correct six perk against the correct elemental enemy, meaning nature, water, against a water enemy, it is an absolute monster. I, of course, have three of these just to cover all of the different elements because this weapon is so strong. The Grunt is a weapon that is definitely new to this series because I did not cover it in my previous Best AR 
Polyars video, but it is kind of, uh, it's a fun weapon. It's not my personal taste. It's kind of a DMR kind of thing where you're shooting eight bullets. And it's, a, it's a semi-auto weapon and it performs well enough. It's kind of an okay defender weapon if you want to use an assault weapon defender, but I thought that I would love this weapon a lot more. Uh, you know, in my opinion, it is exactly a fun weapon sometimes and mathematically it does do really good damage. So if you're okay with a, with a DMR style weapon, it's basically a single shot version of the bundle bus, but with the bundle bus shooting eight rounds in a burst makes it pack quite a punch. So the grunt is kind of an inferior version in my opinion, but it's just not really my play style. So your mileage may vary. The Tiger is a weapon that I'm just going to be brief with. I'm running a crippled on this for some reason. This is just the last time I use this weapon, but it is a very accurate fully auto weapon that performs surprisingly good. I don't have much to say about it as it's not really a top threat weapon. It's not a, you know, high, it's not top on the charts or anything, but it is a weapon that I made a video on recently and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let that video speak for itself because it's an interesting weapon to say the least. The Wraith is a weapon that I mentioned at the very beginning of my last Assault Weapons video, and that's because it's sort of a controversial pick. In my opinion, it is not worth the hype. In a lot of people's opinions, they've, you know, put it in their own videos and ranked it number one AR, and it's just not. Uh, the DPS is very similar to the, the, the Siege Breaker. I believe it's slightly more. I'm not 100% certain on that. But the problem I have with this weapon is the inaccuracy, meaning you essentially have to be standing still in order to get a consistent spray out of this weapon. After about 10 shots or any amount of movement, it is spraying all over the place and I don't really agree with people suggesting that you should shoot slowly to make this weapon better because the slower you shoot the less damage you're outputting and it just makes it a very clunky experience in my opinion however lots of people really like that crit chance and the fact that it can have such a high crit chance means it can two shot many enemies very very efficiently and it can even one shot many enemies depending on your crit or headshot accuracy so it can perform very very well but when you're going up to the true test against a smasher or a mini boss you definitely have better options. So I am not saying the Wraith is a bad weapon. This is definitely like it's even a weapon that made my top 10 list. It's just not the number one weapon that a lot of people think it is. Now we are down into the weapons that I don't have 130, which is typically a bad sign. So we're going to make this a little quick. The Duet is a very dramatic weapon on my channel. I have loved and hated this weapon at different times in my life, and to this day, I am uncertain. It is a weapon that it made me so disappointed that I collection booked it day one of its release, but in previous uses, I found that that bullet shrapnel can make it pretty good in crowds of enemies, depending on how you use it. I went way more in depth in its own video, link below, of course, and I'm just going to leave it there. The Duet is definitely a weapon worth using if you're at all interested. It looks insanely cool, but I've never been convinced that it's anything too insane. Now, the Hunter Killer and the Buzz Cut, I'm not sure why I don't seem to have a uh, copy of the Buzz Cut around here, but it might be in my collection book. They are the same weapon as the Buzz Cut is a scavenger version of the Hunter Killer. Again, it's just a semi-auto weapon that is rather unimpressive. I'll let its video down below speak for itself. And coming close to the end here, we have only got about three more. The Steam Piston is, again, just a, a semi-auto weapon that performs well enough. It's a steampunk AR, and it's very very cool in its design but it actually performed really well i will say that it's not a weapon that shoots fast enough to really satisfy my play style but it, it impacted really really well and it definitely one taps a lot of normal enemies but it behaves very similarly to the wraith except that it shoots a lot slower with the last two on my list, I'm going to actually do the vacuum tube rifle before the end here because the vacuum tube rifle is a weapon that should be uh, should have been mentioned a lot sooner because this is a weapon I don't currently have 130 in my inventory, but it is a very, very good weapon because it is a prime example of those six perk changes, which we've mentioned several times today. But one of the six perks you can get is eliminating an enemy chains lightning, and that is super, super lovely. For a weapon that is already a semi-auto, you're not really going to be spraying it into a crowd of enemies killing tons of things, but with that chain lightning you are just passively eliminating six extra enemies at a time per elimination which makes it really really nice to use and is a very very strong pick definitely a strong weapon that i, I wish i had leveled up and the vintertech pulsar is essentially just a uh underwhelming ar i'm not going to be mentioning it too much it's just a burst energy weapon that is uh, not exactly going to be uh, anything to write home about. So there it is. The best ARs in Fortnite Save the World. These videos take a ton of work and I do intend to finish the rest of this series should this video be well received. So if you guys want to see anything else, comment down below. I want you guys to comment and thumb up any video you want me to cover regarding like the best pistols, snipers, SMGs, shotguns, whatever you guys want next. Thumb up those comments and uh, let me know what to cover because I definitely love to do more of these. Okay, you guys voted and it was 
wasn't even close. I guess it's time to talk about the best SMGs in Fortnite Save the World. And of course, it would not be a good way to start this video for me to not mention why we're making this. So, of course, I covered this video, oh my god, almost a year ago now. It was over a year ago, actually. And a couple of things have changed. First and foremost, there are weapons like the Pepper Sprayer, which exist now, which didn't previously. And a couple of changes have occurred. Now, you might notice that the SMGs are actually among the smallest group of weapons in the entire game. Don't quote me on this, I have not checked my words before speaking them, but I'm pretty sure there are less SMGs than there are traps in the game. However, the SMGs are pretty well known to be some of the best weapons in the entire game, and we will be getting into all of them right away. And I also want to say right away that as of my Vintertech Blazer video going out, I have covered every single SMG in the game on my channel. The best perks for all of these weapons will be linked down below. Even if you're not interested in the best perks for those weapons, it's still going to cover like, you know, how they perform, what they look like. You can see some gameplay that I might not show in today's video, so I still think it's worth checking out if you're interested. Now, of course, as you can see here, the Founder's Quick Shot and Thrasher are very similar weapons. We'll get into that later. They have gotten a serious buff. The Riptide is up there just alongside it, as it is the scavenger version of the Thrasher, and the Lightning Pistol has more or less come into play, even though it was already a pretty strong weapon. So let's get into some of these best weapons, and honestly, I think the best way for us to start is just alphabetically. So we're going from the top down here, and I'm going to go through them as we see. So the Blastatron Mini. This is a weapon that I uh, kind of did dirty in the fact that I didn't really put it in my new top 10 list, and that was frankly a mistake. I actually corrected this in a pinned comment, and it was less of a mistake than it was an oversight. Like, this weapon definitely deserves to be considered one of the best weapons in the entire game. I think it's very, very tied with the Ratatats, which uh, basically puts it in like the number two slot, and that's kinda iffy. It's not 100% certain because the Ratatat was up there for a couple of reasons. This is definitely a top 10 weapon, and I would put it in like the number seven slot all around because it's just a phenomenal weapon. I don't know what else to say. It's a slow firing, high damage SMG with a really nice accuracy, and if you somehow haven't tried this weapon, I definitely recommend giving it a go because you will definitely enjoy it. Now, the Bobcat is a product of me being a little older and a little wiser than I used to be because there was a lot of controversy between the Bobcat and the Silent Spectre. Many people thought that these were like neck and neck as some of the best weapons in the game, and I have since done some math, and even though this DPS here will deceive you, it is not strictly more damage than the Silent Spectre. Uh, the crit damage actually wins out quite a lot here, that's why the DPS is higher on sheet, and there are different ways to perk it, and I've even compared like crit rating, double crit damage, no reload perk, you know, slow and stared bonus and everything, and it is not actually that strong compared to the Silent Spectre. It's actually quite a bit lower in overall damage, but I think a lot of people knew this. What the Bobcat wins over is the fact that it has quite a bit higher mag size than most weapons. See, the Silent Spectre actually needs a mag size perk to even compete. 50 base magazine size is really, really nice, and most SMGs have about 30 to 35-ish. So that is a really, really nice amount of mag size, and it does have a very slow reload, so you're going to need a reload perk on this weapon. But with a reload perk, the Bobcat is actually just, again, one of the better weapons in the game. I don't think it's it's as amazing as the Sound Spectre. I don't think it really compares like everybody used to think it did. So while I don't think this is like a top 10 weapon in the entire game, it is definitely a solid SMG. The Dirge Song is going to be one of our first letdowns of the video. Unfortunately, as with some of the black metal weapons, it is really weird. I'm surprised that it's even classed as a pistol because it's more of like a burst pistol, but it's a nine round burst weapon. So it's kind of like a weak bundle bus with really bad damage drop off. And there is a redeeming six perk, which can give it extra damage against nature enemies. And that would definitely help if you're fighting nature enemies and then you can even swap up that bottom fifth perk to like a reload perk which would be nice but 1.8 is already very good so it's kind of a quirky weapon and again that's where the video down below will get way more to detail than i will today i'm just gonna say for today's purposes that it is kind of a weapon that you can comfortably forget even if it is pretty interesting all right thanks to the alphabet we'll be getting to the quick shot and the thrasher very early on in the video so the quick shot and the thrasher are pretty basically the best SMGs in the entire game. I'm not really going to try to dance around that at all. I have mentioned like in the past, I've ranked like the Ratatat and the Hemlock higher, but those are for very specific circumstances. The Ratatat has a stacking damage and stacking crit rating perk that can really bring it ahead because of its perk choices, and we'll get into that in the Hemlock in a second, but I think, you know, just basic weapon damage, meaning there's no funny business, you don't need to ramp up your damage, just right out of the gate, the Quick Shot is, is the best SMG in the entire game. It's just, you know, it, it 
it is what it is. And you can see based on the perks here, they are effectively identical. What the quick shot has going for it is one more crit damage perk. That's why the numbers are a little bit different up here. You see it has a higher crit damage and it has a different six perk, which definitely matters. Not only does it buff its damage while you're shooting, but your reload speed. Meaning if you empty out your mag size in a full spray and you're not really stopping for anything, when you reload, you're going to reload so quickly that sometimes that bonus can still be active. So this has a huge damage buff on top of an extra crit damage perk, which gives it a little bit of an edge over the Thrasher. So if you have the Founder's Quick Shot, it is basically a direct upgrade of the Thrasher. Other than you will be missing out on Affliction damage, which it is, seems to be a reoccurring bug that the Affliction bonus is doing quite a bit more damage than Epic seems to intend. And if that ever becomes permanent, I do personally think Affliction is a little bit more fun to play with, but raw damage output is definitely just in the Quick Shot's favor. So I'm not going to get too far into these weapons, even though this is the best SMGs video and this is the best SMG. But uh, yeah, these weapons, in my opinion, kind of speak for themselves. They are essentially the golden standard. The Hemlock is interesting because on its... I, you see, I have many, many copies of the Hemlock because the six perks just keep changing around. Back in the day, I used to have the each shot grants shield, and that was definitely great. Then they added Blast from the Past, and then I swapped all four of my schematics to Snare. Then they added the Shrapnel six perk, and that was kind of cool. And I didn't really go for it, but I did, I did find myself with a copy of one, so I leveled it up because why not? And then I used a Core Reaper to get the landing five hits in a row because that is what makes this weapon interesting. You see, the Hemlock is a very strong weapon. I'm not going to downplay it at all. This is seriously a, a top contender, a heavy swinging weapon, but it is uh, a little bit boosted by that five hits in a row because if you take 70%, divide that by five, I believe it's a 14% damage buff, which in general isn't really much of a bonus. If you're just shooting normal enemies, most of them are dead before that first five shots anyway because, you know, it's the Hemlock. But if you're shooting against a fat enemy or a mist monster or a mini boss or, a, you know, a smasher especially, those are the enemies that are definitely going to take a lot more than five hits. And that 70% bonus damage on top of it essentially gives the Hemlock an all-around 14% damage buff. And on top of that, it'll be hitting the enemies around the target that you're shooting at, which can make it a lot better even yet. And with that bonus, it actually edges out the Thrasher DPS-wise. Now, that's just damage per second. These are just on-paper numbers. But when you're using that five hits in a row, it definitely makes the Hemlock, well, quite a bit better. Now, the Lightning Pistol is uh, inappropriately named Lightning Pistol, seeing as it has now been changed to an SMG. This isn't exactly new news, but what is interesting about this weapon is you'll note the exact same perks it has as my Thrasher and the fact that it has a higher DPS. Now, I don't always call to this DPS number. This is not how I rank my weapons, but when weapons have the exact same perks on them, you can actually use that You can actually use that number fairly consistently. And you'll note that it's uh, just a little bit higher than the Thrasher, and that is not a mistake. The weapon is is stronger than the Thrasher. However, anybody who knows anything about vacuum tube weapons will know that this weapon is locked to nature, and that is why I say that the Thrasher is just better. Technically speaking, if you are going against, you know, neutral physical enemies or water enemies, the Lightning Pistol can be better, but it's throttled by two things. It'll do less damage against nature and fire enemies than the Thrasher would, but it's also, uh, well, shooting energy cells. And I know that that's not exactly fair. Some people don't care. I am one of those people who doesn't care, but it's kind of impossible to to ignore the fact that the lightning pistol is strictly more expensive of a weapon damage wise it can be better than the thrasher but you will be chewing through a ton of energy cells so i've never really hailed this as the best smg in the game but it's definitely not one that you want to forget about not to mention it also has a fancy six perk where you can you know chain to other enemies and that is really cool i love that all of the vacuum tube weapons have this but if you do have this eliminating an enemy causes chain lightning six perk it'll you know have a better you know crowd effect but you will lose that 45 percent damage to afflicted and that will definitely hurt your bottom line damage wise so it can be a very fun weapon I, I really don't want to downplay that at all the monsoon is a weapon i'm going to be a little quick about but it's it's basically a pocket minigun it doesn't really compare well damage per second wise because you have to spin up because it's very much so like a minigun and you can see that i have a fire rate perk on this and this gets to a whopping 23 shots per second that is huge this weapon is really really fun when it gets going it doesn't perform normally enough for me to compare it so i will say that this weapon is on its own a really cool weapon and definitely something where I need to recommend the video down below once again because it's, it's just not a weapon that I have enough time to get into today. Suffice it to say that when you get spun up this weapon is really really powerful and really really fun.
The Papa Bear is a brand new addition, kinda, to this video. So this is a weapon that kinda didn't exist before I made this video. It was added after my previous video, kinda, because I keep saying kinda, because it is, well, essentially a clone of the typewriter. I have very different perks on these because I was screwing around with a double fire rate build, which interestingly enough is technically higher DPS than what's over here. But because it's double fire rate, you're gonna be chewing through all your ammo instantly and it's just never recommended. But my point is it's basically the same as the typewriter the typewriter is a very good ish you know b tier weapon it's nothing exceptional it's not a hugely insanely good weapon or anything it's not a sleeper pick but it is a weapon that you could pull out one day not having used it in a long time and wonder to yourself why does nobody talk about this weapon so i definitely you know if you have the papa bear i have not put this in the collection book for a reason because it's actually kind of good and i definitely enjoy using it sometimes not to mention the typewriter is an exceedingly rare weapon as they just refuse to release it back to the shop so a lot of people have actually used weapons vouchers on the typewriter and while i don't necessarily suggest that i think there are better weapons to spend your vouchers on link to that video down below uh you know the papa bear and the typewriter are definitely good weapons if you're looking to have a little bit of fun the Ratatat. I said we'd talk about it, and here we are. So I have triple crit damage on this because I was screwing around with totally rocking out on stream. Uh, you can tell a lot of these weapons that I don't use often because my perks are still weird, but I mentioned this weapon can be better than the Thrasher. So it is definitely a good weapon. It's a weapon that's been good for a very long time. It, it compares really, really well to some of the top SMGs in the entire game. And the difference is... The difference is this new each shot grants damage or crit rating can be very, very effective. And if you run like a normal, I believe you put a crit rating perk on this and you have that stacking, if I can find it, and if you have that stacking crit rating perk, it can be a lot more damage than the other SMGs, exceeding that 300,000 DPS mark. I mentioned that in the AR video, where I am really not sharing a lot of numbers. I do use a calculator for a lot of my numbers here, and when I compare these weapons, it's not really an opinion, but I just want to say that the, the Thrasher, if I go to an example, is about 244,000 DPS. The Lightning Pistol with the right element is around about 250, 260,000 DPS, and the Silent Spectre, which many of you are probably very familiar with, is around about 230k. Well, the rat attack can get up to 330,000 DPS, which again, if this is just a lot of numbers, this is why I don't share them. That might be confusing to some of you. My point is this weapon can be very, very strong about 15 shots in. So you have to ramp up that damage every single time, which isn't exactly practical. So it's technically capable of being the strongest SMG in the entire game, hands down, but you kind of have to set yourself up for that and it's not going to always be active. It's kind of like how Totally Rocking Out is the highest DPS you can reach, but but you need to actually activate that team perk in order to benefit from that. So it's a tricky, tricky weapon to understand. However, the Ratatat is definitely not to be ignored if you want to get into it. I did forget to mention the Riptide earlier, but it's basically the Thrasher. It has literally the only difference is it's a scavenger weapon and it's slightly cheaper. It has a weirdly higher impact, which is so negligible it's not worth mentioning. And it has a base 30 damage rather than 31. So it's around about 3% weaker than the Thrasher, but a lot more efficient. So if you want the power of the Thrasher, but you're on a little bit of a budget, the Riptide is a perfectly capable weapon. The Silent Spectre does not need much more attention. I think everybody knows that this weapon is a beast. It is essentially everything great about the Thrasher, except that it's a... Oh, it's 7.3% weaker. This DPS number here is to be ignored because crits work a little bit differently on these weapons. However, the Silent Spectre is just a fan favorite for a long time. It was the best SMG for a very long time. It has mathematically been dethroned by the Thrasher, but it is still phenomenal. I pull out the Silent Spectre myself almost every other stream. It's a very fun weapon, and I don't want to downplay it at all. A lot of people were messaging me that they were recycling their Spectre once I made my video on the Thrasher, and I was like, stop it, stop it. This weapon is still amazing. If you have a copy, please keep using it using it, but it's not a new enough weapon for me to waste too much of today's video on. I did make an updated video on the Spectre, so if you want to get all of the news about this weapon since its most recent change, link to that below, of course. The Pepper Sprayer is the new addition to this video, alongside the Trinity, no doubt, and it is really interesting. So damage-wise, since I gave you some numbers earlier, I will mention that if the Thrasher is about 244 DPS, you know, 244,000, the Spectre's around about 230, the Pepper Sprayer is about 187,000. DPS. Now, that is a shockingly lower number. It is strictly weaker. And I'm talking crit rating, double crit damage, affliction bonus, and everything this weapon underperforms. But it has two very big things going for it. First and foremost is the reload speed of 1.5, and the second one is the range. Now, the range is kind of a two-parter, meaning it has the range and the accuracy to be kind of like an assault rifle. Like, it has a really good long-range attack, and having a base 34 mag size on top of that is, you know, a little bit more 
than 30, as you will, and it is really nice. It has that 9.9 .9 base fire rate, and the base stats on this weapon are just insanely good. So you can do a total crit build plus affliction or whatever, slow and snare, whatever you got going on, and you can definitely make this weapon just all damage and not even worry about it. So, yes, its damage is quite a bit lower than the other SMGs, but its range and accuracy makes it a super easy, super fun weapon to use, and with a 1.5 reload speed, you won't be out of the fight for very long. So, this is just a weapon that reminds everybody watching that damage isn't everything. And the Trinity is... <sighs> I am so disappointed in the Trinity. I'm not going to try to hype this weapon up. It has a really interesting way that it runs. So it fires in four round bursts, but in my experience, sometimes it was firing in three round bursts. And it is a good weapon. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to knock it at all. But it has a very hard accuracy to control. It's firing in a burst, and if you move at all, you might not hit all your shots. And I have personally never been able to make the Trinity work, but I can't ignore its existence. It is definitely a fun weapon, and I recommend you trying it out yourself. Don't necessarily take my word for it. If you have a copy of the Trinity and you were one of those lucky few, go ahead, power it up, and give it a go. But you might be disappointed. Now, the Blazer is the weapon that actually delayed the upload of this video because I went to record this and was like, wait a minute, <laughs> I forgot to cover the Blazer and it's uh, well not uh, it's good it's definitely better than people you know give it credit for it's a weapon that often gets forgotten but it's not so good that i'm going to justify using a bunch of energy cells to use it and that's kind of where this weapon rests it's a burst base game technically event vindertech weapon and it's not you know a very rare weapon it's available in the mission alerts constantly i cover them every day on my channel you know subscribe for more but it's uh yeah not exactly it's more of like a b or a c tier weapon it's not anything to be right and home about. Now, the Viper is a weapon that I always feel a little bit bad about because in my original uh, at Best SMGs video, I actually noted that the Thrasher and the Riptide had some serious potential to be the best SMGs in the game, and look at where we are today. The Viper, unfortunately, did not get very similar treatment. It was unchanged with the update that made those weapons so great, and it's good, but it has a really low accuracy, super high fire rate at 13.5, which is faster than most SMGs in the game, but it's kind of a bullet hose. You're going to be shooting a lot of shots doing not that many damage per bullet, and good luck hitting all your shots because the accuracy is also kind of holding it back. And believe it or not, that sums it up for every SMG in the game. I know, I told you, there weren't that many to talk about. But as you can see, with the power of SMGs, I've got six Hemlocks over here, six Pepper Sprayers, five uh, Silent Spectres, and that's not me flexing. That's me saying these weapons are so good, they're worth powering up more than once. I have them for different elements, different six perks. I like to use them in all of the different situations that make them good. I didn't even mention the Pepper Sprayer has that standing in place bonus, which can make it kind of interesting. So the SMGs might be a small group of weapons, Weapons, but they are loud and proud and very diverse so they are very very interesting and among my favorite weapons in the entire game all right guys well recently i talked about the oh dear i am so sorry about the wait let's talk about the best shotguns in the game now this is a video that i've delayed for a while because i wanted to make sure i had like best perks on every single shotgun left to cover frankly i got quite busy on top of that and didn't cover pretty much anything that i i, I thought i would cover frankly like i had the founder z constructor on my list i wanted to cover a couple more that i had missed like the backbreaker maybe the dragons but uh if i skipped any shotguns there's a reason for it and uh Let's get into it now. So just like all the best weapons videos, we are going to be talking about basically all of the best shotguns leading from, you know, just alphabetical just to keep things organized. And I will have links to all of my shotgun videos down in the description below. If you're looking for any individual weapon, it should be down there. And if I haven't covered it, like I said, either there's a reason or maybe you should leave a comment and uh, get me to cover it. Now, the big topic for me personally is the Founder's Deconstructor because this has come up a lot and I just tried it in game actually. And I'm coming to you guys with experience and it sucks. I would not want to cover this weapon unless it was heavily requested, and I can explain that now. Uh, this weapon is a pump-action shotgun shooting 0.9 shots per second, basically once per second, and it's only doing like 126,000 damage. Uh, if you look at something like the Ground Pounder, it's doing like, okay, maybe three-fourths the amount of damage, but it's shooting more than four times faster. And same thing with the Husk Buster. It's doing slightly less damage per shot, but it's semi-automatic shooting three times faster. And um, 
That is not a good recipe for a shotgun. And that actually leads us into our very first weapon, the Backbreaker. Now, I am going to be looking stats a lot here because almost all my shotguns are perked the same, and it's the exact same math. 75,000 damage per shot is very low for a shotgun, uh, at 130, I should say. And I, I do have my shotgun loadout on while I'm recording this, so these numbers are going to be a little inflated, but it's okay. They're all going to be consistent. I'm going to try to keep my loadout on uh, for the rest of the video. But yeah, it's a pretty mediocre weapon. Like, it's the kind of weapon that'll get you through in the early game, but you should never... Never level it up, never perk it up, don't invest into this, and just uh, kind of move on. Now, the Black Drum is a weapon that has honestly always had a soft spot in my heart. In fact, this has been the case long before people even agreed with me, where a lot of people don't like the fact that it hurts you. But if you lean into that and get that 80% bonus damage in that fifth perk slot, that can give you a lot of damage. Like I said, 75k was low, then Beast, why are you going on about a 38,000 shot weapon? Well, it fires two at a time, and it has a really good chance to crit, so that can be a really, really nice uh, punch to pack and it's uh it's actually pretty good when you bring it in game on top of the fact that you might notice i have two schematics they have now added extra six perks to where you can get an extra bonus damage against nature enemies that makes this weapon very very strong against nature enemies if you give it that fire element you can actually get a brand new perk you can roll double crit damage instead of maybe uh you know crit rating crit damage and damage bonus from percent health which means you can have better perks and more damage against nature enemies so if you are going against specifically nature enemies the black drum can be a very very strong pick and while I'm not gonna pretend like it's the best shotgun in the game it's definitely something I always keep in the back of my mind whenever I'm trying to have a little bit of fun now the double boiler might surprise some people but uh this weapon believe it or not is if I'm not mistaken it was a long time ago the strongest weapon in the game per shot that wasn't a rocket launcher let me explain so I'm on Fortnite DV and if you just sort by damage at point blank range this will give you the most base damage in the game obviously the storm king's wrath is not gonna surprise anybody neither is the pot shot but these are single target rocket launchers and you can see that they essentially have a monopoly on this however oh look at that it's our friend the double boiler jack's revenge is close behind and you're gonna see some other fan favorites down here like the, the crossbows for example but the double boiler is the hardest hitting non-rocket launcher weapon in the game that is a really impressive statistic and on a shotgun that is a fantastic combo you're not going to see me use this much on stream and i don't have an excuse for that i think it's just not really suiting to my playstyle. if you use this weapon in game you'll note that it has a weird little bit of a kick it doesn't always seem to do all of that damage maybe the drop off is pretty hard you can see i'm getting an extra hundred thousand damage just for aiming at the head so you definitely want to be hitting headshots but that half a million projected dps is actually only higher when you get the crits involved and the double boiler can be a very very strong weapon i'm not really going to get into it too much further but it's a really nice shot going to know about and if you ever see this in your wild west llamas you might want to consider grabbing it the dragon's might is actually one of the shotguns i'm going to skip the dragon's might and the dragon's roar are both uh basically those chinese new year shotguns where honestly the dragon fire has pretty good stats overall but its range is super limited and the dragon's might is definitely going to be hinging very hard on the gameplay that i'll be showing here you shoot a bunch of fireworks and they explode on the enemies it is a fun weapon i'm not going to pretend like it's useless you can actually use this to some rel relative effect effectiveness in like the highest 160 zones but there are way better options this is a fun weapon it's not meant to be taken seriously uh it's a cool way to pass some time sometimes but i'm not going to recommend this as any serious suggestion now the dragoon i'm actually going to talk about with a couple of other weapons because i covered its best perks alongside the old smoky and the thunderbolt now i don't have a thunderbolt leveled up because it's the exact same as the old smoky and the the dragoon is actually quite bad it's not something i found to be impressive the damage is essentially lying to you it only shoots one one shot meaning like it it consumes two shots per shot and you have to reload after every single shot which is a big deal that was a lot of shots right there but suffice it to say the old smoky is definitely the better of that pairing and it is fantastic for crowd clearing it's only doing about 80,000 per shot which surprises me believe it or not because in game it has a really nice uh widespread impact and it could eliminate an encampment without too much help so believe it or not, this is a weapon I actually quite recommend, and I was impressed because I always had a bad opinion of it, but I was happily proven wrong that this was a pretty usable weapon. Obviously, I already got into the Deconstructor, but I'm going to talk about it a little quicker here because I did record some gameplay while I was testing it out, and it is just doing way too little damage. I know I was in a healing death burst zone, but that really shouldn't matter. It was just not impressing me. I'm just saying that there are weapons like the Ground Pounder and the Husk Buster, which are immediately after this one. You'll see what I mean in a second. Those are semi-auto shotguns that will 
will absolutely decimate whatever is in front of you. And believe it or not, we're going to do a history fact of the day. Did you know that decimation was a method for old Roman military generals to uh, punish their soldiers? If ever they were fleeing from combat or surrendering in any such way that, you know, meant that he needed to punish them, he would decimate them by taking out one-tenth of his crew. And uh, I never really liked that term because now it means like whenever you decimate a crowd, you're only taking away like 10% of it. But nowadays the word hits a lot harder and doesn't actually mean what it used to. Either way, you're going to annihilate the entire crowd. That word means what it should mean. And the ground pounder, and I'm going to talk about the Huskbuster kind of at the same time, because believe it or not, the math on these weapons, when you factor in the reload, is identical. The Huskbuster and the ground pounder are basically the same, in that the Huskbuster hits harder, shoots slower, the ground pounder doesn't hit as hard, and it shoots faster. That is the key difference. Uh, I personally prefer the ground pounder because it, it does plenty of damage to eliminate the small enemies in one shot. If anything, I think the Huskbuster is actually a little too too strong it doesn't actually need to hit that hard and obviously you can see from the gameplay these things are just uh, honestly I said it recently in my ground powder video that it is basically the perfect shotgun in my brain if there is anything you guys want to take away from this video is that I personally I have this perspective of the ground powder being like the shotgun to compare all other shotguns to and that it shoots fast does tons of damage has great range great reload speed high mag size there really isn't a drawback to this weapon and you can see it from the footage it just destroys everything in its path and I love love running this shotgun it is basically my go-to in every normal mission like i said the Huskbuster is just too slow of a fire rate to really suit my personal playstyle, but it's a, a very very heavy hitter on its own and there's nothing to scoff at with the Huskbuster. and uh, you can see i actually prepped three of them to power up but i only ever got through one of them so yeah that is definitely still in the back of my brain i have not recycled these schematics for a reason but the ground pounder is essentially if you were ever looking for the best shotgun that is something that i'd like to draw attention to in this video but there are more down the line that we're definitely going to be getting into now the long arm enforcer and okay let's get into this the long arm enforcer the night claw and the bear are basically the same weapon functionally they are very similar to the founders deconstructor they are all pump action shotguns that do pretty good damage when they shoot and they're not unique enough to really talk about in separate uh, situations here. They're all pretty mediocre. I recommend uh, semi-auto weapons whenever possible. Um, and I'm just not going to really get into it too much. The Maverick sitting between these is actually a very, very strong weapon on its own. It is an interesting playstyle weapon where it doesn't do a ton of damage per shot. But two main things make up for that. One, it fires two shots quick, quick before you have to reload. I think you can control that. So you're only shooting one at a time. But you can personally just spam two shots. And I said that it doesn't do that much damage per shot but it can shoot through targets that pierce is really what makes up the difference if you don't believe me just uh, ask anybody who's ever used a xenon bow because believe it or not the xenon bow is like in the bottom half of damage wise uh, with the bows where it doesn't actually do that much damage per shot but because it can hit so many targets it completely makes up for it you can walk up to a crowd of enemies with a maverick and just shoot once or twice and hit all of them and it's really really fantastic and it's actually the same reason that the pulsar 9000 is so good now the pulsar and the maverick are very different weapons they behave very differently but the Pulsar is a weapon that I'm sure plenty of you have been uh, squinting at my video a little frustrated furrow browed because I keep praising the ground pounder. The Pulsar is definitely nothing to scoff at either. It is, once again, a slower firing, like lesser damage per shot, but it hits so many enemies in one shot that it actually makes up for all of its uh, downfalls there and it, it makes it a very, very effective crowd clearing weapon. And that is something very specific. Like the ground pounder can annihilate a smasher, but the Pulsar is going to make much quicker work of an entire encampment and both of these weapons are situational both of them are to be used in their specific situations where they are going to be better than one another the pulsar is a little bit nerfed by the fact that it actually uses energy cells and i know that some people don't care about that some people are rich and if that's you then great i am personally one of those people who could use this weapon to my heart's content but even i acknowledge the fact that it is expensive and the energy cells are something i'd rather save for like the deatomizer or the storm king's wrath assuming somebody might need a storm king run or something and the pulsar however is still a shotgun that is as absolutely a force to be reckoned with. Now, I should have mentioned the pop shot sooner, but take everything I said about the ground powder and Huskbuster and just lump it in with the pop shot and the stampede for that matter. I didn't mention this earlier, but the stampede is actually a complete uh, scavenger, like normal version of the Huskbuster. The Huskbuster is a scavenger version of the stampede. So you can actually throw in the stampede and the pop shot in with everything I said about the Huskbuster and the ground powder. All of these are semi-auto shotguns that are very, very strong. 
Now, believe it or not, the Room Sweeper is actually the highest damage per second divided by reload speed shotgun in the entire game. I know that that was a lot of words, but if you take all the damage you're outputting and you factor in the time you're spending reloading, it's actually the highest DPS. Now, it also has some of the shortest range of all of the other shotguns. It is not going to be doing too much damage to anything outside of spitting distance, and that's fine. It's a very, very fun shotgun. It's going to burn through all of your ammo, but it's definitely a heavy hitter, and uh, it's basically like an SMG but it's firing shotgun shells. Now the Staccato Shadow is a weapon that the stream chat and I have often forgotten was actually a shotgun. It behaves so closely to an assault rifle that that is basically what it is. That's exactly how it plays. It has a really long range. I believe it's actually fully automatic as well so you can just hold down the trigger and it'll pierce everything in front of it. It's not going to do a ton of damage per shot but you have 15 rounds per mag and it is a very very fun weapon. Depending on what six perk you have you can actually make the enemies dance and it actually makes for a really interesting circumstance where you can have that damage dancing enemies, get some bonus damage from that or you can at least stall them because if you're in a situation where the enemies are banging on the walls of your defense you can hit them with something like the staccato shadow and they'll all start dancing to where they won't actually be able to attack the walls it's a really interesting shotgun to use it does a little too little damage per shot for me to use it in the end game but it's definitely something that i've never forgotten about and it's a shotgun i always recommend trying out now, the Stalwart Squire made some splashes when it first came to the game because this weapon hits like a freight train. You might note that you can actually run triple crit damage on this thing. I wouldn't recommend it, but it is possible. And if you put Buckshot Raptor in the lead, in fact, let's even do this just live on video. Let me just put triple crit damage on that. We're up to 530%. Let me just swap out for Metal Team Leader real quick. Go. Oh, actually, no, I got to swap out Buckshot Raptor, put Shrapnel in the support. And let's see just how much damage live on camera this thing can do because I don't personally know but I'm really curious let me get back down to my shotguns here and the stalwart squire can get up to a 680 percent crit damage that is that is ludicrous that is essentially an eight times damage multiplier meaning this thing can hit for pretty much like six seven hundred thousand damage and there are definitely ways to make that even higher i've heard it critting in the millions and that's secondhand knowledge i know that with a full team you can get these numbers a little different than what i've got here but yes this is a very very interesting weapon i wouldn't recommend it it doesn't make it a good shotgun but it definitely has play it also has really good pierce where it's going to be hitting a nice crowd of enemies all at once so if you slap a reload perk on this instead of crit damage which is what i personally recommend you can get a pretty playable weapon just note that this weapon has a very low durability uh, it actually consumes one durability point per shot meaning you're only going to get 300 shots with this thing before it breaks for reference i believe the ground pounder has about 900 so does the, the, the husk buster is a little less because it's scavenger uh, most shotguns are not going to break nearly as quickly as this one will and you're definitely going to feel it all right, now that I've corrected my loadout, let's talk about what is probably my personal favorite shotgun. I know, I've given a lot of praise to the Ground Pounder, but that's just what I think is like the perfect shotgun. The Big Shot is probably one of my favorites right here, because this weapon is unimpressive amounts of damage. It hits about as hard as the, uh, the Ground Pounder, actually, about 90k. However, this brings up a point that I've mentioned multiple times, and that it can hit multiple enemies. And more important than that, it can actually pierce through Shielder Husk's shields, meaning if you get those bubbles of enemies, you can actually just shoot straight through that thing hitting all of them at once and that is a great example of the ground pounder shoots faster and can be a lot more like an smg in that regard but the big shot can pierce so many enemies at a time that it actually makes up for it even though it's doing the same amount of damage and this weapon is awesome it's definitely uh unique in the fact that it's an art deco weapon meaning its six perks are all percent bonus damages to certain elements that's why i have one for every single element here and i'm just trying to match up to all the six perks as well and it actually makes for a very interesting dynamic where you you definitely want to use this in single element missions, four player missions, and it's a, a very, very, very strong weapon, and I highly recommend trying it if you can get one, because uh, you can research these. Our Tech Llamas, believe it or not, as of recording, are actually here today. Uh, these don't come around too often, but I'll, I'll definitely make videos when they do come around, and the Big Shot, if you see it sitting in your Llama, is definitely worth grabbing and giving a try. Oh, the Browbeater. What an interesting one. It's the Spaz-12 of Save the World, except that it doesn't shoot as fast because it's a pump-action shotgun now, and it hits like a truck. I say that a lot, but uh, 200,000 damage per shot is a lot. However, the fire rate of 0.89 is really slow, and that is kind of the, the limiting factor. So it hits really, really hard, but you're going to be waiting per shot. Now, what a lot of people do is they double pump these. They use two Browbeaters back-to-back, 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 just swapping between them as you play. That doesn't work for me personally. 
personally, seeing as I like to play with the Baron and I like to switch to that hammer so I can run around faster. But if you're somebody who's okay double pumping a shotgun, this is a very fun way to play. In fact, we actually did this in a four player mission. All of us were running Browbeater when I was streaming one time and uh, we didn't exactly have too much trouble in that mission. Now the Tiger Jaw. Oh, such an old favorite of mine. I don't run it anymore for not any good reason. I just haven't thought about it in a long time, but it's a fully automatic AA-12. If you liked, uh, you know, Modern Warfare 2 back in the day, then these, these weapons are definitely going to be bringing back some nostalgia. The Tiger Jaw is a weapon that is just exactly what I said. I mean, it's a lower damage per shot, but it's fully automatic, which makes it really fun to use. I recommend a reload perk on this because while it's nice to have a higher mag size, you're just delaying the inevitable. So to reload fast, get back into the action, it is a really, really interesting shotgun and great for crowd clear. I don't have much else to add because it's not going to bring anything to the table that any of the other shotguns don't already do, but seeing as it's fully automatic, it actually plays a lot more like a close range SMG than anything else. Getting to the last shotguns here, but definitely not the least, the vacuum tube shotgun. I'm going to get it out of the way right away. Yes, it uses energy cells, but that aside, this weapon is really quite strong. It shoots in three round bursts and you can have that chain lightning strike. Now, I don't know if that makes it better or worse because that extra percent damage to affliction or slowed and snared can be nice, but chaining the lightning around to all the different enemies around the one that you just killed can actually be a really effective way to eliminate a whole crowd of zombies all at once and it makes for a very fun shotgun to use. I really enjoy pulling this one out. I don't use it all that often like I said because I guess I just need more shotgun diversity but yeah this is definitely a fun one to pull out if you guys haven't tried it in a while. And the Woofer, I don't have leveled up because it's essentially a budget Pulsar. I think I covered this in its video and the Pulsar video and that damage, fire rate, mag size, in every single way that the Woofer can be improved, the Pulsar does so. This is going to look a little tricky because all my perks are blue, but it basically says what I'm trying to say here and that it does more damage, more headshot, more, I mean, that's the same thing, but more crit chance. Again, that would be fixed with perks, so you can ignore that. But the Woofer has, I guess, a little bit of higher fire rate, but that's not really saving it. That mag size doesn't really get better. I mean, having that much more is is nice obviously the pulsar is shooting more shots per shot but that's essentially still five instead of four in every single way that the woofer could be improved the pulsar steps into its place so i kind of just look at it as a budget pulsar now down here we do have a few of just repeats but i do want to point out that the helium shotgun is lurking down here now just like in the smg video i believe it was the smg or the ar maybe both i am going to leave a couple of shotguns uncovered i've already mentioned several of them but the helium shotgun is one that got a very sizable damage damage buff after the rework. I've never known this to be a very strong weapon, meaning it's, you know, it used to not do that much damage. Now it does, but it shoots a projectile that is slow firing and makes it a little harder to control. So this weapon might be very strong. However, I cannot personally recommend it as I have uh, personally left that stone unturned. So if there's anything to know there, comment down below and uh, maybe I'll cover it in the future. If I do, that link will be down in the description below. Now we still have a couple of follow-up shotguns, seeing as I personally, apparently, don't have everything powered up, but I wanted to bring up the brush off, because this is very similar to the uh, the big shot that I mentioned earlier, but it honestly performs closer to the Foundry's Deconstructor than anything else. It doesn't have that crowd piercing, so you are slow firing, pump action, shooting one enemy at a time. It does a ton of damage, but honestly that holds it back too much to make it uh, something that I would want to use. And the two-step. I don't have a legendary copy to flex here, but it is actually a surprisingly good weapon. It fires two shots at a time hence the name the two-step and uh, I'll, I'll leave that video down below if you guys want to see some gameplay but it's actually a really strong shotgun that I highly recommend I don't have my own copy just because I guess I never wanted to spend any flux on it but I definitely recommend giving it a go if you have a schematic and then the Vader Tech Disintegrator is very similar to the helium shotgun just a slow firing projectile I was never terribly impressed but I did do a video on it link to that video down below of course one last note I want to make is a weapon that I've only ever encountered once when I was using it in ventures and that is the pummeler. While I've never covered this weapon in its own video, I do want to add that this is another stone I've left unturned. I did have a very good experience with this weapon where it was actually doing quite a good amount of damage, but it is a pump action shotgun which could potentially hold it back. Once again, I just want to add that I don't totally know about this weapon, but it could be pretty good. All right, we're going to be switching gears with the best weapons series. So I've remade the SMGs, the ARs, and the shotguns now, and I say switching gears because generally I'd hold a vote and then go through all the weapons. But honestly, I'm feeling the trap this time so we're just gonna cover this real quick and there are some actual major changes like I honestly don't even remember if the anti-air trap existed in my previous video it probably did but that got changed the gas trap got changed superchargers are a thing the ceiling electric field can be energy now we got some things to talk about so let's get into it uh first and foremost let's just start with the ceiling electric field because that's what's on my screen this is oh man I want to talk about the best ceiling trap but it's kind of a complicated subject uh, I was a little fueled by a video Chetik made a 
long time ago, so this is a bit more of an angsty video. I'm still going to link it down below because I did some good testing and all of that, and it basically came out to prove that the ceiling electric field, the gas trap, and the tire trap are all very balanced ceiling traps. Let me explain. So first and foremost, the ceiling electric field is honestly my default. This is what I use all the time. Now that it can be energy, it actually does a pretty good amount of damage to you know every single type of zombie, no matter what element they are. I do highly recommend running nature on it if you are specifically running water missions because a 130 nature ceiling electric field will actually do more damage to a water zombie than an energy 144 because the, uh, the superchargers only give you about a 15% and the bonus from the correct element is basically a 25%. So even a supercharged 144 energy is going to do 10% less than a 130 nature. That's actually why I have this copy here and I have changed this around depending on the situation but that gets more into like a best perksy kind of video. I just want to talk about the best traps and the gas trap it got changed in two major ways. One, it no longer does affliction. Does it really still show that? Oh my goodness, they haven't updated the text in a long time. Yeah, affliction damage is no longer a thing. It will no longer tick away at the zombie's health over time, and it got a damage nerf. However, this trap is still far from useless because of things like the uh, the floor freeze trap. We'll talk about that later. But the ceiling drop trap, lastly, is very uh, different as well. So it's not going to be doing as much straight up damage as those other traps, but if you can stack it, you know, two, three tiles high, it'll bounce up and down on enemies and deal extra damage over a little bit of time there. It'll also uh, provide a huge impact and knockback where it'll send zombies back down a hill. It'll move them off to the side. It'll stun them where they're standing to slow them down. I use ceiling drop traps to actually beat twine endurance very easily. In fact, we didn't even plan on beating it. It was an accident. And so the ceiling drop traps, ceiling electric field, and ceiling gas trap are all very situational. And if you know where to put them, they are very useful in specific scenarios. Just to top off the ceiling traps, pun intended, the ceiling zapper is very, very good for like eliminating really high level enemies in endurance i don't personally find use for this because i don't run endurance but it is a thing if you want to just pack a huge amount of punch all at once uh, i don't have much use for this in normal missions and if you're not an endurance player i actually can recommend skipping this trap as you will never miss it now i guess just to keep things in order let's move on to the wall traps the broadside is hands down the hardest hitting wall trap in the game uh, you definitely need to have a wall on the other side of it because it needs to have something to bounce against as long as you have that second wall at the maximum two tiles away maybe three if you've got a really big area but uh, a tile one tile away two tiles away having a wall to bounce against the broadside facing each other is even better it will just annihilate pretty much anything if you're ever trying to take out a trap vulnerable mini boss just go up to the mini boss just build a trade box at a broadside and you're going to knock it out very quickly uh, honorable mentions are of course the wall dynamo and wall darts and by honorable mentions i mean the only other two uh <laughs> wall traps in the game they're both very good you can stack these together with half walls to maybe combine their powers that'll do more damage than a broadside but i've never personally loved the wall dynamo or wall dart so again i play lots of 160s without jailing and i've never seriously needed these traps if you're confused about the zapple max that's one of the new things as well it's an exact reskin of the wall dynamo it's basically just the um the starter pack one i think it's available as of recording this but that won't be true in the future that is available with the machinist mina pack and it's basically a reskin of the wall dynamo it's the exact same thing now after recording that bit i did realize that wall spikes exist they are a very different kind of wall trap so they basically reflect damage back against the uh, zombie that's attacking it that's pretty good when paired with like frost king or the the ice king hero where the enemies freeze themselves while they're attacking the wall spikes it's a good trap but again nothing i've ever needed but it can be pretty fun if you know how to use it now let's move on to the non-damaging wall traps which i personally will say are the most interesting traps in the game the sound wall is really really good for i used to just say making propanes drop but in recent tunnels i just started placing these very recently and i found that they were really good at like stunning smashers and you know preventing them from moving forward and just knocking other enemies in place it might have been other traps taking that effect but the main purpose of the sound wall is to make propanes drop so they don't blow up your tunnel it's very very useful and very nice to have so i highly recommend keeping a few of these on board. Uh, wall launchers are probably my most used wall trap on top of broadsides. I'm not even kidding. Wall launchers, this is again just going to be a nice little callback to my trap video. I probably should have plugged this earlier in the video, linked below to that of course, where I show how to use some of these traps to the most effectiveness and wall launchers are very good for sending enemies back through the tunnels you've already built or off the side of the map or into a death pit and can be very, very effective. I probably use wall launchers in every single mission.
while lights are in my opinion kind of like a budget floor freeze and i say budget because i don't actually know how much they cost but it's less effective in one regard and that floor freeze can freeze an enemy in place just like the wall lights but they also take more damage from floor freeze that doesn't happen with a wall light so wall lights can be really nice to put at like the edge of a cliff or anywhere where you have floor traps that are doing something else other than you know being able to place a floor freeze so that can be nice in certain situations but once i've uh, kind of turned myself on to the floor freeze traps i I have completely stopped using wall lights even though they are very effective for stunning enemies in place i also show effective ways to use them in my trap video down below all right we're done with ceiling traps and wall traps i mentioned this was going to be kind of a quick video didn't i well we haven't got to the floor traps yet right now i want to talk about the flame girl trap just recycle it it's useless but the cozy campfire and the healing pads are very very useful i actually use some supercharged healing pads somebody gave me these a long time ago and i'm still working through the one stack uh this gives you about 400,000 health and a full party of people who are like capable of beating the storm king so maybe you can scale that number down to like maybe whatever your power level is but healing pads are quite expensive but are very very useful at healing you instantly i prefer campfires and normal missions they are extremely cheap to craft placing a couple of these at once are a great way to heal you over time you cannot heal from more than two of these at a time unfortunately you used to be able to spam like 16 of these and you'd essentially be invincible uh, that is not how these function anymore but they are great if you're just trying to heal yourself and your teammates i believe this also affects defenders so if your defenders are taking a lot of heat uh throw down a cozy campfire however if they are taking heat it's probably because you didn't use enough anti-air traps this this is one of the traps that definitely got an upgrade because what used to happen and this is why i have my purple one leveled up is that traps were cheaper when you crafted them at a lower rarity uh which is uh, not the case anymore in fact that's why i always use blue floor spikes because it was just one duct tape instead of two and i preferred that and i never recommended using anything higher than blue because you don't need the damage and i still use my blue uh, floor spikes for that exact same reason however uh, it is no longer more expensive to craft a gold one and that is the exact same with the uh the, the anti-air trap and every other trap in the entire game and that is one of the major changes for this video and i'm kind of glad that it happened somewhat recently because i would have recorded this video weeks ago and then i would have had to like pin a comment speaking of which if anything changes in the future check the pin comment down below that's usually where i put any updates so yeah anti-air trap you can absolutely make it legendary now and it's a very 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 good trap it can hit the uh, lobber zombies then do some damage to those it'll take out the lobber projectiles and can be really really nice against pitchers it'll take out a throne propane it'll no longer affect uh, exploding death bombs when they drop on the ground and propanes no longer drop their propane so a couple of minor tweaks since my last video but anti-air traps are still something you want to use in every single mission now, I already mentioned the floor freeze, I think, fairly well, but this is a very, very good trap. I would say, in terms of, like, giving cadence to the, to the support traps of the game, this might be, in my opinion, the best trap in the game, simply because it's kind of a caveat. Like, no, it's not technically doing any damage, unless a wall launcher hits a zombie that's frozen, that's a current bug, but it actually makes all of your other traps stronger. Everything just... D just does 20% more damage, which is really, really nice to have. And I put these on the floors of pretty much every single trap tunnel because of that. And it is a, a fantastic pick for the late game. Now, the tar pit, while being very similar to the floor freeze, uh, it serves a very, very different purpose. The tar pit is really good at trapping zombies in a single spot. This will stop a smasher mid charge. Uh, so will a floor freeze technically, but if a smasher gets frozen by a floor freeze, it'll just continue running afterwards. That's not what you want. Tar pit will completely cancel that charge and essentially reset the smasher, which is very, very effective this also affects mini bosses so i always put my tar pits at the end of a tunnel you don't want to put these all throughout a tunnel it'll work but the durability goes down with every single zombie that's get, that gets stuck on it that's why i have all five durability perks on it and then i'm only getting to 74 now i think i have survivor squads that'll kick in if i uh, queue into a mission but it's still not going to be enough to last the entire mission so you want to use these sparingly as kind of a last resort to stop smashers and mini bosses and in those cases tar pits are very very nice so if you're ever getting overrun by smashers have somebody throw down some tar pits and you'll be very very happy you did now a couple of the final traps that i just sort of want to go over are honestly like retractable floor spikes don't do enough damage to be viable in my opinion floor launchers are redundant i have never found a situation where floor launchers are doing something that a wall launcher can't but these can be useful so if you know how to use them they are a thing but they don't really throw smashers super high into the air anymore so that's not really a thing i can count on them for so 
I've just not really, you know, these 106 floor launchers have always been me saying, okay, if these ever become useful, I'll make them 130. And like I said, I'd run a lot of high-end missions without any uh, any any jailing, and I, I've just never needed these. And uh, let's actually talk about the fun traps down here. I don't ever bring these up, uh, but I should have in my previous, previous video. Boost pads are super fun. They're not really for anything serious. Player jump pads can get you up really high, which is nice. I just jump on cones. It's not a big deal. What I want to talk about is the low-key best mobile in the entire game of save the world if you place the directional jump pads properly you can get across the entire map with like four or five of these i use these in encampment missions when we need to get around fast and especially in ventures when you don't have a baron these can get you going very very quickly essentially what happens is if you just launch yourself you go a certain distance if you launch yourself again it boosts it i think by a percent on top of itself and it compounds so you can go further and further with every single jump if you can time it right and a nice little trick to go a little bit further is to jump just as you step onto this thing and then get lunged by it you go a little bit further but i think it's a little tricky to do that it's just a thing that you can do and it's uh very very effective not to mention these things are two nuts and bolts in one plank a piece so i almost always just have a stack of these on me they are extremely cheap and uh, you want to spam them around as much as possible if you're going across the entire map like in the uh, encampments mission i mentioned uh you'll actually be able to use lots of those more than once and of course your teammates can use them as well which makes everybody faster and makes the whole mission a lot easier but that's it. I'm surprised that such a such a pivotal part of the game is such a short video, but those are the best traps in Save the World. I would love to see some more traps added to the game. If I was ever going to want to remake a video, it would be because they added more traps, but there's nothing left to talk about, you guys. I covered them all. So traps are a huge, important part of the game. Link to my video down below, again, on how to use traps to their most effectiveness. If you guys enjoyed this video and you guys want to see more, feel free to subscribe. Use code MISTA at your checkout. It definitely helps support me and continue making these. Follow my Twitch link in the description below. You can, get, you can hang out with me on there. Thank you guys so much for watching and uh, have a nice day. Today we're going to be talking about the best pistols in Save the World. The new best pistols in Save the World. And I'm honestly surprised that I'm even making this video because I wasn't 100% sure if I was going to remake this entire series, but some things have changed. I'm older, I'm wiser, so I'm thinking, you know what? Let's get into it. As always, all the other videos will be linked in the description below. Uh, I don't know if I'll link this old pistol video. I'm not unlisting it, but this will definitely be the uh, newer updated version, even though all the recommendations in the old video are perfectly fine I think but let's still talk about some of the things that I have I've learned since then but I am going to be recovering all the pistols just for a refresher now the Storm King's onslaught as our number one uh, topic of discussion here honestly when it comes to mythic weapons a lot of people rank the pistol as one of the lowest but it really shouldn't be like it's actually really really strong has one of the highest I think it's the highest base crit chance in the entire game for ranged weapons it is a base 25% so I'm not even using a pistol loadout right now and you can see them critting 50 53% of the time uh, at 345% at 345 damage. In fact, I can go to my loadout right now and see that I am actually just running my shotgun loadout from my, my previous shotgun video. Uh, that was a couple of videos now if you're recording this. I'm recording more of these uh, at, at a time, which is great. I'm glad that I'm finally pumping these out. I don't want any more one month long breaks in between these, but the Storm King's Onslaught, I think everybody should know is fantastic. I'm currently running a crit build on this, but it does go straight for the head, so you might be able to do double headshot. This is not a best perk, so what I'm saying is this weapon is fantastic. Now, the Bald Eagle is a fun one actually because to those of you who don't know Magist uh it was in my stream the other day and he is a basically a, an epic employee who is a community manager for save the world he's very active in the subreddits I show his uh his reddit all the time because he gives us nice little updates and and uh, little teasers for what's coming out soon and when he was in stream I asked him what his favorite build was and he admitted to using ranger deadeye with bald eagle as with the headshot eliminations cause an explosion so this is an epic employee favorite weapon and uh I honestly agree it's really 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 fun you can see my headshot is going all the way up to nearly a quarter million and if you are using this thing like dual wield especially if you're good at hitting headshots it is a very very fun weapon to use it does hurt a little bit with the range drop off but honestly this is a legitimately strong weapon which is a great way to uh have a break from the norm and that's kind of a theme with all the pistols in the game none of these are seriously good primaries for the most part like the storm king's onslaught is a primary you could use the founder's revolt over most smgs and actually still do really well as a teammate but for the most part a lot of these weapons fall short of that because it's a pistol. I don't blame Epic for making these weapons underpowered. I think it's just the nature of pistols. Imagine every game you've ever played, namely Call of Duty and even like CSGO. Pistols are just pistols. They are sidearms and that's exactly what they are. But there are weapons like the Bolt Bolt, which have a really good pierce, can hit multiple enemies at once. And with the recent buffs to affliction damage, hoping that continues on to the future, it can do a lot of damage to a lot of enemies and actually be really, really effective. Now the Bolt Bolt fails horribly against single target enemies, but like a Smasher, for example, but against a crowd, 
out, it's surprisingly strong, and I highly recommend it. Continuing on with the pierce, the Coco 45 and the Ghost Pistol are two different weapons, but they both pierce enemies and are really, really effective. I'm not going to get too far into the Coco because it, it plays very similarly to the Bolt Bolt. Just know that it bounces around a lot, and that Marshmallow can be really fun to hang around with. And the Ghost Pistol has gotten a, a massive damage buff since I've last covered it, but uh, I did do a Best Perks on it, which is a much more updated video. I'll link that down below, along with all the pistols that I've covered on my channel. If there are any Best Perks that I haven't covered and you guys want to see them, comment in the description below, lol. Just comment down below and I, I will I'll try to get to some of those But there are some weapons that I'm, I'm not going to be covering uh, too thoroughly like the vendor tech blaster Which is a weapon that I'll get to later, but I haven't extensively tested this and it could be very very strong I know I've gotten some requests for that one now the ginger blaster is one of those pistols that could actually be a primary It does really really good offensive damage. Uh, it can drop gumdrops so you can heal as long as you go It has a really good chance to crit great headshot multiplier I think it's double and it's a very strong weapon overall, but it's limited to physical and that alone makes this weapon really tough to use in the end game because once you get against an elemental enemy, you're kind of screwed. The Haywire Storm is honestly <laughs> not a weapon I've covered and not a weapon I really intend to cover alone. In fact, it's so similar to like the Jackal and some other weapons that are like fast firing pistols like that, that I probably will cover a couple of those in one video at some point, but it was surprisingly strong. Like even blue perks, you can see that it's doing 10,000 damage, uh, you know, 70k DPS. With those crits, it's actually doing pretty well. Like it's, it's actually not that bad. So I will say that this weapon is potentially good but I, I can't seriously speak to it. Again, with the Pierce, that's very necessary for pistols because they're single-shot weapons. The Hot Mix performs much closer to an SMG than anything else. Uh, it doesn't actually shoot fully automatic necessarily. It fires like two shots at a time, and I think you can hold down the trigger, I'm not even sure, but it'll pierce tons of enemies and actually be very, very strong. So this is a great weapon to use a crit build on just because of the fact that it shoots two shots at a time, and it's actually very strong, and once you get some enemies dancing, I think you'll enjoy it quite a bit. The Jack's Revenge is notably one of the strongest weapons in the entire game. I'm running mine double headshot with physical just so we can get a whopping 845,000 headshot damage. In fact, if I just go up to my hero loadout real quick and put on a pistol loadout, link to this in the description below because you guys might be interested in a nice pistol loadout. Uh, I guess I don't need Beetle Jest. Let's actually put on uh, Calamity and Support. I would put Calamity and Support, but she's in an expedition, so I might be not able to fill out my point here. But what I like to always show with the, the Jack's Revenge is that Headshot can get over a million, and yep, that is a sufficient amount of hero bonuses. It physically can't show the amount of digits necessary to convey just how much damage the Jack's Revenge is doing. Now, this is a victim of damage drop-off as well. You do need to be fairly close to your enemy, but a guaranteed million damage uh, is going to get my vote anytime, because those of you who have watched me play know that I keep a couple of deagles on hand at all times just for target practice. I like to hit my headshots, and uh, the Jack's Revenge is a fantastic weapon for that. You do need to reload after every single shot, but it is is, if I'm not mistaken, just under the double boiler as the hardest hitting single shot weapon in the game that's not a rocket launcher, and it actually trades blows with the Storm King's Wrath if you can get some crits going. So it's a very, very strong weapon. Krypton Pistol is more of a meme in our community. I was pressured, I was peer pressured into making a video on this, and it was honestly not as bad as I expected, but this is what I would consider to be a very average pistol, and I'm not going to be spending too much time in it than that. I am sorry, J Prime. Your movement was successful. I got my video done, but I'm not not going to lie to the viewers, this is a very average weapon, and considering that it uses energy cells, I could never recommend using it, because when you got the Haywire Storm doing just about the same amount of damage, and I haven't even maxed out the perks, and it's shooting a little faster, and it's not using energy cells, I mean, what can I say? Alright, the last word is actually one of my favorite weapons in the entire game. You might not know this, I don't use it enough, but because, like I said, I'm a fairly accurate player, I used to play a lot of Battle Royale and Call of Duty in my day, so if you can hit headshots, this is a very, very strong weapon. You can fire it very quickly semi-auto if you're hip firing and then if you aim down the sights it's accurate but you're not going to shoot as fast if you can hit headshots that's a very key thing here because you'll double your damage by hitting them it is a very 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 fun weapon to use and i highly recommend it if you're looking to feel that old timey now if you don't have calamity in an expedition like i do uh she's your perfect lead because six shots and calamity buffs your first six shots it's a match made in heaven and it is a very very fun way to play
The Plasmatron is a weapon that, if you're watching in the future, I would not be surprised if they move this to the SMG section, because that's essentially what it is. This is a fully auto, high fire, well, high for, you know, what it is, but higher fire rate SMG pistol. It's technically a pistol, but this weapon performs 100% like a close range SMG. It has a really decent crit chance at 43%, it's hitting pretty well, uh, a crit damage of 210%, and it can also pierce enemies. On top of that, crit hits causing 7 exploding projectiles, 6 perk, very, very good. You can get multiple six perks on this with the creating with the expanding ring of damage that actually does more damage nowadays than it used to uh upping your crit rating can be nice but again this isn't a best perks video i'm just saying there are lots of ways to make this weapon even better than it already is and it's a top contender as it stands now, the Paper Shredder is more of a meme weapon. I'm going to cover it and the Tiny Instrument in very similar ways. In fact, these two and the Freedom's Herald, which is down here, are both are all three weapons that shoot a projectile that explodes on the target. Uh, you can guide the Tiny Instrument to death. I don't even know about the Freedom's Herald, and you can't guide the Paper Shredder. So, they're very silly, meme -y weapons. Uh, I'm probably showing some gameplay now, but the videos on all three of these will, of course, be linked down below. They're very silly, very fun, surprisingly good damage. Like, you might not actually be useless in your mission, but but I'd recommend a more serious pick if you're actually trying in your mission. Now, the blaster, I said we come back around to it, and we have. Again, this is a weapon that probably needs its own video. This might be a teaser for the future, something to subscribe for if you're looking forward to it. It is a weapon that got a really sizable damage bonus. Now, I know I haven't shown this the entire video, but there hasn't been much to show, because you can see that the pistols in the 12.0 update, which happened before my best pistols, or after my best pistols video, so this is new information in terms of this video, uh, most of the pistols didn't really get touched much like the highest up here is like the crypto got a 42 percent which wasn't enough the coco got a 30 percent and then pretty much everything was like slightly tweaked but the Vindertech Blaster got its damage almost doubled, and that is huge and significant. So this weapon is definitely a contender to be better than I know, but I can't really speak to it because I uh, don't have the experience. Now, the Whisper 45 is what I've always considered to be like the basic pistol. This thing is essentially the Silent Spectre in pistol form. It shoots, you know, slower, has the same crit chance. It has less damage. I think it actually does about the same damage per shot, but it's not fully automatic. So this is actually a really, really good pistol. If you're ever looking to just have a normal pistol to use, this is what I'd recommend. You can research it from the military section and it's very very strong and i don't really have much else to say it's a tap firing you know uh, semi-auto weapon that does a good amount of damage now the zap zap is one of those weapons that i can actually speak about because i had never played with it before recording my best pistols video last time and nowadays i could tell you it's fun it's not that serious you can do a good amount of damage you know 69,000 damage nice and it can explode on a lot of targets all at once i was surprised by how not terrible it was and then i looked at the amount of energy cells i was using and uh, kind of choked on my spit for a second in there so it's uh it's a very fun weapon i know that uh some people really like it but i can't really recommend it as a serious pick even though it's better than i might say uh, than i might be suggesting here now the founders vault is probably up there with the storm king's onslaught for the best pistol in the game mine is bright court don't ask i regret it immediately and i can't change it so epic please allow me to change this at some point i can't put it in the collection book because you can't put founders weapons in there and yeah so i'm kind of just stuck but this is a weapon i've seen a lot of people supercharge and i actually recommend it it's it's a really strong weapon bullets chaining gives you a lot of uh, group effect damage and you can get a damage perk where the mag size used to be as you can see i haven't touched my copy in a long time but it's a very strong weapon and really good for group damage like look at this i got a 35 mag size i know i got a mag perk on it but like 1.6 reloads not that bad and 35 is a lot i can shoot for a long time hitting tons of targets dozens of targets even with that amount of mag size and chaining to the multiple targets is really really effective and uh yeah it's a really good pistol that's capable of being a primary and uh it's definitely mentioned like last year in my leveled up copy Copies, but it's certainly not least now we do have some uh, secondary picks usually if I don't have something powered up there's a reason for that basilisk is a pretty good fire rate like decent damage pistol I was impressed when I covered it but it's not you know fast enough firing it doesn't have enough group damage to really be super viable and that's kind of where it's it's at dragon's breath I don't actually know that much about I it's my understanding that most dragon weapons are pretty bad so I've kind of just left it alone the judge I've also not touched much but I know that it's very similar to the bald eagle up above so if you know anything about the bald eagle if i can find it i actually know the falcon and the judge are probably more similar i apologize for the confusion there but both of these weapons are very similar but different in like different ways again they're both kind of mediocre
Joker pistols to my understanding. If I'm wrong, I'll definitely cover these in a future video and uh, update that information. Those will all be linked below if I ever make any new videos, so you guys can check it out down in the description. Mouthpiece and turncoat, and I don't have the Cyclops, but it might be purple. No, so the Cyclops is another pistol from the spy weapon set. So the Cyclops and turncoat are both spy weapons, and then the mouthpiece exists. All of these pistols were rather underwhelming. The mouthpiece is interesting because it has those uh, Art Deco 6 perks where you can have that extra elemental damage, and apparently five hits in a row can cause an explosion. I did not even know that this pistol had that. I doubt that it's going to save it, so extra area of effect damage is nice, so that small explosion could help, but I wasn't terribly impressed, and maybe you'll maybe you'll have a different experience, but I wouldn't super recommend it. Along with the turncoat and the cyclops, in fact, I uploaded both of those videos the exact same minute because I was so done with the spy weapons, I had just covered every other weapon in the set, and uh, those were last for a reason, so I don't super recommend those, unfortunately. Now, the vacuum tube revolver is definitely one of the reasons that I'm making this video at all because of the chain lightning. I know I don't have my copy leveled up. I haven't actually used it a ton, but I have been given a copy uh, and I have tried it on stream. It's actually really good. Like I said, group damage is the main reason that a lot of pistols fall short. So if you can get the six perk where eliminating an enemy gives you a chain lightning strike, that can be really, really effective at crowd clearing and make this a very viable weapon. Even though it's energy cells, it's still worth it and I highly recommend giving it a go. Now, like I mentioned, the Jackal, or I guess the Founder's Vendetta, is technically like the Founder's version of the Jackal and the Burster. I'm going to be skipping all these weapons because I don't have much to say. And then, obviously, the Vigilante is the best pistol in the entire game. I've kind of just sort of saved it for last. I didn't want to just steal the show with everything else. But if you haven't used the Vigilante, then honestly, there's not really any reason to run any other weapon in the game. This is the best weapon in the entire game. They don't even allow you to supercharge it because it's already too overpowered. So the first time I made the best Rockets video, I made like a 15, 16 second intro where I said that the Wrath was the only thing worth using. Well, things have definitely changed a little bit since then, haven't they? We have a couple of new additions to the team. The Shark Attack actually came in uh, into the game shortly after I posted the original Best Rockets video. The Pot Shot is uh, apparently the new Kingpin, according to some people. I'll clarify that very soon here. And we also have a brand new addition with the Sod Buster. Now that, that is a rocket worth talking about, and of course we're going to get into all of that in today's video. But for First and foremost, I actually want to pull up the list of the different changes that happened since my previous video. And you can see here that a couple of changes have been made. The Easter Egg Launcher is just stupendously stronger. They more than doubled its damage alongside the Thumper and the Snowball Launcher. So yes, all three of these uh, grenade launcher style weapons are quite a bit stronger now. And the Jackal Launcher has gone ahead and moved up the ladder. So as the Vacuum Tube Launcher and the Cannonade has uh, always been good, honestly, but it is now very, very good. Other than that, the Quad Launcher, Noble Launcher, these are nice changes, but the Noble launcher will never be worth using so long as it costs as much as it does and most of the other rockets that were already very strong stayed relatively the same but this does change things around a little bit to where the bazooka is now actually not as strong as the jackal launcher so a couple of things have been changed around and uh, that is definitely something I would like to bring up before we get into things so as per usual we're gonna start from the very top here and work our way down now I'm actually gonna break that rule immediately by covering the Easter egg launcher the snowball launcher and the Thumper all at the same time because they behave so similarly that I can't really find a way to talk about them differently. All of them got that damage buff that I mentioned earlier, but there are a couple of unique situations. So first and foremost, the Snowball Launcher is locked to water, so it's only going to be more effective against like fire enemies, and it's going to be pretty normal against water enemies, just like an energy weapon would be, but it has a special six perk where it does extra damage against fire enemies, and it can freeze enemies in place. Both of those will definitely change your experience, and both of those make this weapon a very unique one. I'll other than the extra damage to elemental enemies, that is a new six perk since my previous video, and uh, we'll be getting into that with a sod buster later. But the thumper is definitely more middle of the road than all of these. It's you can be any element. It's the same perks that we can come to expect: stunning or knocking back can deal extra damage. It's very, very run of the mill. I'm going to have best perks on all of these weapons linked down below. You can check the description to go into further detail on any of these. But the Easter egg launcher is the final one that's different because it can have any element, but it also shoots a projectile that sticks to the ground like a landmine that can be really tricky you sort of have to direct impact an enemy for it to explode right away and it definitely changes how this weapon plays not a ton of people might prefer that but it is a little bit different than the others but the damage kind of makes up for it so i recommend uh, looking into that if you're curious 
Moving on to the shark attack, this is more of a gimmicky weapon. We're not going to spend too much time on it because it's not a serious game changer. It is a very run-of-the-mill average launcher. It bounces around with a projectile that makes it kind of tough to control. I never personally took to this weapon and it doesn't do enough damage to justify learning, so I'm not really going to say too much about it. It's not really a top contender. Right off the bat, right from the very beginning of the video, we are going to be talking about the pot shot. Now, the pot shot made a wave in the community because of a couple of things. First and foremost, it does a ton of damage to an individual target, and it also explodes in a proximity, meaning it's going to explode based on the first enemy that gets in range of its projectile. That can make it really tricky to use, especially if you're like new to this weapon and you didn't know that already. It can be very, very confusing, and some might even confuse this weapon for being bad when it is in fact very much so not. It's not going to be a fantastic crowd clearer unless you're literally standing in the middle of a crowd, but what it excels at is hitting an individual target. And that second thing I was going to mention earlier is the fact that not only does it do a ton of damage, but it essentially does twice as much as the sheet DPS says it's going to do. If your weapon information on the left hand side says that it's going to be doing a quarter million damage, it's probably going to hit for half a million. I don't know if this is a bug in the displayed information that we have available to us or in the main game itself. I don't know what's going on it's kind of the same situation as a deatomizer where it says it's doing 46,000 damage for me but it's pretty much always doing more than that and i'm not just counting crits so i'm not 100 percent sure what's up with the pot shot but it hits like a freaking truck and it is essentially the go-to for eliminating mini bosses it is fantastic at that job now of course it's video link down below will go across all the different perks i'm running triple damage reload on this crit builds are good too mine is physical for the mythic storm king fight because those mini bosses don't have elements but depending on how you're using this weapon it could be extraordinarily strong especially if you want to go ahead and give it an affliction perk this is not a best perks video but these new perks do change things standing in place granting damage is a thing that can happen and uh, all of these different things do change how these launchers perform in the real world now the storm king's wrath doesn't need much of an introduction but if you're watching this video as somebody who doesn't know anything just know that it's kind of the kingpin it's the only thing that's hitting harder than the pot shot according to fortnite db where the base damage on the pot shot is just below the storm king's wrath and the Storm King's Wrath is going to be taking a lot of energy cells. So depending on the cost, you might prefer one or the other. But what the Pot Shot cannot do is charge up to full and hit multiple targets all at once. The Storm King's Wrath is definitely, definitely a powerhouse. It is nothing to scoff at. In fact, that's why I said in my original video that it was the only thing worth using. Uh, but I'm going to go back on that a little bit and mention that there are weapons like the Deatomizer. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. We're going to go back to the Bazooka, but the Deatomizer is a fantastic crowd clearer. It's not going to be doing too much damage to one individual target unless you can get a lot of those projectiles in one space, but it is going to eliminate crowds of enemies extremely comfortably, and it is a very, very good weapon for group damage rather than individual targets. And that's where launchers get a little tricky depending on what you're trying to do. I'm going to cover the Bazooka and the Jackal Launcher and the Santa's Little Helper kind of all at once. Hell, we can even throw in the Metal Marauder in there because all of these launchers are essentially just shoot an exploding grenade and then it explodes on the enemies. The only difference is, is that the Jackal Launcher is locked to fire unless you have one of those modded copies that traders like to scam you out of. Those aren't really that worth it in my opinion. Uh, the Metal Marauder is not locked to fire. You can have, you know, physical as well, but if you do give it the fire element, it can have that extra damage versus nature enemies. So if you're in in specifically a nature zone, the Metal Marauder is going to do a lot more than the Jackal Launcher. The Jackal Launcher does also have Affliction, which is one of the best six perks in the entire game right now, and it also has that damage to nature. So it can be a little bit better. Both of these are going to be much stronger than the Bazooka, but I've always liked the Bazooka because of its accessibility, meaning it is just a regular base game schematic that you can get from any normal Llama or Legendary Cache. It can have all the different elements and lots of variability in the perks, and of course it can have that Affliction damage. So uh, Bazooka is, you know, it's the basic launcher. It'll get you started, but definitely something you want to replace as soon as possible with for example, the Santa's Little Helper. It is essentially a direct upgrade to the Bazooka in every single way. If it reloads a little slower or is a little more clunky, it's because it's doing way more damage, and that's why I always ran it physical, because it just did so much damage that it didn't even matter. So the Santa's Little Helper is uh, essentially a direct upgrade from the Bazooka, but the Metal Marauder does technically do more than the Santa's Little Helper, but different elemental matchups can change that. Now, what is very similar to these weapons that I just mentioned that's not quite the same is the Dam Buster. Now, 
I'm not going to get too far into it, but the difference is the Dam Buster has an insane knockback and is essentially just used for moving smashers to where they don't want to be. And uh, that is what the Dam Buster is fantastic for. However, there is something that's a little bit better, and that brings me to the Sod Buster. The Sod Buster is exactly why I've been bringing up six perks this entire time. It is very, very specific to which element you've got working with here. So, uh, for example, if you want to do extra damage to nature enemies, you're going to have a fire copy, and it depends on the element of the mission. Like, if you're running a water mission, you might want to pull out a nature sod buster with extra damage to water enemies, and with that elemental matchup, if you are shooting against the correct elemental enemies, the sod buster is one of the best rockets in the entire game. And I brought it up with the dam buster because if you put quadruple impact on this thing, it's my understanding that it actually has a higher impact than the dam buster. So, it is a very multifaceted weapon that can be used for lots of different things. The catch is you essentially do need three copies of it if you want to use it for every situation because there is no energy option here and if you do like damage to nature and you try to mix it up with like bonus damage to fire or something it's not going to work out it's not the same as energy so if you are going to go all in on the on the sod buster you do need three copies of these i can actually give you some good news though because when the sod buster first came out it was in this art deco section of the collection book where you had to spend a weapon voucher to get it out and while you do still need to spend v bucks on the llamas you can actually research these weapons completely normally using flux and weapon designs just like a normal weapon so it's kind of nice that we have an event weapon that's not locked behind usual event means so the sod buster is surprisingly accessible for anybody who wants to give it a try now let's get into some of the more fun weapons like the bowler the bowler and the jabberwocky are way too similar for me to not cover them together they both essentially shoot projectiles that bounce around and kill enemies the jabberwocky is more so of a weapon that explodes into multiple other projectiles dealing tons of damage and the jabberwocky is an interesting one because i'm going to actually bring up the uh, rocket launcher tier list again because it actually makes a little bit of sense for what i'm about to say the jabberwocky has a base 624 damage and the santa's little helper has a base 625 so technically speaking the jabberwocky is just slightly less damage per projectile than the senna's little helper but that projectile turns into like three or four other projectiles which if you line that up properly can do a ton of extra damage now it is also shooting a weapon projectile that doesn't fly in a straight line all the time so it can be really annoying to use but if you know how to use a jabberwocky in the bowler you can have a really fun time same thing with the cannonade the cannonade i should have mentioned with the other grenade launchers before but it's kind of a weapon that i use as a pickaxe if i ever need to clear out a building i pull out the cannonade and i know that that's not the most glorified way to use this weapon but it kind of works really well but it definitely excels with my rocket launcher loadout i should have linked that earlier in the video but it'll be down in the description down below you can get a ton of extra rounds out of that and it makes it so that your magazine is essentially massive so the cannonade is kind of a weapon that can be spammed to a great degree and will do a ton of damage in the process the desa blaster while extremely fun isn't extraordinarily game changing if you can bounce it off a lot of walls it can be really fun i'll link the best perks for that down below like i did with the rest of them and you can kind of check it out for itself it is a very weird weapon that requires a little bit of finesse to get working the Dragon's Fury is a weapon that I'm also going to be sort of skipping over. It does an unimpressive amount of damage. Most of the damage that you're going to get out of this thing is from the lingering fireworks after you shoot at a target. It is pretty strong if you can get an enemy to stand still on those, but it's kind of a gimmicky weapon and I wouldn't recommend it for like everyday use. The Quad Launcher is a weapon very similar to the other grenade launchers I mentioned before, but it essentially shoots four rockets where you can leave a fire pool down behind it and it'll, it'll burn an enemy for great lengths of time. So if you want to just destroy the ankles of the enemies you're shooting at, the Quad Launcher a fantastic choice. The V6 launcher is very similar to the cannonade in that it definitely excels from that rocket launcher loadout I mentioned earlier. The more shots you can shoot from this thing, the better, and it is actually one of my go-to picks for that specific loadout. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that video will be linked down below, and uh, I'll just leave the V6 launcher up to, uh, up to that for now. Now, lastly, I have a couple of other picks. For example, the vacuum tube launcher. I don't have one leveled up, I don't think, but it is extremely fun and extremely expensive at the exact same time. If you can get the chain lightning six perk on this thing, it is just a decimator of crowds and uh, is definitely something super fun and worth checking out. The trash cannon is identical to the bazooka. It's just a cheaper copy of it. So less durability, cheaper crafting materials, overall more efficient to use this, but otherwise exact same stats as the bazooka. And last and definitely least is the noble launcher. 
here. I have been at war with this weapon for a long time. People have been mentioning it every time I bring it up. This weapon does an unimpressive amount of damage for an extreme amount of energy cells, and I never recommend anybody using it. It's essentially just a, a super expensive Storm King's Ravager 6 perk, if you, if you want to think of it like that. I do not like the Noble Launcher, and if you guys want me to explain why, I will someday do a best perks video on it, if you guys want it, but I am going to just leave that one as a uh, to be continued kind of thing so if you want to see the noble launcher you can let me know in the comments down below but for today for today we're gonna let it be okay so this video is a few months overdue but that's because i had some boxes to check you might have noticed if i actually sort my inventory by rating uh there are way more 130s in this video as compared to my old video because i am older i am wiser i have covered many more melees for a couple of reasons one of course being new weapons like the killjoy introducing new six perks like dealing more damage to elemental enemies and these were introduced with the art deco weapons and has been applied to many other melees such as if you go to the vacuum tube weapons for example vacuum tube sword has chain lightning which was not a thing before it can do extra damage to water enemies as well and it really really changes the conversation. We have Core Reperk, which can now be spent to change these six perks. We have Stacking Damage does more crit rating. We have Crit Hits Cause an Explosion. All of these things have made melee significantly more interesting and has made this, uh, this whole conversation about the best melees take me a little bit more time to formulate than some of the other videos. So, to dive into this, we are going to have to be a little bit more organized than last time. Last time, in my old video, we took an approach to say, these are the best melees that I know of, etc, etc, but I'm going to take a different angle. We're going to sort by subtype. I didn't want to do this in the last video, but I feel like it's necessary to keep things organized, and there are a couple of disclaimers I want to make right away. Uh, first and foremost, the old video is still good. Any melee I said was good in that video, like if you just watched that, it's still a good recommendation. As my understanding has it, every melee in the game basically just got better, and uh, our understanding has improved as well, and that of course comes with Paleo Luna. I'm I'm pretty sure she was a thing when I recorded my first video, but one thing I didn't understand as fully as I do now is that pretty much every melee in the game is usable with Paleo Luna in the lead. That 9% extra health applied to every single swing makes it so that the faster you swing, the more damage you do. In a very interesting way, the best melee in the entire game, I'm going to tell you right now, is a legacy version of the Founder's Night Cleave. These were provided to me by my friend Schnemly. He gave me one of every element, or at least five of every element, because I didn't want to bug him all the time, and his copy is Sunbeam, the better version is Brightcore, but this thing hits for nearly half a million DPS. For reference, the Storm King's Ravager, which is the other best melee in the entire game, I'm going to spoil that right now, but I don't think that's going to surprise anybody, does about 400,000 DPS. So this purple weapon with quadruple attack speed is doing more damage than the mythic weapon, and I'm only saying this to say that basically every melee in the game is good if you're using Paleo Luna. So, to make this video not 45 minutes long, I'm going to go ahead and highlight the weapons that are good based on their own merits. For for example, I'll give you a couple of freebies, like the, the Neon Scythe is pretty good, the, the Fishing Hook is pretty good. If you give double attack speed to like a weapon, like any of those that I just mentioned, the Corsair is pretty good, but none of these melees are exactly top tier on their own without our Queen Luna making it super good. And I'd also like to add that every single weapon that I'm talking about here will have the best perks linked down below. Uh, if I have covered it, there are a couple of weapons yet to cover, like some of the newer Art Deco weapons, and I will update the description as those come out. If I'm missing any of these videos and you really want to see them, leave me a comment down below. I'd really appreciate that feedback, and I will be timestamping this video based on the section. In every other best weapons video, I have timestamped the video based on the specific weapons. This time around, I'm going to go ahead and do it by by subtype. And the reason of that is, like I said, I want to keep things organized, but also I'm covering every melee in one video because melees aren't fundamentally different. Ranged weapons have like a lot of different ways that they play and whatnot, and that is true for some melees, but largely speaking, melees are all kind of swing at the enemy that you're looking at with some different six perks and different heavy attack abilities in there, so it's not that different. But without further ado, let's get started. So starting off with the Storm King's Fury. This is going to surprise nobody and I'm going to make it quick. It's a Storm King weapon. I shouldn't have to tell you that this thing is amazing. This is one of those funny weapons where initially in its video, I covered it long, long ago, I recommended double attack speed. And I want to make a new video where I clarify that a bit because I was, I was wrong 
wrong in that video, but then I, I learned that I'm, I'm right. So like the attack speed double crit damage is the best way to run this. But as I mentioned earlier, double attack speed with Luna is the highest DPS. Now, this is not a best perks video, but this is one that I thought would be funny to clarify right away. Going forward, the video will be linked down below if you guys want perks. But the Storm King's Fury speaks for itself, does a ton of damage, very, very strong. If you use the heavy attack ability, it is going to rain down a ton of meteors attacking everything in front of you. And it's just a very, very powerful weapon overall. And your top pick for defeating the Mythic Storm King. If you want to defeat the Mythic Storm King a little more effectively, link to that video down below. Now, I am going to be pointing out weapons along the way that I refer to as crit explosions, and when I say that, I mean that they have the six perk that causes an explosion when you hit a crit. And the Husk Stopper is a super average hardware that gets a lot better because it has that six perk, and it just is amazing. Whenever you activate that explosion, it blows up everything in front of you. I'm not going to dive into every single one of these crit explosion melees. Just know that I'm going to point them out as we go along, and all of them are very, very good for exactly that purpose. It turns them from a regular boring melee into an explosion machine, which is fantastic for crowd clearing. Another one that's fantastic for crowd clearing is the Husk Warper. This isn't like a top tier melee. It's not the biggest deal, but when you right click it, it sucks enemies towards you and does a little bit of extra damage. It's kind of a gimmicky weapon. It's nothing top tier, but it's super fun indeed. And for the rest of the hardwares that I got here, the lead sled, the pipe down, the six feet under, the doom hammer, all of these are pretty okay melees. You know the drill, double attack speed with Luna and they're pretty good, but they're not really super exciting and I'm going to be skipping over them for the most part. The one thing I'll mention is that a lot of these melees do have double movement speed, which makes them pretty good for getting around. So if you just put on movement speed perks on these, you can get around pretty comfortably. But of course, if you have the Baron, uh, you're going to be in good shape. The Baron is not a very strong weapon generally speaking it's not something what the f windows it's not something that you're necessarily going to be using for damage but it does have triple movement speed giving you a 42 percent movement speed bonus so you're going to see the baron in pretty much every clip today because it's just that good and i kind of skipped over it here but the surround pound is your best non-mythic hardware weapon for the storm king's horn this is essentially one of your gateway weapons to the storm king weapons and that's because it's one of the strongest hardest hitting hardware in the game this is super usable even without luna the double crit damage i was using here was to spam the heavy attack and that can be really really good for eliminating crowds of enemies which makes for a very fun weapon and makes it one of the best melees in the game i'm going to skip over the rest of these hardware and if i ever do that in any future situations it's usually for a good reason if you guys have any complaints and think i skipped over a good weapon you let me know i will just say that the heavyweight uh art deco weapon is definitely pretty good i was impressed with it when i used it but as of recording this video as of upload i have not made a video on it so check the comments or the description down below there might be a best perks for that because it did appear to be a pretty good weapon when i first tried it now the clubs should be a pretty quick conversation but we're going to start alphabetically with the astrobat 9000 this is a pretty mediocre damage wise melee but it is one of the few in the entire game that has a ranged attack that makes it pretty interesting kind of fun to use but not too much more than that the Fortsville Slugger 3000 is a very, very common base game weapon that you've probably never looked twice at, and there's good reason for that. It's, much like the Astrobat, a very average damage melee. However, you can see it on screen, crit hits cause an explosion, making this a very, very fun weapon. You can take a mediocre weapon and make it top tier just by making it explode when you crit, and that extra area of effect damage makes it super useful. Uh, the Sur Hootie and the Contender are two weapons that are pretty fun, kinda. You know, crit hits on the Sur Hootie makes it fun, the Contender has that super nice knockback that's kind of what the boxing glove is about but none of these are necessarily super high damage melees and i'm not really going to be getting too far into them the one exception is the mic drop uh, i don't know why i don't have one of these leveled up but when i did try it out it was surprisingly good and its right click ability makes it pretty decent those boombox weapons usually have some fun stuff going on so definitely worth a try Moving on to axes. Axes in this game have always been plagued from the fact that they kind of have a wonky swinging animation. They're a little tricky to use and most of them are pretty slow swinging, but one of my favorite weapons in the game is the Argon Axe. Because this weapon has the highest base crit chance of any other weapon in the entire game at 30%. I have a melee loadout on buffing it to 47.5%, which means this weapon literally doesn't even need a crit rating perk. You can just run crit damage on it and it's going to be perfectly fine. Not to mention it has the crit Hits cause an explosion perk, making the Argon Axe one of the most fun weapons in the entire game. Definitely one of the best melees I wanted to point out. The Armageddon Axe is pretty good, pretty not great. Uh, it's really, really good if you run uh, Totally Rockin' Out on this weapon. With the crit hits cause an explosion, you're in for a very good time, but you definitely need that six perk to make it worthwhile. 
The Husk Grinder, pretty not great, but it is one of the black metal weapons that has a few other extra things going on. It has those six perks that reduce your health for extra damage, and you can do more damage to nature, but none of that is super saving this weapon, so we're not going to give it too much time there. The Supersonic Slasher, again, crit hits cause an explosion, makes it super fun. This thing I was running double crit damage, totally rocking out. It was quite fun and uh, definitely a unique pick. Slower swinging, higher damage per hit, makes it definitely worthwhile. Same story with the Vacuum Tube Axe. This weapon is is way stronger than you might think. If you are not in a healing death burst mission and you are in a water zone where nature is going to be most effective, the vacuum tube axe is way more powerful than you might think. The chain lightning is doing enough base damage to knock out normal enemies, which means the fatties and the mist monsters are going to be the only enemies giving you any trouble. The vacuum tube axe is definitely very strong and with that chain lightning six perk can be a very top pick. The Vindertech Sever is an interesting melee. I've never quite tried it out myself, but the 0.41 swing speed is comparable with some of the other swords in the game, and it's an axe. So it could have an interesting place as kind of a Paleo Luna spammer where you're just trying to do more damage with her attack bonus, and that could be really nice, but I've never actually quite tried it out, so I might leave that one up to you guys. The Stop Axe is a weapon I kind of have to skip because I definitely want the other melees to still seem kind of useful. So if I really even showed you how strong the Stop Axe is, uh, the Mythic weapons wouldn't even see any use. So I'm going to keep that one to myself for now. And that just about wraps it up for all of the axes. If there's anything that I skipped, there's usually a good reason for that, so let's move on to the scythes. Definitely an underrepresented group of melees. Unfortunately, there aren't too many abilities... Unfortunately, there aren't too many heroes in the game that actually buff scythes, but there are a couple worth talking about. First and foremost is the fishing hook. I'm pretty sure this one can have the crit hits cause an explosion. Unfortunately, not my copy, but as usual, it makes this weapon quite a bit stronger than it normally is. And the neon scythe is an old favorite of me and my friends because it's actually like pretty good. It has an attack speed that nearly rivals swords and it can have a hitting an enemy grants extra damage. That extra damage output from the six perk definitely makes this weapon a lot stronger. And as per usual, paired with Paleo Luna, it's actually a pretty solid pick. The Steam Thrasher is one of our very first super unique melees, in the sense that it has a heavy attack ability that continuously spins. If you have ever longed, if you have ever sat on your lawn, under your tree, reading your book, putting it down gently, gazing up at the sky, wishing for more, wishing that you could have been the lawnmower that cut the grass, then the Steam Thrasher is it for you, you guys. You can spin around continuously. It's a super fun ability. Pair this with heroes that give you tons of energy to keep on going, and it is going to be quite an interesting pick. I'll leave that video down below for you guys to check it out more in depth, but yeah, the Steam Thrasher is very, very interesting. And that's pretty much it for Scythes. I'm telling you guys, they're pretty lacking, and uh, I don't really have much else to add. And here it is. We are pretty far into the video now, but if there was any set of melees that is probably deserving of its own video, it's the swords. The swords are pretty uncontested as the best category in the entire game, and attack speed is pretty much why. Uh, Paleo Luna is quite strong, and the perk options on swords are very nice. So the Storm King's Ravager with a crit build normally, or with triple attack speed with Luna, is an insanely powerful weapon. If you utilize its heavy attack ability to shoot a wave of damage out, it is an extremely high amount of damage. Pro tip to anybody ever laying into a mini boss: you can swing in bursts of four, meaning you're going to swing one, two, three, four, then one, two, three, four, jump backwards, then use your right click, or if you're on console, you know, use your heavy attack ability. That'll do a ton of extra damage and is way more efficient than continually swinging so pro tip for uh, taking out mini bosses the corsair i mentioned it earlier as an example of a weapon that's pretty good but you know not a top tier and then while that's true it ranks really highly as like one of the top 15 top 10 best melees in the game damage wise and that's especially because it has a brand new six perk no longer are you limited to pairing it with the jack's revenge for any kind of good utilization no 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 you have a couple of six perks boosting your movement speed or your crit rating based on how many times you swing it and while crit rating is not the best bonus for a melee it does still apply to extra damage and it's a pretty nice thing to have i'm running mine with movement speed for some reason i think i was just being tricky but double attack speed with damage and you are just you are cruising definitely a solid weapon and a fun one to spend some core reaper on the Masamune, for those of you lucky enough to have it, is an insanely strong weapon. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because, of course, it is a Founder's weapon, but after six hits causing explosion is super nice. I'm pretty sure there aren't even other options because, as I mentioned, it is a Founder's weapon with a unique six perk. But yeah, typical, you know, triple attack speed on this thing. It is an insanely fast swinging sword, super comfortable to use, and even if you're not using Luna, other perks will make this definitely a strong weapon, and it's just a really, really great pick. 
One that definitely surprised me was the Guardian's Will. I was not expecting this to be such a good weapon, and it is technically, depending on how you want to look at how you move in Fortnite, kind of better for moving around than the Baron because it has a lunging heavy attack that will make you go quite far, and the higher you stack up, the further you're going to glide downwards, and that can make this really, really good. Also, if you're ever stuck in a hole, you can use that lunging ability to get out of it. Uh, I'm totally not speaking from experience, and that's definitely something I've only ever seen other people do, but it's a really strong weapon on its own. Hits for over 33,000 damage per swing which is a lot for a sword and with the double attack speed plus luna plus affliction being an insanely good six perk it is a really really solid pick and with all of the different elemental choices which is not something you always have with melees the guardian's will is really solid for not only movement but doing actually meaningful damage now an interesting pick that you might not even expect is that the spectral blade can technically sort of out damage the mythic ravager let me explain so with swinging the sword granting extra damage plus the triple attack speed and everything you usually see and water against a fire enemy the spectral blade can out damage the ravager if you're not using the six perk heavy attack damage from the Ravager. So if you're if you're sending that wave of damage, the Ravager out damages it cleanly, but normally speaking, just swinging, the Spectre Blade can be stronger. And that's because of what I mentioned with the Guardian's Will, where the Ravager is linked to energy or physical, meaning uh, the extra water damage against fire doing 100% damage normally is uh, definitely something that can make the Spectre Blade a little bit better in fire zones, but it's kind of a caveat. It's a normally extremely good weapon. The Spectre Blade is super good, uh, happy to remake this Best Perks video when it comes back out near the Halloween season. If you're watching this video then, then comment down below. Super fun weapon, definitely go grab it. Now a perfect example of a melee that just exploits the hell out of Luna is the Stabsworth the Third. This is a pretty good, decently high damage melee, but the fact that it can have such an insane swing speed is why it's better than Luna. You might have noted that the Ravager and the Spectral Blade have really, really high swing speeds, a little bit quicker than the Stabsworth, but that's because they have triple attack speed. With double attack speed, this thing can get to 0.28 and even faster with Bright Core. I've done the math on it, Sunbeam is still better, but with Bright Core, this can be an even faster swinging sword, and all of its damage comes from Luna. It's kind of a funny combination, but the Sabs with a third, even without Luna, is still pretty good. You can get a crit build on this thing. You don't need a ton of attack speed because naturally speaking, it is the fastest swinging sword in the game. Different perks can sort of change that down the line, but its base swing speed is the fastest. It is also the normal legendary variant of that Founder's Knight Cleave I showed earlier, so something to know. Fun fact of the day, I do not have a Vindertech Slicer, but it is the exact same base stats as the Stormblade with the exact same perk choices. The Stormblade is better though, probably for what you can see, the crit hits cause an explosion. With White Elf Fiona in support, I am getting a 50% chance to crit, which means I am activating explosions for most of my hits, and with a 0.4 swing speed getting tons of damage from Luna, the Stormblade is a very, very strong weapon and super fun to use. And it's funny that the Slicer is technically the same weapon, but without that crit hits six perk, it is uh, definitely falling behind, so I highly recommend the Stormblade over it. Now, one of my personal favorites is the Killjoy. You, uh, If you were on stream that one day, you'll know I spent 1,800 flux getting the final six perk bonus because I had, you know, extra damage against nature. I had extra damage against water and I wanted one more. I think technically the nature one was the last one. It doesn't even matter. I eventually just core reperked it and have never uh, regretted that decision. The Killjoy is one of those interesting weapons where it's not the highest damage. It doesn't have the crit explosions. But if you are, for example, using a Killjoy with nature against water enemies with a six perk that buffs your damage by 44%, Against those enemies, this weapon becomes one of the best picks in the entire game. Uh, the Ravager and the Spectre Blade are still going to outdamage it because they're just insane, but the Killjoy definitely is a fun, unique weapon to pull out if you're ever trying to, you know, utilize that elemental advantage. So if you've been queuing nature missions all day long, then pull out a fire copy with extra damage to nature, and you're going to have a fun time. It's definitely a good pick. Now, there are a lot of melees like the Tree of Light that people have tried to convince me is good. It has really nice, you know, like knockback and the fact that it can you know stun with the six perk and with triple crit damage this thing is a monster of a pick with totally rocking out uh it kind of requires totally rocking out to be good in that sense but it's never been my personal play style it's more of a slower swinging super high damage weapon i mean look at that 455 percent chance to crit this thing is nutty with totally rocking out that's not my personal play style but if it is the tree of light might be the pick for you 
Vacuum Tube Sword, I mentioned it earlier. This is going to surprise nobody since I mentioned it, but yeah, the Chain Lightning is super, super fun. It's not quite like the Vacuum Tube Axe because it doesn't do nearly as much damage per swing, but seeing as you're swinging faster, it's a sword. It's a really, really nice thing to use, and I highly recommend it if you're ever running water missions. As for the rest of the melees, I'm kind of going to skip over them. The, uh, the Krypton Sword's been on my radar for a while, but I don't know much about it, and the Dragon's Tooth is pretty good. You can hit five hits in a row causing an explosion, which is neat, but it's not nearly as as good as the crit hits so there are other weapons like the black blade terrible weapon it, it is probably the worst sword in the entire game if you can convince me otherwise go for it but i'm not wildly impressed with it Woo! all right we made it through the swords probably the best category in the game followed up to close it out normally people say last but not least but in this case it definitely is least Spears are probably the most underutilized weapons in the game. There are a, a lot of hero changes happening as I'm recording this, so maybe they'll make some better spear heroes. I'll try to update some of these videos as needed if that ever happens, but uh, spears in general are pretty bad, but we do have a few very nice standouts. I'm going to start with the ear splitter because it's definitely a fan favorite. It's never really been my playstyle, but the heavy attack on the ear splitter means that you can pump out a bunch of damage doing a ton of boom based damage while you eliminate everything around you. They're going to run towards you and die in the process and a lot of people really like that some people even use it for farming and it's a really interesting ability indeed and can definitely make for a fun time so if you're ever trying to spam that ability you know this is the weapon for you and that ability as a recording doesn't actually use durability so if you're kind of working on a budget this could be a great pick for you farming and doing damage while never utilizing any durability craft this weapon once and you're set for life could be a fun pick not gonna lie and the Atomic Light Expander is, in my eyes, an honorary crit hits cause an explosion, because its crit hits cause seven explosions, and that is a really, really fun ability. It has a really decent swing speed, really good perks. You can see that we worked in an attack speed perk and a crit rating crit damage perk. Makes for a very, very fun weapon, and definitely worth looking at. I don't think that's going to surprise anybody, seeing as it's a retro sci-fi weapon and all of those weapons are good, but I'm still going to mention it. Farmer's Glory, same deal as always, a much better weapon than you probably ever imagined, and the crit has caused an explosion is even better on top of it so definitely give it a try i don't know what else to say at this point if you've watched through to the end of this video and you haven't skipped ahead this shouldn't need any prior explanation and that's kind of what i'm talking about where the rest of the melees are kind of meh i know that the vacuum tube melee the vacuum tube spear is definitely similar to the axe and the sword with that chain lightning and i definitely need to look into it but it's again one of those videos where as a recording i haven't quite done that so that one has a little asterisk next to it as for the rest of the weapons there's really not much to talk about the only thing i want to say is is a Sir Lancelot really has a unique ability in that it can push enemies around and it's the same as a scrapper spear so if you got that bundle long ago it's the same weapon apples to apples and it's really good for like shoving a mini boss out of the way if you're late game in endurance or something but that is pretty much it all right you may or may not know it but you are currently watching the end of i i want to say a trilogy but it's not a trilogy it's like 10 videos long so a long long time ago i posted the best weapons series and that consisted of the top 10 best weapons along with every single subtype in the game including traps and melees and i actually put all of those together into what is called the best weapons in fortnite save the world you probably recognize that video because it's the most popular one on my channel and over the past 11 months i know i've taken my sweet time i have been updating every Every single one of those videos to go along with the new perk changes and the new the new damage bonuses and all the things that have changed since then and I am here to present the final piece of that puzzle every single one of those videos will be linked down below including the new ones and then after this video is posted I will be making the the new best weapons video but that's a little into the future right now we are covering the best snipers in the game we have covered the best bows which never got a new video because they are kind of you know they're good that's up to date it never needed a second video and is something I'm mentioning very importantly right now that we are not talking about bows today. They will be sprinkled throughout my inventory as you can see. They are classed as snipers but I think we can all agree that their playstyle is just completely different and so they have their own video off to the side. We will not be mentioning bows today. And then we have covered the top 10 best weapons, the new best ARs, SMGs, shotguns, traps, pistols, launchers, and melees. And then finally today... We are covering the snipers. So, 
Let's get into the best snipers in Fortnite Save the World. The new best snipers, if you will. And I want to give a little bit of an apology. I don't back down on my words, but my very first best snipers video, it was very critical because snipers in this game are definitely in an uphill battle because Fortnite Save the World is a defense game where most of your enemies are rather close ranged and coming in groups and swarms. And frankly speaking, the targets that you're going to be hitting with snipers are like smashers, miss monsters. I consider smashers different because they're so beefy. The, the big fatty zombies, mini bosses, all of these bigger targets that you'd generally be using a sniper on, because snipers are high damage, low fire rate, they just aren't, you don't need a sniper for that. They're going to be taken down quite easily with a high fire rate SMG or a good damage AR or a good shotgun. So snipers have always sort of been considered the lowest class of weapons, and I don't really disagree with that. However, there are a few standouts, and that's definitely what we're going to be getting into today. So before we get into it, I will have all of my best perks videos for these snipers linked down below. I haven't technically covered every single sniper in the game because, like I mentioned, uh, snipers aren't really the best weapons in the game. And there are new ones like the takedown here, which is a very, very good sniper. I'm just going to say that now. I did get a little bit of gameplay before recording this, and it is way, way stronger than you might think. Decent fire rate, decent damage. I'm really impressed. I ran a crit build just to test, but again, I haven't made the best perks on this, so I'll talk about all the different options in the future at some point. Comment down below if you want to see that but definitely a really strong sniper and I might not bring it up later since I mentioned it now regardless I will have all of the best perks linked down below for every weapon that I have covered and generally speaking the rule of thumb is if I haven't covered it in the best perks video there's usually a reason for that if I haven't done the best perks for it it's usually for the same reason you shouldn't upgrade it but the takedown is an exception to this rule so I'm going to be going alphabetically let's start with the Blastatron 9000 the Blastatron 9000 is a really really good sniper it's really more of a DMR because it shoots semi-auto like an AR. You got about 10 rounds in the mag depending on your perks and it just does really good damage. It does use energy cells which is kind of a thing that you might want to consider but being from the retro sci-fi set I don't think anybody's going to be surprised when I say that this thing is actually really strong. So yeah with a decent fire rate, high damage and the essentially AR feel of a Blastatron 9000 it's kind of basically not even a sniper and it's really really good if you're looking for something easy to use. Another one that's actually very similar to the Blastatron 9000 is the Crankshot. And I think we're all going to know the Crankshot because it is essentially an automatic assault rifle. It has like 24 rounds in the mag without a mag size perk. Fully automatic, shooting 5 rounds a second, and a lot of people run this thing Brightcore with fire rate, and they pair it with Sub-Zero Zenith. Sub-Zero Zenith freezes enemies when your sniper crits, and with a super high fire rate, the crank shot is basically a freeze ray. It actually shares this role rather nicely with the Vacuum Tube Sniper. I'm going to cover both of these weapons at the same time, because the Vacuum Tube Sniper is really hard to control. It's not really a weapon that lends itself nicely to being a primary weapon. The Chain Lightning definitely does help with that. That's one of the updates to the old videos that chain lightning exists now and it adds a lot of really good crowd clearing to this weapon and the vacuum tube sniper and the crank shot both have a decent enough fire rate and crit damage to be very very good as i said freeze rays to be paired with sub-zero zenith i've never actually technically made a video on sub-zero zenith but i covered him pretty heavily in the crank shot video so link to that down below but I covered him pretty heavily in the Vacuum Tube Sniper and I think the Crankshot video, one of those two, or both. Link to those down below, like I said. I definitely get into it there. All right. I was wondering when I was going to get to this. So this might be a little too early to say a thing like this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go for it. I do believe that the Neon Sniper and the Obliterator are the best snipers in the game. In fact, I actually have the Obliterator's favorited because I covered its best perks right before uploading this because I wanted to make sure that I had all my boxes checked. The Obliterator is just frankly the most viable sniper. I'm not even gonna lie, just speaking from personal experience, it's essentially the only sniper I use. I want to clarify again here, I am not talking about bows. I use them quite regularly. They are very strong. There's a reason the Xenon is supercharged. I am talking about strictly snipers. I do not use anything really other than the Obliterator. Editing Beast here. I just wanted to clarify because I finally synced up the perks on my Neon Sniper and Obliterator and I really wanted an apples to apples comparison to really compare these weapons and I'll link this DPS calculator down below. I use it for all of my videos. I don't like to show a ton of numbers in these videos because it can get very confusing for those who don't need me to prove every little thing I'm saying, but uh, the Neon Sniper was doing about 106,000 DPS and the Obliterator is doing 
more damage, and it's a cheaper weapon, and I, that's definitely why I prefer it. But these weapons are extremely even, so if you just completely ignore the fact that the Neon Sniper takes batteries and energy cells, making it very expensive, the Neon Sniper will have more range than the Obliterator because they can see through the walls, and it'll be basically the same amount of damage. The difference between 116,000 and 106,000 is irrelevant. You just hand it off to a defender and forget about it. So I just wanted to get that clarification in there. These are essentially the same weapons, but now you kind of know why I'm so heavily weighted towards recommending the Obliterator. These are definitely the best snipers in the game for handing off to defenders. They can shoot through the walls, doing really good damage, shooting at a decent fire rate, and it's just a fantastic combo all around. And not to mention, the Obliterator is a pretty fantastic pickaxe, so hey, that's kind of a perk too. And now this is kind of a personal favorite. The Old Betsy and the Spyglass are the exact same weapon. In fact, if I compare these two, you'll see that their stats are identical. The only difference, of course, is the Spyglass has a scope and more range. That's literally it. So these are, essentially speaking, the exact same weapon. I used to use this way back in the day. I've told this story every time it's come up, so I'm going to make it quick. It used to be my secondary, my Miss Monster Killer. It doesn't really do that anytime outside of the 100 power level zones. Once you get to that higher part of Twine, it just doesn't do enough damage to one shot, so it's really not a viable pick as an endgame player, personally speaking. But if you're watching this as somebody who's in Canny, Plankerton, or hey, if you're lucky to have one of these in Stonewood, this will definitely be a really good weapon for one-shotting Mist Monsters for up until the 100 zone. So, personally speaking, I've always loved the Spyglass, but it's just... It just doesn't work in that late game, and so I had to put it away, but I've always hoped that they'll buff this weapon in the future, and I actually want to bring something up now. So we're going to be going to my collection book, because I do not have a copy of these on hand, but the Spyglass definitely reminds me of the Spy Sniper, the Cleaner. The Cleaner is a candidate to be one of the best snipers in the game. I do not keep a copy on hand, because it has... A crippling flaw, a three second reload speed that cannot be sped up with a reload perk. The only hero currently in the game as of recording to buff your reload speed is Chromium Ramirez, and she is the only one that will actually do anything for that. And running Chromium Ramirez in the lead for a reload bonus just to use the cleaner doesn't even make sense because your fire rate is 0.3. So even if you reload in time, you're not going to be able to shoot. It's ridiculous. It is just so unfortunate because if you look at the damage numbers, which may or may not be something I can show you because Fortnite DB wasn't working earlier, you can take my word for it at least. The cleaner is the hardest hitting sniper in the game besides the crossbows. Yes, I said the crossbows. Yes, they are good. And yes, we'll get to them later. But the cleaner hits like a truck. Look at this thing. Level 30 with the perks not even gold. It's already doing 400k headshots. Trust me when I level this thing up, it's a monster but you're waiting three seconds to reload. So it's not going to be featured heavily in today's video as a good weapon, but I'll say, if they add a reload perk, I'll pin a damn comment. That is a good weapon just waiting to be useful. So hopefully that gets a buff, but for now, the cleaner Old Betsy Spyglass are all very similar weapons, and the Spyglass, at least, is quite usable. Now, the Ralphie's Revenge, kind of a fan favorite, kind of just a sneaky little fun weapon. Uh, my perks are blue because back in the day I wasn't rich, and it's locked to physical, which is honestly just a crippling flaw. If it wasn't locked to physical, it's a decent fire rate, you know, just kind of a DMR, uh, much like the Blastatron like I showed earlier. It has an insanely high headshot multiplier of a six times headshot multiplier. With a couple of headshot perks, you can see it's doing ten times damage for hitting headshots. This thing is really, really nuts if you can hit them in the head, but of course, in the higher level uh, twine missions, which is where I play mostly. Uh, if you're running up against an elemental enemy, it's just not going to do enough damage. For those who don't know elements, if you're shooting at an elemental enemy with a physical weapon like this, you're going to be doing half damage, which cuts my headshot multiplier to five, essentially speaking, and it just... It just, it just sucks. It's unfortunate. I really don't know why they don't let you change the element. Maybe you'd be too strong, but you'd have to hit headshots, so you'd really be earning that damage, and... So I don't know. I don't know. Ralphie's Revenge, if it ever gets the option to change elements, could be very good. But uh, for now, it's just a really fun weapon if you're looking to just try something new. And along the lines of just having some fun, this Super Shredder is, much like the crossbow, a weapon that you'll be surprised to hear is, yeah, really good. The age-old debate is the fact that it uses shotgun shells and it shoots like a shotgun, but is it a shotgun? No, it's a sniper. It's, it's, it's classed as a sniper, so we're bringing it up here, not the shotgun video, and it's good. I'm not going to elaborate too far because I've already spent a lot of time talking about some of the better snipers today, but it hits really good, good headshots, decent fire rate. Uh, link to that video down below if you guys want to hear more about it. It's better than you might think, but it, it's not a top pick. 
Now the takedown, I mentioned it in the intro, so I'm not going to get too far into it, but it's a sleeper pick. I have not covered it since it came out. I really should, so comment down below if you guys want me to cover it. I will put it in the description, so look for it there before you comment. But yeah, really, really good weapon. I was impressed with it. All right, so you might have thought I was trolling you, but anybody who's been watching my videos for a long time knows that I can't spot weapons in a group, and I actually skipped the Heartbreaker on accident. So, we are finally getting to crossbows. Yes, I said it earlier, these are the hardest hitting snipers in the game, which is funny because their base damage is 316, and the cleaner's base damage is 315. So Epic literally did double their damage in the 12.0 update, as you can see, and gave them one point more damage than the other best sniper in the game and they hit insanely hard this is some old footage back when chrome husks existed uh they come with the blockbuster event so if you're playing during the blockbuster event this is relevant but if you're watching this as of release they're not a thing but suffice it to say chrome husks actually have more health than a smasher and they are not fun to deal with however the heartbreaker going back and forth you know double pumping as you will actually does enough damage to where they just knock them on their butt with the super high impact and do a decent amount of damage because it's hitting extremely hard it should be noted that the heartbreaker and the regular military crossbow are exactly the same if i compare the stats here you'll see that they are the exact same weapon save for the six perk options and i actually called it in my crossbow video Corey perk was not even anything that any players knew anything about but i mentioned that if you're able to change the six perks they might be a lot better in the future and i was right you can have affliction on the crossbow back in the day i think we had like nine different options on 49 db so they clearly trimmed that down for the uh, Corey perk release but the heartbreaker is good as it is because a 30 percent weapon damage bonus bonus by just pulling up your scope is an insanely good damage bonus really good six perk and i wouldn't change that on any sniper in the game i don't think because that's just a nice thing to have even the headshots cause an explosion is nice for some extra bonus damage to the enemies around it it gives it some area of effect damage which snipers really need and can benefit from but a 30 percent damage bonus is super nice so yeah i'm not kidding if you guys ever want to have some fun with crossbows literally just two of them back forth with coconuts or something it's a really fun combo and you'll be impressed i should also add before i get out of this uh it does have pierce so not only are you doing a ton of damage but you're shooting through other enemies and it's just it's a great old time we have officially moved into the uh more of a question mark territory because if i don't have a weapon leveled up that's usually a bad sign but i haven't tested every sniper in the game so I'm just going to rattle off a few here that might be good that I haven't tested. So Bon Voyage, I have tried it out. It's actually pretty good. I wasn't blown away by it, but it's basically like a good B or C tier sniper. Uh, the Deathwing could also be good. The One Shot could also be good. The Tsunami could also be good. I've heard a lot of good things about it. Vindertech Jolter, Sunsetter, Triple Tap. Good rule of thumb is if I haven't heard anybody say, hey, this weapon's amazing, it's, it's probably bad. I believe all of these snipers to be within the B or C tier range, just pretty good. If any any of these are insanely strong and you have a good case to make comment down below but it uh is probably worth skipping these weapons i have done completely fine having never used them before so yeah dragonfly again i'm not shocked if it's a bad weapon but i'd be blown away if it's really good what I will say is in these unleveled up weapons, there is one that might be pretty decent, and that is the Dragon's Claw Sniper. This, along with most of the other dragon weapons, are just pretty bad, but it does have a redeeming quality. In fact, if you pull up this weapon, you'll see that it shoots small fireworks that embed in the target and explode. It's very similar to the Powder Keg Sniper, but the explosions are a little smaller, and they're a lot more focused. What happens there is it's decent for crowd clearing and can be super fun to spam, but it's not anything that's ever really impressed me so dragon's claw can be super fun but it's nothing that has really ever drawn my eye personally now before we get into the last sniper in the game i do want to make one mention of the zapatron sniper i'll admit i've missed it in my first round of recording because i don't have a copy of this weapon it has been given to me before and i do have a video on it link below of course but i wanted to mention that this weapon is kind of a, uh, a mystical weapon it's one of those super old weapons that was added to br it was super overpowered for a little bit but the importance of this is that it does actually do a really good amount of damage right now unfortunately it's single target damage there is no viable crowd clearing you have to charge it up it uses energy cells it's super expensive it has all of the regular drawbacks that i've mentioned before and i, I have to mention the zapatron in a sniper video but it's still not super viable i'm not going to consider it a good weapon but i figured i should at least bring it up just so you know i didn't forget it and i have saved the best for last a sniper so good that i forgot i uploaded it Freeze frame. Okay, you're going to hear me call it Yemen throughout this recording. I know it's called the Yeoman, and I always forget that. I just wanted to get ahead of those comments down below. Okay, play. 
the Yemen sniper. I can't even do this. It's a meme. This weapon is uh, a favorite amongst us to kind of joke about. It is a long-range javelin weapon. So it is the only sniper in the game with bullet drop. So it it is a very hard to control single shot reload weapon, which d does more damage than the spyglass. But yeah, good luck hitting your shots consistently. It used to be, it used to have a claim of fame for being really good at doing high damage to the UFOs, but then the xenon bow came around and just it just made it useless and it no longer has any use the yemen i'm not even trolling i genuinely forgot that i had uploaded this video uh, somebody brought it up in chat one day and i was like oh my god it was after the stream that i had realized that i did have a best perks on this and if i forgot about my own video that's usually a bad sign the exact same thing goes for event people, meaning the different heroes that can be available, you know? And uh, this is a very, very big topic. There are lots of heroes in the game, and you probably saw this coming, but I also have a best heroes video. And uh, as of recording this, they are in the process of rebalancing lots of the most underused heroes in the entire game. For example, we'll just look at Chromium Ramirez as, as to just give exactly one person so I don't confuse you guys too much, but her perk makes you reload faster in the commander slot. In the support, it gives you shield regeneration whenever you reload. That is an example of a perk that's not that helpful. It's actually the only hero in the entire game that buffs your reload speed. So little things like that could change in the future. And I'm going to try to keep the description very, very updated. And I'm going to try and tell you guys which things are good, which things are old and outdated. And so you guys can have all of the proper information. All right, you guys, let's talk about heroes. So as I'm recording this, it is October 24th, the day before the Gravedigger had just come to the game. And I want to get a few things out of the way right off the bat. Everything in this video or in these future videos, I haven't decided if this will be a four-part series on all the hero classes or if I'm just going to do one monster video that'll probably end up being more than 45 minutes long. I don't know yet, so if there are any weird cuts at some point, like at the end of the video and in the future episodes, then now you understand. But I want to get it out of the way right away that everything in these videos are going to be my personal opinion based on a lot of experience. So... I haven't played this game as much as the next guy necessarily, but I, I am power 131. I've been playing for a year and a half now, and I would like to think I know my stuff. And there are a lot of factors that go into what makes a best hero, and I'm going to say it right off the bat. There isn't one. There is no best hero for any anything. Um, for any main class, it, there are certain best heroes for if you want to run around really, really fast, there is literally no other hero that buffs your movement speed straight up. There are a couple of outlanders that buff your phase shift speed, but you see what I mean? Like, already, as I've picked my one example of a best hero, there's already other options. So, there is no one best hero. It absolutely depends on what you are doing. And that's why I've decided to either break this series down or this video down into the four sections of all the different heroes. I favorited many of the heroes that I want to talk about in these sections, and uh, so there's a lot to cover. And I wanted to start with the most important stuff and work my way down. So for soldiers, I'll give you an example of what I've got set aside here. I've got a lot of the main soldiers that do exactly what a soldier should do. Now, the basic idea for soldiers is that they are really, really good for damage. So, I mean, if you put on a soldier like, you know, Rescue Trooper Ramirez or Havoc or Sledgehammer, these guys are just going to buff your straight-up damage and your crit damage, and that's kind of what a soldier should do. However, there are some other more fun options. If you want to do, say, a grenade loadout, I got a video on that, link below. Um, this Battlehound Jonesy isn't somebody I'd ever recommend for any reason, but if you are going to make a grenade loadout, I believe I still have mine uh, constructed here, then he's pretty integral. But a grenade loadout is very, uh, very gimmicky and not really the topic of today's video because it's not the best for anything other than dinking around when you've got a Stonewood V-Buck mission. So let's start from the very, very tippity top and get something out of the way right away. Um, Rescue Trooper Ramirez and Sledgehammer will be treated as equals in these series because they effectively are. So if you're doing this yourself, this bonuses tab is something that's fairly well hidden. I don't know that many people for use it. I often forget about it, but it's amazing for what we're talking about here because every hero in the entire game is, uh, is a perk, basically. <laughs> you should treat every single hero in the entire game as a perk and then go from there. Like Sledgehammer, yeah, he's a character, and I guess he's got voice commands, uh, dialogue that he might have in-game, but effectively, Sledgehammer is going to do this, 
end this depending on if he's in your support or your lead. So let's finally uh, officially start this section. This will be the beginning of soldiers. So I'm going to timestamp just about everything that I can in the description so you guys can follow along. And uh, without further ado, let's let's get into soldiers. So rescue trooper Ramirez is a personal. Oh, what am I doing? I don't show again. How can I upgrade her? She's maxed. Come on, game. <laughs> So, Rescue Trooper Ramirez is uh, probably one of the best soldiers in the game. And I, I say that with a huge asterisk in saying if you just want to do more damage, Rescue Trooper Ramirez or Havoc, if you did the Twitch Prime event in 2017 or 2018, whenever that came out, um, he's fairly rare if you have him, you know, congrats. But he's uh, definitely the same thing as Ramirez. They are identical. So, uh, also is Sledgehammer. I'm going to show a bunch of math on screen right now. If you want to give it a read, go for it. But that is our proof. All of the numbers in here are based off of a basic crit damage hemlock schematic. And you can see that pretty much how you, no matter how you slice it, uh, Sledgehammer and Ramirez balance out in the end to do the exact same damage. That's all I'm going to talk about in this video. Uh, if you'd like to discuss it more, our Discord is a fantastic resource. So, that being said, Ramirez is a very basic, awesome option. She just buffs your damage by 50% in the lead. And personally speaking, is one of my main heroes, and kind of why I started with her, because you should know about her. That being said, Sledgehammer is, you know, a, a perfectly good option, but every time I've ever done the math, uh, he seems to be about 10% better in support. I'm not saying that's flawless math. I haven't put it under nearly as much scrutiny as the as the commander argument, but he, he seems to do better in support, and I prefer female characters generally. It's just how I play games, and um, she's kind of she's kind of a favorite amongst my men friends anyway. I don't I like the soldier dude, but that's preference. That's completely preference, and, and he is a, a perfectly good option if you're running a crit loadout as well. So those are the top three right off the bat, but I want to get into one that's not maybe as well known, but that's Rex Jonesy. So you're gonna see a common theme throughout all of these uh, all of these parts here, and that is the Dino set. These guys are amazing. <laughs> so Rex Jonesy is only good under the circumstance that you're using the Blast from the Past team perk. Any of the Dino heroes will give it. So you've got Rex Jonesy, you've got Iza, uh, wherever I can find her, prehistoric Iza, and then you've got the uh, Paleo Luna, and then we've got the the Outlander, which is Fossil Southy. Obviously, regenerating uh, energy and doing more melee damage isn't exactly uh, going to be helping you in a soldier loadout, but if you're going to be using Rex Jonesy, then you're going to want Blast from the Past, because his commander perk is severely limited if you don't have it. 9% of your current health will go towards damage on your next range weapon hit every single second, so Blast from the Past triples your health. So you will do three times as much damage if you're running Blast from the Past with Rex Jonesy, then you can just go ahead and throw on Prehistoric Iza, and I would do Southy. I mean, unless there's some chance that you'll be using a melee weapon, which, hey, if you're going to be fighting a mini-boss that has smokescreen, you might actually want that melee weapon. But ultimately, Rex Jonesy in the lead, 9% of your current health is a lot. So if you're a max level player like I am and you use some 130 heroes in your support, it's not unusual. In fact, if you're playing with a group of higher level players, it's actually quite common that you'll start the mission before you even boost your health at about a million. And that makes for very easy math. So a million means... Every one second of firing, basically, one of your bullets will do 90,000 extra damage, completely separate to any of your weapon perks. That's effectively take any weapon you're using and just add 90,000 90, DPS. That's not necessarily as much or more than Rescue Trooper Ramirez. That completely depends on what weapon you're using. But with Rex Jonesy, Rex Jonesy, it's kind of funny that not only does he affect every ranged weapon, whereas she only affects and he only affects assault and SMGs, you can use a gray pistol, shoot a zombie, and that ranged weapon will add 90,000 damage. So it's a really interesting, interesting perk. And I put him right here up at the top because the dino heroes, I would genuinely consider them to be among the top four heroes in the game simply because of Blast from the Past. That is amazing. It's an amazing, amazing team perk. And I'll link my video below on exactly everything about that. But that's that's not exactly the topic of the video. That's a team perk. We're, we're talking about heroes, which are closely related, but not exactly the same thing. Moving on, let's talk about Crackshot and Bulletstorm Jonesy. So you'll see that I'm putting them in the exact same category, even though they're not 
really the same heroes. They're just very, very similar. I don't have him favorited because he's purple down here. But Boltstorm Jonesy and Crackshot are effectively the same thing. So Boltstorm Jonesy, um, he ups your ranged weapon damage by 1% up to 25. And then 2% uh, ranged weapon damage up to 25. And, and he, you know, that's that's basically the same thing as Crackshot. <laughs> Crackshot goes up to 50 stacks in your support. And then it just kind of increases your damage a lot. Crackshot in your support goes up to about 150% of a damage buff if you have him in your lead and that's a lot you'll be hitting like a truck but you're pretty much going to need uh mag size perks or lmgs if you're going to try to be hitting for past 50 bullets consistently and that uh that added weapon stability is almost irrelevant especially on pc pc all we have to do is pull our mouse down a little bit I i've never ever noticed a difference in stability i've used crack shot with and without him in the support, I've used him as my main, I've not used him as my main, I've never felt the difference in that stability, so I, I consider it a non-factor. And Crackshot basically goes up to 50 stacks and Boltstorm Jonesy goes up to 25. So Boltstorm Jonesy, in my opinion, is just a weaker version. <laughs> he stops at 25 and the other guy stops at 50, but they have effectively the same bonus, even though they're they're slightly different. So a fantastic option nonetheless, but, you know, I'm, I really am working from the, from the top down here. And then Skull Ranger Ramirez is one of these uh, interesting points where I, I wouldn't consider her a commander necessarily, like a contender for a commander, because this fire rate and damage works out to be almost identical. You'll find, as I go out throughout this video, uh, the, the overall damage bonuses between Rescue Trooper Ramirez, Sledgehammer, Crackshot, like almost everybody. I have actually, I've actually talked around to Tic Tac, shout out to him in DMs about this quite a bit, and we've tested almost every like considerable, considerably good soldier, and they almost all work out to be within the margin of you won't notice it, <laughs> which is negligibility. And that is to say that, yes, sure, on a mathematical level, crack shot is better after 50 shots real world the only time you're hitting 50 shots is if you hate reloading and switching your weapon and or if you're shooting a mini boss so like it, it really doesn't make a difference and then you've got skull ranger ramirez who has uh not only limited by the reload meaning all of this bonus that she gives you needs you to reload whereas you know rescue trooper is just active constantly but it also substitutes actual damage for fire rate now something to be very aware of in fortnite is uh a, a difference when you talk about damage per second so there are certain situations i'll head over to my smgs real quick just to show you that there there is something to talk about here i'm gonna actually pull up my my bobcat so my bobcat is critting crit damage that used to be fire Fire rate and damage and the reason for that was in a per damage per second you know head to head fire rate and damage is identical to crit rate and crit damage the only difference is crit rate and crit damage has you know obviously the slower fire rate but it's more damage per bullet rather than you know just more damage per second and that's one of the differences between fire rate and raw damage so you might not shoot as fast without that fire rate buff but you're kind of shooting a lot of lesser damage bullets rather than slower more powerful bullets in the end it's kind of the same in fact I actually actually have some weapons that are still fire rate damage simply because I love the fire rate. In fact, I'm looking for the typewriter right now. That's a slow firing weapon just regularly. Uh, 11 and a half is after that, that fire rate buff. And so that's a fairly slow firing weapon, but that thing with fire rate is such a joy to use. It just, oh, it's, it sounds amazing. And I'm kind of forgetting that this is a tab. Oh, I should be using this more often in this video. So yeah, Skull Ranger Ramirez, uh, the reason I even brought her up at all is because she's actually pretty good in the support. Um, I, I would say that she she has her use case. I don't personally use her, but that doesn't mean that you guys shouldn't. If you don't have a ton of options or if you have Skull Ranger Ramirez and you just want her, uh, five seconds, by the way, is more than enough time to empty your clip. Any normal weapon with 50 to even 87 bullets and like a somewhat decent fire rate is going to empty its clip in two to four seconds, depending on your weapon. It absolutely depends. Obviously, if you put like uh, Stars and Stripes Jonesy as your lead and then you put Light Show Spitfire in your support and then you put, you know, all four mag perks on your Mercury LMG like I did in this video description below, you can shoot for two minutes straight. That's that's going to slightly outlive the 15% 15, 15 you know, for five seconds. Two minutes is a bit more than five seconds, but in any conventional loadout, that's kind of just a, a joke for the plug, any any conventional loadout, that five seconds is going to be more than enough of time to uh, enjoy that 15% damage buff. So she's a great option, but I, I think that if you unlock later game heroes and have more, more availability, then 
you know, she, she might be replaced fairly easily. And uh, that moves us on to first shot Rio. So I was going to talk about Stars and Stripes Jonesy, but he's kind of a universal character. So I, I classed him right alongside Survivalist Jonesy, who I never even favorited here. Uh, and that's because these two are worth talking about. And boy, do I have something to say, but they're going to work in pretty much every situation. I'm just going to talk about damage per second heroes right now, and we'll move, on, we'll move on after that. So first shot Rio is not much to talk about. The only time you'd ever want to use her is if you're using like the crap. No not crack shot i'm thinking about the, the the hydra or the rat king these are two weapons that fire in like one shot and that's because they will be able to use up that 100 percent crit chance so if you're using like a hydra for example you can basically every single shot do like 150,000 damage or more especially if you headshot and that's a very very powerful thing if you're using first shot rio you absolutely need sledgehammer in the support obviously i've said that he's identical to ramirez and her damage buff will boost your your crit damage so you'll have a 100 percent crit chance which means you'll always be critting and that crit will go up with that 17 percent damage but you probably just want both of these but sledgehammer is definitely what you want if you're constantly critting so that 75 percent damage buff to crit is only balanced because you don't always crit but if you are always critting he is absolutely the better option no contest the the thing to say lastly about first shot rio is that you really need need the correct weapon set or else it's just not going to be that useful so i'll actually show it and case you're oh, actually here i can uh, just go to my schematics i could actually show you in case you don't actually know what the hydra is i don't even think i have a rat king schematic i'm gonna look for it real quick but we do have the hydra schematic right here uh and that's because every time i've looked at it uh the, the hydra king the hydra seems to have more straight up damage than the rat king but if you have either both are great so what i have here is you can see that it, instead of a crit rating crit damage loadout i have a double crit damage loadout because I only ever use this weapon with first shot Rio, and in that instance, you are always critting, and it, it makes for a very, very fantastic loadout. All right, lastly is one of the reasons that I'm happy to make in this video when I am. So, Break Pack, Break Beat Wildcat is a hero so new, I don't even know her name, and uh, this Battle Beat loadout is uh, something completely new. So, Rock and Riff was added in a recent update, I don't even know which one. It's a very interesting thing to consider. Um, I haven't decided whether or not it's it's great yet, that's up to you guys if you want to try stuff out, but I have I have found some good use for Breakbeat, Breakbeat Wildcat in my support because uh, all, of the, all of the different Rock and Riff heroes have different forms of activation, like the Outlander for example, uh, one of these guys, I think he's the, the black dude football player, or at least this chick. Harvesting Metal gives you um, the, the Rock and Whiff wafers, you just eat those and it gives you the ability for a short while and then there's a bunch of different options. I mean, point is, um, with her, eliminating 10 enemies in 9 seconds basically just buffs your damage by 50%. And that's in your support. So, if you're killing a lot of enemies, and this does work from traps, by the way, any form of killing, defenders and traps, once the defense starts, you'll be hitting for 50% extra damage on top of Rescue Trooper Mira. So, if your base damage is 100,000 DPS, she'll buff it by 50, she'll buff it by 50, so you got you know, that's separately. So 20,000 or 200,000 damage per second you would get in that instance. Uh, very, very interesting hero. Again, that takes 10 enemies in 9 seconds, and then it's only uh, a decaying over 8 seconds. And from what I understand, decaying means that 50% will be decreasing until it's gone. I don't know exactly the slope of that, if it's, you know, linear, or if it goes down to 40 and then straight down to 30 and then just sort of decays slowly. I don't know what that, that graph would look like, but... It's something to consider. I've used her in my melee loadout because I have found that it's not uh, not too uncommon that I'll be killing a lot of enemies at once, but uh, frankly, I usually don't get the bonus, and half the time I forget she's there, so I'm probably going to call that one a dead support perk on that front, but... You know, again, that's up to you guys to decide. And now we're going to get into some of the more specialized heroes. So starting with the, the shotgun heroes, there's only really two to talk about. And that's Buckshot Raptor and uh, 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 Renegade Raider, Shrapnel Headhunter. So yeah, this is actually identical to Renegade Raider, if you guys didn't notice. Pretty cool hero to have and save the world because some uh, Battle Royale normies will come over and think you're super OG. But um, yeah, she's identical to Rescue Trooper Ramirez, and he's identical to um, uh, Sledgehammer. Only difference being they affect shotguns and the other two affect, you know, SMGs and assault rifles. That's pretty much it. There's nothing more to say about these two that I haven't said before. He's better in support, I think, from the math I've done. 
I prefer her in the lead. It doesn't really matter. There is something to talk about, especially with shotguns, and that's that buffing all of your damage by 50% means you're always doing more damage than normal, whereas making your crits do a ton of damage means only when you crit are you actually getting his bonus. So especially when it comes to shotguns, I would personally prefer to be doing 50% more damage always rather than 225% on top of your normal crit damage sometimes. That's just up to me. Um, you guys obviously can do whatever you want. This is an informational video to give you the tools you need to build whatever loadout you'd want. Uh, and then uh, for, for pistols, there is more to talk about. I have a whole pistol guide in the link in the description below. But for pistols and soldiers, I think Quick Draw Calamity is the only one that actually directly buffs pistols. All of the other pistol heroes are over here in the pistol section, and I'll cover that in the uh, pistol segment of this series. And Quick Draw Calamity is, uh, well, does what she does. In the first six shots, she buffs it by 20%, 25, and then 16, 75. Pretty self-explanatory. She'll buff your first six shots. And that's an interesting thing to know because if you're looking to use her, you're going to want to make sure your pistol has six shots. So the Blaster Time Mini is now an SMG, but it used to be a pistol, so I'll use it for an example anyway. Uh, this is a weapon that has 35 bullets in the magazine, probably why they made it an SMG. So 29 of those shots would just be completely unaffected by uh, by Calamity. So if you're going to use her, the last word is basically like her pistol. That and the Judge. I don't think I have the Judge powered up, but it is that six shooter pistol. If you can already picture it in your head, then congratulations, you're winning. There it is. So the Judge is basically like her, her main pistol in all of her artwork, but the mag size is like six and that's exactly what she buffs so it's kind of a great you know combo deal there she uh definitely works for whatever she does and um <laughs> calamity is an interesting one because calamity comes with the uh the support uh the, the team perk that gives you a certain amount of damage if you switch your weapons in a certain amount of time i don't even know exactly what it does because it's not uh not exactly the most useful thing i don't even know where it is but it, it is interesting to note that uh all mythic heroes come with their own team perk and i can actually show a picture from our discord if you guys want to join it link below where uh i'm gonna have to open the original aren't i where i actually have a list of the initial uh v8.0 update where they added all of these this is very old news and i can link that patch in the description below but this won't cover all of the new mythic heroes although this does cover a huge amount of the heroes already in the game this stuff is pretty well hidden in the main game so it's kind of nice to see that quick draw calamity has hot swap and eliminations increased damage for every time you switch your gun so it's just something to know that if you guys want to use that as a resource but uh, the only other mythic hero that we'll be talking about in this video primarily is wukong but i can address master grenadier ramirez so uh that's it for quick Draw calamity she's really the only one that actually buffs pistols so next we'll talk about wukong and wukong is one of those heroes that i put in the everything section alongside stars and stripes and survivalist and that's because you could pretty much stick him on any loadout shotguns pistols ars you could put this on your any any situation where you're killing enemies by hand because every six every six kills will just uh make everything explode into a ton of damage and that's actually a pretty good loadout i use him if there's like a spare spot and i don't really care like that ninja loadout i mentioned earlier this would probably be a better option six kills they just all explode in place but um that's that's just it's it's i don't know every time i've ever put him in a loadout i have found a better alternative so he's just something to know but as for the team perk, he's the guy that gives you Soaring Mantis. So if you like ninjas and you, you know, don't want Blast from the Past and you want to jump three times, he gives you some of the best mobility in the entire game. I have no idea why he gives you Soaring Mantis, but he does, and it's awesome. And that's something really important to know if you're looking to recruit Wukong. And then the other mythic, just to cover her, is Master Grenadier Ramirez. She's exactly the example I had earlier with the frags, and that you really wouldn't want to use her unless you're making a grenade loadout. But if you if you do have then she's great for that and her team perk that she gives you isn't really that great it's the cool customer one i've tried using it i literally don't even know what it does like i i know what it does but it, it i didn't notice any different when i used it so i don't know she's uh not really worth her team perk but i mean if you're going to be using a grenade loadout you definitely want that radius to be bigger so the last two that we're going to talk about for the soldiers and for this video yes i've now decided that this is going to be a four-part series is uh survivalist jonesy and stars and stripes jonesy so i'll talk about survivalist so we can end on a good note <laughs> survivalist uh is great because it gives you passive healing if you have him use him but skipping ahead to the outlander video if you have crossbones 
beret and you're okay with dedicating a part of your inventory to coconuts, coconuts is superior in every way. It heals a third of your health instantly and then gives you passive healing, which is way better than even two campfires for 30 seconds, and it buffs your damage. So coconuts completely outclasses survivalist, even though survivalist is a fantastic early game thing because he is main game. He's quite easy to recruit and achieve just from normal llamas, and it's nice just passive healing, but he is completely outclassed once you get to the later game. In fact, you can completely replace Survivalist Jonesy with just using an Adrenaline Rush or spamming campfires in the world around you, so you don't really need to put him in your support anyway. And the good note to end on is Stars and Stripes Jonesy and Light Show. So I'll put Light Show in the, um, in the timestamp down below just to say that we mentioned him. This is a bad perk for one reason and one reason only. Uh, it buffs your base magazine size. So if you have 30 bullets, this 30% will give you nine extra bullets no matter what. So like my Silent Spectres, for example, they have 56 bullets because of their mag size perk. If I used him in support, that um, that 56 will go up to like 65 or something like that. I, I think it's 56 in their, in their mag size. It doesn't really matter what it is. The point is he's going to add nine no matter what. Okay, it's 52. And I've known that it's, it's also, it rounds down a little bit, but it, you, whenever there's an integer, it rounds down in this game. But in in game this gives you 61 bullets and that's just bad <laughs> it's really like he should give you 30 percent of your end magazine size so it's actually usable but we don't really need to worry about that too much because stars and stripes jonesy does that and he does it better so there's a little bit of math to explain here um what he does here is when they uh chance to refund ammo Oh, that's interesting. I believe it used to say not to consume ammo. I'm not even sure what that used to say. But the point is, it just doesn't shoot. Meaning, uh, that's how we got that LMG to shoot for two minutes straight. Is because instead of just, like, uh, saving a bullet or whatever, it, it just doesn't consume the ammo. So if you, sh if you shoot 30 bullets, you know, you have 30 bullets in your magazine and you use this guy in the support, you'll get about 40, 41 bullets or so. And instead of using 41 ammo, you'll still use just 30. I hope that made any sense at all, but uh, there's another way to explain why I just said that that gave you an 11% bonus instead, or 11 extra bullets instead, and that's because this 24% works on bullets that you say. Let me walk you through this, okay? So if you have 100 bullets and you use this guy, on average, you will save 24 of those bullets. But then that 24% works on that 24. And then however bullets you have, however many bullets you have left after that, the 24% applies to that. We've done the math for you. It's give or take about a, a 1.317 repeat, something like that, something like that. It works out to be about a 31% in the support. And as the lead, this works out to be about a 93.5% that it saves, and that's why that LMG shot for two minutes straight. It saved, of the 400 bullets, it saved 90% of them. So it basically shot another 400. Not to mention we had light show in the support anyway, just to give us 30 extra bullets. And that's the most extreme example of why he's so broken. Literally broken in a bad way. I mean, we had a 400, 400 round magazine, and he gave us 30 bullets. Ugh. Anyway, uh, Light Show, Star and Stripes Jonesy is absolutely the best mag size perk in the entire game. And what's unfortunate is I personally didn't understand this when I first read it. And everybody I've told about this has uh, shown me that most people don't realize exactly what this does. I used to think it just, you know, refunded ammo. Meaning, like, if you um, shot 30 bullets, you would always shoot 30 bullets, but then you just get an X amount of ammo back. No, 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 no. It, it gives you extra bullets and it's amazing. So I actually use him in my main soldier loadout and that's just complete preference i take the damage hit meaning i could be running skull uh i could be using wukong for the damage or the skull ranger for the extra 15 percent damage anything but i prefer to just have all that extra ammo because sometimes you don't need extra damage you just need a bigger magazine think about that for a little while all right if you're watching this then this is part two of my best heroes and save the world series uh if you want to go back and watch the soldier video you're absolutely welcome to but if you click on this you're probably looking to learn about the best ninjas and save the world and that's exactly what we're getting into right off the bat these are my opinions backed by a lot of experience so i do know what i'm talking about i've played this game for hundreds of hours a max level what other accolades do you need i don't know i try to keep myself informed uh and and so i, I do feel qualified to talk about the best heroes here and uh there will be timestamps in the description below for you guys to jump around at your leisure if you're looking for a specific hero they will hopefully be down there if they're not down there ask me in the comments below because uh, I'll explain to you why they're not meaning if you want to know about forged fate then it's probably because heavy attack efficiency isn't uh, isn't that great but in my opinion so we're gonna start right off the bat with paleo luna 
that's probably why a lot of you are here. <laughs> she is hands down the best melee hero in the entire game. She just is. That that 16.5% uh, of your current health and melee damage when you're using Blast from the Past is amazing. Blast from the Past for higher level players is well known to give you about a million HP or more depending on who you're playing with and that roughly translates to about 165,000 extra damage per hit on top of how good your weapon already is. So it's very easy to get about a quarter million DPS when you're using something like the, the Spectral Blade which is my personal favorite sword. This thing's already really, really good with the crits, and she just makes it that much better. So, there's not much more I want to say about Paleo Luna. Her, her reputation sh should speak for herself. She's extremely good, and only really that useful if you're using her with Blast from the Past. If you're using another me melee loadout, please, for the love of God, put her in your support and use Blast from the Past. Um, there aren't any other heroes that'll buff your melee damage more than her, and um, uh, you, you do need Blast from the Past to make that go all the way up. So I would recommend using uh, Dino Southie and uh, the, the chick that makes you very tough, because that 33 armor is, is huge. So... Next up on our list is Whiteout Fiona, and that's basically, uh, oh, no, I wouldn't say it's a requirement, but she's definitely something you want in the support when you're running any loadout that buffs uh, swords or axes or scythes, because that 15 crit rating is almost exactly 15% crit chance, more or less, it's not exact. Um, I'll, link this, I'll link in the description below a list of how it slopes, uh, it's an old Reddit post, but that is a very, very good one to use because it just buffs how often you crit. Assassin Sarah is basically what we used to use, if I can even find her. She is the only other hero in the entire game that I would even compare to Paleo Luna because 18% of your weapon damage stacking five times gives you about a 90% damage buff if you're swinging a lot, but it cools down almost instantly. One stack for five seconds, so you, you need to be constantly attacking to get that damage buff. So most often, you're probably only getting 20 or, you know, 36% or whatever it gives you. So she is a great hero, definitely nice in the support if you want some extra damage, but I'm not gonna lie to you, I'd be surprised if you even felt the difference. So that's it in terms of, like, raw damage. Ninjas mostly are best for swords. There are a lot of options to buff hardware, that'd be constructor side, and then if you want any any specific axe loadouts or scythe loadouts. I'm sorry, I won't be talking about that in this video, and that's simply because this is about the best ninjas, and I've never had anybody convince me that a scythe loadout is amazing. I know, I know the Steam Thrasher is a fantastic contender. This is something that with heavy attack efficiency, haha, fate, you're coming back into the discussion, you know? Uh, it, it can be very good to spin around and do a ton of damage, but that's still kind of a gimmick loadout, and I've I've not been convinced that that's really that powerful. If you have a fantastic loadout for that, let me know in the comments below. Let's talk about it. But uh, we're going to move on to uh, more ability-based discussion, because abilities are one of the biggest things that ninjas offer. Uh, in fact, I'll backtrack just a little bit here and say that Assassin Sarah, with her smoke bombs, dragon slash, and throwing stars, is quite a better loadout than Crescent Kick, Smoke Bomb, and Kunai Storm, because Kunai Storm isn't that great. I don't like it that much. You just jump in the air and do a little bit of damage. It's basically a weaker smoke bomb. And then Crescent Kick is... is blech. <laughs> Throwing Stars gives you range, Dragon Slash will kill everything in front of you, and Smoke Bomb, if used with Alchemist Sarah, uh, we'll talk about her later, uh, will actually heal you. So, Assassin Sarah has a better loadout, but the damage from Paleo Luna is just... Uh, you can't compare. So, in terms of abilities, let's talk about Dragon Scorch. He is hands down the best Dragon Slash hero if you just want a very powerful Dragon Slash. A very, very good second place is Snuggle Specialist Sarah, and I would never suggest using one without the other, because her Dragon Slash leaving that Tail of Energy means you're going to have that constant damage. You can, in fact, slash across a field of enemies and then create a wall of fire that they can't pass. Quite the spectacle. But um, Dragon Scorch is something I would recommend using the support, because that, that three-tile range, two-tile, you know, wide... Also has some pretty good height. That's also, you can actually kill stuff over a tile above your head even if you didn't know that. That Dragon Slash is huge. And it buffs the damage by 25% only in your commander. So if you want to use a Dragon Slash loadout, which in the recent event for Hit the Road is actually exactly what we did. We would complete that uh, 140 no damage taken with Dragon Slash loadouts because we would just swipe across a field of enemy and killed everything in front of us. And that was extremely effective. 
again, I would highly suggest using Snuggle Specialist Sarah in the support with that because uh, it's very, very good. And there is another hero. I think I have her in the book. It might be the Sarah Hotep or something, but there is somebody that reduces the energy cost of Dragon Slash. The problem with that is Dragon Slash has about a 10 second cooldown. So no matter what, the energy is going to be back in time. So I, I don't know. If you're constantly using your smoke bombs and throwing stars, I guess you'd want less energy, but it, it's really not that big of a deal. Next up is Lynx Cassandra. So this is another one that I've sectioned off into the Kunai Storm loadout. And Kunai Storm, I mentioned previously, isn't really that powerful, and I stand by that. But if you're using Lynx Cassandra, something different happens. She has Hang Time, where now Kunai Storm has you floating in the air for four seconds, doing 140% more damage. And that is more damage. So if you're already doing 100,000 DPS, when you use Kunai Storm in the air, you're now doing uh, 240,000 DPS. It's very, very, very powerful. If you're ever using uh, Lynx, I'd highly recommend jumping in the air in front of a Smasher because they will melt in front of you and it is amazing. And if you want to buff that Kunai Storm, uh, you're going to want to talk about Bladestorm Enforcer, making your Kunai Blades explode. And then Dashing Hair Ken, which was that Easter dude, if you couldn't tell what event he was from, he also adds additional egg bombs on top of the kunai blades. So the daggers and the egg bombs are separate. So you've got about whatever it is, I haven't counted, 5 to 10 projectiles going on the ground exploding underneath you. That does some pretty good damage. I killed three Mist Monsters on stream today just doing that. And uh, that was actually very, very powerful. And if you want to have that re cooldown faster, you're going to want Overtaker Hero. Uh, I know, I know. Three heroes dedicated to Kunai Storm and one loadout is probably uh, a bit much. But the Kunai Storm eliminations can decrease your cooldown. Note, that is from the Kunai Storm itself. So if you're in the air shooting stuff, that won't reduce your cooldown as far as I'm understanding here. If, if that's wrong, then you'll find out on your own and that's awesome. Um, I would recommend trying him out anyway, but from my experience, that does not seem to be the case because, I don't know, he was bugged when I first used him, so that might have skewed my current knowledge, but, you know, it is it is at least worth mentioning that. And that's pretty much it in terms of the three Kunai Storm abilities that buff stuff that are worth talking about. Lynx is, um, well, <clears throat> she's favored among the uh, players for reasons that... You could probably figure out on your own, uh, but her damage is great too, and uh, I use her quite often. In fact, I uh, showed in my previous soldier video that I use her for... Uh, today I was messing around with the Soaring Mantis loadout, and that was pretty fun. This is exactly what I used, and it was, uh, it was a good time. And uh, yeah, that hang time is an extremely awesome loadout. Next, we're going to talk about Smoke Bombs, which... He used to be very, very good because the uh, this guy, Infiltrator Ken, was bugged. And he was not only doing his commander perk, but he was like... The, the smoke bomb radius was way bigger than his commander perk is nowadays in the support. So you could use Dim Mach to reduce the cooldown by like 10 seconds, 15 seconds, whatever it was. And um, and he was, was very good. But... That's no longer the case. However, if you want to use Dim Mach Mari, and then you want to make it bigger with Infiltrator Ken, maybe throw on Alchemist Sarah to heal you, Smoke Bombs can be pretty good, but uh, that's pretty much it. It's not as good as it used to be, but I would recommend using him in the support, him, him in the lead to make those Smoke Bombs nice and big, Sarah to heal you, and then Dim Mach in the support, because you want that cooldown to go down. If you're going to have three or even two heroes buffing smoke bombs, you're going to want to be using them as often as possible. And that's it. I'm kind of going to gloss over Alchemist Sarah, but uh, what, it, what there is to say is that the smoke bombs healing you is a fantastic option. In fact, just earlier when I showed my loadout, I, uh, I used Medicinal Fumes because if you're using a loadout where you're going to be in the action all the time, you're going to want to heal on the fly. And Adrenaline Rush is great for that. Campfires are great for that. Coconuts are best for that. But Medicinal Fumes are great because they also affect teammates, and they might even affect defenders. I don't know about that. That's just off the top of my head. And then lastly for ninjas uh, that I have on my list, at least, is, uh, is where is he? Fleetfoot Ken. And he's, you know, he's one of those heroes where if you have a spare slot, then throwing him in your support to buff your 12.5% movement speed is nice. It's not, um, it's not that amazing. You're not going to notice it instantly, but it is something to have, and it is something that once you take it off, you're gonna, you're gonna miss that 12.5%. But in the lead, I wouldn't necessarily think that that is necessary. Like, if you're doing something where you need to go fast, like repair the shelter where you're lo locating modules, uh, having that 37.5% movement speed is amazing. Uh, if you are using the Baron, oh, I don't 
don't actually have a Baron leveled up. I always have people give it to me. But if you have the Baron, um, that buffs your movement speed by 42%, and that does stack. So now you're running at uh, 42% plus 37.5%. So rounding up, what is that? That's a great option if you just want to go fast. But since the Baron is literally better than he is the baron in your hand is better than he is in the support so you do have some options for that one but i figured he was worth mentioning and that's pretty much it for the ninjas you guys there are some other loadouts like uh, you know the shurikens can be fun that can be a very good loadout um someday i might make a loadout on shurikens because i've uh i've, I've heard some some i've caught some wind from my friend that means two things about how throwing stars can be uh really really good but they're not they're not really like good enough to talk about in this video so i'm just gonna leave that as uh to be continued if i ever make a video on that and uh that's it for ninjas you guys all right <sighs> For you guys, it's a fresh new video. For me, it's uh, quite the session because I just talked about soldiers and ninjas. If you guys haven't checked out those videos, they'll be linked below. You should check them out right now. Um, if you're watching in the future, then the, the constructor video should be linked below as well. But today, we're going to be talking about the best outlanders in Fortnite Save the World. And I'm going to say what I say every single time. These are my opinions based on a lot of experience. I've used outlanders for a very long time. I'm aware of what most of the best ones do, uh, meaning like I don't investigate every hero, but if it's, if it's good enough to be good then I've, I've heard of it <laughs> and uh and that, that's basically it time stamps will be linked in the description below if you guys want to check out a certain hero with nothing else in the way for me to talk let's get into archaeologists so archaeologists and uh fossil southie are basically the two crown outlanders for farming in this game there are some people who like the idea of decreasing your phase shift and there is uh instead of flash ac there is there are certain loadouts where the phase shift immediately brings back your uh your, your punch time i think those are fairly jarring and i don't personally recommend those but it, it is an option so what i'll be talking about here is the uh is archaeologist right the bat because she was the uh classic new hero rework best farmer because she reduces your anti-material charge by 128 percent which basically brings it from 50 down to like i think 18 or something it's very cheap <laughs> which means you can punch over and over and over again and uh that costs a lot of energy and that's why fossil southie was such a fantastic addition to the game when he first released he gave you 12 energy per second in the support just like his commander they patched that which means with Archaeologist in the lead, you can pretty much punch five times before you're out. And with Fossil Southie in the lead, you can punch about six times. Because even though you're getting three times as much energy, your uh, cost is, uh, l you know, it's, it's much more expensive to punch. So he gives you a lot of energy back and she reduces the energy per use. So it, it really much, it really depends on which one you want to use. So Fossil Southie, you'll get another punch if you're spamming. But in either situation, you will be constantly regenerating energy so long as you're using Blast from the past which is pretty much the only reason he's good um when shield is depleted so unless you're constantly taking damage and breaking your shield you're going to want to have blast from the past and if you're farming you you definitely want blast from the past just because not only will you be stronger in battle but you won't have to worry about prepping this guy so you're going to want to to have him set up properly and there is something else to note and that's that if you're using archaeologists in your lead not only will you be a nice thick archaeology lady but you'll have southie in the support being one of your two dino heroes to buff Blast in the past. So you can have him and say Iza to make you stronger. And then you'll have three other heroes that you can put in your support. Whereas with him in the lead, you're going to have to have uh, two dino heroes in your support. So you won't have as many options. And that's just something to consider. But both of these are very, very good for uh, allowing your anti-material charge to be as good as it possibly can be. And then Crossbones Beret is something I want to talk about right off the bat. Usually I order the heroes to have the all-around heroes to be at the very last, but I want to talk about him so much because he is probably one of the most important heroes in the entire game. Because Going Coconuts is the best healing method in the entire game. Uh, going Coconuts gives you about uh, about a third of your health, so if you're using Blast in the past, one coconut will give you about 300,000 HP, depending on how much HP you have, and that's huge. That is that is so amazing to pop in the middle of a fight, and not to mention it gives you about 30 seconds of healing afterwards. That is a little bit faster than two campfires, and it buffs your damage by 16%. Uh, coconuts, they just do everything for you. <laughs> they just give you health and damage and uh, another thing in your inventory slot so you can only have you know two weapons instead. But he is one of the most important heroes in the entire game, and he's an outlander. So here he is in this video. You should have him. If you don't have him, you should use a voucher. If you can't use a voucher, then you should email Epic telling them to re-release him because he was locked behind the pirate event and should not have been because this is 
such a powerful perk to have. Next, we're going to talk about Phase Shift and Recon Scout Eagle Eye, Phase Scout Jess, and Flash AC. All three of these guys just buff your Phase Shifts in various ways. If you're looking to move around fast, these are fantastic options. I honestly don't have much to say beyond that, but um, there, there you go. If you're looting very fast, these are definitely three contenders you want to have. Um, but, I mean, that's, that's basically it. They all pretty much buff phase shift in various ways and, and let you move faster. If you're farming, you're also going to want Pathfinder Jess. Uh, believe it or not, in my original notes for this video, I didn't even have her listed because I completely forgot about her. But Pathfinder Jess does exactly that. But you can see, she buffs your pickaxe damage by a lot. In the lead, she's actually one of the uh, potential contenders for your main farming hero because that 50% pickaxe damage is huge. You can two-shot a lot of builds by using that. But I haven't found that to be the way that I like to farm. I like to just punch stuff and have it explode in front of me it's extremely satisfying but i definitely put her in the support because work work usually can take about a hit off of your like one smack off your mining speed sometimes it'll take two if you're breaking down a big wall um but it's just something that's very nice to have in general especially since a lot of the ores in the highest twine zones right now leave you at about 35 health uh work work is is very very nice to just have to to supplement that and i'm going to dedicate this part of the video to sanguine dusk which is one of my old favorites before the hero rework, she had a lot of other abilities that made her one of the best heroes in the entire game. Um, but since then, her phase shift healing you has been nerfed uh, quite considerably. But if you have an extra slot and you happen to have Sanguine Dusk, especially since as I'm recording this, it's early October and Halloween, the official day is coming up and the event for these guys are going to be re-released. And uh, Sanguine Dusk might be joining us soon. And you might want to pick her up just because she'll heal you in the middle of battle. But as I said earlier, uh, coconuts are so much more powerful, it's not even funny. And to phase through enemies means you basically need to put yourself in combat. So it's something that you'd want to kind of take into account. Next, we're going to talk about pistols. Uh, and that's one of those interesting things where um, pistols were talked about in my soldier video and I brought up Calamity. And uh, pistols are almost universally locked behind Outlanders for some reason. And that's where we're going to talk about Beetle Jess and uh, where's the other dude? Ranger Deadeye, who for some reason I haven't made 130. And the last one, which is Gunblazer Southie. So Gunblazer Southie is uh, right here. There you go. If you're going to use pistols, I have a whole video in the description below on the best pistol loadout where I get way more in depth with pistols. But he buffs your pistol damage by effectively double for four seconds after you phase shift. Ranger Deadeye is exactly the same thing as Rescue Trooper Ramirez and Havoc and uh, uh, Sledgehammer. These two are e exact doppelgangers. Um, they basically have the same bonuses, but for pistols. I personally prefer Beetle Jess because, as I've said in previous videos, I like to use the female characters just because that's just you know smaller character models how i play uh ranger deadeye is you know same thing as you know you just buff your damage what else can i say about pistols you guys now let's talk about sub-zero zenith which is by far the most unique hero that i'm going to be talking about in today's video how do i even get into this one sniper critical hits applies water affliction dealing water damage for three seconds that's good i guess if you're in a fire zone but it's really good in your commander perk they not only apply the affliction damage but they freeze them in place so if you have a high enough firing sniper rifle with a decent enough crit chance you will be freezing enemies in place that's a pretty good combo to have i'm not gonna lie um he's definitely if you're gonna be using Using this you're going to want uh some sniper buffing heroes like redline ramirez or rabbit dude these two are again somewhat doppelgangers not exactly in the redline ramirez category but you know they buff your sniper damage and if you're going to be using a hero dedicated to doing sniper damage then you're gonna want that that being said, you're not exactly doing sniper damage. What you're doing in this case is freezing stuff in place, which applies to smashers and mini bosses, not mini bosses, uh, smashers and the other mist monsters and regular enemies and fatties. And if you use something like the, um, do I even have it? I think I have it to put in the book. It's the, uh, what is it? Uh, the vacuum tube sniper rifle. I think this is one of the fastest firing snipers in the entire game with a 15% base crit chance. So if you put even double crit rating on this, you effectively have a freeze ray gun and Sub-Zero Sub Zenith allows you to make that possible. So definitely a good hero to have uh, if you want to go for that really wonky loadout. But I, I put him lastly here just because it's not exactly, <laughs> it's not exactly metagame. And that's pretty much it for the Outlanders, you guys. There aren't too many that are really worth mentioning. Outlanders are namely best for, oddly enough, their pistol heroes and their farming abilities and crossbones berets his own deal with his coconuts all right 
Let's go ahead and do something that I have never before done on my channel before. Believe it or not, I have never talked about constructors in a video before. And that's personally speaking because I think that they are uh, really boring. <laughs> Constructors, you almost can't go wrong, and no matter what loadout you use, they're going to be good to, to use. And and most people who actually understand constructors know that they are, uh, know, know pretty much what they're doing. So, before I get into it, let me just say that this is my opinion based on a lot of experience. I'm not the, the most, uh, biggest fan of constructors, but I, I do know which ones are good and which ones are not. And I'm going to be talking about the best ones, not necessarily all of them, and, uh, let's get straight into it. So, Mega Base Kyle is probably my favorite one to start with, and that's because he has everything you would want from a constructor. He not only increases the base by a huge amount, that's three in every direction, by the way. So if you put that down, that's a huge ring of added effectiveness. But he also adds the Supercharged Traps ability, meaning uh, in your team perk, if you select Supercharged Traps, every single constructor will add a 6.5% damage buff to your traps, meaning uh, at, at best, it's going to be doing doing about 32.5% extra damage because of supercharged traps. So if you're trying to buff a, uh, a trap tunnel, 8.5, my bad. If you're trying to buff a trap tunnel, then this guy is exactly the way to do it. That's a 32.5% bonus. Oh, ju this just in. I, uh, I checked my math after that mistake because I was certain it was 6.5% before, but apparently it's 8.5%. They might have buffed him at some point, but regardless, 8.5% means all five constructors in your support would be doing 42.5% extra damage if you have all of these filled out. So 42.5% extra damage for your traps is uh, not a bad deal. And he's not everybody's main constructor because if you're trying to do... Uh, let's talk about what constructors usually do. If you're trying to buff traps, Mega Base is great. If you're trying to build your walls as strong as possible, Base Kyle is what you need. If you're trying to do something like counter exploding death bomb, which is a stupid team perk, I'm a stupid uh, modifier. I, I don't do missions with that. But if I have to, I like to use power base Nox because he will buff 11% of your max health every 10 seconds, which means you can mostly counteract that. But I'll, I'll get into them more specifically later. Mega base Kyle is great for that team perk. So if you don't have him recruited, you should. Supercharged traps is absolutely a, a super powerful thing for the later game. And uh, let's move on to, to base Kyle. I, I suppose uh, it doesn't really matter where we go next because any Kyle <laughs> any Kyle constructor is is pretty much going to be awesome almost all of them are really really nice to have um, but base Kyle is one of the most infamous because buffing your building health by 84% is huge um, in the later game that metal that three tier metal can get into like the 20,000s if you use um lofty architecture here and that's just a really really great thing i always like i said you can't go wrong with constructors i was gonna say i always throw them in my support but like you can throw him in the support you can put mega base in for the extra range i constructors are always great in support you can just mix and match constructors nowadays and i think constructors were one of the class loadouts that the, the, the class of heroes that got best affected by the hero rework back in March or May or whenever that was, whenever they just redid every single hero in the entire game, link below to that video. Uh, constructors became mixed and matchable. You can just, you can just construct, if you will, your perfect loadout based on constructors. And that's again why I never did a video on it because I think it's fairly intuitive. Um, but let's just continue with the bases. Um, power base Nox is something that's very important to understand exactly how he works. So he heals it based on a percent every 10 seconds. So 4 and 11 uh, respective to your standard and commander perk. If you want to get the absolute most out of him, you need to make that percent as useful as possible. Meaning, if you're trying to do a hard mission where your base is going to be attacked, then you want to have your metal or brick walls all the way maxed out. Because if you only have a thousand, this is only going to give you 110 health. But if you have 10,000 health, this is going to give you 1,100 every heal. Uh, and that's uh, that's a big difference. And those really are the differences. I mean, like metal, I don't even know what it is. 1,700, something like that. But if you max it out, it's in the 10,000s. I know that for sure. Uh, or at least very close to it. Um, so you want to max that stuff out to get the most out of Power Base Nox. And that's why you typically want to use him in the Commander perk if you're going to be needing him. And it is important to note that some of these do stack. Not every Constructor ability stacks to my knowledge, but I have seen Lofty Architecture take priority 
even after you place your base, somebody comes in with lofty architecture and your walls are going to get a lot stronger. So that's why you'd probably want to put mega base down, get the range of the base set, and then base Kyle on top of that, somebody with power base Nox. You're about to build a very, very, very strong castle right there. And if you're going to do that, we're going to skip uh, the base real quick, uh, heavy base Kyle. We're going to skip him real quick and talk about Electropulse Penny. And that basically makes it so that any time your structure is attacked, they hit themselves. Simple as that. So if you're going to be using, you know, a, a big base, a strong base, a healing base, Electropulse Penny basically makes the base work for you. I use her and any combination of the other constructors whenever I'm doing easy V-Buck missions because I can just slap down a base and not fire a bullet. Uh, the other way to do that is Thunder Thora, but we'll get to her after Heavy Base Kyle. Heavy base Kyle, when I said that all the all the Kyles are good, was probably the exception. Field of base is, um, I, I haven't found that to be amazing, but after enemies are killed standing on your structure, it charges it, and after 30 charges, it explodes, dealing a little bit of extra damage. That 39 base energy damage isn't insane, and I, I haven't seen it, I haven't ever actually noticed it doing damage. I know it does, I just... The fact that I haven't noticed doesn't give me a lot of confidence in saying that it's, uh, you know, it's that great. But I see it used a lot, so I figured it was worth mentioning. And that was Thunder Thora being skipped. <laughs> Thunder Thora is one of the most overrated constructors in the entire game. Uh, a lot of people use her because Electrified Floors is great. It makes people take damage when they're standing on it. It makes them take a very tiny amount of damage. Um... I haven't ever noticed this making a difference in any serious mission ever. Uh, it's only every 5 seconds and 12 and a half isn't a lot and you definitely don't want to use her as your, as your commander. There are so many better options. But what I do use her for is what I mentioned is those early missions. You put on Mega Base Kyle and then Electropulse Penny so that they attack the base and hurt themselves. And then Thunder Thora. All you got to do is spread out the floor in like a Stonewood mission and the mission will do itself. Everything will die as soon as I touch the tiles. It's marvelous. Next up is Ice King. Ice King is definitely the kind of hero that you can throw into a support making them have snared is nice because snare snacks <laughs> i'm gonna leave that in snare stacks in this game so whenever you have wooden floor spikes it you know it, it pricks them and then they walk slower and then you hit them with a slowed and snared weapon that stacks and then this guy's 50 percent stacks on top of that you can basically make a Smasher's Charge run in place if you use all three of those combined. So, whoa, look, it's Editing Beast for the first time in this series because I forgot something so major that I'm I'm pretty embarrassed by it. And that's that uh, the Ice King, I only covered his support bonuses, and that's because I wanted to lead into the fact that he is an amazing commander. If used appropriately, especially if you use wall spikes or something, the way that his commander perk works is once when uh, enemies smash your walls, they actually freeze themselves in place and take frost damage in the process. So if you stack something like Electropulse Penny and uh, the wooden wall spikes or the, the whatever, the wall spikes, you can make it so that enemies will kill themselves very, very effectively on your walls. Then you throw in some lofty architecture, some healing builds, mega base to make it bigger. I, you can basically make a fortress. So his Frozen Castle ability is uh, very aptly named, and he is a very, very good hero in the lead. And that's why I say he's very good in support support, but he's even better if you use him correctly as a commander. If you're using the Ice King and Floor Spikes, go in there with your slowed and snared weapons and tap on Smashers. They will spend way more time inside of your tunnels, but if they get too close to you, you're going to want Bomb Squad Kyle. I don't need to explain this, do I? Armor is good. What I can't explain is my understanding of armor. That's not a percent. So the way that 22 works is the idea is that it, it is a percent, but it's kind of not. And that's that if you're taking damage, your normal death rate, call it 100, armor will make it 122. So it's not, it is a percent, but I, I don't, as I've been told, it doesn't exactly work that way. It just adds survivability. I don't even know the factors for this. All I know is if you want to live longer and be stronger, use him. Uh, but Iza is so important, and I'm actually disappointed in myself because she was the number one constructor on my list to talk about, and here we are nine minutes in, and I haven't even mentioned her. Uh, although I have mentioned her in my Soldiers, Ninjas, and Outlander guides. Link below. But uh, she is probably one of the best heroes in the entire game because of Blast from the Past. Blast from the Past is that team perk that gives you three times health and you need two dino heroes. I use her almost every single time I need that to be activated because that 33 armor is great. And as I do understand, I believe it's stacked. 
back. So if you use her and Bomb Squad Kyle together, especially with Bomb Squad Kyle as your lead, Blast on the Pass, her and the support, you can basically be a tank. Although him plus her would be 99, but her with the lead and him and the support would be 122. So I mean, she's a dinosaur, but he has a bomb suit. I, I guess dinosaurs are stronger. Either or, both are great. Um, I've never personally used Bomb Squad Kyle because of prehistoric Iza, but I mean... He's an option. You can you can throw him on there. He's basically like the B team and she's the A team. Now, towards the end here, I wanted to mention not controller Harper, although I'm gonna throw her into this video anyway, because this decoy cooldown is huge. If you're ever doing a stall tactic where you need stuff to be distracted a lot, decoys are great and she's what you want. There's not much more I could say about that, but there you go, decoys. Uh, I wanted to talk about Machinist Harper, wherever she went. Uh, she's up here. Machinist Harper is <sighs> I, I guess the only time you'd ever use her is Endurance or Storm Shield Defenses. So increasing the trap durability is never going to be useful in a conventional mission. Uh, if it ever is useful in a conventional mission, either you're using way too many traps or you're, or you're doing something in a really weird way. I've never needed her in a conventional mission because your traps are typically going to survive an 8 minute defense. But if you're doing Endurance or a Storm Shield Defense where your traps are going to be getting hit hard for hours at a time, using her, especially as a commander, is going to make them last 52 and a half percent longer which is is considerable if a gas trap can fire 40 times i don't think that's its durability but for the sake of conversation if it can fire 42 times 40 times this basically makes it like 60 sometimes 62 times something like that that's a pretty good deal that lasts for a lot longer and that's pretty much the only time you'd ever need machinist harper i think we had talks of use or no we did use her in um was it was it frost night i don't know we use her in in some situation i, I don't know if she had that ability before the hero rework, which is when Frost Knight occurred. Point being, she is very, very useful if you absolutely uh, know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, Warden Kyle is something I wanted to mention just because if you don't have a ton of constructor options, but you happen to have Warden Kyle, it makes it so that you and your allies heal when you stand on the base. That's nice to have. Um, it's not great. Even survivalist is better, and if you have a base set up, you should probably have traps killing stuff, so survivalist should be active anyway, but it is an option if you want to just have passive healing. Again, he is only recommended if you have no other options, uh, even a campfire would do better than that. A campfire plus machine is Harper for that added durability, it would be, uh... Probably better than Warden Kyle, but I wanted to mention him because he's such a basic and, you know, moderately helpful hero. And lastly, I'm going to end it on a very fun note, and that is Demolitionist Penny. This is your hero in the game that will uh, buff your rockets. I think it's the only hero in the entire game that buffs rockets, but um, there she is. 50% added damage on a Santa's Little Helper means, let's see, let's see actually, my Santa's Little Helper, when I'm alone, not inside of a group, is hitting for... 265,000. So when I was in a group, mine was hitting for about half a million, and she buffs your base damage. So that was adding about 130,000 to that, so I was hitting for about 650,000 damage per shot on that rocket launcher, and so uh, Demolitionist Penny is uh, very, very fun if you're only using rocket launchers, and if you can afford that, that is an extremely fun way to play. And lastly, on top of her, she was my last point, but 8-bit demo is worth mentioning because he reduces durability after a ability is cast but i'm not even gonna lie to you guys i would love it if somebody could explain it in the comments um check first if somebody else has explained it don't spam the comments with this but i i'm not even entirely sure what this means um after ability cast i assume that means after you put your base down but i don't know if that six uses of the durability resets after a reload or if it's only every time you move your base Regardless, if you are using rockets only, you're going to want that 40% less durability because, you, I mean, rockets are very, very expensive and they go out fast. In fact, that Santa's Little Helper I use for an example, I have a durability perk on there and it only lasts for about 22 or 23 shots. So 40% would mean that would last for, I don't know, 28, 30 shots instead. And that's kind of a nice option if that's even possible. But again, I don't even fully understand how he works and it has prevented me from using him in the past. That's it, everybody. Those are my picks for the best constructors in the entire game. And 
also the first time I've ever talked about them in a dedicated video. So hopefully this is useful to some of you. Let me know if you learned anything. I like to hear about that stuff because whenever I toss these videos out, they just kind of go out into the wind and then some of them get views and some of them don't. But if you tell me if it helped you or not, it really does make my day to hear about that. So let me know if I missed anything. Uh, let me know if I got anything wrong. Leave them in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is the conclusion of my four-part series on all of the best heroes in Save the World. So since we're on the topic of heroes and updated information, and since I already sort of covered all of the uh, items in the game, uh, with, through that video I should say, uh, farming is a very important thing. Knowing which loadout to use is very, very good. Probably no surprise, this is going to be the mantra of the video. I'm going to link my best farming loadouts video down below as well, right below the how to get every item video. I'm not going to be demonstrating anything in this video. And what you're farming for is uh, all of those resources to craft not only weapons and melees and stuff like that, but also traps. Now, traps are a little bit of a trickier topic because you guys want to know how to defend things. And one of the biggest questions I got was how to do individual missions. And by that, I mean, I'll go into Twine just because I can see everything a little easier. And you know what, let's go to Snowwood because that's probably what a lot of people are going to be seeing right away fight the storm defending an atlas or retrieve the data where the balloon comes down from the top these are the kind of things that you will learn from experience uh, which missions are good and worth running and whatnot and that is essentially its entire video in and of itself uh, to include it in today's starter guide video would make this a very long video and if you guys want me to do a series on how to cover these individual missions i can but most of them come down to setting up certain walls and putting tunnels in front of them, and that was pretty well covered in my trap video. Now, it's probably a while ago now, so I, oh, I can, yes. Beast Guide to Trap Tunnels. Okay, welcome to a video that was highly requested and something I have put off for a very long time, and that is a guide to trap tunnels. And the reason I've never done this is that generally my videos are pretty well structured and very focused on a single thing, and trap tunnels are inherently not that. But through playing many, many missions, I have found that there are a couple of key little sections here that I use in pretty much every single mission that you can mold to any environment. So this is going to be by no means a complete list of every way to trap every single mission ever. But honestly, you could use one of these different kind of components in every section of any tunnel that you'll ever need to make. And I try to record some gameplay on stream, so I'll hopefully fill any kind of dead space or examples with that footage so you can see real-world applications. Now, I honestly can't really see a better way to get started than to just go. So first and foremost, we're in Plankerton. That's just because it's a big empty space. There is literally no other reason. It is my understanding that Plankerton affords us the most natural amount of empty space that we can just talk clearly here. Now, uh, obviously in normal endurance or normal storm shield defense, they spawn out here. And let's actually start on the far right here to get into how you sort of want to funnel. Now, I talked about this a long time ago, but funneling is hugely important. And there's kind of a rule of threes. So my cones here are meant to be where the zombies are spawning. They're meant to be in and around this area. Now, you can ignore that ramp for now. That's not really meant to be here. Uh, well, it's not really meant to be part of my demonstration. But the idea is that, generally speaking, you want three walls out from the nearest little purple thing. You know, those little purple spawning indications. If there's one of those right there, then you might want to continue this tunnel out just like this. And you can reinforce it even further by building walls like this or doing it like this. Or if you're in a corner like we, uh, like we have here, then some people will do something where they put a cone just like that. That can work. A lot of endurance nerds really enjoy that kind of stuff i believe that these uh these floor here's are quite unnecessary i rarely do this but what you're seeing here is a very basic pattern that i do almost second nature at this point i don't even really think about it but wall plus ramp means there are two different walls they need to walk through meaning a row of three is a lot in the way for a zombie to ignore and they'll just walk through your tunnel instead and I actually, since we're starting over here, I might as well say this now. Um, something that's really nice is going to be partnered with that original tunnel down there. But honestly, the timeout room is almost more of just like a, a reminder. I'm sure anybody who's watched tunnel videos forever, I, I don't remember who invented it. I am so sorry. I never really watched much of David Dean. It might have been him. If there is somebody who can be accredited to the timeout room, please comment below. This is not my area of expertise. I have mostly learned just from literal experience and friends and conversations, and I never actually watched any video guys. But the basic concept is really awesome. I've, I've always loved this concept. It doesn't really matter who came up with it in my brain. Whoever did, they, uh, well, thank you, because this is quite the contribution. And that is essentially extending your tunnel by a ton, and we'll do that later on. I'll show it. 
But uh, basically when they go through the tunnel, they'll be hit by the wall launcher and pushed into a corner. And in here you can do whatever you want. You can do gas traps in here. You can put a ceiling zapper, which will do a ton of damage. Generally in normal missions, I'll just do straight broadsides. That's pretty casual for me. Uh, you'll see that I use a lot of floor freeze. They are quite expensive, but... We'll get into why I do that in a little bit. And generally in these tunnels, if you're just being lazy in a normal mission, that'll do it. Like, that right there is basically, I don't even know, like six or eight tiles long. Like, we're only walking through two tiles here, but since they're being pushed back, many zombies, if you have double reload on your wall launchers, I, of course, am rocking right here, double reload, triple impact, they'll be probably sent into this hole once or twice, and then twice again, so they have to walk back out every single time. And that actually, again, you guys, I'm actually kind of chuckling here. I was going to start from left to right, but since we're on a roll, let's start with the tunnel that I was going to talk about in a second. This is a basic tire trap demonstration. We'll get to that later. But this is a tunnel that I don't think anybody, again, I don't know if there was any one creator of this. Somebody did it in my mission one time, and I was like, yes, I am doing that. Because to me, this is like the most brutal tunnel uh, that you can make. And you can honestly, again, I'm showing this because you can stick this anywhere. Any place where you have enough room, uh, you can build something like this. Now, this is a straightforward design where we're just walking through. And the basic concept is you have an entire floor of floor freeze or floor spikes. I mentioned I was going to mention what uh, I'm itching my leg. I was, I mentioned that I was going to talk about what these are for. And obviously, uh, you know, the floor freeze just freeze them in place and they take about 20% more damage. And that is really, really nice. That is definitely my preferred. But these are expensive. Floor spikes are really good, at least at the beginning of the tunnel. I even recorded some gameplay, which you can see here. I probably cut it in where I actually only used floor uh, floor spikes instead of floor freeze. And it worked good. Floor freeze would have definitely been more effective. The enemies would have taken more damage. But honestly, just slowing enemies down was pretty much fine for everything but a smasher. And smashers are always going to be a problem, so they can kind of be ignored in that sense. I, I prefer floor freeze if you can afford it. And this was also an old tunnel made before. For the changes where uh, recently they actually nerfed jailing by making it so that all of these floor freeze and wall launchers can only affect a zombie five times before they're no longer affected and I have not found that to be an issue that has not changed anything at all in my experience and what I always like to say is if your zombie of choice or whatever you're, sh you're pushing back was able to be frozen or stalled whatever five times and it's not dead already you're doing it wrong and that's why we have the broadsides and the gas traps just utilizing every open space of this tunnel so obviously they're going to walk in, get frozen, pushed out. I have put this on a ramp. So there was a ramp down under this floor and enemies were walking up to it. And they were pushed back and barely anything throughout an entire mission even made it past this third bend. This being, uh, whatever this is, six tiles long right here, is hugely overkill. And obviously, like I just said, um, this is going to take away two. This is going to take away two because they're going to get frozen and pushed. So they're not really going to be affected by these wall launchers anymore uh, further into the tunnel. And that's another example of why you might just want to use floor spikes since they might not be able to get frozen. But again, I definitely recommend floor freeze. The gas and the broadsides are just going to be doing... Doing tons of damage the whole way and that leads me to another tip that I cannot say loud enough always have a wall for your broadsides to push against I am going to show some footage basically it shows that broadsides when they're not bouncing against a wall do basically no damage I, I had a little rant on stream and this is a huge thing your broadsides need a wall to bounce against or else they are very useless because they shoot five cannonballs that just go off into the distance and don't do any damage <laughs> basically but if you have a wall on the other side preferably one tile th uh, one tile thick just like this one these two shooting back and forth are going to go back and forth a lot one tile away and they're going to do a great ton of damage this tunnel obviously it's wider it doesn't really allow for one tile but two is going to be just fine and that'll definitely be nice and that's where like right here it looks really natural to put a broadside here, but shooting off into nothing is going to be worse than no trap at all. I mean, literally speaking, it'll do more damage than no trap at all, but not significantly enough, and you'll never notice it. So definitely save your broadside. As for this tunnel in, in example, this is something I use a lot for zigzags. So say that there's like some natural boundary that just doesn't really allow you to build straight on. Say you're defending your home base, but the spawn is over here. You can zigzag this really nicely. You can just do something like this. 
and then the tunnel kind of just builds itself. Say the spawn points are over here and they're walking through here. I would funnel it something like this, you know? Sorry, I'm a little messy here. But yeah, if you could just funnel it something like that, everything is going to be pushed into this tunnel right here. And then you can just complete it like that. You're going to want to have a little bit of an access. You always want to have visibility of your defense because you can try to stop the zombies. You can try to put little, little half walls like this. Propanes will get stuck on these and smashers will trigger. So not only will you wreck your walls, but propanes are going to, they're going to blow it up. Just leave it open. Let them flow through. You got to go with the grain. And again, just wall launchers pushing back at every single opportunity that you possibly can. And then, as I said, any space where there is room for it to bounce against, broadsides are just going to make your tunnel that much stronger. And then your ceiling damage of choice. Uh, it's basically between uh, the ceiling electric field and gas trap. I don't really think that there are other options. You can use a zap, and please do not use tire traps at, you know, one tile high. If you use something like these, you can, if you're going two, tie, or two tiles high, you can absolutely absolutely use a ceiling electric field, maybe it gets propane, maybe tire traps three tiles high is going to be the most effective, but uh, in this case I'll just use a, a ceiling electric just to show that you don't need to use gas. In fact, uh, gas would actually be best with floor freeze because floor freeze uh, holds them in place for long periods of time, giving the gas more time to be effective. Gas does not have affliction anymore, so it's not going to be as effective against uh, the floor spikes when they're just walking through them. So, you know, ceiling electric field would maybe be better in this instance, but if I was using floor freeze, I would still recommend gas. I am really sorry if that's a lot of information, but hey, it's a big topic, and if you have to rewatch this video, do not feel bad. I'm just trying to blurt as much information as I possibly can. So, before we get into the rest of this tunnel, let's take a little break from all that. So, these, as, I'm, as I've been saying, can be as long or as short as you need. A tunnel with a zigzag like this very rarely needs to be longer than four or five little tunnels. Like, the floor spikes is how you can count it. This is only four long. That is plenty. Even in the 164 players, you guys, I have seen very, very few zombies get through this. You're going to need nurses or healing death burrs to, to make them survive long enough to get through that. Uh, you should be completely fine with that. I want to talk about a little bit of stalling tactics. So, obviously, I feel like it should go without saying, any time that you have access to the edge of the world, use a wall launcher. It is literally infinite damage to just push them off the map, and you can just completely avoid any combat by doing so. And mostly in the deserts, if you're ever defending against a nice big slope like this, say that the brick is the ground and the defense is up here, uh, I do this all the time tire traps they bounce down and roll down very effectively pushing things down with it and you can put wall launchers here because the tire traps won't uh, respawn as fast and that can be really effective it's not going to get every zombie so you can maybe take one out of that playbook a lot of times i'll just do like a floor freeze and maybe a couple of broadsides that'll do it honestly if you're feeling overkill just slap a broad uh, slap a gas trap on it and you'll be just fine this module is all me it's also nice to mention that if you do have an enclosed situation like this where it's not really going to help to push them off, you can just put broadsides or something as well, and it'll do a little bit of extra damage. I'm not going to pretend like I invented this. It's not that clever of a design. I'm not that proud of that. But I will say, I didn't see it from anybody. I saw this as like the basic, most compact, you know, FU zombie kind of setup you can make, and this is the lazy tunnel. This is something you can stick anywhere anytime there is any space for a zombie to get through double broadside gas in my personal preference but you know the ceiling electric field would be better against elemental zombies or whatever it doesn't really matter gas or ceiling electric field obviously if you're in an exploding death bomb where it's breaking the walls which by the way uh, they actually don't do quite as much damage anymore so exploding death bomb no longer precludes us from putting walls down here which is really really nice this is brand new information as of like a couple weeks ago so you guys are getting some up-to-date info check the date on this video and any pinned comments down below to make sure that you're getting the best information for the future but yeah assuming that doesn't change exploding death bomb not too bad but definitely put some seeing electric field up there because it'll be out of the range and won't you know get destroyed like the gas trap would but if you don't care again this is a lazy tunnel when i'm talking to chat just trying to build this is very effective and it's the same thing as before three or even four tiles long should do it i have seen this completely prevent any zombies from getting through and we're talking 164 player missions highest level that you can queue that'll do it this is quite lazy and and frankly quite expensive i mean we've got four traps per block here or per tile you know minecraft player here that should do it and these are basically the same thing if you want to go three high tire traps will bounce more from the higher that they go up Technically speaking, you can do four tiles high, and especially if they walk on cones, sometimes zombies will trigger it. And same thing with seeing electric field. 
Some zombies like smashers will be able to get hit by that three tiles up, but don't do that. Uh, two tiles is significantly more consistent and perfectly fine. Three tiles up for the tire traps is, again, perfectly consistent and definitely what you want to do. And this tunnel just works. Uh, floor freeze or floor spikes, like I said. Or if you guys want to cheap out, you absolutely can just put a floor spike at the front of these, slow the enemies down as they get frozen. That is going to be a very effective combo, and I have never seen any need to use, like, the fire traps or whatever. In fact, my inventory right here is every trap that I use. And I want you guys to know, I don't jail or i mean i do jail occasionally in ventures recreationally but normally speaking i don't jail i, I really just don't need it <laughs> i've never done it uh, in a way that I really need to, unless I'm just getting carried for ventures. Uh, in normal missions, 164 players, this is it, you guys. Tar pits are something I'll talk about uh, right after this, actually. And wall lights can also be somewhat effective sometimes. Like I said, if you're not using uh, floor freeze, it is nice to have them stunned underneath the gas trap. So you can do kind of a budget build, if you will. I don't know if I would even call this a budget, but what you can do is alternate wall lights and broadsides. And I'm not saying these are the only ways to configure this use your brains you guys you know come up with some fun ideas if you think you have a better way to do it maybe you prefer wall dynamo or you want to use your zapple max go for it the basic idea is that they are being stalled into place again this would only work if you had the uh floor spikes of course because wall lights and floor freeze are not something you need two of you just don't need two things stunning something like this would work fine but just remember wall lights do not have any extra bonus damage that the floor freeze grant Remember, enemies will take more damage when impacted by a floor freeze. In fact, if you are one of those teammates that insists on shooting into a trap tunnel, uh, yeah, your, your, your weapons will do more damage if the enemy is frozen. That is especially relevant for smashers. Um, my point is with that, though, is uh, tar pits. So uh, my point is that that can be an alternative. But where I was going with that are tar pits. Now... Tar pits are not exactly a replacement to floor freeze. I've seen them used that way. People like to put them all throughout here, but the durability is, is an important thing. Mine currently have 97 just because of my survivor set bonuses or whatever. That is 97 hits. Now, the floor freeze has 57, but the floor freeze triggers, freeze a bunch of, uh, freezes a bunch of enemies at once, and then you're just good to go. Everything is frozen. The, the tar pit, <laughs> it'll trigger a durability for every single enemy that sticks to it. And then when you burn the tar pit, everything will just walk through. Uh, I'm sorry if I don't have any gameplay for this, but hopefully you can imagine what I'm talking about here. It's uh, very, very low durability in the long run. And honestly, it's not even more effective than, you know, floor spikes or floor freeze in my experience. So what I'd recommend is putting them at the very end of the tunnel because their main purpose is to prevent smashers and mini bosses from getting any further. They will even stop a mini boss so long as the tar is there and it'll actually stop a smasher mid push meaning if a smasher is running towards you it'll get stopped by a floor freeze but it'll actually just keep on running after it's thawed with a tar pit it'll just run all the way through your tunnel and stop and that'll give you time to deal with it put a gas trap and some broadside make a nice little uh end of your tunnel where it's specifically designed to just eliminate smashers that'll be great in fact that does lead me to another thing that a lot of people have done i don't know if i totally recommend this this is more of like a try hard endurance strategy but technically speaking you can put a wall dynamo on this and wall darts back there and it'll the wall darts will shoot over top i'm sorry i can't illustrate this i don't have any crafted but it's basically here i'll just craft some right now it's basically to this effect where it's it's not you know anything that i think is really practical for a normal mission i don't think this is necessary but yeah if you have the traps you can do something like that that'll do more damage than a broadside uh but i don't think that that's exactly space efficient or at all necessary for a normal mission so i'm not 100 percent sold on that but it definitely works for endurance but i'm also not giving endurance tips here i'm giving normal mission tips and uh, hopefully i've sprinkled in enough gameplay to show this stuff used in the real world what i want to say is these tunnels can be as long as possible these are three long just for showcasing purposes it can be one long as i showed earlier you can zigzag it this is honestly why I haven't made this video. It's a pretty boring tunnel in my opinion. When you realize, when you watch my streams, that I basically do the same tunnel or the same variation of tunnels in every mission successfully, uh, it gets a little dull of a topic. Now, the tricky thing is fitting it to any scenario. And I'm gonna show a mission that I recorded just the other day. You can see it hopefully on screen now, where we were down under a cliff. 
Those are the worst case scenarios. In fact, that is a situation where defenders are very important. They got their whole video, link below. We're not going to be talking about them here, but they did a lot of the work this mission. Basically what I did, and I tried to show this in the footage, they ran off the cliff and I made it so that they froze when they got down there. I put a couple of broadsides to do some extra damage, and the only thing that was going to reach over top the cliff without giving them a surface to walk on were three tile high uh, drop traps. And that worked actually like surprisingly well and that was also the same mission where i used a zigzag tunnel i don't know if i already showed this footage but yeah that actually worked really well over there too so it uh it definitely depends on the situation that you're in where you're defending and i honestly as a completionist you know i like my videos to be very thorough i wanted to show a situation for everything but honestly I can't do that. In fact, I'm actually just running through my base here. You guys can see a little bit of a, uh, a hybrid build where I used these, um, what, oh my god, timeout rooms. I just said it earlier. Timeout rooms on top of the zigzag method to just provide maximum stalling. And I will say, this north side of B in my Plankerton Endurance was uh, definitely one of the better defended areas. However, there are sections like this where they have a whole ramp where they're walking up. And I just tried to block it off. And I remember that being kind of successful, but... You got, you got to just work with your landscape and try to do as best as you can. And honestly, if I just run over here, you'll see very, very similar tunnels all throughout. In fact, this is actually a great example of A, I think, where we just had a long row of timeout rooms and that just about did it i know we're in plankerton and typically if you're even going to need this video you look in a trap in like high twine when things get really tough but the same principles apply and i think you can pretty much do whatever you want with this kind of information so definitely try to stay creative but these are my main tips if you have a ramp just use a tire trap that is definitely recommended if you have a uh a basement or maybe the edge of the map or something use a wall launcher push them into that hole they'll despawn or get shoved off the map and die instantly that definitely works as well. Just make sure it's not a mini boss because you'll lose the rewards. Timeout rooms are a classic for a good reason. They are still fantastic. And of course, I love this brutal tunnel design where they are not only getting frozen and assaulted by gas traps and broadsides the whole way, but they're also getting pushed back every single time that they stop for a second. And that just, honestly, in my experience, I've seen enemies go through here four, five, six times. Like, you can make your tunnel way more effective by just incorporating uh, wall launchers in some very strategic spots. You'll note that I haven't used any floor launchers. I have seen them used uh, with little ramps like this where they'll put a floor launcher on the ground and then they'll, you know, do that sort of thing. I've never found that to be necessary. It works. I mean, whatever, you do you. I have just personally never found that to be necessary. Uh, if you're ever pushing this way into like a pit or something, then a wall launcher is going to do the same job. And there are different uh, clever things you can do with that. And if you enjoy it, go for it. I have just never found that to be needed personally so hopefully I covered everything that I wanted to show here today if I forget anything or want to add anything I'll pin a comment or hopefully edit this video before it goes out but yeah if you have any questions comment below I'll try my best but if you need any help on missions I'm not your guy you might want to ask in our discord lots of friendly people in there hopefully this will uh, this will give you guys some better confidence in your missions and if I think of enough trap designs that I somehow forgot to mention in here because this is pretty much all I do I will definitely try to make a part two if it's heavily requested or if this video does well now, honestly speaking, just like the weapons and the heroes, you kind of want to keep one of every trap anyway. I didn't mention this as thoroughly before, but in the collection book, you can slot stuff in here. These are inaccessible. You can't use these heroes anymore. They won't be available to you, but they will up your collection book level. This is not important in the early game. You don't need to do this right away. You always want to keep at least one copy of everything. In fact, if I actually go to my heroes here, uh, I actually have a couple in an, uh, in an uh, expedition right now, so we can ignore that for now. But if I sort by collection book, you can see I don't actually have a lot of heroes in the collection book because I try to keep one of every single hero in the game first then I put duplicates in the collection book. That's how you want to do it with traps. That's how you want to do it with weapons because as you learn the game and as you progress, certain things are going to be more useful than you thought. Certain weapons are going to get updated. Like I just said, a lot of these heroes as I'm recording uh, could very well be changed in the future and that's a big thing that we expect soon. So, you always want to plan for the future and know that updates can and will happen. I'll give you one more example. I don't want to talk about too many specifics because there's a lot to cover in today's video, but Extraterrestrial Rio. She used to have an ability that was uh, essentially doing more damage to Shielder Husks. If you play in the game, you'll see the purple bubble later on in the game. I think they come out in Plankerton, and uh, those are kind of annoying to deal with. And she used to help you do more damage to those, which... 
wasn't the most useful ability ever, and they updated her to make it so that whenever you're using energy damage, you'll just do more damage to shields straight up, or at least you'll do more damage total while your shields are over 50%. Sorry, that was more confusing than it needed to be, but that also calls into attention energy damage. Now, elements are a little less complicated. I do have a video on that, link below, as, of, as always, but I will get into it here uh, just a little bit. So, I have lots of different copies of weapons, like my Bobcat here, because different elements do different amounts of damage to certain enemies. That's what that video covers more specifically. I don't want to confuse today's video with that, but it's worth knowing that uh, which elements you use does matter in the given mission. I'll give one example. So, right now, as of now, we have, I think what's uh, going on is a, a water or a lightning storm? A lightning storm. So, every single mission, at least in Twine, you won't have to deal with elemental enemies in the early game. In Stonewood and Plankerton, it's not really going to matter too much, but once you get to the uh, Canny Valley quest line, or at least the uh, Canny Valley zone, I should say, uh, Stonewood and Plankerton, it's usually just the regular zombies, but once you get into Canny and Twine Peaks, that is when you're going to start dealing with a lot of, uh, well, elemental enemies, like lightning enemies, and these seem to be all over the place right now. On June 19th, like I said, when that venture season rolls over to the next one, we might have of fire enemies or something all over but in our specific example here lightning is actually weak to fire so that's why i actually built a second bobcat for fire because affliction is really good right now that's super specific not important right now but uh fire is uh what you want to use against na uh, against nature enemies so knowing these sorts of situations uh which uh perks to use and everything is good i have i think as of recording, I have 199 best perks videos. That playlist, not every individual video, that playlist will be linked to the description below. You can look up essentially any weapon in the entire game, and I have almost certainly covered it. If I haven't, leave a comment. Let me know about it. And uh, if enough people want me to cover a weapon that hasn't been covered uh, yet, then uh, I'll get to it. So that's a good resource. If you're ever looking up any individual weapon, I almost certainly have it covered. If I don't have it covered, usually it's it's there's a good reason for that. So you can rest assured that if uh, you're looking up a weapon that I haven't covered, maybe maybe you can skip that one so let's go back to these tabs up here and talk about quests uh these are seasonal like i said currently we have the yar event going on and ventures is a thing and these reset at the end uh like june 19th like i mentioned this will change in the future sometimes dungeons is available sometimes frost night is available uh these things rotate on a more annual schedule and these are all sort of things that you can keep up with be sure to do your daily quests as well if you're getting this game from not a Founders Pack, meaning back in the day you could get Founders Packs where you could earn V-Bucks. They are currently not available anymore, and there is no future plans for them to come back out to our knowledge. If that ever changes, I'll let you guys know, but... Uh, you should do these anyway just to get x-ray tickets so that you can buy the llamas in the shop. And uh, if you ever end up using V-Bucks for that, feel free to use code Mista. But I don't think the tickets help me. Either way, they help you and you want to spend those tickets on these llamas when you have something good in there. So if you pull up a llama and you see something like a Trinity, that is where you could go to my channel and uh, check that out. See if it's a weapon worth unlocking. In this case... I'm going to argue no, but, you know, and then, of course, all the things in the event section are going to be coming out on that event cycle, and then the weekly items resets every week. I cover these daily on my channel, so every weekly uh, shop, I will cover it and let you know if it's any good. The map, of course, already showed it. This is how you get to your different quests. Not too complicated, in my opinion. If you ever have any specific questions about a quest or if you need any help, feel free to join our Discord link down below. Please be polite. Nobody ever has to help anybody. Nobody's obligated. But if you're friendly and polite, I am certain you'll have no problem getting some help on whatever mission you're doing. And um, that can be a really good resource. We already did talk about heroes, but while we're under this section, we can talk about hero loadouts. Now, I have covered a lot of these on my channel, and this is a little tricky for me. I don't want to spam my entire description with loadouts, but I have said before to people that if you're looking just for what I've covered on my channel, if you just type loadouts into the search bar, I'm going to cover it a little bit here, so I'm going to move myself. You can kind of just see everything I've covered. Here's the farming loadouts I talked about earlier, minigun, ventures loadouts. I try to do these every single season when relevant. Today's uh, Today, as I'm recording this season, season five, hasn't really changed enough for me to make a video on it but last season i did that rocket loadout this one's super fun i cover loadouts for dungeons soldiers ninjas these are really good resources season three of course and uh if you're looking for all the loadouts i've ever covered they're pretty much here loadouts is in the title every time and uh there are lots of different ways to play this game and there are lots of different ways to have fun and uh that can be a really good way to do that i also did get a question on how to get more of them so when, when you start playing the game initially 
I believe you only have five loadouts, and then you can unlock six, seven, eight, and nine. The way that you do that is, going back to our map, when you do your Storm Shield defenses, you can do 10 per zone, and then Endurance is what you unlock after the 10th one. So when you do Stonewood 10, Plankerton 10, Canny 10, and Twine 10, you unlock one loadout per section. So uh, I unlocked them all right away because this was a long, it was an update long ago. But as you play through the game, when you do all 10 Stonewoods, you'll get six. When you do all 10 Plankerton, you'll get seven. They don't need to be done in order. Maybe if you play through to the end of the game, you do Twine 10, you'll get number seven, and then Plankerton, you'll get number eight. Whatever order, it doesn't matter. You should end up with nine. And I and many others believe that nine is not enough, but that that is neither here nor there. Uh, you're you'll understand what I mean once you start building more loadouts. But uh, yeah, this can be a definitely definitely a fun resource to get everything set aside and play more properly, you know, and uh, get your weapons doing the best. I'm not going to cover any specific loadouts. That's what the video is for. Defenders, hello. It's a defender video. So I wasn't really sure how to approach this video because defenders are kind of really really complicated and not at all complicated depending on your approach to it because like first and foremost the main thing that i'm talking about in this video as the title probably suggests is that sniper defenders are essentially the only ones worth using and i am going to attempt to prove that point today now if they ever add a rocket defender that is going to be hands down the number one choice albeit it'll be very good at blowing up propanes and making you go broke and of course a bow defender might happen in the future when or if bows ever get Get their own class so if you're watching this in the future and bow defenders come out i'll pin a comment for any corrections in this video whatsoever and if i miss anything down the line i will update in the, in the comments below that being said i will also make any edit to this video saying if any other defenders are significantly better than i originally believe in this video i'll make a case for them in that pin comment should it become necessary because there is a case to be made for defenders like the shotgun defenders where you give that guy a ground pounder or a pulsar or whatever you've got there are some very strong shotguns in this game unfortunately the main problem with those guys is that they are going to be in the thick of it they're going to be surrounded by a crowd of zombies and you can try to put them in a little box or something but the bottom line is they are basically going to die quickly and that's the problem that i have with every single defender even with assault defenders which did kind of okay i think assault defenders might be one of the better ones because you need defenders to be up and away otherwise they're just gonna die which they ended up dying anyway i didn't get any gameplay footage of a melee defender because i feel like the shotgun guy kind of showed it anyway they're just they're just gonna die too quick they might do some damage and while defenders might be a lot more useful in like maybe a v-buck mission where you don't really want to do anything yourself that's completely fine um it's just gonna be not really worth it to put them down because they're always gonna be high maintenance they're always gonna be dying defender pads can be a little expensive depending on you know depending on whether or not you have the resources to craft those defender pads because if i'm not mistaken i'm gonna check it while i'm recording i believe it takes bacon to make a defender pad so it's not exactly like it's the cheapest thing ever you know bacon duct tape eight nuts and bolts per defender pad if you use these every mission that's going to add up and that might not be worth it if your defender is just going to die all the time I also got footage of a pistol defender where I'm pretty sure it was bugged the entire time because none of her shots went anywhere that was going to impact an enemy. And regardless, I gave her a ghost pistol even instead of the Storm King pistol. It was not very impressive. So the pistol defender might be worth it if you give her like the Storm King's onslaught, but I'm not convinced that it's any better than a sniper defender would be. So... Before we get into it any further, before I start talking about sniper defenders and why they're so good, let me actually get into how you place defenders. Because I get this question a surprising amount, and what I mean is, when you are in a single player mission, meaning it just shows the industrial park and what zone you're in, it doesn't say four player, you can place one defender per missing teammate. Meaning, if I drop into a game solo, I can place three defenders. If somebody joins, one of my defenders is going to be despawned and I can have two defenders. If a third person joins, we'll have one defender left. And once that fourth person fills the slot, nobody can place a defender. That said, everybody can place three defenders capped at, you know, the amount of people that are not in your game. So I could place one and my teammate could place one. That way we'd have two defenders. But as I said, as soon as somebody joins the game, we're going to lose one of those defenders. For a four player mission, the cap is raised all the way up to just four defenders. You could have three per person. So I like to typically put my three sniper defenders down. And then if a teammate wants to come in and drop one after me, that's completely fine. If two of our teammates want to place two defenders each, that'll be fine. As long as there are four defenders maximum, it doesn't really matter. One person 
person can place a maximum of three. So no one person can always can ever place all four defenders. That's why in all of my gameplay of the snipers defenders, you're seeing that there are three of them. So that's kind of how that works. Hopefully that clears it up. So a lot of people come into my streams and ask me, hey, how did you get four defenders down? And then I tell them what we're in a, that we're in a four player. So that's basically a rundown of how many defenders you can place. Okay, so now that I've kind of explained why we don't use the other defenders, let's talk about why sniper defenders are awesome. Then we'll get into the perks that you're going to want to use on all of your defenders and then why we use the specific weapons that we use. So first and foremost, sniper defenders are up and far away while still doing lots of damage. That is just everything you want in the defender. You can put it right on top of your base. They have a pretty good area. They'll walk about a one tile distance around the edge of your defender pad. You can spam down anti-air traps to keep them safe, put them in a little hut. And depending on if you're using a specific weapon like the obliterator or the neon uh, sniper or the xenon bow, they will be able to shoot through those walls. So if you want them to be completely safe, you can put them inside of a metal box and then it will restrict their range by a specific amount. We'll talk about that a little later down the line here, but uh, ultimately they are safe. That's the point. Sniper defenders, you can put them down, and so long as the flingers and the lobbers are taken care of and nothing is getting thrown up on the base, they should be completely healthy and fine the entire time. On top of the fact that they are a sniper defender, now it's a ranged high damage weapon that they're shooting. So it's like the damage of the ground pounder that I mentioned earlier, except that they're standing safely on your base. So defenders can just have this wide area of effect. They can knock off any of the zombies that might make it through your defense. They can help with mini bosses. They can help with smashers. They are quite effective at cleaning up everything that you might miss with your traps. So that's why I use sniper defenders all the time. I'm well aware that it's expensive. If you do this every single mission at the rate that my defenders tend to go on average i think i use an obliterator uh about in four games so every four games you kind of have to craft a new obliterator which is a weapon that i use we'll talk about that later and that is very expensive so i highly recommend if you are on a budget or you don't appreciate farming then uh if you do appreciate farming you know link to my video on some good farming loadouts down below i'm not just plugging that will definitely refill your bags i'll also link my video on how to get every item in case you don't know where to get the parts for your weapons uh you can do this in the lowest zones you guys so that might be helpful to you but Ultimately speaking, if you don't want to spend that much, I'd highly recommend saving these for like the 164 players or the 144 players, the hard four player missions. Like I said, not only are you not able to place all of the defenders in a full party in a single player mission, but you also wouldn't want to because, you know, if you're, if you're playing with a full party, like in a single player mission, which doesn't require four people in your party, you probably don't need defenders anyway, and some basic traps should do the trick. Now that we've talked about why sniper defenders are awesome, let's talk about the perks that you're going to want. So... In all of my experience, in all of the sniper defenders that I've ever checked out, and all of the defenders that I've ever checked out, I have only ever seen three perks that provide any damage. Meaning this second perk and this fifth perk are pretty much always shield, health, or essentially just shield and health. Like, it's almost never anything that does any damage. I've never personally seen it. So if you do have a defender that somehow is doing some damage in this second or fifth slot, then... Congratulations, that might be a good one for you. Now, the things that I look for in my sniper defenders are not this. <laughs> you can get mag size and reload speed and more healing stuff. It's it's just not necessary. For a sniper defender, which are usually safe, like I mentioned, you don't need them to have any extra health. You don't need them to heal any quicker. You don't need their shields to do anything that they don't already do by default. What I've checked here, the ones that I have favorited and powered up are like perfect quote-unquote defenders where... This lady right here does crit da uh, crit rating, crit damage, and fire rate. That is, that is two thumbs up. That is well three thumbs up because of the three perks. Those those are very complimentary perks. The crit rating ups your crit rating, and the crit damage ups your crit damage. Now that's really nice. You could have double damage and reload. That's not as preferred as crit builds. Typically, crits tend to do more damage uh, in the long run, I should say. And then of course, you know, the other one that I have is another fire rate, crit rating, crit damage. I did favorite this one as well because she's not what you want. You can have like more shield, more health. You can have more mag size perks. I don't think magazine really helps you. A reload, a reload perk is going to be a lot more helpful because they're going to be shooting constantly. And if you up their mag size, it's just going to delay the inevitable. It'll just make sure that they're not shooting for longer. If you up their reload speed, it means they can get right back into the fight. Now, now that I've talked about exactly what perks you want, I'll get more into that in a second. I do want to talk about the weapons that we use and why. So if you check out my old obliterator video, I recommend double headshot. 
That was because it was my understanding that defenders always hit headshots. It's now my understanding that most of the time they actually don't. <laughs> They're actually not perfect. In fact, the reason that we use legendary is because all of the stats are better, but the higher you level up a defender, the more accurate they are. Uh, I don't know if you knew that. I'm, in fact, I might even be, uh, I don't know if I have enough defenders to really show it in this video, but one of the things they'll show in the stats is weapon skill. And this says it right there. Weapons can be equipped that will have scaled down uh, weapon match skill. So the higher the weapon skill is, the higher their accuracy is, the higher level weapons they can use. So if you hand a 130 obliterator to a not all the way powered up purple defender, it's that, that obliterator is not going to do as much damage. So you really do want to max out these legendary defenders. Um, that being said, the weapons that I use are the obliterator and the obliterator. <laughs> I use two obliterators, and I'll show you why. I actually don't use energy on this. If you're going to make one obliterator schematic, I would highly recommend energy. And the reason we use obliterator is because it can shoot through walls. I already sort of talked about that earlier, but that is integral. That, it might not seem like that big of a deal, but that is a huge bonus because it means that they have more lines of sight. And one of my most recent Recordings I can show you where they were standing up on the base shooting straight down through the floor because of the fact that the obliterator can shoot through walls and that's just sort of a, uh, a technique with the obliterator. Now if you don't have the obliterator or you don't have the neon sniper which behaves very similarly, you really can use any sniper in the game. You know the spyglass or the old Betsy is really good, the Ralphie's Revenge is great for headshots but not really a good option. Uh, in fact I can actually, if you want to do this yourself, you can sort by subtype and then scroll down to all the different snipers in the game and you can sort of pick out whichever one you might think is is best. I'm going to link my best snipers video in the description below. It's a little old, but it'll still cover all of the snipers worth knowing about and give you some options. Uh, the Blaster Tron 9000 is a good one. I'm glad I did this. The Crank Shot is a fully auto sniper. Uh, uh, it's uh, a... <laughs> It's, it's, it might be worth it, but you're going to go through a lot of, of uh, ammo that way. Also, I probably should have mentioned this in a more structured part of the video, but when you hand a sniper defender a sniper, about 300 rounds is overkill for an obliterator. That seems to be my experience, but uh, I only use the obliterator because it's high damage, can shoot through walls, and it's kind of just the standard in that regard. So depending on what snipers you have, it doesn't really matter if you, you got to just use what you got, but I highly recommend the obliterator. You can always research it from the book. And the other thing is bows. So there are bows in the game, obviously, but I do believe that a bow defender might come out later on, and I also don't think it's worth it. I didn't get any gameplay for this, but I did hand Xenon bows to my sniper defenders a long time ago, and... Yeah, it shoots really slowly. They got to draw it back all the way. They got to make sure their aim is perfect, and it, it's just not worth it. it. You'd think it's really good, but it's it's really not. Like, even my supercharged Xenon bow is hitting for about 71,000, right? But my obliterator is hitting for 69,000. Like, it's not... It's not that big of a difference. <laughs> and the obliterator can shoot much faster, and it's a lot more reliable. So I don't recommend giving them the Xenon Bow, even though that sounds like it's a good idea. Uh, no. So now that we're focused on the obliterator and you kind of know why I'm using this, the reason that I use two elements is because fire and water will hit everything for at least 75%. So if you don't know elements, energy will do 75% damage to water, fire, and nature. And the water obliterator will do 75% damage to water. So it'll do 75% and 100% to water and fire. And then the fire will do 100% to nature and 75% to fire. So these two elements just let me cover everything. Now this can be any combo. You can use nature and water or nature and fire. I don't think it really matters. Uh, the point is I use two of them just because this was, this was for chrome husks back in the day. They could only die from fire and water element weapons. I don't know why. It was just, it was dumb. If you use physical or energy, you had to kill them over and over and over and over, and then eventually they die, and it was ridiculous. So I eventually just <laughs> sacrificed my other obliterator, took double headshot off of it, stopped using it as a weapon as my primary, and just gave them both the element of fire and water. That way I'm doing the most amount of damage against nature, the most amount of damage against fire, and then against water, I kind of just do my best, and you just I just use my water obliterator. It's usually not that big of a deal, though. So that's why I use two. You would obviously want to use energy if you only have one copy. And then as for the six perk, I wouldn't go this far. The headshot eliminations cause an explosion is default. I kind of just leave that alone. I don't think it makes that much of a difference. You can trap your defenders in a cone and give them the standing in place grants plus damage. That can work. But that ties into what I was saying earlier about your limited range. So the obliterator can basic the obliterator can basically shoot as far as they can see when they're not obstructed. But when there is a wall in front of them, they used to be able to shoot forever, but Epic patched that temporarily and then changed it so that they could only shoot zombies where they could hear them. Meaning you essentially have a four-tile radius around them in a sphere. 
uh, in their effective range. So if you want to trap them in a box, you need to realize that they're only going to be able to see about four tiles away. They are significantly more effective if they are unobstructed. They can see as far as the eye can see, and they're not going to be that unsafe. I mean, in the 164 players we were playing today, the defenders were pretty much fine. The only reason they died was because of lobbers and flingers. So if you got anti-air traps, that'll more or less handle it. Which brings me to another point for sniper defenders. They basically do the uh, de they basically do the work of an anti-air trap, but better. So they won't take out the lobber projectiles, but if a flinger throws a zombie, the sniper defenders will prioritize those zombies and take them right out of the sky. A lot more effective than an anti-air trap. And it's because of this that my anti-air traps never run damage, because A, damage isn't really going to do enough in the end game. It's just not going to make any difference. And B, <laughs> well, the sniper defenders sort of take care of it anyway. They will defend themselves, which is a real Really, really, really nice bonus. So you might want that standing in place grants damage, but I don't think it's worth a core reperk. My sniper defenders have always been perfectly fine without it. But yeah, bringing it back to our defender perks, like I said, I'd return to it. The reason I'm running crit is because these guys are shooting constantly. I would never recommend a crit build if you're using the sniper as your primary weapon. I think that humans are a lot more capable of hitting headshots and doing more effective damage that way. But because the sniper defender is just rattling off shots the entire game, I don't see a reason not to run a crit build. Now, if you're using a different kind of defender, you're essentially looking for the same thing. You can see the shotgun that I've set aside as double crit rating, crit damage. I never like double crit rating because of diminishing returns, meaning that second crit rating is not going to be adding nearly as much as the first one in terms of your overall chance to crit. However, it's a it's a defender. You can't currently change their perks. It's not going to make that you know, you can't really do anything about it. It's still just going to be more chance to crit and he'll be doing 54% more crit damage. The point here is that shotguns are very strong. So any defender with any perk is a good jumping off point. Uh, these sniper defenders that I have set aside with like the double crit rating damage and all of these that I've, I've set aside and started using, these are like the four or five that have been good in years of playing. These are... Uh, th these are hundreds, I mean dozens or hundreds of defenders I filtered out to find these ones. So if you're watching this video and you're discouraged because you don't have the good perks, it doesn't matter. Any sniper defender is going to be better than no sniper defender. You can always recycle it later and just get all of your things back. And it's so, it's kind of just a, it's kind of just a zero expense. Like you're not going to waste anything by leveling up something now. You can just recycle it later and get a different one in its place. So you can see some of these older ones are like double critting fire rate where I used to use this guy all the time. And then I found this lady right here as crit rating crit damage instead of double crit rating which i think is a little bit more effective so you can kind of just filter these out to your heart's content and that same philosophy sort of applies to the assault weapons as well uh, it's extra damage reload fire rate i thought that was good enough to demonstrate for the video uh this guy's got uh weapon crit damage uh melee weapon damage i thought that was a decent combo because uh, melee weapons tend to have really good crit chance anyway so they don't really need a crit rating perk on your defender it doesn't really matter is my point here so you can kind of just mix and match with whatever you choose so i think that just about covers it i'm sorry if this video ran a little long maybe this will just go to show why i put off this video for so long and why it seems apparently no other youtubers have really covered this in depth it's because defenders are really really complicated and also really really simple <laughs> like i like i said you can go into it and care about perks but ultimately a sniper defender is going to do what a sniper defender does it doesn't need to have optimal perks and it doesn't ultimately matter which weapon you hand it that said i would recommend the obliterator or the neon sniper the neon sniper i didn't talk about much but it's basically just a more expensive weaker version than the obliterator so it's not really recommended ever it's got a better headshot but defenders aren't known for that it's got slower fire rate less damage it's um yeah i know my perks aren't the same here but it takes energy cells which is quite expensive to be putting in the hands of a defender not to mention 15 batteries per neon sniper yeah it's technically a replacement to the obliterator but i would recommend researching an obliterator instead now another final point i should have mentioned this earlier i guess you could go bright core on it it would shoot faster and you wouldn't have to craft as many obliterators but you're going to be taking about 20% off the top damage wise from your defenders and I'm not sure if that's worth it. So if you're working on an extreme budget, you hate farming, yeah, use bright core obliterators. Other than that, I recommend Sunbeam. I'm going to let the video in the description take it from there. So if you're interested, man, if somebody actually took all of those video links in the description as I mentioned them, it would take you like it would take you like a hundred hours to watch this video. If you hit pause every time I said that, then went down to the description and, and watched it through. 
Oof, you'd be busy. Now, expeditions are a pretty good way to get some easy resources. Uh, there is a curtain, a, cur ooh, a current thing with the uh, trap bundles here. Where, well, it's not current anymore. It's just kind of how the game is where uh, I've looted some traps. You can see them here. When you recycle traps, you get 100% of what was taken to, uh, to craft those. So when it comes to those expeditions, you can get lots of resources by running these trap bundles. You can get a few amount of survivors from these. It's not usually worth it. These uh, red boxes are really good at giving you lots of different crafting supplies. Again, the every item video explains what those are and which ones you're going to want. These are really good to run. You can go your entire life without running expeditions, but if you send out a few heroes and do these pretty passively, you can just do trial and error, you know, run some of these supply caches, figure out what's good and what's not. Generally, the red boxes are the ones you're going to want to go for. Those are going to give you the most general amount of stuff that ends up crafting traps and weapons, and these can be really, really helpful. So I'm not going to get too much into expeditions. They're currently not a very powerful feature. Uh, if they ever do update these and make them uh, very, very good, I will make a whole video on uh, expeditions. I have not made a whole video on expeditions yet, but they're kind of worth doing. Uh, they're definitely something that is more geared towards the end game because, like I showed earlier, a couple of my heroes are out on expeditions, and you can't use these heroes while they're gone. So it's kind of geared more towards people who have the heroes to spare. So as you play and you level up more heroes, the further you go, the expeditions will be a little more enticing. But as I mentioned, with the correct farming loadout, as I showed, um, you shouldn't need expeditions. You just you just farm like normal, and you should be good to go. Now, in the armory section, uh, schematics. Already mentioned these. I have covered weapons extremely thoroughly on my channel, so lots of resources are available to you. Already talked about the backpack. This is where you can craft your weapons. It shows you what's going to be needed over here, how many items you're going to need over here. Nowadays, if you're playing the game new, you can craft uh, or you can have stacks up to 999, which back in the day used to be 200. So you're never going to know how annoying that was if you're new to the game, but that's okay you're not missing anything nowadays you can hold lots of materials which is super convenient very nice quality of life update and uh, all of these things can be very convenient to get and then of course it just shows you all the items that you have and uh, be careful with traps you can craft to get 100 of your resources back but with weapons and melees it'll be a reduced amount so for example i can just show just real quickly here storm king weapons are not your priority you don't need them until well ever you never need them but they're very very end game it's just at the top of my inventory to demonstrate this will cost 11 sunbeam to craft and 30 mechanical parts if i go and well this one's nearly broken maybe a better example is the nocturno it has the same cost but it'll give me uh, 12 instead of 30 and 4 instead of 11 so be sure to craft you know carefully if you're broke and you you don't want to waste all that storage is just an extension this is something that you cannot access in game but is where you can just dump all your tier 6 stuff these are not currently available in the game you cannot get them they are not valuable they're not used for anything i simply like to collect them because i think they're neat you don't ever need these. If anybody is ever trying to trade you these items, it's not worth it. Uh, in your journey, you will come across impossible weapons like this Siege Breaker, which has tons of perks, or this Jack's Revenge that I built when Meg Size was a thing, and then they reset everybody's schematics. These are called um, they're called modded weapons. Most of these are referred to as legacy, as they're not available anymore. These are nice-to-haves. They're never needed. They're not anything important. Uh, traders love to make a big deal out of these, and many YouTube channels will make you think that they are worth something. They're not. They're not usable in-game. Uh, it's not worth it to anybody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I have a few of these because, you know, look at my storage. I got room to be a little bit of a collector, but they're not worth anything. Uh, they're just kind of nice-to-have and stuff you you might encounter on your journey like honey for example is not an item you can obtain anymore but it's it's neat to have resources is uh, similar to the items that i mentioned earlier this is not covered in the how to get every item video but pretty much every resource on here if you look it up on my channel i get into it core reperk allows you to change the sixth perk on a weapon so if i can go down to one of these melees like the armageddon you can see that with critical hits i can uh, explode the enemies around me with core reperk i can actually change that sixth perk and that's a very neat resource i have a whole video on how to spend your core reperk welcome everybody to a long delayed headache i mean video that i've been putting off for a while because this is a very very complicated subject it's been a very 
basic question for a long time. Hey, Beast, how do I spend my Cori perk? But the answer has uh, a quite a lengthy notepad going on right now because there are, as you might have noticed, a ton of weapons in this game. And if you aren't aware, uh, Cori perk wasn't always a thing. So back in my day, we always had one six perk, and that was what it was. I mean... If you wanted to get a different six perk, you had to open more llamas, get more copies of that weapon, or research more from the shop. And nowadays, you can change it with these cool reperk items, and uh, that is very, very cool. But these are very expensive, and it is not entirely clear whether or not all of these changes are useful. So, before we get any further into the video, there is a lot of disclaimers. I just want to get out of the way right away. First and foremost, timestamps below. You don't need to watch through this in any kind of order. If you're looking for a specific weapon or a certain perk that you're curious about, I will do my best to label my footnotes in the in the in the description uh, and also the pinned comment. Meaning, I still to this day am not perfectly aware of every single weapon in the game, but it has been months and I'm aware of like 90% of them. So if there is any weapon that comes out of the blue and some six perk radically changes how it works and I somehow missed it, which is quite unlikely, uh, I'll pin a comment with any corrections as well as future changes because I can't read the future. I can't know what they're going to do, but if they do make anything uh, worth changing, you know, any of my suggestions in this video, the pin comment will cover any of that. Always scroll down on any of my videos for that matter to check for any corrections because times change in the videos. Well, can't because I have to remake it if it's that serious. So that is just a very important thing that I want to get out of the way. Also, there is no one suggestion. If you came here for the one weapon that you gotta change, sorry, <laughs> it's just not something that exists. There are fan favorites, and I'm sure that we'll get to those at some point in this video, but without there being a number one pick, I can say that there are a, a lot of good options, and Cory Perk isn't as rare as I made it sound. I mean, I think some people have as much as seven now, which is kind of a lot. I only have two, but I will say that I have spent exactly one Core, well, no, I've spent two core reperk in my day. So these aren't like main suggestions, but they are things that we'll get to later down the line. And I do want to mention the one that I changed it to uh, for one is a Spectro Blade, where this came with Snare naturally. That gives you no damage at all. It's not an improvement in any way other than just slowing the enemies down that are like already in front of your face. So you never really need Snare. Um, but we did the math, you know, to Chunai and found out that that hitting an enemy granting damage on top of like the triple attack crit build optimized everything paleo luna why don't fiona support all the bells and whistles that stacking damage perk can make the spectral blade just a little bit stronger than the storm king's ravager by like a few percent points now it still needs to be water to be like significantly better against fire enemies and whatnot but the fact that the spectral blade can out damage the ravager with that six perk I felt like that was worth a core reperk, especially considering that the slowed and snared wasn't doing anything anyway. And that is a theme that I want to get to throughout this video. This isn't just jumping to a suggestion. I'm saying that since I can't give you one recommendation, I want this video to be able to allow you to make your own decision, meaning a core reperk needs to be used in such a way so that it drastically improves the weapon that you're using. A very, very common question the, probably the most common is should i use damage to affliction or slowed and snared or the stacking crit rating now if you don't even know what that means i'll show you so here's a thrasher with the each shot fired grants crit rating that can be the highest damaging thrasher that can exist however you're going to need to get about 15 shots in for that to even make sense. And by that point, your enemy is dead or you've stopped firing for one second or you stop to reload or shit happens. You know, you're in the middle of a fight, you're building, you're whatever. That, that bonus gets interrupted. So you're constantly starting from scratch. And I broke it down really well in my Silent Spectre video. I'll try to do so here, but I'll, I'll link that below. I get way further in depth. I just show that, honestly, when it comes down to it, the uh, damage to slowed and snared or affliction bonus is about the same as that each shot fire grants crit rating now i'm not kidding the crit rating is the better option when you're like 15 bullets in for sustained damage against a mini boss for example but is it so significantly better that you need to use a core reperk on it in my opinion no simply i mean just frankly no however some people might choose to go that route i'm gonna save my core reperk this is already a a schematic that does plenty of damage as you can see i already have a copy of the thrasher with that crit rating and i i don't use it so it's it's just not it's not good enough in my opinion now the other cory perk i used was kind of a good example i think of a good situation where sometimes life happens so 
To those who weren't here on stream, this was one of the most brutal moments on my entire stream. I was trying to get my third Killjoy. I had one that was Element Fire, you know, damage to damage to nature. And then I had one that was Element Water, damage to fire. And I wanted one that was damage to water with the Element Nature. And I got it on my second try, just researching it from the collection book, and didn't realize it. So I... You know, trying to get my copy back, spent about 1,800 epic and legendary flux failing to get this weapon. And at that point, that far in, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to use a core reaper. <laughs> I'm just going to grab whatever copy, no matter what perk I get, unless it's damage to water. I am, I am just using the core reaper to get damage to water. And that's what I did, and I don't regret it. I spent a disgusting amount of flux that day and this is my example of sometimes if you just really need one more perk Cory perk is exactly what that's for so that's my criteria it either needs to be super worth it like a definite like a definite increase like the spectral blade was or it needs to just spare you from you know having to go through it like the killjoy and that segues into another thing so the killjoy while it's not exactly an event weapon you can go to the uh let's see well it's an event schematic though but you can actually research these which is exactly what i was doing so that's kind of a bad example of something you'd want to use a core perk on obviously i explained myself but Typically, you wouldn't want to do that. Typically, you'd want to save it for a weapon that you can't get another copy of. For example, uh, an interesting one is like the Corsair and the Jack's Revenge. So these two are a very interesting case where they have the, uh, the, the combo deal where the Jack's Revenge headshot eliminations boost crit chance with swords. And then I believe the Corsair has something similar where it's pistol headshot damage, or no, on crits, increases pistol headshot. So the idea is you're supposed to hit a headshot with your pistol, boost that crit rating, switch to your sword, get a crit hit, switch back to your pistol, use that bonus headshot damage, and switch back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's how these weapons were intended to be used. However, that is a very stressful way to play. Even explaining that, it kind of annoyed me because I always just, it was kind of fun to use it like that, but oh my goodness, that's frustrating. So with the core reaper, you can actually turn this into like a normal sword. You can just give it the stacking crit rating and hey, now you have a melee that doesn't need a pistol. Because if you're not using the Jack's Revenge, this is a dead six perk. You're buffing the pistol damage of a pistol you're not using. Um, that's even worse than the Slowden Snare that I mentioned. So this is a good example of where a core reaper can turn the Corsair and the Jack's Revenge into usable weapons. In fact, I actually want to scroll down to the Jack's Revenge. This is going to happen a lot in this video. I'm sorry, these weapons are all over the place and I am really screwing up trying to find it. So yeah, the Jack's Revenge is an interesting case where you can actually give it a couple of different options where the headshot explosions can cause, uh, whoops, headshot eliminations can cause an explosion. That can give you some really good area of effect damage, which is what pistols are kind of lacking. And on bullet, you can splinter into shrapnel, which is good. But this is once again an example where are those perks so powerful that the Jack's Revenge, you know, you need to use a Cory perk on it? In my opinion, no, but maybe you really like the Jack's Revenge and you want that to happen. I don't know. This was just set up for a, a, an argument I had in Discord. But this is a weapon that with double headshot and the right loadout, it actually breaks the sheet because it does over a million damage already. So do you really need to spend one of your very precious core cool reperks to make it a little bit better? And I say that with quotes because that headshot elimination causing an explosion is extra damage. I can't deny it, but it's not that big of a deal. So yeah, now I kind of started the video with these suggestions because these were on my list. And I also just wanted to continue to explain that that is a criteria you're looking for. So even though I've already knocked a couple of things off my list, we've already passed a couple of timestamps if you're already watching, uh, let's get into some some that are interesting examples. In fact, I actually want to start with that stacking crit rating that I mentioned in the beginning. Obviously, I already covered this, so I'm not going to get too far into it, but the basic idea is that, yeah, the damage to slowed and snared in Affliction, that 45%, is give or take uh, not significantly worse than the stacking crit rating but an example i had is actually really really interesting for the i have the stabs worth listed here so the specter as i mentioned you know i already explained how it's it's, it's not significantly better but the stabs worth is funny where this is a weapon that kind of tries to bait you because it has that stacking crit rating but as far as I can tell, with the way that we use this weapon, because it has a really high swing speed, it's really good with Paleo Luna, this is more or less the build you want to go for. That stacking crit rating is not actually doing anything for you. There's there's just no room to have the double attack speed, which is better with Luna. I'm sorry, you might like crits, but if you're using Paleo Luna with this build, you, you want the attacks you want the attack swing at, at all costs. So 
an extra stacking crit rating is actually not useful at all. And I didn't mention this in this video, but with the stacking crit rating on the SMGs, you're actually losing that fifth perk. All you have left over for the SMGs is like a damage to stun staggered, which isn't really happening, or a damage to miss monsters and bosses, which is, you know, 36% is less than 45%. So you'll have some help on the bigger targets, which are the ones that are going to need that much ammo anyway, but you're losing that 45 bonus to every enemy that you hit. So with a stab's worth, this is a good example where this looks like a really enticing upgrade. It's actually not. That damage to affliction or slowed and snared is definitely better to keep that fifth perk where it is. And so it's a good example of, of a way that you can you can try to be careful. Now, 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 now. This is a very, very popular one, and it's probably my, my favorite to talk about because this is probably where most people are going to be spending their Cori perk, and I can't even blame you. Kind of. It depends on which one you, you pick. But crit hits causing an explosion is really popular right now. So this is an example where I do not have a complete list of every melee that is affected by this. If somebody has one and comments it, I would love to pin that comment. Or like, it would be my own comment if I make any corrections, but I will credit you if, if somebody can give me a complete list and double check it that that is every melee that has the stacking, uh, not stacking, the crit hits cause an explosion, because that is really, really fun. So this is probably the first part of the video where I feel like gameplay is actually necessary. It does exactly what you'd think. The fort spill explodes whenever you hit a crit, which is just awesome. It makes this weapon a tremendous amount of fun. Um, the fort spill is just the one that I've been using. It's kind of a meme in our, in our community. Thanks, Acorn. But it is by no means maybe the best one. I think it has the highest swing speed and a really good damage output. So it's an unironically good weapon. In fact, when I made my video on this, I recorded the gameplay, I think, in a 160 zone and didn't even notice. It was either this or the Husk Stomper, which... Uh, mind you, is another example of a pretty unexceptional melee, you know, hammer hardware. But when you give it the crit hits cause an explosion, it gives us some useful area of effect damage that is actually pretty fun. And I've actually, oh, I, I exited out of my thing. I actually got some comments recently on the, uh, the slasher, the, what is this thing called? The supersonic slasher. Apparently this has a crit hits cause an explosion. And this is one that I understand might have a pretty high swing speed. I have not explored this weapon that much. And this is where there's a little bit of an open end to this video where if you can find a melee that has a pretty good swing speed or good all-around damage and has that crit hits cause an explosion, you might want to go for that because it could make it really good. I know the Armageddon is another axe that has the crit hits cause an explosion. Look for a melee that has that and you could have a fun time. Now, the Argon axe is another example. This is probably the last one I'm going to show, but it has a base 30% crit chance without any crit rating perk. And so that crit hits cause an explosion is already going to be happening 30% of the time before you even give it crit rating. I've been told that that with Whiteout Fiona in the lead and a crit rating perk on the Argon Axe, I think you can get up to 75% chance to crit or something, which is a little ridiculous. At that point, you're going to be losing out on attack speed or whatever, and it's not going to be as worth it. But I'm just saying you could have a good time with that. Now, this section of the video is going to start off with the vacuum tube weapons, but this and the next two timestamps are going to be completely dedicated to elemental bonuses. So, first and foremost, all of the vacuum tube weapons are very unique in that they have the six perk ability for chain lightning. And this is once again where uh, gameplay is almost required for you to even, you know, conceptualize what I'm showing if you've never seen this before. Basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. When you hit an enemy or eliminate an enemy, depending on the weapon, it chains lightning out to the other enemies. So Vacuum 2 Bow has done this just natively forever. It introduced the six perk, but with the ability to change uh, the six perks, the core re-perk, you can make any of your Vacuum 2 weapons chain to other enemies. This makes the shotgun really, really fun. It makes, well, all of them really, really fun, but most notably like the Vacuum 2 pistol, for example, is uh, the Vacuum 2 revolver, I should say, because a pistol is exists, but it's technically an SMG. Yeah, I know. I'm confused too. But the vacuum tube revolver is a pistol that doesn't really have that good of area of effect damage, but with the ability to chain to other enemies, it's actually able to eliminate more than just the one enemy you're shooting at. And then the last example I just want to talk about and show is a vacuum tube sword, where when you're hitting and eliminating enemies with this thing, they are chaining like crazy, and it makes that sword so much more fun and so much more useful. The caveat is what I mentioned earlier, where these are not event weapons. Vacuum tube weapons are in all the normal llamas. You can get them from normal missions. I point them out in my daily videos every single day. Vacuum tube weapons 
weapons are all over the place. There is absolutely no need to spend a core reperk on this. However, if you are really, really unlucky, you have been just completely unable to acquire one of these weapons. Maybe a single core reperk could be worth it on like the sword, maybe the revolver if you really want to use it, the AR, the shotgun, and I think that's about it for my suggestion. I know that the vacuum tube axe is kind of good. <clears throat> And then there's kind of a funny example with the vacuum tube uh, launcher where it can have that chain lightning, but I'm not 100% certain if that's useful because of the other six perk. Now, the other six perk is, well, the other side of the vacuum tube weapon. So if I can find the vacuum tube launcher in my inventory, which is unlikely because I don't even know if I have a copy of it. <gasps> I do. Yay. Okay. So. What we have going on here is the extra damage against water enemies. So not only do the vacuum tube weapons have a chain lightning, but they have the, well, bonus damage against water. I don't feel like it's necessary to go in depth on what that means. It just means you'll be doing 44% more damage to water enemies, which is what you should be going against if you're using the vacuum tube weapons anyway. So just take everything I just said about the eliminating enemies chain lightning thing and fill in the water enemy bonus because that just makes every vacuum tube weapon 44% stronger to water ele elemental enemies, which is kind of a good bonus and up to you. I can't honestly say which one is better. For the revolver, for example, it gives it some much needed area of effect. For the bow, it gives it some much needed area of effect. But for like the AR or the shotgun or the rocket launcher, perhaps you might want that 44% damage to, to water. Now, if you don't want to do more damage to water enemies, you could use the black metal weapons. So I didn't prep this uh, on the screen here, but the black metal weapons, um, they don't really need much of a display. I don't think I need to show this, but it's the same thing as before where I believe every single one of the weapons that you see here has that ability to have their, their perk changed to the damage to nature. So... These are interesting because as of recording this, Dungeons has just left like a couple of weeks ago, so you probably had ample opportunity to save up on the Black Drum, the Blackout AR. In fact, I myself did just as much, so if I can scroll down to the Blackout, yeah, I just have this sitting in my inventory, 44% extra damage to nature enemies. That is just a direct upgrade because with all of the Black Metal weapons, they have uh, perks that hurt you, which people don't love. I respect the idea where you can get that fifth perk where it gives you more damage against enemies based on your missing health and that can be a really nice bonus but it is a very dangerous way to play and it is very unfriendly to people who might not be as versed in combat or they're just a more casual player it's a really hardcore way to play and you can avoid all of it by not only giving yourself a constant 44 percent bonus damage to nature enemies but no chance of killing yourself in the middle of fight so it's kind of a good bonus and the metal marauder is a good example too of a weapon that's really really powerful black metal and everything you know it's the same set that i'm talking about but that extra damage to nature just removes the ability to hurt yourself and just makes this a monster of a rocket launcher that 44 percent bumps it up a couple of tiers on the rocket list and if you're willing to spend a core reperk on it you can but the reason i haven't and i suggest people don't is because there are already weapons like the santa's little helper and the deatomizer and the storm king's wrath like the rockets are very very competitive and those weapons already don't need a core reperk now what's kind of like a pseudo black metal weapon is the jackal launcher so the jackal launcher has that six perk option where you can have the damage to nature as well while it's not black metal it is locked to fire so if you want to just make your jackal launcher 44 percent stronger to nature enemies that could be a really good one, and I feel like this is a popular pick because while I don't suggest it, you don't need this. I mean, the Santa's Little Helper already exists and all the other rockets I just mentioned, you know, the bazooka even, but the jack launcher is stronger than the bazooka, and if you want to keep it on top, you can just remove that affliction damage because it's not really helping you. That affliction does like a meaningless amount of extra damage, and it's kind of a dead perk, so if you really like the jack launcher and you like that pumpkin giggling whenever you shoot it, then that could be a pretty good option, and it's also sort of a safe pick because the jack launcher is not really coming back the way that it's been available for a long time is you get it from the collection book and once you get it you got it i am not currently aware of any way to get a second copy unless a weapon voucher is possible i'm not certain of that but i, I wouldn't recommend a weapon voucher on that just for the collection book so i also and cannot even guarantee that you will get the new six perk out of the collection book that is a whole weapon voucher for a gamble assuming you can even grab it which i don't even know just live on video let's go to the event schematics scroll down to the fort nightmares weapons jack launcher yeah you can't even research it so i think that one could be a very very safe pick with a core reperk because there is no sign of it returning anytime soon
Now the last one I want to mention as far as elemental stuff goes is a little bit less focused because there isn't one set like black metal or vacuum tube that's focused on just being water, but the holiday weapons are pretty close because the frostbite, the blizzard blitzer, and the snowball launcher are all locked to water. And it's my understanding that they can all get that damage to uh, damage to to fire enemies. So if I scroll down to the snowball launcher, it's actually I think I went past it. An interesting example because not only does it have damage to uh, to fire enemies, but it has that six perk where it can stun and freeze an enemy. So that is really really interesting because I've heard that it's not that useful, but it is an option where stunning and knocking back can freeze an enemy in place, and that is. And that is interesting. Doesn't affect enemies that have recently been frozen. Miss monsters are bosses, which kind of sucks because the miss monsters are the enemies that you'd want to freeze. And it's also my understanding, I'm checking this live as I'm recording, the Blizzard Blitzer has this as well, where you can stun or knock back an enemy to freeze them. Now, I believe it's already always had that. It was either that or the hitting an enemy causes them to freeze. I know it had this one. I don't know if it had both, but my point is that one might be worth a core reperk, but that one is definitely up to you. However, it is a good factoid to note that the Blizzard blitzer is if you factor in the regular dps of the weapon divided by the time spent reloading and compare it to every other assault rifle the blizzard blitzer is the highest dps ar in the game when you factor in reload that is a very tricky thing to say though because it has a very limited range it's shooting snowballs you can see that you have to lead your shots it's it's not maybe the best weapon to be wearing that crown but it is mathematically true so if you want to make it all the more stronger than the damage to fire enemies uh, can be a really nice 44% bonus, but all of the six perks on the Blizzard Blitzer are pretty good. Like the one I have is critical hits, snare the target, and nearby enemies. That's pretty nice. Uh, if you crit an enemy, which you'll probably do often, you know, 38% of the time with this build, um, that's that's going to freeze or at least slow down all of the enemies around it, which is kind of nice. Um, but this perk freezes them. So... Do you want them frozen in place or walking slowly? I don't really know. You can't really go wrong. The Blizzard Blitzer is sort of a, a catch-all. Now, the other one that I mentioned there was the Frostbite Sniper, which I don't have a copy of, so I can't show you, but uh, it's my understanding that that weapon is not worth any kind of investment whatsoever. Nevertheless, a core reperk. Oh my goodness, we are getting towards the end of the list, but we're not quite there yet. Another one that I have to mention is the five hits in a row. So this one was famously donned by the Bundle Bus and the Mercury LMG natively for a long, long time. And these two weapons were top weapons in the game for a long, long time because... On that fifth hit, that explosion that occurred was very strong and very busted. Instead of doing 70% of the damage dealt in your last bullet, it was more like 170%. <laughs> it, was, it was a very, very strong bonus and very, very nice. And in fact, I would venture to say that it wasn't even overpowered. However, that got patched a long time ago and the Mercury LMG fell down to like C tier where it belongs. Now the Bundle Bus never needed that six perk to be overpowered, but it helped. And so the Bundle Bus is useful. Definitely used it on Storm King. Not that that six perk would have even helped on the crystals, but it, uh, it certainly got demoted when that thing got fixed. And the Bundle Bus is a funny example where you just want to keep it. I mean, my build here has triple crit damage because I was using this for first shot Rio in a video. But that each shot fire grants crit rating is kind of pointless. Like, it stacks to 15 times, but your next burst, I don't know if there's a full second of downtime in between. But I don't even know if you could properly utilize that six perk. So the five hits in a row that comes native on the Bundle Bus is probably just fine. All right, Beast, well, if you don't have a perk suggestion, then what are you talking about? So, the Mercury LMG also has the stacking damage and crit rating. Now, I'm not certain if either of those will really severely help this weapon. I think the five hits in a row is a pretty unique perk and good to have anyway. It just means that you can focus on a mini boss or a mist monster or a fatty husk in the middle of a crowd of zombies, and it'll be every five hits constantly hitting the enemies around it for some good area, area of effect damage. So... I think that perk is fine. I don't think that it's a good enough upgrade to change it to the damage or crit rating, but it should be noted that those perks exist and it is a bonus. Now, I didn't dedicate a whole section of this video to this just to talk about those two. Hello, it's editing me and I knew I'd forget something. So on the five hits caused an explosion, I wanted to mention the Hydra because I actually got this weapon on accident in Ventures, not intending on learning anything. But as it turns out, the way that the Hydra works is probably known to you as a shotgun AR hybrid meaning you are using an assault weapon but it uses shotgun shells and it shoots in pellets which based on my understanding based on the look of the weapon and what i was experiencing 
every other shot is essentially six bullets hitting the enemy, which uh, is, is enough to activate the six perk. So every, you know, five shots, so every other hit on an enemy, you're getting an explosion out of this weapon. And I found that to be really useful. So... I don't know. Maybe it's worth using. Um, this was a kind of a niche weapon, so you use double crit damage and reload, and then you pair it with first shot Rio. That's kind of like the meta for the Hydra. So if you're already doing that and you use that loadout a lot, you might want to consider the landing five hits in a row causes an explosion. I might do this myself. It's not even my style of play. It's not even a weapon I really enjoy using, but that is interesting enough to me to where I felt like it might uh, might be worth it. The five hits in a row can be used by another weapon that I'm sure a lot of you can already see coming, the Hemlock. Now, the Hemlock is a hybrid weapon, so meaning this weapon looks like an SMG. It performs more similarly like an assault rifle, or at least back in the day, it was classed as an assault rifle, but performed more, more like an SMG. Um, but it doesn't have that stacking crit rating. It doesn't have the stacking crit damage. In fact, they treated this one more like the ARs, which it has the typical medieval stuff where each shot can grant shield or, you know, regain shield. Um, and it has the slowed and snared, but... This is one that is much like the uh, the Spectral Blade that I showed, where you can probably tell that the Slowed and Snared on this, on this weapon is doing nothing, because without a damage to Slowed and Snared perk anywhere on the weapon, this is just a useless amount of damage. It doesn't do any damage at all. Now, it can slow enemies down, which is nice. I should have mentioned that earlier, but I feel like that's kind of obvious. That can be nice, and it stacks with floor spikes, but I've sort of stopped using floor spikes on a personal note. So my suggestion is... As I've said in the top 10 weapons video, the landing five hits in a row, if you're not aware, the 70% divided by the five hits is a bas basically a 14% damage buff. So if you're hitting a heavy target like a Miss Monster, Fatty, or, or Mini Boss, Smasher, whatever, uh, that bonus makes this weapon just barely the strongest SMG in the game. Kind of. Because, <laughs> there's always caveats with this, you guys, the Ratatat also holds that ability, where because it can have three crit damage perks on it, you throw in a crit rating, double crit damage, and then stacking crit rating, for example, the Ratatat can also be the highest SMG base damage. But they're kind of hard to com compare because you're stacking that damage on the Ratatat, and the Hemlock doesn't even get that as well because... Most enemies are going to be dead before that fifth shot even occurs, so you're not really getting a 14% damage buff. But, as I always say, if they're dead in the first five shots anyway, then who cares? I mean, it's, it doesn't sound like you ever needed that buff anyway. So, the Hemlock is a very, very strong contender. Now... The bullet, the bullet splinters into shrapnel can be nice. I have not found that to be useful. It was rumored to me that it gave a 40% damage to the target that you were shooting at, but even if that was true, I did not find it to be. I did a little bit of testing. Uh, I, I did not find that to be the case at all. Even if that is true, that would be a glitch, and I'm suspecting that would be patched at some point anyway. So naturally speaking, as it's intended to occur, 40% damage to the enemies behind your target is, is not that useful it's nice it's extra damage is it worth a cory perk no if you're going to be spending a cory perk i think that five hits on a single target is definitely what you want to be focusing on and if you do use the cory perk on this weapon be sure to focus on the biggest target in the crowd at any given time uh try to group the enemies shoot the the fatty or the miss monster in the middle of a crowd of weaker zombies and that would be the most efficient way to use this weapon and uh that is where the hemlock can get a, a drastic improvement now, staying in tune with the holiday weapons, there is one that I love to mention, and that is the pop shot. So the pop shot is when I mentioned that damage divided by reload whole thing with the blizzard blitzer. The pop shot is another one where it is tied with the ground pounder, husk buster, and because the husk buster is a scavenger weapon by extension, the stampede as well, as the exact same DPS. So these weapons are all preference, basically. And the pop shot does it with essentially a useless six perk. So that five headshots in a row increases weapon damage is nice. If you want to go ahead and hit five shots in a row with a shotgun, then go for it. It's not that hard to hit with those pellets. But what I think is interesting is that you do have some other options, but none of them really help you because, uh, as I'm double checking there, the damage to affliction doesn't exist. So that affliction damage isn't going to be helping you that much. And the crit hits snare the target is a thing and nearby enemies so i don't know if that's worth a core reperk it would be better than nothing but i wonder if that five headshots in a row might not be just a little bit of damage compared to the zero that you get from the snare but especially if you're using a shotgun constantly snaring all of the enemies around you could help you get away reload because in this game when you take damage it cancels your reload that could be a helpful thing to have and it might save you a few times 
I'm not certain if it's really worth a quarry perk, but I figured a weapon as powerful as a pop shot shouldn't go ignored. Now, on the topic of shotguns, some of them do have, again, another baity six perk, where it looks like a good option, but I'm not certain that it is. So, the stunning or knocking back an enemy deals 12 base damage. Uh, this also applies to some rocket launchers, where that might actually be a nice bonus. Again, worth a whole quarry perk? I doubt it. The Deatomizer and the Santa's Little Helper both have this perk and are doing just fine without it, as with most RPGs, but if you really want to make your weapon that much stronger, that could be an option. I'm just saying, uh, to use it, you would have to take away the damage to afflict or slow and snared, meaning on the Ground Pounder, you'd have to be only bonusing against Miss Monsters and bosses, or you could have that 60% to damage stun and staggered. Now, most shotguns are going to be stun and staggering enemies, so that could be nice, um, but it's kind of a, kind of a zero-sum thing. Like, this is a kind of nice sixth perk, but you're losing your fifth perk. So, I don't know if that's worth a quarry perk, but it's an option that I've always been, well, I've always wanted to do that, because it is a direct upgrade to the rocket launchers. Like, kind of, kind of, because the deatomizer has an exploding ring of damage, so I don't even know if that would be helpful. It's just one of those things that exists. It's not worth a quarry perk in my eyes, but if you give me unlimited quarry perk, yeah, I'd love to try it out. And maybe one of you would too. I don't know what the edit's going to be like, but I am 30 minute, 32 minutes into recording this video and my throat hurts. But we are coming up on, I think, I'm reading through my list right now, the very last suggestion. In fact, I'm going to show this just in case anybody at some point in this video is curious what we're working with here. I believe I've covered everything up until... The bows. Yeah, the bows and the obliterator. So, I guess those are sort of the same topic. Let's start with the uh, the obliterator, because this is one of my favorite weapons. Well, it is my favorite weapon to give to defenders. It's basically the only one I use. The headshot eliminations cause an explosion is quite useless. Uh, they don't hit headshots that often, and I don't even know if this perk is helping them. But the standing in place granting damage can be nice. I don't know if I have any footage of this, but you can kind of image with me. If you put the defender down in the middle of the pad and then a cone on top of it, they'll stand still and they won't be able to move. So if you have that stacking damage perk, your defender will do, after 10 seconds, 55% more damage. In that specific use case where you're limiting their movement, that could be quite useful. And I believe the same perk exists on the Neon Sniper as well, and could make for a, uh, a nice little bonus to your defenders. And the Neon Sniper as well. Five headshots in a row, your defenders will never. I they will never <laughs> i mean not in any way that you could trust it so the stars would have to align for that bonus to be active for all of 10 seconds standing in place granting damage could be a nice bonus to those weapons and then lastly with a now sore throat i want to mention that some bows have that stunning or knocking back deals 12 base damage bonus and that can be nice, you know, on the powder keg, for example. Again, slowed and snared, not really helping this weapon. Although, it is an explosive weapon, so it could affect a whole crowd of zombies and make them all walk slower. You can get away and reload. But typically, if you're running a bow, you might not have her, but worth a voucher, in my opinion, you might, you're you probably using Stoneheart Farah, so you can always double jump away. I'm not certain that slowed and snared is necessary, so that stunning or knocking back dealing base damage could be useful on the powder keg or any bow that it comes with. I just, once again... I'm not certain that that's worth a whole core reperk, but as always, it is worth mentioning. Holy smokes, I knew this video would be tough. All right, and of course, I have a video on hero superchargers, trap superchargers, survivor superchargers, and weapon superchargers, all four of them. You know, the idea behind my I'm not lazy, I just really enjoy doing nothing shirt was that I was meant to be not making videos today, but uh, today I wanted to cover a topic that is going to be pretty casual for me. There shouldn't be any gameplay necessary. This is more of one of those chatty guide videos, but a lot of people since the day they released have asked me how to spend their superchargers and... I wasn't being lazy, I just didn't really feel confident talking about it because there are heroes, melees, traps, and ranged weapons combined, over 500 different places you could put your superchargers, and we're not even talking about survivors. So, I really wanted to have my ducks in a row, and I'm proud, well not proud, but I'm excited to say that it doesn't matter. Alright, thanks for watching everybody, and then cue the outro, no, 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 but... 
it kind of doesn't. So let's start from the top with survivors, and then I'll talk about um, the, the hero superchargers, the trap superchargers, and the weapon superchargers. So the survivors are the easiest. Basically, just put them into your mythic leads. Um, don't waste them on anything else. And then once your mythic leads are done, which I believe might be possible with Venture Season 3, then go to your mythic survivors. I went straight to my mythic survivor, not caring, because in the end, they'll all be supercharged. And then... After you've done your Mythic Lead, your Mythic Survivors, all of them are, are supercharged to max. Um, you can start on supercharging your Legendary Survivors in the area that you are most interested in. So for me personally, Fire Team Alpha and Close Assault Squad would be a primary start because I really like my offense stat being as high as possible. Um, if you're somebody who really likes Paleo Luna, for example, then I guess Fortitude, upping your health. Maybe you really like Blast on the Pass in general. Uh, maybe you are somebody who runs a lot of Endurance and you need your tech, your traps to be even stronger. You might want to supercharge these legendary survivors after your, everything else is said and done it really just depends on your play style and you can't really go wrong because of what i said in the end in the very very end years from now you're going to have every survivor supercharged anyway so it doesn't it doesn't really matter and you could always recycle a uh, anything to get your supercharger back and uh that brings me to to heroes because i feel like traps will be very easy to talk about and weapons is where the real meat of this video is heroes i'm very very happy to say it doesn't matter as far as i'm aware as far as i'm aware let me move this just out of the way so you guys can at least read every single stat clearly um the health shield everything actually let me go to supercharger hero so you guys can see the difference uh let me go to azelia cleric which is somebody you should never supercharge you can see that all of these stats change your hero ability damage goes up which would be in this case shock tower size expansion phase shift but as far as I'm aware, your actual damage output does not get better. The only way that I can see damage output getting better is in, in two main places. First and foremost, I know I'm bringing her up twice already, but when they, when they add a hero as powerful as Paleo Luna, you got to talk about her because she is essentially the melee hero in this game. And I'm bringing her up because it buffs your health, which is uh, exactly where she pulls her damage from. So the higher your health is, the better Paleo Luna will be. Now, it's not going to be a lot of health. So you can see even with one supercharger, it's going to be 6,000. So 9% of 6,000 is... Uh, here, let me just... <clears throat> uh 6000 times point what 91 right yeah is um that much so 540 is how much is removed there 540 extra damage is not a lot <laughs> uh Paley luna is typically responsible for hundreds of thousands uh, per second so that's what I'm saying is obviously this number will be multiplied a lot when she's in my lead. It'll be more like, you know, maybe uh, 2000 extra damage per supercharger, but it is so tiny that it's almost not even worth talking about. Like I promoted uh, Stoneheart Farah, as you saw, to max because I went straight for my Xenombo. I have noticed no difference. So my point is the only superchargers that really matter are for Paleo Luna and upping her health by a negligible amount or ability-based loadouts. Now you could go many many directions with this i want this to be abundantly clear that this is an example and you don't need to do minigun but minigun is a good example where that ability damage is uh exactly what your minigun is is ability damage so i guess giving him extra ability damage is going to increase your minigun damage by like i said a tiny amount now this is going from 21.2 to 21.8 which is wild now obviously five superchargers would be more like a 10 percent damage increase maybe 15 so that's pretty good you know make your minigun even stronger but minigun's a funny example because minigun is already very very strong perhaps you could go shockwave with this there are a lot of options and fundamentally none of them really matter so what i would recommend is pick your absolute favorite hero in my case, I guess Stoneheart Farah. I have the most fun running bows. She's not my favorite hero, but I really enjoyed the Xenon bow. I chose it to supercharge, so um, supercharging the hero that goes along with it was kind of an obvious choice for me. And for you, it is a case-to-case -case basis. Think about yourself. Think about the loadout. You have the most fun running and supercharge that hero because I, I don't think it matters. As for the traps, this is a very simple conversation because there aren't nearly as many traps as weapons. I went straight for the ceiling electric field, and that is because it is the trap that I use the most. I feel like the ceiling electric field, the gas trap, the broadside, and maybe the ceiling drop trap are four of the top contenders for what you might want to supercharge first. I actually have seen people supercharge a healing pad, because if I'm not mistaken, it ups how much it heals you. That can be um, a pretty good bang for your buck. So 
I guess maxing out a 144 healing pad would be really, really good. Now, there is a trick that's currently a thing that I'm not really a fan of because it defeats the purpose of superchargers being scarce, but I know plenty of you know about it already where you can just recycle a trap, you know, after crafting like a stack of them. You'll get your superchargers back and then you can just put it into another trap. I don't like that because you're going to have to spend V-Bucks to get it right back out of the collection book. That's not technically duping or anything. I don't think they're going to ban me for saying this, but it's... I don't know how they would even patch that. I don't really support playing like that. I don't really think that that's something that is even worth doing. Because, again, these superchargers are, like, at least on the weapons that I've calculated, I don't know if the difference is exactly the same. Because this number is a little trickier to work with. But it seems to be about a 15-ish percent damage bonus. So if Epic banned me over telling you guys how to get a 15% damage bonus on your traps, I'd be a little sad. But... I don't think it's that big of a deal. So I went straight for my ceiling electric fields because I use those in most games. And the broadside would be a good follow-up, but that's already a very powerful trap. As I said, healing pad can be a good bang for your buck. Cozy campfire, sort of the same uh, line of thought. And the tire trap is interesting because it could use the extra damage. It's not the strongest trap, but it's usually meant for rolling enemies down hills, knocking them back, stunning them, knocking them down. It's more of a stalling trap rather than raw damage. So... You could supercharge it, but it's also pretty laggy, so it's not really a trap I'd want to encourage myself to spam everywhere. And you might have noticed uh, that I have a 130C electric field that is nature. I powered this up a couple streams ago because I mentioned that 15% damage bonus. This will do 25% uh, more damage to water enemies over the energy one. So even a 130 ceiling electric field nature will do better against water enemies than an energy ceiling electric field. Which, if you're watching this video upon release or in the following couple of months, it appears as though that is this is one of those seasons where every single four player is water element for whatever reason so your boy lock uh, your boy lucked out <laughs> leveling up a nature thing and that does seem to be consistent with ventures as well so this won't be true forever we've had nature zones in the past i believe or we had another water one we definitely had a fire zone where it was just fire missions everywhere now normal missions can have a different element but most uh, of the four players especially are water if they have a specific element at all so that's not, you know, going to be good advice forever, but hey, maybe something worth thinking about. Now, I also want to talk about weapons like the wall launcher, where I, I don't know what you get. An extra impact, this thing, I don't know if enough impact would make this thing work well against smashers, but I don't think a wall launcher or a floor launcher or a tar pit or a floor freeze or anything like that is at all where you should be putting your superchargers. I definitely think these uh, these top five or top six are certainly where you might want to be putting your juice. All right, all right, traps are out of the way. Let's talk about weapons. Now, that 15% is something I am going to cling to because I have a different take on this than everybody else. A lot of people went straight for the Storm King's Wrath or they went straight for the Pot Shot, which is a known to be very, very, very powerful weapon because it's kind of bugged, it's doing more damage than it should be. Or they're going for weapons like the Thrasher. Now, in my case, I'm not going to be doing weapons like the Thrasher or the or the Pepper Sprayer or anything that you see I have multiple elements of because of that 15%. A supercharged energy weapon is still going to do 10% less damage to fire than a water thrasher would be doing. It would be doing 10% less to fire, or 10% less to water, than a nature one would be. This is hard for me to explain, but a proper element weapon, 130, is still stronger than the supercharged one. So, in my brain of max damage, I would need 15 superchargers just to do thrasher, just the one weapon. So, that's why I went straight for my Xenon, is because I felt like being locked to energy, I'm pretty much only going to have one copy of this weapon. I'm not trying to build any more schematics for the Xenon. I figured this was a safe supercharge, and I haven't regretted it for a second. And that's my philosophy, is the strongest weapons in the game, like the Mythics, the Thrasher, the Quick Shot, Blastron Mini is really high, but it's not the strongest, you know. The weapons that I mentioned in my Top 10 Weapons video, link down below, those don't need a supercharger. They are already very, very strong. So in my, uh, in my head and eyes came out of my mouth at the same time, I feel like some of the underpowered weapons might be a good way to look. Now, I was actually looking at the, the Electroshock Rifle because I really like the feel of this weapon. I enjoyed recording a video on it. I found out later in the comments that this is apparently an ammo meter. And uh, I like the feel of this weapon. And I feel like if it was 15% stronger, it might actually be more usable in missions. 
And that's kind of what I'm thinking, too, is it's sort of the same as a hero, where the superchargers are doing such a little, like, 15% is not going to make or break the the output of a game, like, the out, the, um, the, the final, I can't think of the word, the outcome of a game. Like, whether or not you supercharge your weapon isn't going to dictate whether or not your team is successful, so I think when it comes to superchargers, you might as well just go for your favorite weapon. If you really like the Jackal Launcher, or if you really like the Gravedigger, and you are using it every single game, then go for it. In fact, we had a lot of math one time uh, talking about the Spyglass, which I can't find. I saw the old Betsy up there, but the Spyglass was my personal favorite, where this weapon uh, falls off in the late game, where it is no longer one-shotting Miss Monsters. Now, with the right group, you know, full power level players, I was able to one-shot Takers, but those the Zappy faces weren't quite there, and you're never going to one-shot a Smasher. And... I thought, maybe, I still think this, maybe if I supercharge this thing all the way, it might do enough damage to one shot. I haven't done the math on that, um, don't find out for me. <laughs> you might waste your superchargers, but with weapons like that that are just not quite strong enough, maybe a supercharger can help a lot. That was also my philosophy with the Xenon. Not only is it locked to, uh, not locked to energy, but because it's a bow, because you you basically only have one shot to kill enemies before you have to reload, I figured if I can just give it that little oomph from a supercharger, maybe it'll be more consistent in one-shotting enemies, and that, I don't know, seems to have been the case, but the fact that I don't know is kind of my point. You know, just supercharge your favorite weapons, and I really can't see how you could go wrong if you need a template i'm gonna link my top 10 best weapons uh video down below those are shocker some of the best weapons in the entire game and there are a lot on that list there were many weapons that were tied in the 12.0 uh, update lots of weapons essentially math out to do basically the same damage output so there are quite a few options like a couple dozen weapons on that list and uh if you enjoy one of them maybe you want to give them a supercharge and uh if you guys really enjoyed this video, I might do a follow-up on how to do Core Reperk because whew, that was another one that took a lot of research. Like, there are way too many Reperk options nowadays, and figuring out which weapons were worth what has uh, taken a while, but I think I am far enough along to where I can actually recommend stuff. For example, my Spectra Blade, I spent a Core Reperk on, and uh, maybe a video focusing on Core Reperk would answer a lot of questions and show you where you should spend that very limited resource. If you guys enjoyed the video, feel free to use code MESA to check out. I'd appreciate it. Um, this video might have just been a sit down and chat, one take kind of video, but trust me, I have spent the last few, when did these come out? Months? Um, learning the ins and outs of the game so I can even talk about this intelligently. Uh, these are not really, I mean, it's largely opinionated, but I have looked at all the different things the superchargers do and all the different uh, effects it's had on heroes and weapons and these are my recommendations. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, recommended video should be on the screen by now. Hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you uh, in the next one, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I hope the weather's nice. And if it's not, then I hope you have a space eater or a cozy blanket or... Okay, goodbye. All of those are covered in the same video and how to spend these. It's a really great resource if you have no idea what these are. These are what you get through those ventures missions like I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can't get these through normal play. So this is why I definitely recommend going through the venture season while it's available and uh, being sure that you stay on top of that stuff. Now, that's uh, definitely something that you're not going to need to worry about later because I think you need to supercharge tier 5 materials. So if you're just playing today, this is totally outside of anything you ever have to worry about but it is a way to get like 135 for example you do need to use survivors to get there my survivor squads video doesn't mention that i might have should have brought this up earlier but uh, 130 is the natural cap but if you supercharge your mythic leads and all that other stuff again way down the line not your concern uh, you can get a little bit of extra power level but a 135 player is not doing anything that a 130 player can't so if you ever miss out on any superchargers do not do not worry about it you're going to be fine. <laughs> you're going to be completely fine. The skill and the activity of the player is going to outweigh that power level every time. So, uh, yeah, AFKing is is not going to be helping too much in the mission. Now, Flux is... Uh, man, so this stuff is not something I've covered in a video, but you'll sort of figure it out as you go. Rarity is a thing in this game, and I wanted to show this through the collection book as well. You can see that Ramirez here has a green, blue, purple, and legendary variant. That's technically uncommon, rare... Uh, 
epic and legendary i just say the colors and uh flux is actually how you change that you can't make anything mythic but if i go to uh let's see let's just find a purple hero here here we go Daimos, Daimos. that's probably where uh, many of you are coming to this video from i can spend if i move my camera 100 legendary flux to make him legendary uh i'm not going to spend flux on that personally and which weapons and heroes you should use flux on is again something that if you look it up on my channel and get at least a review for me or another YouTuber that can sort of let you know whether or not you want to spend flux. The ways that you get flux is through the collection book rewards as you level it up down the line. Again, don't do that unless you have duplicates or through the llama shop where you can buy 50 every single week. I super recommend doing that every single week. Uh, no matter how much gold it costs you, no matter how broke you are, you always want to stay on top of that flux and, um, you know, maybe the event heroes are a priority, but you should always be trying to get that flux because you're never going to get a chance to get that 50 flux again. Now, you can see with my surplus of a couple thousand, you're going to get enough down the line anyway. It's not that serious, but you definitely want to stay on top of it. Now, vouchers are another big topic where I have covered heroes. All right, this is going to be an unexpected update video on spending your hero vouchers. Now, there are a couple of things I want to get out of the way right away. This is a hero voucher video, so if you guys are looking for the weapon video, uh, that one's up to date i don't have anything new to add to this i might reword some of the things i said and maybe shift around my emphasis but honestly this is a good video if you want to spend your weapon vouchers link down below i stand by it i'm probably not going to be re-recording that one anytime soon however i do want to update my old hero vouchers video for a couple of reasons First and foremost, not a reason, but a disclaimer, uh, if you just followed this video or if you've spent vouchers on it recently, you're probably good, okay? There's really nothing seriously wrong with this, but if you check out this pinned comment, there's a lot to add. A couple of key things. Stonehurt Farah came to the game. Clip came to the game. Both of them are top tier heroes and they just didn't exist at the time. And Happy Holidays and uh, stuff like Crossbones Barrett, who I, I gave a lot of emphasis to and pronounced uh, Beret at the time because I didn't know it was called Barrett. Those can be researched without vouchers. And so that's kind of going to give us a little bit more to talk about. And I figured I'd get into it. Like I said, if you followed that video, you're good to go. But if you guys want to uh, spend your hero recruitment vouchers, Let's start from the top. I am going to be going through the entire collection book. So if you guys want to hear me go over every single hero, that's what we're going to do here. If I skip any heroes, there's probably a reason for that. But let me get the top recommendations out of the way. Because in the last video, almost two years ago now, I gave a heavy emphasis to like the top six or seven heroes. Because that's the most vouchers we all got at once. By now, I haven't exactly been counting. But I think between all the venture seasons and the seven initially, I think 12 or 13 vouchers, maybe more, maybe less, is about how many... Some of you might have i'd be shocked if you have that many on hand but i want to get over to the the top picks right away first and foremost anything base game or researchable meaning you can go to recruit and it does not cost a voucher obviously is not going to be a part of today's video you can't spend a voucher even if you wanted to and that's great because you'd be wasting it uh but let's get into the top heroes to pick First and foremost, I talked about Stoneheart Farah. She is, uh, with every hero in the game, I want to get into a disclaimer right away. Couple of things to note before I recommend Farah. Do not research any hero that is currently available. For example, if you go to the event shop right over here, Ragnarok is right here. Don't voucher him. I wouldn't recommend that normally, but anybody who is in the event shop, do not voucher. And be aware of your events. This is going to take a little bit of research, or, I mean, if you're subscribed to my YouTube channel, then you probably won't need it. Go to my playlist over here updates and news currently if you've been following my channel as of recording this we are in the middle of a fort nightmares event meaning all the halloween stuff is coming out i'm going to show what that means right here i'm going to timestamp this video so if you guys need to you know not need this information you can skip ahead but uh blockbuster is now what we're looking for fort nightmares you can expect Every hero here, if they aren't currently already available, like Swamp Knight and Mermonster are both available from Dungeons. Jonesy is coming back. We just got him announced today, or yesterday. All of these heroes are probably on the docket. Uh, so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't voucher anything. And by following this playlist, or just staying up to date with recent events, you'll know that as of recording, this will change in the future, check the date on this video, as of recording, all the dinos and archaeologists and Azelia Clark 
all just left the shop, all just left the game on September 4th. That was 24 days ago as of recording this video. So what I'm saying is I'm going to be recommending dinos anyway. That's not going to surprise anybody, but they are a prime pick. The only thing you can ever do with vouchers is save time. Uh, pretty much every hero is going to come back. I'm not aware of any worth talking about hero that has never returned. Like there are like birthday heroes and whatnot, but these are all reskins and you can't voucher them anyway. So, I mean, you know, it's whatever. Uh, just be aware of what what just left so you know the dinos just left that's a perfect thing to voucher so let's start with the dinos and Farah because I think they're kind of uh, tied together so Farah, I bring up all of this because she is kind of a uh, I think a Valentine's hero being the you know love ranger kind of deal so it's currently September she can be expected in you know the springtime months so that would be uh, February March May somewhere in there April skipped a month so she is honestly just your go-to bow hero I'm gonna link my bow loadouts video down below and my best bows video link down below because she is phenomenal if you're using bows even in support she is still a fantastic pick because three out of five chaining not even that bad 20 percent is not a big deal but still she is a really really top pick if you really like bows go for it however that's not the first hero i'd ever recommend in fact i gotta recommend dinos you guys know i like them in fact you know what i've been called bi biased towards dinos which i kind of am but i'm gonna talk about totally rocking out first because all of these heroes, if I'm not mistaken, can be researched normally. All of the Totally Rockin' Out heroes can just be researched without vouchers, except for Dennis Jr., who, in the bottom left, the ad is covering it, gives you Totally Rockin' Out. He is the only one you'd have to voucher. Totally Rockin' Out is the highest damage you're going to achieve in the entire game. I don't personally use it. It's not always active, and when it is always active, your traps are going on an onslaught, so you might not even be needed, blah, blah, blah. I don't personally dig it. That's part of my bias, but I can't ignore the fact that it's an insanely good damage bonus, and that's, if you want to be a glass cannon, that's for you. Dennis Jr. is a really, really good pick. And I'm going to note alongside him, if you're going to be picking up Dennis Jr. for Totally Rockin' Out purposes, you're going to want Sledgehammer. He's available in the road trip section, so Sledgehammer is just a nice pick. Recruitment voucher, he just, like I said, as of recording, this will change in the future, just left the game with the Dino Heroes, and he gives you a massive 225% crit damage bonus. For normal use case, this isn't better than Ramirez as is like 50% damage bonus trust me it works out to be essentially the same but if you're using totally rocking out upping your crit rating by a ton this is a very very good commander that you are definitely going to want to have so if you're looking to spend a couple of vouchers him and dennis jr plus regularly researching the other support heroes not a bad combo editing beast here to just say that sledgehammer is really really good normally day to day anyway i brought him up here just because i was talking about totally rocking out but if you need a regular typical assault weapon smg damage bonus to just have in support in your regular offensive soldier build he's a really really great pick i use him all the time personally whether or not i'd suggest him as a voucher in case you're just using him as a support perk all the time i don't know about that one but i'm just saying if you're going to be using totally rocking out you definitely are going to want sledgehammer as well all right all right so I like to have consistency personally. I have always been a huge fan of the dinos. I think the original four remain to be the ones that I would suggest. So Triceraops in our current version of the game, hero updates may change this in the future, is not very strong. If in the future she's doing more than 2.15%, uh, whatever, 125, she might be worth considering. I don't think you should ever research her unless this number is at least 10%. Because even then, every five seconds, 10% is going to take you, what, 50 seconds to get back to full health? Uh, no, Editing Beast, who is usually smarter and wiser than recording beast has done the math it's actually 235 seconds in her current state which rounding up for easy math means you will be waiting four minutes to go from zero health which would mean you're dead so gg to you all the way back to full health i'm saying in the future if she made it if it was like 10 percent every five seconds then it would be 50 seconds to get back to full which honestly would still be slow so you know just try to take this with a grain of salt should she ever be updated in the future that's way slower than a coconut, and uh, we'll get into that in a second. So, yeah, I don't recommend Triceraops. However, the core four are honestly great. Rex Jonesy, really, really good. You can get them all with vouchers. Uh, he gives you damage based on how much health you have. Iza might be the first dino you want to recruit. Just remember, if you're going to be recruiting Blast from the Past heroes, you're going to need at least two to activate the support perk. And if you intend on using Paleo Luna, the best melee buff in the entire game, hands down, you're going to need two dinos in support as well. So if you're going to be unlocking Blast from the Past just with vouchers and you have none of these heroes, be prepared to spend three if you want Luna, 
two if you want to use the perk at all. And then the last one I'd want to recommend is Fossil Southie. He is fantastic for energy generation. I use him in support with Luna all the time because I like to use melee heavy attacks. Uh, Storm King's Ravager definitely benefits from that a lot. Four energy per second constantly happening is a really nice bonus. All right, I wish I would have mentioned this sooner, not so late in the video, but Cassie Clip Lipman is currently a fantastic pick. Not as a recording because she can be expected with the Fort Nightmare stuff very soon, but she essentially gives you a chance to double your loot while farming. This is not builds like wood, metal, brick, but like oxidized mineral powder or any mineral powder, whatever power level you are, uh, you're going to get extra like rough ore, you're going to get extra ferns, you're going to get extra planks, all the extra crafting stuff she can double in the lead. I'm going to link a farming loadout down below. That covers it pretty heavily, and she's a great addition to it. Uh, between her and Archaeologist, come to think of it, I might just edit this in right when I bring up Southeast, so if this is a little jarring, I apologize, but Archaeologist reducing your heavy attack efficiency makes farming incredibly easy and both of these are really good picks the farming loadout video kind of gets into which one of these are the best ones for your commander slot but i uh highly recommend having them if you're looking to farm up a lot and just kind of get going in the early game as for the rest of the dinos uh we're not going to talk about garadin none of them are really like super big voucher picks in my opinion uh i'm not going to get into it or else this video will run on too long but these original four uh jonesy Iza, luna and southie are definitely the ones you really want to look at uh just in case you're looking to uh get blast in the pasco and you'll be very very bulky and it's a very nice bonus i want to get into crossbones barrett because he like sledgehammer has very very good uh synergy with the blast in the past heroes and uh, as of now you don't need vouchers uh this isn't new or anything but you can just re recruit him normally and i've seen some very newbie players like that just started playing the day of get barrett because the coconuts give you about 30 percent of your health instantly which means you can just eat two or three coconuts and be full they give you healing regeneration at the speed of a little faster than two campfires at like full healing and reload over the course of 30 seconds and on top of that you get a 16% damage bonus. I use coconuts in almost every single loadout because healing and damage is just a phenomenal combo. And frankly speaking, in our current version of the game, unless you want to spam healing traps, he is the only support perk in the entire game that's really going to keep up with Blast in the Past. In our current version of the game, uh, survivalist is just not cutting it uh, there is no other perk that's really going to buff that so hopefully that changes in the future and we can get some better support perks but if you're fine with searching coconuts barrett is a really great pick i know this is a voucher video but uh well he was a big conversation last time and you don't currently need a voucher anymore all right so those are the big picks if you are brand new to the game looking to spend vouchers you're probably empty by now but if you somehow have all of that, let's get into some of the other stuff. Now, I mentioned Sledgehammer, but I want to mention Beetle Jess. Like I said, currently speaking, I don't know if she's exactly available now, but we should be seeing her in the shop soon. She's essentially the Outlander version of... Uh, you know sledgehammer she just gives you the 225 percent to pistols and smgs instead of smgs and assault weapons so she's a great pick if you're not currently in the halloween season so if you find this video two or three months from now give her a consideration if you want it uh definitely a great pick i mean not much else to say about that and redline ramirez is another one i want to bring up so she is blockbuster or road trip i always forget right next to our pal sledgehammer she's not a super serious pick this is the kind of thing where like if you have everything i've mentioned so far and you really like bows or whatever Whatever. a flat 17 percent is a great bonus i use her all the time uh she's again not my top pick for a voucher she's really not anything to build a loadout around but if she's the missing piece i can't not recommend her redline ramirez is a great pick and she honestly goes alongside the uh, springtime other bunny right here rabbit raider jonesy also needs a voucher he gives you uh, crit damage uh, these are very great for bows currently they are classed as snipers i imagine if bows ever get their own weapon class it'll be like you saw with the pistols and smgs bows and snipers will hopefully be buffed by him as well so long as that's true he is really great to throw in support um yeah if you're using blast on the past or totally rocking out he's going to be a great thing to throw in all right, last couple of things I want to mention before we get into like the general overview is Fall in Love Ranger Jonesy because he is really useful. He's been useful in a lot of venture seasons where eliminations just straight up give you energy, and that is nice. Six energy over three seconds doesn't sound like much, 
but it really does add up and I use him in a lot of different loadouts where I'm spamming Teddy or Shock Tower if I need it. Usually fragments handle that, but if you're using an ability that doesn't use fragments, uh, this is super nice and uh, just something worth considering. Again, Fall Love Ranger, not anything you should spend your very first voucher on. If you have everything I've mentioned already, he might be the missing piece to your puzzle. And finally, I want to mention Whiteout Fiona. This is before we're going to get into the main stuff, but yeah, Road Trip has a lot of good stuff. Whiteout Fiona, I use a ton because she just gives you a straight crit rating bonus to swords axes and sights crit rating is not crit chance this is not a 15 percent bonus but you'll find that it helps a lot i use her in almost every sword build uh she's just a really good bonus i'm gonna bring her up in a lot of videos and it's kind of a boring support perk you're almost never gonna notice you have her but if you take her out of your loadout you're gonna crit less often and you're gonna notice it immediately so sometimes she's even good in the lead combine her in the lead with like a crit explosion melee and you might have a good time so definitely worth considering all right so starting kind of from the top because i'm skipping over steel wool and some of the home base heroes we already talked about clip art deco is uh, a group of heroes that you could voucher at one point in fact i believe i got gumshoe through a voucher but you don't actually need to anymore and because these are fantastic heroes i'm still gonna bring them up anyway but fragment abilities doing 30 percent means shock tower and teddy a flat 30 percent bonus whenever you're using a charge fragment is huge and i use her all the time the only other one i'm gonna get into right now is noir and lefty and righty being extended is fantastic for dungeons right now so so long as that's in the game definitely a good pick we already covered the rad heroes and believe it or not we actually got through most of the road trip heroes because they just have a really great set pirate heroes don't really have too much to get into i don't believe uh blakebeard the blackhearted blackhearted is kind of a good pick kind of because uh blakebeard stash is really really fun i'm gonna link a video on it down below i found it to be very useful in nearly every single venture season getting started uh he gives you a nice cannonball bonus in the support which is great that affects the cannonballs you can throw and it actually affects some other weapons the video gets into it down below but he might be a fun pick it's my understanding that many of the other uh pirates are easily researchable so you can honestly build this loadout with one voucher you know get Barrett in support you can get freebooter ken as well if you're looking to use smoke bombs i recommend getting privateer hype because buffing your clubs is really nice because you're going to be using peg legs again won't need a voucher and between privateer hype barrett and blakebeard in this in the support you can build whatever commander you want just to use uh you know a blakebeard stash it's a really good combo and uh, he might be worth a voucher if that's interesting to you moving on to blockbuster heroes this is more of a seasonal suggestion but carbide is a phenomenal bonus Bonus. I don't remember if he's base game. I don't think he is. He comes with a, uh, the Blockbuster event. Uh, the very first time I ever played Save the World was the, during the Blockbuster event. So I've always been, I've always had that memory tainted. But right now and forever, he is currently just the best hero in the game for dungeons i mean that's kind of a bold statement you know take that with a grain of salt but if you've ever seen the way his ability ricochets along the map if editing beast is being a good boy then you probably see some gameplay of this phenomenal pick really only useful in dungeons but oh my god i use him all the time very very fun diecast jonesy i supercharged him and carbide by the way 144 power level that going commando being energy or even 25 percent in support is huge and supercharging heroes does buff ability damage so i've never regretted supercharging him and if you want to pull a voucher out it might be worth it if you're just looking to complete your minigun build blockbuster did just leave recently so uh as of recording they could be a very good pick as for the spy heroes, there's really nothing I'm going to really mention here. Springtime, we did kind of get into it. Most of these are like grenade builds and stuff, so I'm not going to spend too much time here, but Star Spangled Headhunter, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that she has a very, very fun loadout. This rocket loadout video right here is very, very fantastic. She is critical in allowing you to spam rockets a ton. Very, very nice to have. And Stars and Stripes Jonesy. This is for those of you who have everything i've mentioned so far this is a frivolous pick at best but the way that his support perk works means you are not only just not spending ammo but like you're saving those bullets in your magazine and his ability can activate on the same bullet multiple times the brass tax of that is he essentially extends your uh, your ammo your mag size by 31.7 percent and you just shoot more often and spend less ammo really really good in support i use him every time i can i uh really really like it i miss out on a little bit of damage by using him but every time i take him out i find myself reloading more often and i can't not recommend at least giving him a look not the first thing you could you could voucher i don't recommend that but he's definitely a good pick Holiday heroes are something I should have mentioned a little sooner in the video, but it's kind of okay because you don't need vouchers for most of these. So, for example, Jilly Teacup, you can use a voucher, but you'll get the Happy Holidays team perk, which reduces ability cooldown. I mention her because that used to be the only way to get it. Ted will also give you Happy Holidays and buff your minigun 
and not cost a voucher. So again, this is a voucher video, but he's a really good hero that you should probably have, and you don't need any of the holiday heroes to get Happy Holidays. So you can just research Ted normally with manuals and, and flux, and you'll just be off to the races. As for the rest of these heroes, there's nothing insanely worth mentioning for the most part, but I am going to get into a few. Obviously, Lynx is in here, and I know some of you are gasping that I said it's not insanely worth mentioning. If you look at a run Storm King, she's a top pick. That's the only time she's ever really viable. Not really in normal missions do we see her very often, but in my opinion, I feel like if you're running Storm King, you've probably had a chance to grab Lynx, but be careful buying her because she usually comes out in like the uh, January range, winter range, so as of recording this, we could be seeing her next event. If you don't want to wait a few months and you want to buy her right away, that's a good, uh, good thing to do. You can go for that, but just, you know, be warned. Ice King, again, there are a lot of very capable constructors in the game. Uh, base Kyle and Power Base Nox are going to cover most of what you need, and they're both base game. However, freezing enemies when they attack your base is a really nice bonus. This affects Smashers as well, and he's a really, really great pick. So definitely worth looking at. Same disclaimer as Lynx. He does come out in the winter season, so you got to be a little careful of when you buy it. Whoa, it's Editing Beast again. Just wanted to mention, before we move on to the last hero, Crackshot is really, really good. I always kind of forget he exists because it's sort of has to ramp up your damage and that can be a little tricky to deal with but I've actually as of recently completed supercharging my Storm King Scourge all the way to 144 because it is one of those weapons where it never actually has to reload it'll only overheat when it's almost done so you combine something like that with Crackshot who's increasing your damage by 2.9% up to 50 stacks, and you can get a really, really good bonus. You don't need the Storm King weapon to utilize him, but he's very, very strong. And he's very well paired with Bullet Storm Jonesy, who also increases your damage by 1%, in support that is. Crackshot is definitely better in the lead. The stability is hardly noticeable, especially on PC. And combine these two together for a very, very powerful loadout. It's my understanding that Jonesy doesn't even need a voucher, so you can actually get him for relatively cheap. And the last thing I want to mention was Fragment Flurry. She's, again, not a voucher pick, but she has a really good ability where 13 eliminations give you a charge fragment. I mentioned those earlier with Gumshoe. Using her in the early game for Shock Tower and Teddy is an insanely fun thing for Ventures. Uh, I swap her out for Cyberclops later on, but definitely something worth knowing about. On that topic about fragments, I'm going to bring up uh, Deadeye even because he's not, again, a voucher, but uh, Shock Tower Affliction, really nice bonus. That's all I wanted to say. I kind of have a soft spot for him. First Shot Rio is an interesting pick because she gives you a 100% crit bonus whenever you reload for a couple of shots or six in the lead. Kind of a neat thing, but you don't need a voucher, so it's kind of whatever. You know, I, I love how easy this video has become because so many good heroes just don't need vouchers anymore, and I'm really, really happy to report it. Again, Fort Nightmares kind of already covered it. There's nothing in here that I'd seriously recommend absolutely grabbing out of season. There are a couple of options like Skull Ranger Ramirez where you don't need a voucher, but a nice flat 15% bonus for reloading. Kind of a nice ability. I use that personally on my shotguns because you're reloading constantly. And if I use like preemptive strike on my bows where I have no more dinos in my support and I've got room for extra, 15% uh, every time you reload your bow for five seconds at least is kind of a nice bonus and you'll definitely notice it. And then lastly, that brings us to the Retro Sci-Fi down here. Extraterrestrial Rio. You don't even need a voucher. I'm so surprised to see that because she gives you a flat 20% in support while your shields are up. Not a good thing to combine with Blast in the Past, but if you're using Totally Rockin' Out or Happy Holidays where you're going to have those shields up, uh, nice 20% flat bonus to energy damage. Not a bad thing to have. Cyberclops mentioned him earlier. You don't need a voucher, but he's really good just for Shock Tower and Teddy. Uh, I use him in Ventures quite a bit, and Azealia Clark I don't think is worth recruiting everything else beyond here is just expansion stuff i'm like 100 percent certain none of these need vouchers so you definitely you know well you can't spend a voucher on them but you shouldn't even if you can deadly blade crash is a really fantastic hero to pair with whiteout fiona so something worth knowing existing but yeah the rest of that is more for a best heroes video and weapon vouchers on my channel before i wanted to add real quick before this video gets going that if you're looking for hero recruitment vouchers i do have a video on exactly how to spend those they are different than weapon vouchers in that they only work on heroes so that'll be linked below if you're looking for any recommendations as far as i know this video is still up to date and if my recommendations do change at all you can check the pinned comment for any of those corrections all right as I'm recording this, weapon vouchers have been confirmed to come to save the world. I do not know specifically how it will work, or how many we'll get, or how many things we're going to have to do to unlock these things. But what we do know is you will be able to recruit event weapons at your discretion from the collection book, and that's mostly what I'm going to be focusing on today, but my suggestions are going to be interesting. So, I want to talk about some of the best weapons in the game. However, they changed a lot of six perks. For example,
example, there are weapons like the Thrasher. I have hyped this up a lot on my channel and it deserves all of the praise that it got. I have done videos on all of the weapons that I'll probably recommend today, so those will be linked down there. But for example, the Thrasher, this is pretty much the ideal build. I still do recommend checking out my video because I talk a lot more about why we use the perks that we use, but... The six perks have some options down here. Now, again, we don't know exactly how these are going to work. I am recording this before the update. So if anything critical changes, a new video will be linked in the comments below or the description or both. I do like to put corrections in the comments. So check the pinned comment if I make any mistakes in this video or anything changes. Because one thing I want to get out of the way right now is that I don't think I or anybody knows exactly every single weapon that was changed, which is probably most of them. A lot of them are given these different options. And my point that I was getting to, just so I can get out of the way, is the fact that crit rating makes the Thrasher kind of a lot better. Like, I don't know exactly how much. We haven't specifically crunched the numbers, but it's definitely probably a better option. Yeah, definitely probably. This is a person who hasn't ran the math, but we have run the math on a few other weapons and crit rating or even just uh, up upping your damage, which isn't currently an option on the Thrasher was quite a bit better than Affliction. So now you have an option to do like damage to miss monsters, which will actually be pretty damn good. And I think the Bobcat was one of the weapons. I'm just going off the top of my head here that actually has the ramping damage as well. So it's crit rating and damage. Uh, crit rating tends to be better, but again, we haven't specifically ran the math on that. So damage is better if you're not running a crit build. And then crit rating can be good if you want to forego a crit rating perk, but it's not exactly a replacement. Do not quote me on that. You typically want to keep that crit rating perk anyway. Again, that is seriously a conversation conversation for another video, but my point is these six perks change everything. And I'll leave a lot of the things that I might miss to the comments below, but I do have a list here. Now this is kind of ugly. It's not meant to be like super coherent, but I'll try to flash screenshots of what I'm talking about. These are some of the six perks that I have noted that have stood out. I am certain there are more options. That's where the comments come in. If I miss anything, let me know anything cool. But stacking damage and crit rating, that can change a lot. Stacking movement is something that can happen on melees where the more swing speeds you get, you know, the faster you'll move. Multiple hits can cause an explosion. Some of the melees have that as well. Sometimes when you crit with the melee, they can explode. Like the Argon Axe has that. I can show that here. Shrapnel is something that came from the Steampunk weapons where you can get some shrapnel behind the enemy and a cone of extra damage. And that can be actually pretty good for crowd clearing. And then this is one that I can actually show because I was given a weapon where eliminations can cause chain lightning. Oh wait, are you seeing the vacuum tube bow right now? Uh, yeah, all of the vacuum tube weapons can get that. So not only do we have the launcher, which can decimate an encampment, large crowds of enemies and chain to lots of things at once for tons of extra damage, making the vacuum tube launcher a very relevant weapon in today's day and age. But you can also put that on the sword, which we've recently found out uh, multiple attack speed perks are definitely the way to go if you're using Paleo Luna in your lead. So the vacuum tube sword we're using right now has double attack speed, which is awesome because we can quickly eliminate enemies with Paleo Luna's extra damage and you'll chain out to a bunch of extra targets. And as of recording, that chain damage doesn't actually scale with the amount of damage you've put in. So it doesn't really matter that our sword is doing a lot less damage than normal because Paleo Luna is picking up a lot of that damage. <gasps> the chain lightning will do the same amount regardless as of recording. If that changes in the future again check the pin comment but my point is that chain lightning is huge it's so so good and then another one i've seen is stunning or knocking back an enemy deals x amount of base damage i've noted that the powder cake has this that santa's little helper has this the backbreaker has this and these are more of references to say that the santa's little helper is among many rpgs that have gotten this and that's just great it means that if you literally just stun or knock back an enemy you do extra damage it's it's literally that simple and that is kind of huge because I have affliction on my Senna's Little Helper, which is kind of not great. Like it doesn't need that, for example, like with a high powered rocket, I don't want to wait a few seconds for my enemy to get finished off. I just want that extra 12 base damage right there. Now, exactly how much 12 base damage is, is kind of hard to calculate and very specific to the player in question because power level and survivor squads can change a lot. <gasps> but <laughs> yeah, I'm breathing a lot here. There's a lot to say, but 12 base damage is, is a ton. It's, it's definitely thousands. I have not done the Math, but it's a lot and it's certainly worth using and the backbreaker is to say that some shotguns have this as well and that changes everything no longer am i going to just be saying flat out match your fifth perk to your sixth perk because that extra damage just by stunning or knocking back an enemy is pretty crazy because a lot of shotguns actually have a pretty good, you know, impact or knockback modifier, which is kind of a hidden value. Knockback isn't really shown to the player, but it is a thing that exists. 
that's cool. That changes a lot. Stunning or knocking back enemies can freeze. Standing in place was introduced with the uh, spy weapons, where if you stand in place, you get different modifiers like shield or damage to miss monsters or just straight up damage. And something I've noted really important here is that uh, you can hand like an obliterator or a neon sniper with that new six perk to a defender and just trap them under a cone or something so they can't move. And then they'll just get that damage, which is a 55% damage bonus, which is way better than damage to afflicted because when you're using a sniper, you don't want them to have to take a second shot. And that's a big deal. And then another one I want to show is that critical hits have a chance to snare. A lot of the winter weapons have this, and one that I noted was the pop shot, where the pop shot basically has a dead six perk of five headshots in a row, but if you have critical hits can snare a target and nearby enemies, that's at least kind of good. It's a lot better than a five headshots in a row damage bonus that is almost never going to actually be activated. So you can at least slow things down, and other weapons also have variations of this, where you can freeze them in place, Again, that's a big deal. And then I also wanted to note that the uh, Duelist and the Corsair have new perks to where they can function very similar to the Jack's Revenge. And on that note, the Jack's Revenge can also have some other perk options. So you can get some extra area of effect damage with the headshot eliminations or that cone effect of the shrapnel. Snowball Launcher, other winter weapons also have the extra 44% damage to fire enemies. And I've noted that the Black Drum has a 44% extra damage to nature instead of the perk that damages you. So now the Black Drum can be perked in such a way so that it is no longer contingent on damaging you, but you're actually just doing more damage to fire enemies, which if you're running the black drum, you should probably have the fire element on it anyway. I ran it physical for a long time. That's still a good way to go. But if you have that six perk, you can make that element fire and just kick ass against nature enemies and also not hurt yourself in the process. That's a big deal. And I also like to bring that up because I am sure there's a damage to water element on some weapon out there that I haven't noticed. And that could be very cool. That could be very, very cool that that bonus is not just being locked to the Art Deco weapons and can actually help other weapons. And then the Pulsar and the other sci-fi weapons are no longer locked to the six perk that they came with, but they have other options as well, including the Deatomizer, which has a new set of six perks, which can also be very, very helpful. This has been a very long breakdown of a lot of six perks that have stood out just to very, very much so emphasize the fact that all of the best weapons that I'm going to recommend in this video here are probably different. Now, a lot of the weapons in the My Best Weapons video are still very relevant. Pretty much everything I said was good has only gotten better, and that's true twice over, meaning that in the 12.0 update, they changed a lot. Here's the spreadsheet. If you want to just copy it, I'll link it below anyway. A lot of weapons just got better, meaning every weapon I said was good is probably super good. Every weapon that I said was kind of, eh, is probably very good. Like the Thrasher, for example, wasn't even on my radar. But that little tweak to the damage literally put it as the Crown SMG. It, it, it does more damage than any other SMG. You can fight me on it. I won't listen. We've ran the math. If you, if you give me numbers, I'll listen. But we have done the math. We have a calculator. I should be making a video on that soon. Thanks to Choo Choo. He did a ton of the math, but it's, it's kind of math we both already knew. But he plugged it into a calculator, did a ton of work to make sure that they was accurate. It's cool. It's very, very cool. He just done a very good job, and we've been crunching a lot of numbers, and uh, yeah, the, the Thrasher is fantastic, and that spreadsheet can show a lot of other weapons that have gotten a lot better. Unfortunately, they also got buffed again, so things have gotten shaken up even more, so that weapons like the Bobcat here can have that extra damage and crit rating, and that's a big deal. That, that makes these weapons even better than they might have been before, and some of these six perks are ones you can look out for. If any other fantastic six perks or six perks slash weapon combinations stand out to me to be very very powerful again check that pinned comment but without further ado this will probably be a timestamp in the description uh getting all of those six perk recommendations out of the way and all of that factored in let's talk about what has so far stood out to me to be some of the best weapons that you can use your weapon ticket on now first and foremost i'm not talking about expansion weapons if this for some reason works on mythic weapons don't it just just don't uh, for two reasons one you'll feel a lot better if you beat the storm king with you know your own hand or you know a team or you can get it done and pick up the weapon cache yourself and two if you spend a ticket on it you'll forever know that you could have just beat the storm king later on when you were perhaps you know more prepared just don't waste a ticket on it. It's, it's not worth it. And any other weapon here, you can absolutely just recruit. Like the uh, vacuum tube launcher that I talked about. You can just research this, 
right now. Like you could just go get it. I'm not going to do it because there is a chance I'll get that new six perk, but there's also a chance I will not. So I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to not, but you can, if you want any of these weapons, you can absolutely research them or just get them from a normal llama. And of course that applies to the range weapons up here. Like all of these things you can just research except for the typewriter. Oh shit. Well, never mind. Oh yeah. You can use a weapon voucher. Okay. I was going to say, yeah. So that's one of those weapons. It's like really, really randomly rare. It's not incredibly strong. It's identical to the Papa Bear. I covered it exclusively exclusively here you can check it out there with lots of information that is just a weapon that you can get now if you want it's it's you know special i guess but i wouldn't waste a weapon voucher on it so let's talk through the event schematics and i kind of want to start from the top and work my way down and if i am going to start at the top then the sci-fi weapons is is basically where i want to start i'm just going to do the no bullshit approach to this video and say that the deatomizer is pretty much my only serious recommendation for a weapon voucher because this highly depends on how many we're going to receive if it is literally once ever then the deatomizer if you don't have it grab it like simply you know see you guys later but <laughs> let me explain if you get lots of these like once every five months or twice per voucher you know ventures event maybe you can get three per event maybe you can start with the deatomizer work down to the pulsar you know get some of the other ones because the deatomizer is just extremely powerful very very good against the storm king crowds of enemies it's great great i use it a lot and if you don't have this weapon it's a detriment to your day and that also brings me up to another example i'm going to go in a linear fashion after this one but i do want to talk about the bundle bus which is a great pick it's a weapon you really really want but it's more of like a means to an end like you're just going to use the bundle bus to essentially take down the storm king and then you get the storm king's wrath which is it just does everything the bundle bus does but better but it uses energy cells if you're somebody who's always coveted the bundle bus and you really want it then a weapon voucher is probably a good spend but again there are some other options. So I want to start with the Art Deco weapons and go down. First and foremost, I can't recommend a single one of these. Uh, they're all amazing. Seriously, the Floor Flusher is one of, if not the high, well, it's not, but it's one of the highest DPS ARs in the game. If you match the six perk to the element, extremely powerful. The Big Shot, one of the best shotguns I've ever used. The Mouthpiece, well, as far as pistols is, all pistols are kind of tough if they don't have area of effect damage, but it's very strong. And the Sod Buster is the third highest damage rocket in the game. But all of these weapons that I'm talking about here, as a record, if you're watching this in the future and these llamas have come and gone and you missed them, everything I just said is relevant, at least as of recording, because I don't know what's going to change. Pin comment. But if you're not from the future, then I don't don't spend a voucher on any of these because they could very well come out any day as they did once with V-Buck llamas already just a, a week ago or so. You got to be aware of that. And then, of course, as of recording, all of these weapons in the boombox set are available through the Rad Llamas, so don't waste on any of these. However, if you're watching this in the future and the Surround Pound it has come and gone, then the Surround Pound is a big pick. Again, but for the same reason as the Bundle Bus, I can't also recommend it because you're just going to use it for the storm king that's pretty much what everybody uses the surround pound for and then you'll get the storm king's fury which is is just better in every way the surround pound does have a video where i talk about a lot of its different uses i'll link that below of course like i mentioned i would but um i'm not really sure that it's that big of a deal if that heavy attack looks amazing you can grab it but i don't know how game changing it is and then there are a lot of weapons here that are just good like the subwoofer is kind of like a weaker pulsar 9000 the b blaster is fun but eh, staccato shadow you know what i mean i'm talking about what you should be spending your voucher on not what's good that's what i did in my best weapons video and then i already talked about the bundle bus the bowler's fun very powerful but you know and then the Corsair and the Jack's Revenge are two weapons that, especially with the new six perks, are quite powerful. Jack's Revenge hits so hard on a headshot that it can't even display a million damage when I do it. It does bug out. I think I showed it in the Jack's Revenge video, but uh, it's not maybe something I would use a voucher on. Corsair is a very strong sword. You can give it like double or triple attack speed. I'm not exactly sure. Whatever the amount of attack speeds you can put on it. Couple that with Paleo Luna, and it is an extremely powerful weapon, especially with the new six perks options. And the Powder Keg is, again, very, very strong bow. I'll link my best bows video below to talk about but all those more in depth that video is up to date there are no caveats with that one but it's 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 a bow most of the best bows are very good like a powder keg vacuum tube bow and the the xenon are all fantastic xenon of course is core llamas you don't need to spend a voucher on it and the powder keg is quite strong i can't recommend against spending a voucher but as i was saying there are some other options spy weapons are largely unimpressive there every single weapon in here has a stronger version that exists so i can't recommend anything besides the pot shot the pot shot does a stupid amount of damage like literally more than double what it says on the sheet i think it's bugged but nobody really seems to be doing anything about it i don't think epic cares so as of recording, you know, I love saying that, the pot shot is an extremely powerful weapon and something you might want to consider, but 
be prepared that that might get patched because it's literally doing more than the sheet says it should. So I know I'm not critting every shot, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Just be careful. And the pepper sprayer is a very nice SMG. I know people have defended it. I know you can get double crit damage, crit rating, if damage inflicted, all that stuff. But it's it's beaten out by other SMGs, as I already mentioned. It, it just is. It's very neck and neck with like the Sound Spectre and Bobcat, but... It's got some good range. I wouldn't use a voucher on it. I, I simply wouldn't. It's not game changing enough, especially since there are better weapons like the Silent Spectre, Bobcat, Thrasher that you can just get from the collection book right now without spending a precious weapon voucher. The dragon weapons. No, I'm just kidding. So the holiday weapons are... Okay, I'm double kidding. I do want to say that a lot of these weapons did change with that 12.0 update. They do need a second look by me, but none of these are promising enough to really even address here. So with the holiday weapons, that's another one where the Blizzard Blister gets some interesting six perks. The pop shot can get rid of that six perk. I already talked about it. Fantastic shotgun. The ginger blaster is a fantastic pistol. Shark attack is a fantastic launcher. You know, pain train is really, really good, but it's kind of like just above the sound specter and DPS if you factor in that ramping damage damage perk the pain train can have but that's kind of it like none of these all of these weapons are good and things you should use but i don't know about a weapon voucher however for the senna's little helper yes sir it's very much so like the deatomizer in that it is basically one of the best weapons in the entire game extremely powerful uh, especially with that new six perk you know that extra base damage is nice if you impact enemies which you will be with the Santa's little helper every single shot you will be stunning or knocking back an enemy no doubt and it's a top pick seriously if you want to spend your voucher on this i will not say no that's that's a good one. It's solid. Black Metal is interesting because all of these are kind of, eh. Metal Marauder is like the same thing as Sentinel's Little Helper, but it damages you. If you have a Metal Marauder that doesn't actually damage you, this thing, I think, will hit harder than the Sentinel's Little Helper and make it a very strong pick. Of course, you'd have to put, like, a different perk down here. Maybe reload at the bottom, damage up here, triple damage, you'd have a fantastic weapon. And then, of course, you want a fire element if you're going to match to the damage to nature. Black Drum, same story. Uh, both of those are amazing weapons. The Metal Marauder is, again, same praise as the Sentinel's Little Helper, a top pick. Fort Nightmares is interesting because all of these weapons are interesting in their own way. I will highlight the fact that the Candy Corn LMG is only useful with like triple crit damage totally rocking out. It's very niche. I, I wouldn't recommend that as an all-around voucher pick. And the Jackal Launcher did get a buff, but it's still not quite as strong as the launchers I just mentioned. And uh, hey, if you have a weapon voucher, then it does matter which other weapons are better because you can pick whatever you want. So why would you use a voucher on the Jackal Launcher if you don't have the Santa's Little Helper or something that you could get instead? And then the Spectral Blade is kind of the same story as the Surround Pound of the Bundle bus where it is a very strong sword we're talking top tier unless you count the uh, mythic tier where the ravager is literally everything the spectral blade is but better the only time the spectral blade is ever better is if you're using the water element in a fire zone in which case it can deal more damage than the storm king's ravager but in every other circumstance the storm king's ravager is is just better the Rat Rod weapons have uh, very little going for them. Some of these weapons are very good, and I am I know that the Rat Attack, Crank Shot, Two Step have all been very useful in their own builds, but I wouldn't recommend them for a voucher. And I'm sure everybody's been looking forward to the Sci-Fi. Blastotron Mini, 9000, 9000, uh, Deatomizer, Pulsar 9000, Plasmatron, Blastotron, they're all good. They're, they're pretty much every weapon in this set is good. I wouldn't recommend any of the melees with a voucher, but the deatomizer is my personal highest recommendation. I, I don't think there are many other options that even top that in usefulness. And the Pulsar 9000 is certainly worth considering. It's a very, very strong shotgun, extremely good for crowd clearing, and yeah, the sci-fi weapons cannot get a high enough praise. I do think collectively they have the most amount of strongest weapons in the game. And if you want to take that to mean that the sci-fi weapon is the best set in the game, then you can. I'm not going to say that, but it's um, it's it's up there. And then the steampunk weapons do have a few going for them. The cannonade is very strong. The baron is fantastic for movement, but that's it. You, you don't want to use a voucher on a schematic you're going to craft once and then be set for life. If you need a Baron, you can ask somebody. Just ask somebody in your game. Be polite. If you want to ask in our Discord, you can. But please, be polite. If people say no, that's okay. That's that's their right. But if you are ever given a triple movement speed Baron, you're good. You don't, you don't need the schematic. So it's interesting and worth talking about, but not a voucher kind of thing. And the Double Boiler is one of the strongest shotguns in the game that nobody knows about. I'm not even kidding. It has the highest base damage of any non-rocket launcher in the game. That's a big deal. 
Just saying. But even then, I don't use double boiler that much because it's kind of clunky. I don't know. It's good. Very strong shotgun. If you really love shotguns and you don't have the double boiler and this isn't an expansion weapon in the future, then yeah, a voucher is worth considering if you have most of the other things I mentioned. And that leads us to the medieval weapons. And I don't have much to talk about here other than the Jabberwocky being super cool. Video link below. But the Hemlock is something that has interested me. So this is where my current knowledge is going to come into play, where I wish I knew the new six perks for every single weapon, but I just don't. I have personally noticed that the Hemlock has a myriad of very interesting six perks, where I have Snare, but that does no damage for me. I don't personally love Snare. It just slows enemies down. That's cool. If a Smasher is rushing you, you essentially have 30% longer to kill it, but why have 30% longer to kill it when you have perks that can just do more damage? The Shrapnel can do more damage to enemies behind it. That's cool. You know, give you some extra area of effect damage, but the landing five hits in a row causes a small explosion is super cool. To have that on a Hemlock will be so badass, and that can be very, very good. The Hemlock is a top-tier SMG. It ranks right up there with the Silent Spectre, Bobcat, Thrasher, all the ones I've been mentioning. You know, Pepper Sparrow, for that matter. It's a very, very good SMG. If you have the Deatomizer and all of those, like, main game top meta picks, if you will, then the Hemlock is certainly worth a weapon voucher, I, I do personally believe. I, I, don't, I, I don't have five schematics for weapons that I think are bad. Just saying. Huh? Uh, I just talked for over 20 minutes straight. After 10 hours of playing Pokemon Go today, my legs hurt right now, but they hurt less because I took an ibuprofen so I could record this video. Yeah, I'm working hard for you guys and maintaining a rigorous social life. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope this was helpful. I'm sorry that I couldn't give any one answer besides the Deatomizer because there are a lot of options, you know? I could recommend the hell out of the Deatomizer, but if you already have it, then what else, you know? And there's a lot to talk about. Obviously, these things could change in the future. The pinned comment will let you know. And I think I did an okay job covering what was worth talking about. If you think that there's something that's seriously worth recommending, you know, comments below. I am very excited to check out all of these new six perks. I don't know what Ventures is going to store. Obviously, the statement is going to be outdated in like three days when it comes out, but that's kind of why I wanted to make this video now, get you guys excited, get you guys thinking, get you guys planning towards some weapons you should be checking out. Maybe you should be getting ready for something. I don't know. If there's any major change that totally radicalizes everything I've just said here, I might have to make this video again. But until then, I bid you adieu. If you guys want to support the channel, like, uh, you know, you oh, 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 it's been two weeks. That might happen to you guys too. Use code MISTA to check out. I really appreciate it. Become a channel member, you know, support me there you know check out those perks you can get that with the join button in the channel page or the the member link in the description below and uh yeah thanks for watching two very big videos linked down below if you're looking to spend these these are very useful to you newbie players if you're just coming in brand new vouchers are a way to get some of the most powerful heroes in the game you're gonna hear about dinos from me and um many other people and Typically, vouchers are heavily recommended to be spent on them because Paleo Luna, one of the best melee heroes in the game. You can get her with a voucher. I'm not going to because I have multiple copies, but these are heroes that are, you know, lots of heroes in the game. You can use vouchers to get them, and uh, they are certainly... They are certainly something that you want to be careful when you spend because you only really get one voucher every two or three months. So... Be careful. Watch my video on it before you spend anything. But nowadays, freebie, Crossbones Barrett doesn't need a voucher, and he's one of the best heroes in the game. I'm just going to leave that one at that. You can explore that thread on your own. And then the rest of the resources are very much so just, you know, perk up can make the perks of your weapon stronger. That's what all my best perk series are regarding, is making these perks more better. And a nice little tutorial for you guys. If you're looking to get more evolution materials, you might not have 10 or 20,000 on you uh, when you start out the game. This is an absurd amount because I have played way longer than most people do. Uh, these are things that you get from the missions that I talk about every single day on my channel. Uh, I have no plans to end this series anytime soon, but generally speaking, you get these from regular missions you know like this mission is going to be giving me 4x schematic xp and you can see the timer these rotate uh, every single day so i cover them on a daily basis which missions are worth running and uh it's definitely just something that you want to you know keep on top of watching my videos or at least logging in every day to check these missions if you're looking to get drops of rain in your plankerton player then run this uh 20 what is this a 28 four player mission so these are the kind of things you just get through natural play and you'll get tons of them these are used to evolve something so if i'm looking at this powder keg for example you can see that it's going to cost XP and this amount of resources. So if you want to just see what a 130 weapon costs, there you go. This is a weapon I totally plan on leveling up anyway, and it brings me to a nice conversation. 
Sunbeam or Brightcore or Shadow Shard or Obsidian. Obsidian goes to Brightcore and Sunbeam goes to, well, Shadow Shard goes to Sunbeam. You want Shadow Shard every single time. That is my basic recommendation. I have found very, very few examples where you ever want bright core and even in those examples sunbeam is fine anyway the difference is sunbeam reduces your durability from uh 375 down to 300 on more weapon on normal weapons but it gives you 20 percent more damage so it also it also uh, does the fire rate so let me go through that one more time sunbeam gives you 20 percent more damage 10 percent less fire rate and 20 percent less durability so you'll be shooting a little slower and you'll be shooting a little less often because your weapon will break sooner, but it will do more damage while it's available. And honestly, 20% less durability doesn't matter if you're doing 20% more damage because you'll be using, well, 20% less ammo anyway. So it works out to essentially last the same amount of time. And you want Sunbeam every time. If you look in the upper right here, Sunbeam, uh, all of my weapons are Sunbeam. Except for explosives, for example, where you can't actually make them Sunbeam. So, not a big deal there. But every weapon where I have a choice, they are Sunbeam. Except for one. I made one mistake way back in the day with the Founders of Volt. Now, if you ever do make a mistake, uh, I do have a video on this. But since it's only one minute long, I suppose I can demonstrate. You can uh, put an item in the collection book. I'm not going to actually book my Whisper 45. But if I do so, it'll actually bring it from 130 back down to 20. And I'll actually be able to unslot it for 20 V-Bucks. I can demonstrate that here. If you go to, uh, let me just do event schematics. My brush off, for example. If I do unslot for 20 V-Bucks, you can pull it back out. And then you essentially have a chance to level it back up. That's, you know, it's a 20 V-Buck mistake. You don't want to do that. But it is a way that you can change it. Of course, with the uh, Founders Revolt, this is that Founders pack that's not available anymore. This is what allows me to use V-Bucks. I can't put this in the collection book, so I'm stuck with Brightcore, and I've regretted it every day since. It's kind of a, you know, you wake up in the morning thinking the sun's shining, I'm feeling good, and then I remember the Founders of Volt every morning. So you definitely just want to do Sunbeam every single time. There are, like I said, some extremely niche cases, but even then... Even then, with my Storm King's Fury, Sunbeam is going to work completely fine. It doesn't need to be bright core, and uh, that is not something that you're even going to need to worry about right now. So, I think that just about covers it for the resources. You know, like Frost Up, Fire Up, Amp Up. This allows you, once again, to just, you know, change the element. Uh, that's actually what that's used for. In fact, if I go to the powder keg, you'll see in the bottom right, uh, these, you, these are exactly how those are spent. But these are things that you'll figure out along the way, and every one of my best perks videos essentially covers those. XP is the exact same thing. Reperk allows you to... Um, change the perk you'll never guess right <laughs> but pretty basic and then of course the team at xp boost you want to spend these as much as possible just dump them on all your friends uh they stack forever you can't waste them um i did not want to click 543 times and then you have to confirm it so that'd be a thousand and eighty six times that i didn't want to click but uh, if you use those as you go, your friends will appreciate it and you guys will all level up faster. What that does is under your profile, you can see that I have, uh, if I move my camera, about 3 million XP to the next reward. That's like one mission, it's not a big deal. And then you get all these sorts of things as you level up. Even if you hit max level, you're always going to be able to spend you know, XP. You just get that from playing the game. You do not need to worry about it. It is something that will happen in the background, whether or not you are aware of it. So, Locker, same as BR, not a big deal there. And then the Llama Shop is something I think we've already covered. So, I, I risk saying too soon, 30 minutes into the video, I think I've just about covered the basics of everything. This is by no means all-encompassing. I am sure there are tons of questions. Ask your friends, comment down below, join our Discord, ask in there, ask me on stream, Twitch link down below. I will try to answer questions on, on the streams, of course, but this should have hopefully been a really, really useful jumping off point so that you guys kind of know where you're kind of going in this game and what you're trying to do and uh i'm sure i didn't cover everything but how could i we're already half an hour in but that should have been a really good starting point for a starter guide for fortnite save the world thank you guys so much for watching even if this video wasn't like heavily edited or anything i did put a lot of thought into it just trying to articulate this in a way that wasn't extremely confusing not to mention the past two and a half years i've spent accumulating the videos that i linked down below it might seem a little lazy that i'm plugging those videos but all those videos took work too, and I made them for you guys, so enjoy. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Twitch, YouTube, you know, Creator Code. If you're this far in, you know, consider it. I'll see you guys hopefully in the next video, and uh, enjoy your journey.
Did you really watch this whole thing? You didn't just click to the end, did you? Like, did you actually, like, all the way through the full eight hours? If you made it this far and you didn't just click ahead, I want watermelon is very poggers in the comments, okay? This is a secret message recorded just for you. If you skip to the end, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. You, 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 you lost, okay? You failed. If you actually watched this whole shit post, then congrats. Uh, I'll, I'll see you guys later. And then...